Grandson of the Holy Emperor is a Necromancer. Chapter 1, 001 Prologue Life could be so unpredictable. I mean, who could have guessed that you'd just suddenly die from a VR game project you participated in with the simple hopes of making some pocket change? This stinging sensation alongside the smell of cooked flesh yup, this was definitely an electrocution. By the time I lost consciousness and woke back up again, I was already possessing a different body. Was this reincarnation? Maybe possession? I couldn't really tell. However, one thing I knew for sure was that the class I picked for the game testing necromancer became my current profession. What's worse was that I now lived in a theocracy where the Holy Emperor set the laws. It seemed that I became the Mang Nani grandson of the Holy Emperor himself. I'm F asterisk Ed. 001. Prologue Finn. Chapter 2, 002. Imperial Prince is a Grave Keeper minus 1, Part 1. Even though this was during the middle of the day, grayish, chilly fog was blanketing everything the eyes could see. I gripped the shovel real tight and slammed it hard against the ground. Sweat trickled down as I panted heavily. My whole body felt heavy like a soaked sponge. I glanced at my side towards the wagon filled with corpses. I was currently burying them underground. Anyone unfamiliar with this sight might think that they ran into a horrifying scene of mass murder. Regrettably, though, that wasn't the case. Yup, being a gravekeeper is no picnic at all. Indeed, I was working as a gravekeeper. Chilly atmosphere enveloped the entire graveyard. I shifted my gaze towards a derelict monastery on the verge of collapsing. In this northern region covered by snow 365 days a year, the land of the dead spirits where rotting corpses and various undeads rampaged about, I was spending my days as the exiled imperial prince. If you asked who possessed the absolute authority in this continent, then people would most likely point at just one man. He was the king of humanity. An existence that even the lofty emperors had to be respectful and mindful of. He, in a nutshell, was the holy emperor, also referred to as God's emissary. Anyone who inherited the holy emperor's bloodline would be treated as a person blessed with a noble lineage. Too bad my situation was somewhat different from that. Banishment is it? I clicked my tongue as I stared at the side of the graveyard. The weather might have been chilly, but flies still buzzed around the corpses atop the wagon, with maggots crawling all over said corpses as their companions. I hoisted the shovel on my shoulder, a bitter grin etched on my lips. Why did it have to be this particular body, though? I wasn't sure whether this was a reincarnation or a possession, but what mattered here was the fact that the owner of this body had been banished to this place, the land of the dead spirits. He was then given the job of a grave keeper here. The reason was pretty simple he was a complete trash, a maggot no one wanted to be associated with. Honestly speaking, this body's original memories didn't exist anymore. However, I would still hear some stories about this body's past on occasion. For example, while walking around the Imperial Palace, he felt quite bored, and so, he summoned a servant only to kick and slap the living hell out of the poor person. Another one includes him spotting a servant girl walking around and sexually assaulting her, or he'd mercilessly beat up a tutor coming to teach him just because he got bored again. Sure. A portion of aristocrats would also do something like this, it also means that such a simple reason couldn't have warranted a banishment for the imperial prince and become a grave keeper here. The actual reason why he got banished to not just a regular frontier region, but to a very dangerous one at that, even becoming a grave keeper was. Blasphemy, that's what. The libido of the holy emperor's grandson had awakened and he tried to rape a certain esteemed daughter of a noble one who came to the theocratic empire to train to become a lady-in-waiting. During the deed itself, he was discovered by an archbishop who came to pay his respects to the holy emperor. Now normally. Tisk, tisk. That Mangnani is causing yet another incident. That's where the matter should have ended along with the archbishop stopping the youth. However, the problem was that the lady-in-training happened to be the granddaughter of the same archbishop who discovered the deed midway. 
The granddaughter he sent to the Imperial Palace to learn refinement and etiquette was about to be raped, and he got to personally witness that sorry sight. Of course, the Archbishop flipped his lid. Unsurprisingly, the incident of the Archbishop using his crozier to beat the living daylights out of the Imperial grandson at the time occurred. Both of them were summoned before the Holy Emperor right away. One could say that the next most powerful person besides the Cardinal was the Archbishop, but such a thing wouldn't matter after beating up the Holy Emperor's grandson. However, as the grandson was also guilty in this case, both were punished with two months of house arrest. Things seemed to have calmed down with the case now closed, but then. He dared to hit me? The immature boy of fifteen years old sneaked into the archbishop's quarters and proceeded to burn his holy scriptures. He broke the cross and then painted the wall with large letters that read a lowly bastard who sleeps with goddess Gaia. Despite him living in a theocratic system, and on top of that, he was even the holy emperor's grandson, and yet he dared to blaspheme. What a crazy and reckless fool he was. Thanks to that, the Holy Emperor's pent-up rage exploded and he promptly banished his grandson to the land of the dead spirits up north. The Imperial grandson's authority and status were stripped away from him, and he was even ordered to perform services to the village there. Mourn for the dead and improve yourself that way. This was probably what the Holy Emperor was thinking at the time. While in post-banishment, the influence the boy possessed as the potential successor of the Holy Emperor vanished too. He didn't even have any escorts anymore. It was easy to guess what the Emperor's intentions were. He wouldn't give a damn even if the boy got kidnapped by another country, or his life was endangered by something else in this dangerous land. Basically, the Holy Emperor had abandoned the boy. Even then, suicide is just not on, dude. The grandson, while full of dissatisfaction, headed to a nearby village and went on a rampage. He acted like an arse and not even a day later, paladins came to visit him. The imperial grandson got subdued in an instant. He was then imprisoned inside the monastery with nothing but prayers and water as his nourishment. After that day, the boy became truly enraged. This is unfair. Too unfair. How dare those lowly things. This whole thing must have been completely unacceptable when viewed from the perspective of an once lofty imperial grandson. Then again, he got banished to some backwoods to lug around corpses and shovel the ground. He probably couldn't see a better future anymore. Was that the reason why he did it? By the time I gained consciousness, I was already flailing about in a noose around my neck after he hanged himself. Indeed. The Holy Emperor's dumb grandson complained about his sad fate and tried to kill himself. Well, it doesn't matter now, does it? That was all in the past now. It wasn't something I should particularly worry about anyway. This body had now become mine and my second life had begun. However, it would have been nice to live the life of a gold spoon in the Imperial Palace, but well, living as a grave keeper wasn't so bad either. Actually, this suited my personality better. Maybe because of the profession necromancer that I chose in the game I was playing for my part-time work in the previous life, I didn't really feel any repulsion when handling all these corpses. Hell, I was even okay with all the dreary, gloomy fog and the still silence, as well as the lingering stench wafting around here. I sincerely pray that I'm not some loon who loves to spend time with dead bodies. I muttered to myself as I glanced at the corpses. There was something really odd about me, though. For sure, a necromancer was a magician-type profession that used demonic energy to rule over death. But now, it felt like the characteristics of this particular profession had been altered somewhat. I glanced around the vicinity. After confirming that no one was around, I cautiously touched one of the corpses. Suddenly, the body that was ready to be buried emitted white light, and sure enough, it began standing back up on its feet while creaking like a wooden doll. Oh, ooh. Rotting flesh, empty eye sockets, and even the unmistakable stagger. This was, without a doubt, a zombie. Yes, it was definitely a zombie, but... I frowned deeply while looking at such a creature. Why do you possess divinity though? 
forget about the aura of death, this zombie was overflowing with the aura of life instead. It was a zombie overflowing with divinity. The necromancy skills I possessed were resurrection of the dead, dead spirit soldier, plague of debilitation, swamp of death, and horrifying curse. As for my sundry passive skills, I also boasted the mind's eye and translation, etc. I possessed a couple of other skills, but it seemed that I couldn't use them yet. I wasn't able to remember them at all. However, they sometimes flitted in and out of my mind, so I merely thought that it depended on my proficiency with my current skills in order to activate them. In the case of my necromancy skills, they display effects closely related to all things life-related. For instance, if I summon zombies or skeletons, the ones appearing would be filled with divinity and not the normal demonic energy. The plague and the curse skills actually granted blessings, all the while the swamp of death actually summoned a pit filled with holy water. All these skills that foretold one's death had now been altered to ones that bestowed life. The reason for that must be. It's probably this body's fault. I took a closer look at my current body. Rather than demonic energy, it was brimming with divinity instead. Even though he was a complete asshole and possessed not a shred of faith in his bones, he was still blessed with a sizable amount of divinity because he was the grandson of the Holy Emperor. I wasn't sure what the levels of other priests were like around these parts, but this body's divinity was probably about average in his age group. Sir Imperial Prince Nim. Your Highness. A voice called out to me from beyond the foggy footpath. I looked back to discover two men, both seemingly farmers, fumbling about while making their way out of the forest's narrow path. Chapter 3, 002 Imperial Prince is a Grave Keeper Minus One, Part 2 They were wearing masks, and with some difficulty, lugging around a corpse. I was so preoccupied with what I was doing that I failed to notice them approaching me. Go inside. The divinity-filled zombie wiggled about and reacted to my words. It willingly entered the pit on the ground and comfortably laid down. As an added bonus, it even began dragging in the surrounding earth to bury itself. I took care of the remaining soil scattered about. I grunted heavily as I closed up the ground and carefully hardened it. Nice. While feeling satisfied, I sneaked a glance at the farmers approaching me. Hey? Weren't you with someone just now, sir? Nope. I shook my head to deny what he said. It'd be wiser to keep the villagers in the dark about the undead. Could you even imagine the kind of reactions it would cause if the Holy Emperor's grandson was seen hanging around the zombies? The Holy Emperor's seventh grandson has grown disheartened by his fate and signed a contract with the devil. I somehow managed to miraculously survive the suicide attempt, but now I was controlling zombies? A heresy inquisitor might really get dispatched here immediately. It'd be rather difficult trying to convince the priests of the Holy Emperor's kingdom, when they only believed in what they wanted to believe. So, uh, Sir Imperial Prince Nim. Um. As for me, I was referred to as either the Imperial Prince or the Seventh Prince. Originally, I should have been referred to as the Imperial Grandson. But the thing was, the Holy Emperor's son, my father, who was the first in line for the throne, had already ascended to the seat. But then he promptly went missing afterward. So, my current title was apparently the Imperial Prince. We greet your highness, the Imperial Prince Nim. There was no way that a couple of villagers from the Styx would know anything about decorum or etiquette. The two farmers belatedly bowed their heads a little as their greeting. For some reason, they seemed to be minding my mood too. The original owner of this body must have thrown an almighty tantrum after such greetings were offered in his way. Probably. I actually preferred these simpler greetings though. Besides that, I also had no clue as to what the established decorum or etiquette was myself, so I was in no position to demand that from these two. I pointed at the corpse they brought in with my chin and spoke to the farmers, what is that now? Feeling a bit fatigued, I stabbed the shovel on the ground and leaned against it. The farmers quickly explained the story behind the dead body. You see, sir, my neighbor Baron died from the plague. 
Yu Yu, it was so terrible. I'm worried about us getting infected by the plague ourselves and die later. You didn't cremate the body. I said in pure dissatisfaction, causing the farmers to stare at each other. They then replied with awkward expressions. Well, that. You know, it's a bit. Even though we weren't that close, we still said good mornings to each other every day, so we figured that he should at least get a decent burial, you see. We heard that a simple purification ceremony is enough to let us bury him as an intact corpse. W. We got tasked with this job recently, so we don't know much about the finer details on what we should do, sir. How should we even cremate? I glared at them with eyes filled with dissatisfaction as I raised myself up. It'd be fine to cremate the body and bring only the ashes, but these villagers seem to be rather disinclined to harm the corpses. Perhaps it was due to the affection they felt towards one another when the dead body was still alive or something. Obviously, the number of things I had to do would increase because of this, but oh well. I raised my shovel up high, and then I glared at the farmers. The farmers flinched in surprise and backtracked in a hurry. I Imperial Prince Nim. One farmer was panicking, while. I told you his old habit is still there. He didn't change after his suck. The other farmer was shouting loudly, his complexion ashen white. They probably thought that my shovel was aimed at them. It was then. Kuo. The corpse wrapped tightly in fabric suddenly writhed and began moving. It extended its hand out and grabbed one of the farmers. Its cheeks were torn open and its mouth was split wide as if its jaw wanted to fall off. Just before the damn thing could take a bite out of the farmer's neck, my shovel sliced down. The edges of the farming tool slammed into the animated corpse's head. Heek. The farmers got the shock of their lives and ended up falling on their asses. I lightly dusted my hand and spoke, I keep telling you people. Raising the shovel again, I performed the kill confirm strike. A rather bone chilling noise issued out. If you don't cremate the corpse, it'll turn into a zombie in three four days. This world was rather unique in that way. I wasn't sure about a bustling city, but the thing was, when a person died near negative spots, such as somewhere out in the remote rural areas, some gloomy forest, or even in the middle of a battlefield, there was a one out of ten chance he or she would be revived as a zombie. It was like the standard rule of this world or some such. And the ones tasked with dealing such zombies among the villagers were called hunters, grave keepers, or the priests. The negative spot found in the surrounding vicinity of the land of the dead spirits was especially strong. However, this was also probably because this was the final resting ground of the necromancer king, the one who turned the continent into an ocean of death in the past. Thanks to that, anyone who died in this place had about a 50% chance of turning into an undead. The villagers already knew about this, and yet their dumb beliefs meant they were reluctant to cremate the dead with their own hands. Their reasoning was quite simple a superstition about getting cursed themselves. I wiped the sweat off my forehead and then drank some water out of the leather waterskin attached to my hips. Whatever. Thanks for your hard work. You may go now. I waved my hand dismissively. The two farmers swallowed nervously as they stood back up. They then studied each other's moods before quietly opening their mouths. Excuse me. Sir Imperial Prince. What now? I stared at them as I drank some more water. I Imperial Prince Nim, sir, you. You're a priest in a way, yes. I don't know crap about being a priest or not, but I'm the grandson of the Holy Emperor, sure. I'm just the grandson of a man who enjoys the authority of an emperor and a pope at the same time. Well, that's what I was on the outside. Ah, I forgot about the divinity inside me. I in that case, is it possible for you to bless us so that we don't get infected by the plague? I looked at them with a less than impressed glare. What the hell were they on about? There's no way you wouldn't get infected by the plague with something like that. Do you think that it's some sort of vaccination? Besides, I didn't even possess such skills either. I wasn't even a priest, but a damn necromancer, so why the hell? 
I shook my head as a response to their request, but the farmers didn't give up so easily. E even if it's just a simple baptism. They held hands and begged, their expressions serious and earnest. The plague doing the rounds in this area lately must have been pretty grave. But then again, that had to be since corpses were frequently being brought into the graveyard. The appeal that the villagers sent to a nearby feudal lord must have fallen on deaf ears. At this rate, it wouldn't be strange to see a whole village disappear. What do you mean by baptism? I've never done anything like that before. P please don't be like that. These farmers seemed to be under the assumption that I wasn't helping them out because I couldn't be bothered about their fate. They rummaged through their pockets and fished out a handful of coins before presenting me with those. This isn't much, but please. Indeed, it was literally a pocket change that a little kid might carry around. I alternated my gaze between the two farmers, and they looked back at me with pleading faces. I spat out a lengthy groan. If that can put your minds at ease. Even though I said that, I still didn't know how to perform a baptism or whatever. I mean, when would I have ever had the chance to do something like that? I tried to recall what I saw in passing from TV in my previous life. I poured a little bit of water from the water skin at the two farmers. After drawing a sloppy cross in the air, I mumbled out. Uh, so. Um, amen. Even if it was just for show, I thought it'd be discourteous not to do it. Originally, one would have to spray around holy water and recite the holy scripture, but as I didn't know how to do that, I decided to just gloss over the finer details. When the farmers saw how sloppy I was, they sighed under their breaths. But still, they gathered their hands and offered their prayers. We pray that Gaia's blessing will be with us. It was exactly then. You have blessed your target. But how? 002 Imperial Prince is a Grave Keeper Minus One, Part One and Two, Finn. Chapter Four, Zero Zero Three. Imperial Prince is a Grave Keeper Minus Two. As I studied the distancing backs of the two farmers, the mind's eye skill showed me their current conditions. Name: Grill. Age: Thirty-five. Speciality: Farming. Physical labor. Plus, currently in a blessed state. There it was, the status info so short that someone who couldn't be bothered to must have written it. However, I shouldn't be worrying about that right now. Blessed. I only drew a cross with my fingers and said Amen though. Despite my actions that could be construed as sacrilegious, the divinity inside my body still leaked out and the skill activated on its own. More importantly, though, I didn't possess any skill called blessing. I sank into a deep contemplation before remembering a certain skill. Horrifying curse. Damage a target for a prolonged time by inflicting pain. It seemed that its attribute had been flipped on its head. Well, it shouldn't pose any problems later, right? Eiii, what could possibly happen, anyway? I mean, it wasn't a curse but a blessing, so it should be fine. Even rotting food would serve as medicine if you don't get sick after eating it. If you didn't die after getting hit by magic, it would be a blessing in and of itself. If something really did go wrong, they would surely seek me out right away. With these thoughts in mind, I decided not to worry about the matter anymore. I was a grave keeper. The priest that maintained the monastery, buried the dead, and performed the purification ceremony. Indeed. There was no need for me to sweat over the ongoings of the outside world. Right. No need to mind the outside world. My job was to simply start shoveling, dump the maggot-infested corpses inside the burial pits, and then perform the purification ceremony so no one would turn into zombies. That's it. I felt no dissatisfaction towards what I had to do. In fact, I didn't feel any repulsion towards the dead bodies which probably had something to do with the effects of my profession, necromancer. This job was even rewarding in its own way and could be fun at times too. However. This ain't it. Imperial Prince Nim. Imperial Prince Nim. 
the farmers from before had shown up again while pulling a wagon with great difficulty this time. However, the wagon was now carrying four or five corpses instead of one body they lugged around previously. The accompanying flies and wriggling maggots were simply an additional bonus. I fell into despair after seeing that wagon. God damn it, there's more. Each of the bodies weighed at least somewhere between 50 to 60 kilos. Digging the burial pits and moving the corpses were easy, since I could just turn them into zombies and make them do all the hard work. Afterwards, all I had to do was close the graves and perform the perfunctory purification ceremony. That's it. It was possible to take care of everything so effortlessly, but I couldn't utilize my skills at all thanks to the farmers that kept paying me a visit far too often. In the end, I had to shovel, shovel, and then shovel some more. On top of that, I now had to lug around the bodies and perform the burial properly. This had to be the zenith of all hard labors in this world, period. God damn it, to think that the Holy Emperor's grandson, supposedly beloved by the gods, had to perform such stupidly hardcore labor. This didn't make an iota of sense. Ah, the highest esteemed goddess of love and mercy, Gaia. Have we become sworn enemies now? I inwardly threw curses and insults in the direction of the goddess that the theocratic empire worshipped. While doing so, I flinched greatly as I stared at the corpses. How many days has it been since they died? Pardon? Oh, uh, maybe three or four days. What about the cremation? As you can see, we didn't do it. The wagon suddenly began bucking wildly. And then, three zombies promptly stood up. Cool. While spitting out phlegm-filled roars, the zombies tumbled down from the wagon. The farmers cried out in panic. I became utterly speechless by this scene. Hell, I was even tempted to pretend that I noticed nothing and ignore them for now. Why was I given this gravekeeper job? Being thrown into the army would have been more preferable than this. I groaned under my breath as I wielded the shovel still in my grasp. Then, I began smacking the heads of the zombies. The first blow, second, and then, the third. Zombies collapsed as their heads exploded. Blood splattered on my face. I scowled reflexively at this. After wiping the blood away with the back of my hand, I lifted up the unmoving bodies. D asterisk M in it, this was still a part of my job. If only my profession was a warrior or a barbarian, however, my current job was that of a necromancer. The profession that was at the height of sneaky cheapness one that simply threw a bunch of zombies and skeletons out there and watched them fight for you. Such was the characteristic of this dark magic profession, meaning there was no way that my strength stat would be any good. I definitely had a weak-ass priest's physique. But my muscles and stamina were built up a bit by all the shoveling exercise I've done lately, which barely managed to prop me up until now. Even if we're dealing with zombies, I'll still feel bad if they're damaged like this, you know. I tossed the corpse with the busted head down the burial pit. The farmers helped me too, sweat trickling down their faces. Soon, most of the work was done. Feeling tired, I sat down on a tombstone that hadn't been set in place yet. While pretending to pull something out from a leather bag, I accessed my item window. I pulled out a boiled potato and took a bite out of it, with bloodied hands and all. This couldn't really be helped though trying to wash myself before eating every time would be a waste of time. Also, this body must have been sturdier than I thought, or maybe I should thank the divinity inside me. I hadn't fallen ill once after occupying this body. E excuse me. It was then that the farmers, finished with their quest to help me in my work, suddenly addressed me. They exchanged glances with each other as if they were scared of the sudden change in my mood and then, they cautiously opened their mouths. I it's like the village has been cursed by an evil spirit. Be because, how can a plague like this one be? An evil spirit? That wasn't even funny, dude. Looks like these gullible fools got suckered into believing yet another baseless superstition here. W.L., Imperial Prince Nim. You're a priest, aren't you? 
How about exorcising the evil spirit from the village? Son of a gun! They were now asking me to become an exorcist too? I frowned heavily towards the farmers as I spoke, I'm telling you this right now, I'm a priest only in name. And yet, you want someone like that to exorcise evil spirits? Say something that makes sense, will ye? Unfortunately, my job description meant that I couldn't refuse them. As long as I possessed divinity, I should be able to defeat all the undead in this place. However, this was a really cruel thing to ask from a fifteen-year-old boy. And so, shouldn't requesting the paladins that showed up like clockwork every month the smarter thing to do here? Besides, I'm only fifteen years old. Do you really want to entrust the exorcism to a fifteen-year-old kid? 1. The two farmers shrunk back since they also knew this point oh so well. Oh of course, but, but. The Lord Paladins who visited the village the last time told us to leave everything to you unless it's a truly dangerous matter, Imperial Prince Nim. Those stinking paladin as asterisk holes. Just as I began hurling all sorts of curses at them. A also, you've bestowed us with blessings, haven't you? You're an amazing priest capable of that, so we were hoping that you could also purify the village. What? What were they on about now? I stared at the two farmers with a puzzled look on my face. They noticed my expression and spoke up again. After you baptized us, we weren't struck down by the plague. I tilted my head after hearing them. Well, you two just got lucky, that's all. We've been dumped with this task to cart around these plague-infected bodies the whole day. But then, rather than falling ill, we... The farmers began patting their torsos as if it was the oddest thing ever. It's as if we've been filled with lots of energy for the past few days. My tilting head leaned even further to the side. But, surely that's because of the stamina you built up by farming? The injuries we suffered healed really quickly too. But... That's because the folks of this world are especially sturdy, so. Both me and this fool, the two of us are the only survivors from our village. I stared at the two farmers with a dazed expression. It had already been a week since I used the skill horrifying curse slash blessing on these two. Between then and now, about twenty corpses were brought here. Those must have been their fellow villagers then. Yet. These two farmers who brought in all those plague-ridden corpses were still perfectly fine. Even right now, they weren't wearing those cumbersome masks because they got in the way. The effects of making a cross the air with my hand and saying Amen was that strong. Yes, it is. The farmers nodded their heads with certainty. Holy cow! Dear Goddess Gaia! Did you feel lazy like me and just haphazardly slap them with a blessing or something? I knew it. I was wondering why so much divinity leaked out of me back then. It seemed that the blessing itself had been pretty generous, to say the least. I crossed my arms and groaned loudly, a skill activated all on its own, and it even has a super awesome effect, too. Pardon. It's nothing. I guess it'd be better for me to raise the proficiency of my skills so that I could use them at will later. That'd be a much smarter thing to do rather than not even knowing that I somehow used my skills. I shifted my gaze back to the farmer duo. Did you say that you two are the only survivors? Then, where are you staying? We're currently residing in a neighboring village. I massaged my forehead. This was a job I had to do anyway, so I figured it'd be better to do it as soon as possible. And as an added bonus. The two of you, help me out. Doing it while I had two additional helpers would be smarter, right? The farmers became somewhat confused after hearing me, but they still nodded their heads. What a bloody spectacular sight this is. We arrived at the farmer's old village. Thirty or so shacks greeted us with a portion of them having already collapsed. There were shattered windows and broken doors, various filth and corpses littered their vicinity. A village that would have had a starring role in a horror movie was waiting for us. I observed the conditions of the corpses lying around the village. After turning one of them over, I ran my hands over the damaged parts and tilted my head. Looks like he's been bitten by something. 
Did an animal take a bite out of this corpse? No, hang on. The bite mark was too small to say that an animal did this. I raised my head and scanned the village. What a relief, there doesn't seem to be any zombies around. The corpses found around the village were either quietly staying dead, or were far too damaged to become undead. I looked at all the puke stains and filth scattered everywhere and scowled real deeply. Since there were so many dead bodies around, I naturally spotted lots of rats gnawing on them too. The rodent closest to me stopped chewing a corpse and raised its head to meet my stare. It had a disgusting stench and red eyes filled with murderous intent, as well as the faint trace of demonic energy coming from it. A zombie. It then bared its crooked fangs and dashed towards me at a frightening turn of speed. It was so quick as if it couldn't wait to bite the crap out of me. I raised my shovel and then slammed it down. The rodent was sliced in half, its torn flesh bouncing around. What's up with this guy? Even though it was in two pieces now, the rodent wasn't dead yet. Despite ending up as a severed torso, it was still trying to bite into my leather boots. I lifted my foot up and heavily stomped on it. The farmers flinched at my actions and shrunk away. Since when? Pardon. I squatted down and picked up the dead rodent before glaring at the farmer duo. This thing was a zombie. A damn undead rodent, okay? So, since when did things like this little guy begin running around in the village? The farmers hastily exchanged glances with each other. Then, while making perplexed expressions, they shook their heads. We don't know. What a refreshingly honest reply that was. Is that information important, your highness? They tilted their heads. Well, no. Not really. I tossed the zombie rat away. It wasn't only humans who could turn into zombies. A portion of any life form that died near a negative field would turn into an undead. You wouldn't turn into a zombie just because you got bitten by an undead in this world. However, if the toxin spread in you and you died from that, then sure, there was a good chance that you'd turn into one, but if not, you'd just suffer from high fever. As long as you didn't die, you'd naturally recover. Meaning, it was that sort of an illness, no more and no less. The stench is pretty intolerable though. This rodent, however, was no longer on the level of simple zombification. A seriously thick amount of demonic energy was permeating from within it. Since there was so much, there was a high chance of a human dying from its bites and then turning into an undead later. Was this thing a hundred-year-old zombie rat or something? If there was only one, or maybe two of these critters around, other animals or even humans would have easily killed it off, but... I shifted my gaze again. I spotted pitch-black shadows coagulating around a certain collapsed shack. Dozens upon dozens of zombie rodents, all with crimson eyes, were glaring at me. Seeing this spectacle caused my eye muscles twitch all on their own. With such a vermin horde around, it'd been even stranger to see a village that managed to escape unscathed. You too, are you sure you didn't start a vermin farm or something? I asked the farmers, and of course, they hurriedly shook their heads. Once they also saw the zombie rodents, they eagan stumbling backwards in pure terror. T there is no way. I it wasn't like this a few days ago. I remember now. You said that you left this village, didn't you? The farmers quickly nodded their heads. E even if this place is our H home village, e everyone was a already dying from the P plague, W who do you want to stay here? RF families have left T this world a long time ago a already, T this I is why we didn't have any reasons to s stay put. W weary currently staying in the N neighboring village. They readily accepted you too. Why yes. In turn, the village tasked us with delivering those who died from the plague. Oh, so that's why you were accepted. Seriously, man. There's so many things I've gotta do now. I glared back at the zombie rodents. Well, there's your evil spirit. Not only that, they're pretty dreadful ones at that too. Hundreds of zombie rats opened their eyes wider. And then, the horde began to dash towards us. 
my sole weapon was the shovel in my hand. Unfortunately, it'd be impossible to fight them with just this. I Imperial Prince Nim, run. While glaring at them, I stabbed the shovel into the ground. I sucked in a deep breath, and as whitish air exhaled out of my mouth, I muttered out the name of a skill. Swamp of Death. 003. Imperial Prince is a Grave Keeper minus 2 Fin. Chapter 5, 004. Imperial Prince is a Grave Keeper minus 3. The Divine Puddle has been summoned. A voice delivering a message could be heard inside my head. The ground beneath my feet suddenly became mushy. With the shovel as the center, the water began to fill up below and eventually created a smallish puddle. And then... Squeal! Dozens of zombified rodents that stepped into the puddle all melted away. Their bodies maintained by the thick demonic energy simply stopped existing, leaving behind only their skeletons. As they slowly sunk into the puddle, they completely vanished from the view. Oh, my goodness! The eyes of the two farmers became huge circles. They walked closer to my side, and while staring at the melting rats, addressed me. I heard that some priests can soar through the air and can even heal a dying person to their full health, but this. I didn't know that you possessed such immense power, your highness. Can you also beat up the zombies while scattering light too? Hey, did you guys read a Zionzia novel or something? I clicked my tongue while looking at them. It wasn't so far-fetched to see them carry around strange notions regarding priests though. I hadn't seen other priests of this world yet, but they shouldn't be on such a fantastical level as described by these two farmers. Yup, they probably should wield a similar level of holy magic as me. I lifted up the shovel and rested it against my shoulder. The swamp of death in front of me, which would originally create a puddle filled with demonic energy and kill the victims by sapping away their life force, had been altered to summon a puddle filled with holy water instead. That's all good and well, but... Arg. Anemia. I staggered unsteadily. I've been thinking about this every single time it happened, but man, the amount of divinity spent was nothing to laugh about. I really needed to learn how to control my own powers, but it was kinda difficult for me to figure out the methods to do that when all my holy skills were based on necromancy skills. Still, it sure is powerful all right. I looked down on the zombified rats melting away. I didn't know that holy water could even melt down an undead skin and flesh, actually. I dunked my hand in the holy water beneath my feet and took a whiff of it. What a unique kind of water it was, with an invitingly sweet aroma and all that. You could drink it straight up and it wouldn't cause you any harm. Holy water very effective in curing any illnesses, enhancing your health and as well as boosting your natural recovery rate. My version was created through a different process from the stuff found in churches or other monasteries, which was made by priests praying their butts off while adding divinity to water. However, the effects should pretty much be the same between the two. It's really annoying to baptize everyone one by one, so, I pointed at the holy water puddle and told the two farmers, go and distribute this to the other villagers. Around a finger-sized portion should suffice. Have them drink it and the plague should be completely gone. Actually, I hadn't experimented on living people before. But upon seeing that the two farmers were fine after being blessed by me, this holy water should also work pretty well too. You, want them to drink this. The farmers stared at the holy water puddle. Bits of flesh and bones that used to belong to the zombified rats were still floating around in it. They then shifted their troubled gazes back to me. I don't think both of you are in any position to mine stuff like that right now, said I while staring straight back at them. The farmers seemed to give up as they nodded their heads. We'll distribute them right away. Yup, you should have done that in the first place. Otherwise, I'll be really troubled by you lot. I definitely didn't want this dang plague to get worse than this, after all. I was already losing my sh asterisk t from the increase in the workload you gave me. By the way, why were all these zombies crowding around that particular house? I studied the house where all those zombified rats came out from. 
only the skeletal frames of it remained as if the vermin relentlessly gnawed on it or some such. I entered the structure and my gaze immediately lowered down to the floor. That's when I saw a tiny little gap. My shovel slammed down and enlarged the gap, and I began prying it open. I used the tool's handle like a lever and pushed it down, causing the wooden floorboards to shatter. It was then something reddish-black suddenly pounced at me. Brandishing a sharp kitchen knife, a girl covered in a scarlet color grabbed my shoulder and pushed me back. I lost my balance and tumbled on my butt. I even heard my shoulder muscles being crushed. A pair of icy cold eyes were now looking down on me. Without a shred of hesitation, she quickly stabbed down with her knife. God damn it. I reflexively blocked the knife with my shovel. The blade trembled mere inches away from the tip of my nose. I managed to save myself just in time with my trusty shovel. The girl and I entered into something of a power struggle. I thought this village was abandoned. Cold sweat trickled down my face as I glared at the girl dyed in blood. She seemed to be around 15 years old. Who'd have thought that there was still an insane survivor in here? A properly bat sh asterisk t insane one to boot. She must have stabbed and bit the zombie rats to death, as evidenced by the rodent flesh and fur that were stuck to various parts of her body. On the other hand, many gouged out wounds could be seen on her too it was perhaps caused by the rats biting her. Her irises were constantly shaking about. The glow in them was murky. There was almost no light of life in them at this point. Could she have thought that I was a zombie and attacked me? More cold sweat trickled down. My body was already weak to begin with and I began to tremble. L little miss. You're making a mistake here. Get off me before your noggin gets a good smack. The kitchen knife was getting closer to my forehead now. At this rate, never mind getting pricked in the head, the bloody knife would go straight through my skull. Die. A cold-blooded murmur came my way. The girl, her expression as cold as a sheet of ice, glared at me with eyes full of murderous intent. Looks like you're a bit angry about something, but... Defending myself any more than this would be tough. Strength was leaving my hands now. The kitchen knife crept closer to my forehead. Cool your head for a bit, all right. I summoned up every scrap of power and twisted the shovel to deflect the knife, and then, hit the girl in the head with my weapon. Crack. Accompanied by a rather chilling noise, the girl crumpled into the corner of the shack. I somehow managed to get up and touch my face. Her killing intent was so thick and heavy that I thought she actually did stab me. After confirming that there was no wound, I quickly turned my head to look at the girl. She was now lying on the floor, but her scary glare was still fixed on me. Beside her, I could see two corpses, currently covered by large sheets. I saw that, and my lips began twitching. Holy sh asterisk t. The two corpses were horribly maimed and shredded. It was a pair, an adult man and woman. They had bite marks that evidently came from the rats, but more importantly, smallish knife stab wounds could be seen everywhere on them. This girl, she killed her parents that turned into zombies. Then, she must have hid herself below the floor and endured until now while fighting for her life. What happened? Imperial Prince Nim. The two farmers hurriedly rushed inside. They saw the girl covered in blood and shouted out in sheer astonishment. Charlotte. Oh, oh. Dear Goddess Gaia. Oh, goodness me. I looked at the two and grumbled in pure dissatisfaction, you said there were no survivors, didn't you? T there was none when we were here last time. Rather than there was none it's more likely that you failed to spot her. I massaged my aching shoulders and spoke up, how long has it been since you left this village? It's been about a week, your highness. However, we came here three days ago. Back then, the whole village had already. I see. She must have at least endured three days, H.M. Without a doubt, the girl couldn't have gotten any sleep, nor eat and drink anything properly. She must have endured against her hunger and thirst by consuming the zombified rat's meat and blood. 
This happened all the while the dang zombie rats tried to devour her after sensing her life force. What a tenacious will to live! The two farmers checked her head and cried out after spotting blood trickling out from there. It seemed that the impact from the shovel had been greater than I thought. Don't get all worked up, you two. She's still alive. I grabbed her collars and dragged her outside. I Imperial Prince Nim. What are you? I then tossed the girl into the puddle filled with holy water. The cold water must have woken her up as her eyelids faintly cracked open. Drink. One of the farmers hurriedly approached me and spoke up, she's still a young child. Her wounds are serious, if you handle her so roughly. A young child my a asterisk s. She's about my age and also, I pointed to the front. Even if she was hallucinating, she tried to kill me. I don't need to treat a would-be murderer so kindly, now do I. H however. Hey, kid. The girl's eyes shifted towards me. Drink. I walked closer to the girl and squatted down next to her. Let me be brutally honest with you. Your body right now isn't in a normal condition. You ate zombie rats to survive, and the demonic energy and the poison from them have already spread throughout your body. You're also bleeding a lot too. At this rate, you're going to die and then become another zombie yourself. She had been in a far too close proximity with death itself. As soon as her breathing comes to a stop, she would become an undead for sure. I pointed at the holy water puddle. However, by drinking this, something might happen. You might still be saved. Honestly, this was a gamble that had to be taken. When divinity was forcibly inserted into a body that had absorbed demonic energy, an adverse reaction would occur. One mistake and the body itself would balloon up and explode. But, at the very least, you won't become a zombie. The survival rate might be less than 10%. Now, choose. Either choose to suffer horrendous pain and become a zombie, or struggle so that you can somehow live. I read descriptions of the potential reaction from the interaction of these two forces, divinity and demonic energy, in an old book I found in the monastery. I wasn't sure whether it was due to the special perk of my profession, or because of this body already possessing a certain amount of prior knowledge, but I had no trouble studying books related to magic. I yapped on about the standard knowledge found in the books and looked down at the girl. She was getting tearful as she tried to speak, Mom. Mom is. Not here. Dad. My, Dad. He's not here too. Teardrops formed at the edges of her eyes. She showed no indication of drinking the holy water. Was she going to give up after everything she went through? You struggled until now to survive, didn't you? Weren't you fighting in order to live? You want to live, right? It's simple. Drink this. Of course, your chances of survival are slim. However, you won't become a zombie. There's no point in dying twice, right? And also, I quietly looked down at the girl and continued on, at the very least, two people who are no longer here would have wished for you to live on. Those were the keywords that made her move. She finally made her choice. After moving her head with some difficulty, she buried her face in the puddle of holy water. She opened her lips and poked her trembling tongue out to lick it. The moment the liquid entered her throat, her entire body began convulsing. Woodoo duck. Her bones broke, and the sounds of her muscles being crushed accompanied her tearing skin. Her horrifying scream filled my hearing. It was so sickening that I ended up frowning deeply. At this rate, she'd go full on insane even if she managed to survive. W what is going on? I stopped the farmers from getting any closer. The girl would end up as one of the two either a living and breathing survivor, or a corpse that got blown apart. Her skin continuously ripped apart as blood trickled down. While she thrashed about in pain, the holy water on the ground healed her. Her old flesh burned up as it was replaced by new flesh. Her bones repeatedly shattered and realigned themselves. Wouldn't the metamorphosis described in the martial art novels be similar to this, I wonder? 
Even as these sorts of useless thoughts circled around in my mind, I continued to silently observe her changes with my shovel stabbed into the ground. Five minutes passed by. Ten minutes, then thirty, and one hour later. Her horrifying screams gradually died down. Her convulsion finally stopped and she completely passed out, submerged in the puddle of holy water. Although faint, she was still breathing. Hiya. She survived it. You could say this was a bit of relief. There was nothing more sour tasting than watching someone die in front of you. I sighed inwardly and addressed the two farmers, take her with you. Pardon us. The duo tilted their heads. She's your fellow villager, isn't she? Why yes, that's true. However, a child struck by the plague is a bit. What the hell, seriously? Were they all putting up an act with their concerned expressions earlier? Or were they just being hypocrites? My straightforward glare caused them to shed buckets of cold sweat. Their gazes lowered while they spoke their piece. We'll try our best to talk to the folks from the neighboring village. Good. Oh, and like I said, distribute the holy water too. You mean this? As the farmers looked at the puddle of holy water responsible for causing that bout of convulsion in the girl, their complexions paled. They probably ended up recalling her rather violent reaction just then. That only happened because she swallowed up demonic energy. Oh, wait. Could it be that your new village has people who eat zombies? Wowzers, talk about stomachs of steel. And no, your highness. That's not it. The farmers shook their heads side to side. In that case, you don't have to worry about it causing any side effects. So, let's prioritize in stopping the plague first, said I before getting up while dusting myself. I pulled the shovel out from the ground and perched it on my shoulder. Oh, right. Install lots of rat traps too. It looks to me that the cause of this plague is the zombie rat's bites. One or two might not be an issue but when there are hundreds of those things, just imagining it gives me the heebie-jeebies. Right? Just imagine hundreds of those swift-footed critters rushing in at you. No one would be able to deal with that sh asterisk t. You gotta decrease their numbers, even if it's only by a little. Also, send the word out to Rania as that's the nearest domain run by a lord. The feudal lord there will send out a priest to investigate the origin of the plague, at the very least. I mean, he surely won't sit still when a deadly plague is spreading in an area around the Holy Emperor's grandson, right? We understand, Your Highness. Good. And with that, this saga should be over. The need to shovel away, lug around dead bodies, or to perform burial rites the need to perform all the extra physical hard labor should be gone soon. Now that I created holy water, this year's plague should be stopped pretty easily too. My peaceful daily life should get going once more. That's what I thought. Until the following day when hundreds of villagers arrived in front of the monastery, that was. Did they want to express their gratitude regarding the distribution of holy water? Nope. The villagers, all of them carrying expressions of despair, cried out. I Imperial Prince Nim. Please save us. Zombies are in our village. It seemed that the once serene rural villages had become a zombie's den overnight. 004. Imperial Prince is a grave keeper minus three fin. Chapter 6, 005. Imperial Prince is busting heads minus one. This couldn't be anything simple at all. In just a single night, the village was decimated, leaving behind 100 or so survivors. They all crowded into the narrow and dilapidated monastery. Kids, old folks, housewives, and the likes were busy offering desperate prayers inside the building. Meanwhile, men were helping me lug around the dead in the cemetery. Once things had calmed down sufficiently enough, the representative of the village, the village chief, came up to me. Thank you for aiding us, your highness. I was flustered. The village was decimated even before the holy water could be distributed. I had a mountain of things to do now thanks to this development. Wasn't there a paladin stationed in the village, 
said I, remembering that there was a paladin residing in the biggest village here tasked with monitoring me. After the incident happened, we sought him out. However, his current whereabouts are a mystery, said the village chief as his response. What about sending the word out to the theocratic empire? Sure, it might have been a banishment, but still, an imperial prince was staying here. Paladins promptly showed up just because the owner of this body rampaged around a bit, so there was no way the higher UPS would ignore the advent of a zombie wave. At the bare minimum, they should dispatch a night order or something. T that is, we tried to send a messenger, but... But... He must have been killed by the zombies during his journey. There are zombies hiding along all of the roads leading to Rania. Even the contact with the nearest sentry post has been cut off too. The zombies of this world were pretty amazing then. The paladin in the village monitoring me went missing. Thus, the zombies seized this opening and attacked, and they even managed to cut off the exit. Did that mean they could use their heads? If this was true, then these bastards were even scarier than the ones from the movies, those that were capable of running around like marathon runners. Also, Finding the origin of this plague would be next to impossible if it turned out there was a separate entity with enough intelligence that commanded the others. How many zombies are there? T. There were about 30 of them. That's how many we saw when we were running away. The village near the monastery actually consisted of four separate satellite villages. I went to an already decimated village yesterday, so this meant that in just one night, the remaining three had basically been wiped off the map. If there were 30, did that mean there were around 10 in each village? Or, maybe they worked together to attack the villages instead. It wasn't as if we were dealing with a zombie den or something, so there was no real need to get scared by an undead that couldn't run and were only capable of flailing about ungainly. Also, you wouldn't turn into an undead just because you got bitten once too. Okay, so what now? WED like you to contact the Imperial Palace. Your Highness. But didn't you say that all roads have been blocked? Wouldn't offering a prayer be sufficient? Like, with some sort of magic. How unfortunate, but I didn't know any convenient skills like that one. The villagers were looking at me with hopeful eyes, but it was my job to break the bad news for them, such a thing is obviously impossible. You said that a wave of zombies showed up, right? In that case, we don't have any choice but to pull our socks up until paladins come to rescue us. If not, we'll all be dead meat. I didn't want to get their hopes up, so I honestly told them our current position and options. Thanks to that, they all fell into panic. Some became really pale, while some wailed uncontrollably. Hell, some of them even began screaming too. The villagers were in despair. This was quite obvious really since they were about to die from the plague, or become the next meal for the zombies. Even if I enjoyed similar attributes with the undead, the continuous appearance of zombies would still be dangerous for me in the long run. If I managed to survive alone when everyone else perished, it would look rather peculiar to other people, wouldn't it? This meant that the current situation remained unfavorable whether it was for the villagers or for myself. Please help us. Your Highness. Aren't you the grandson of the Holy Emperor? Even if that's true, I was but a mere regular person now. I stared at the village chief. These villagers seem to be taking the banished imperial grandson for granted here. A banished member of the imperial family was no different than a commoner who lost all of their status. The exiled people who arrived in places like these would have to work as lowly gophers running errands for the villagers, and they wouldn't even receive any compensation in return. There was no prior case of an exile taking revenge on the villagers either. They probably thought that they found themselves a nice little servant here. I wasn't that unhappy about their request, though. The villagers seemed to be willing to help me out too. It was just that. If these folks were shameless enough to think that I should obviously do it for them, then I wasn't planning to smile and bear it all out. In that case, I should put forward a beneficial condition for me. I smirked and stared at the village chief while using my mind's eye to confirm his status window. Name, Parag. 
age, 75. Speciality, snitching, farming, petty tricks. Plus currently in a scared state. My smile became one filled with contentment as I studied him. Fine. I'll help you. The two farmers from the night before were smiling brightly now. On the other hand, though, the remaining men carried unmistakably bleak expressions. Their reactions were rather lukewarm at best. Even if I pounded on my chest and declared, Who am I? I'm none other than Holy Emperor's grandson, I wouldn't be able to convince anybody. Because, I was the Meng Nani Imperial Prince after all. I used my royal background to beat up servants and sexually assault maids. Hell, I even tried to rape a lady in waiting too, who in their right minds would trust me. The village chief hesitated greatly before opening his mouth, evidently having decided to grasp at straws with no other options available. T then, we shall be in your care. He probably figured that it was better than nothing and they might as well believe the priest and follow his lead. It sure was a rather arrogant attitude. I guess one could attribute his shamelessness to all those times he ordered around exiled formerly high-ranking gophers as he pleased. Such a habit must have been deeply ingrained in his bones by now. Well, it didn't really matter. Helping them out was the only way I'd be able to spend some peace and quiet myself. Besides, I wasn't going to personally deal with the zombies, anyway. However, I have a condition. The village chief flinched before tilting his head. With a confused expression on his face, he asked me a question, when you say a condition. I want you to start handing over some necessary funds. It's rather unfair that I've been performing free services until now, right? Don't you agree with me? Are you asking me to pay you wages? B but, everyone who was exiled here so far were. I quietly stared at the village chief. The silent pressure I gave off forced him to shrink back and nod his head. I I understand. Don't rat on the paladins later, got it. As long as I stayed in the monastery, I'd get a bit of food and water for free. However, that was pretty much it. I had no funds to spend for myself right now. Once every month, a traveling merchant would show up in the village, so it'd be a good idea to fix up the monastery with the funds I'm going to receive later. The theocratic empire had already given up on me anyways. I might end up spending the rest of my life here, so shouldn't I try to spruce up the place with a few decent pieces of furniture? Oh, and one more thing. I pointed at the dilapidated monastery. I want you to fix that while you're at it too. Pardon. The village chief looked at the building. Although it was quite old and worn down, the building was still large enough to house 100 or so of his fellow villagers. This meant that repairing it would require a considerable sum. After a lengthy deliberation, the village chief finally spat out a groan and nodded his head. I understand. Within my limits I'll. And, you need to periodically provide supplies for free. I'll see what I can do within our means. Nice. With that, all my problems had been sorted out. You see, rainwater that leaked into the monastery had been causing me a lot of grief for a long while. Not only that, the provisions I received as compensation for maintaining the cemetery were only potatoes and vegetables. I should be able to get myself some meat now, and since winter was coming, I might as well get the villagers to diligently bring me my deserved rewards so that I wouldn't have to go get firewood personally. Your Highness. Imperial Prince Nim. While I was in the middle of my chat with the village chief, a man hurriedly ran over towards us. He shouted out with a pale expression, The zombie horde is here. I was stunned to hear this. Zombies were actually coming here? This meant there was no need to go over where they were personally, judging from how they were gathering here in order to prey on the living. They're pretty loyal to their base instincts, then. This was a relief, actually I didn't have to search around and purify them one by one this way now. The amount of work I had to do decreased because of this. Nice. All of you, get your tools ready. The villagers, including the village chief, all began to tilt their heads. They're confused, 
dazed gazes were focused on me. What are you, um, talking about, your highness? I shrugged my shoulders after hearing the chief. What's up with your expressions? Didn't you ask me to sort this crisis out for you? Why yes. But, why? His voice trailed off with the words, why are you throwing around such an ugly word like tools at us? The corners of my lips arched up. It should be obvious, right? Yup, so bloody obvious. I had four jobs as it were. 1. The Imperial Prince of the Theocratic Empire. 2. A Grave Keeper. 3. A Priest, at least nominally. And finally, a Necromancer. None of these were the kind of professions where you'd march to the front lines and perform a sword dance or something. From now on, you lot are going to do some zombie hunting, that's why. The village chief and his fellow villagers stiffened up in an instant. Don't you worry. It's not like you'll become a zombie just because you get bitten by one. It'll just sting a bit and you'll run some high fever for a few days, that's all that will happen. You can rest easy because my heart shall ache alongside your pain too. The village chief forced out a smile as cold sweat trickled down his forehead. Why your highness? This is no time for jokes. You said you'd help us earlier, so. I shifted my gaze over to him and grinned refreshingly. Did it sound like a joke to you just because I smiled? He openly formed an expression that cried out, What kind of a dog shasterisk tea is this? Well, if you don't like it, you can forget about it, then. I stared at him and cackled loudly in a rather evil manner. Well built men gathered in front of the monastery, there were about fifty of them in total. Each one was armed with farming tools, logging axes, saws, or hunting bows and arrows. They were all built rather sturdily, perhaps owing to the fact that they were farmers, woodsmen, or hunters during their daily lives. Nice. They didn't forget to pack their weapons before running away despite the urgency of the situation. The survival instincts of this world's denizens were pretty outstanding, indeed. Oh. About the equipment you took out from the monastery, make sure you don't damage them, all right? I'll be charging you money if you break even one. The villagers were now carrying fed-up expressions. I cleanly ignored them and simply nodded my head in satisfaction. Nice. This should suffice. They might be zombies, but as long as we aren't dealing with animal types, we should have no problems as they are all very slow. Also, even if there were animal types mixed in, their attack power should still be limited overall, so it didn't really matter either. All right, everyone. Let's take our time with this. Your safety should be your top priority. So don't be too tense about hunting zombies. If it gets too tough, just help each other out. As long as we pace ourselves, no one will get hurt, A and D. It was then I reflexively blocked my nose in a hurry. A truly horrendous stench was wafting out from the distance. Demonic energy was reverberating within the air like the disgusting stench of death. I cautiously shifted my gaze towards the forest. Eyes glowing in crimson hue were slowly surrounding the perimeter of the monastery. Soon, the staggering zombies marched out of the dense fog. Their numbers were in the several hundreds. Why the hell? Are there so many? I called out to the village chief, who happened to be backing away from sheer terror at the moment, Oh I I I I, Mr. Village Chief. Why yes. He looked back at me with a pale face. Didn't you say that there were only around thirty or so back in the village? T that is. That's what we saw. Even the chief himself looked confused, evidently not understanding what was happening here. I began massaging my forehead. Four. No, one of the villages was completely decimated, so. What's the total populace of the three villages combined? The village chief hurriedly counted by raising and folding his fingers. W.L., that is, the biggest village has over 200 folks, while the other ones have between 50 to 100. It should be at least over 300. Okay, so, since there are 100 survivors here with us, 
and you saw about thirty zombies. In that case, where are the rest of them? The chief flinched and stiffened up as he dazedly stared back at me, then muttered out helplessly, I don't know for sure. We were too busy running away, so. With this, it's pretty clear to me now. A portion of the escaped villagers must have been hunted down, it seemed. Or maybe, these creatures simply wandered into the land of the dead spirits. Well, the very distant northern tip of the frontier wasn't called the haven for the undead for nothing, after all. My eyes twitched as I observed the slow, lumbering march of the zombie horde heading towards us. The villagers were crying out to me in sheer panic now. Why your highness, what should we do? Imperial Prince Nim. Should we run away? The village chief butted in at the end and asked me. I couldn't help but massage my temples even harder. Is there any other way to deal with zombies? No, there isn't. Even when a horde like this is coming. The chief wiped away his cold sweat as he replied, an event like this one rarely occurs, you see. If we're faced with such a crisis, we simply inform the feudal lord and wait until he dispatches his troops. I couldn't help but form a miserable expression upon hearing that. Why did my workload have to increase like this? Hang on a minute, could it be that I'm paying for all the blasphemous crap the previous owner of this body committed in the past? Although I was just kidding now, I couldn't help but feel a bit bitter after thinking about it. It was possible that my situation was exactly the result of that. Since magic existed for real in this world, I couldn't discount the possibilities of gods really existing too. Not that I was religious or anything, but if gods really did exist, then there was no way they'd do nothing when a supposed believer cussed them out, right? You dumb asterisk s grandson. I facepalmed grandly. The crime of blasphemy this body's former master committed was pretty damn hefty, to say the least. If I was really paying for his transgressions, then hell, I was neck deep in trouble here. Ah! Uh -huh. The goddess of love and mercy, Gaia. When I shouted this out, the village chief and the men all looked at me. Was it because I offered a prayer just now? Their eyes seemed to have a renewed light in them. They probably found priests using divine powers in front of the undead rather reassuring. Indeed. The holy men and women of this world did pray before gathering their divinity to cast their magic, didn't they? However, I was different. I refreshingly trampled on the expectations the villagers held of a priest like me. Love and mercy, my ass. If you're putting me through a ringer just because I cussed you out once, then Imma cuss you out even more. You cheapskate stinker of a goddess. 005 Imperial Prince is busting heads minus one fin. Chapter 7, 006 Imperial Prince is busting heads minus two. The complexions of the villagers instantly paled. They were probably stunned silly after witnessing the Holy Emperor's grandson grandly blaspheme their goddess. If high-ranking church officials were nearby, then I'd have nothing to defend myself with when they either collapse from pure unbridled shock or try to arrest me for blasphemy. I could hear someone among the villagers whisper, could it be that the imperial prince brought this plague upon us? It wouldn't be all that surprising to see the villagers think that a calamity befell on them as punishment for the holy emperor's grandson committing blasphemy. I could only dry cough and look towards the front. The zombie horde was coming. Name, zombie. Age. Specialty, biting, clawing plus currently in an instinctively ravenous state. My mind's eye returned a truly sloppy information window. However, it was enough. As implied, these creatures were slaves to their primal instincts, capable of only biting and clawing with their hands. The men from the village should be more than enough to deal with the lot. He ick. But, the only problem right now was that they were in a terrified state. They began faltering back while voicing their dissatisfaction to me. Your Highness, this is impossible. How do you expect us to fight them? We're not a priest like you. I kinda understood their position. If not for my profession of being a necromancer, I'd be sh asterisk my pants by now too. For the time being, 
I ignored them and silently glared at the zombies. This prompted one of the scared villagers to shout out. I... I can't do this. We might survive if we run away now. If I take my daughter inside the monastery and run, we might. The man stopped yapping suddenly, his eyes growing larger. That was because he noticed one particular female zombie staggering around in the middle of the horde. Am my wife. The man formed an expression of despair. Tears flooded down his cheeks as he began to wail. I observed the woman in the midst of the zombies, half of her face had been ripped off. She looked pretty gruesome, what with various parts of her body riddled with bite wounds. Although unfortunate, the woman was no longer his wife. No. She was just another walking dead now. I ignored the sobbing man and placed the shovel on my shoulder. While doing my best to look unperturbed, I raised my voice, Wow, that's a lot of zombies, all right. Leaving them alone like this will cause a serious issue later. Killing them quickly and ending this calamity right now is for the best, really. I forced the corners of my lips to arc up, but man, acting wasn't easy at all. Even I was feeling a bit tense right now. We weren't talking about one or two zombies here, but several hundreds. Getting bitten wouldn't simply end with a bit of pain either. You'd really die if a whole bunch of them started biting you. I began inhaling deep breaths in order to settle down my nerves. But then. I can't do this. I just can't. The sobbing man loudly shouted at me, I know it's impossible for you lot, too. He then yelled at the rest of the villagers as if to lodge a protest. Pointing at the zombie horde emerging from the forest, he continued on, they were our family members. Our friends, our neighbors. How do you expect me to kill them? I scanned the villagers. Unrest was rising up among them. This was quite problematic. Not only were they falling into a bout of pure fear, they were even losing the courage to wield their weapons as well. I quickly opened my mouth, they're already dead. Nothing will change if you ignore reality. The man was startled by my words, and began to glare at me. His tearful eyes were now filled with murderous hate. What a headache this is, said I, before walking up to the man. I lightly patted him on the shoulder and did my best to sound as gentle as I could be. Fine, since you don't want to fight, you'll run away instead? Do what you want. I won't stop you. Once the man heard my permission, he shifted his gaze back to his zombified wife, and then he started backpedaling once more. However, you better stay sharp so that your zombie wife doesn't hurt your little girl. Those words stopped the man dead in his tracks. I glanced at him and continued on. I'll say this again. That thing over there is no longer alive. I pointed at the zombified woman, and the man turned around to look at his former wife once more. She looks pretty gruesome on the outside, right? Well, too bad, she looks even worse inside. What do you think is happening to her, really? You see, the mind's eye skill didn't only tell me the target's specialty. Her corpse is rotting away while her soul has become a wandering specter that's howling out from suffering right now. Maybe it was due to the effects of the necromancer profession, I was also able to see the soul of the departed as well. Distorted souls overlapping the hundreds of zombies were screaming out in pain. This was one of the reasons why I made graves and performed purification ceremonies. Without the ceremony, these souls would never be saved and just continue to scream every single day. She, she's suffering. The man's eyes trembled. I nodded my head obviously. She's become an undead that harms other people, who in their right mind would be happy about that. If you let her be like this, she's destined to wander around forever as a specter, never to be saved. Her corpse will rot and only her skeletons will remain. She'd remain as an undead for a very long time with no one to save her. I picked up the discarded farming tool and pushed it back to him. If that's the case, how about you lessen her suffering? Your wife probably wants to close her eyes in her husband's presence. Wouldn't you say so? The man was no longer looking at me. He silently stared at his zombified wife, 
his hands gripping the farming tool tighter and tighter. Tears fell as his expression crumpled even further. This was the face of a man in agony. However, his eyes had stopped wavering and his gaze towards his dead wife had transformed into a glare. He must have made up his mind now. I patted him on the back. The dead should remain dead, while the living should go on and live. I then glanced at the rest of the villagers. I don't care if you decide to run away. However, you better discard the notion that doing so will guarantee your survival. These aren't your run-of-the-mill zombies. They're smart enough to block all the exits, don't forget. You think you'll be able to evade such zombies? Nope, it's utterly impossible. Most of those who escaped elsewhere other than the monastery had already turned into zombies. Which meant that trying to escape from here now wouldn't get you very far. In that case, there's only one way out of this. I raised my shovel and pointed at the zombies. My eyes swept over them as I spoke up. We round them up and smack them dead one more time. This is the only way to protect your family, friends and loved ones and to save those wandering souls. I ended my speech with a bit of a smirk and the men began gritting their teeth. Even though they were still trembling in fear, no one was backing away now. This was a satisfactory result. I guess you all came to a decision then. I stabbed the shovel on the ground, grasped its handle with both hands, and while shrugging my shoulders, I addressed the villagers, let's end this as quickly as possible. Our job is simple. Kill the zombies and give them a proper burial. Don't you worry about getting bitten though. I'll bleed in my heart for you. And as an added service, I'll provide you with holy water too. Was it because I sounded sarcastic? The villagers began cussing me out. He's not even a human. How can he act this way? Oh, I'm sorry. What can I do when this is the real me? However, just who am I? Aren't I the imperial family's Mang Nanny? Just because it's not your family. Ahaha, ha, you should be grateful that I'm willing to step up for you. If it were someone else, not only would he have run away by now, he'd also have chased you all out from the monastery too. I warmed up my muscles. Getting a move on while their minds were made up was the smartest thing to do. Who knew when their fighting spirit would start wilting due to the already present sense of agitation. Let's end this quickly. I grasped the shovel with both of my hands. The dead probably wish to rest quietly too. So. Don't get killed though. You'll only increase my workload. Charlotte grew up in a happy family. She was renowned for her honest and hard-working ways in this small village that was located far north in the land of the dead spirits. In the mornings, she would help her mother out by preparing breakfast and drawing water from the river. In the afternoons, she'd help her father by entering the forest to cut some firewood. That very fateful day began the same as every other day. She finished helping her mother prepare breakfast and went to the river outside the village to get some water. While struggling a little with what she was carrying, she returned to her house. It was then, a rather familiar noise entered her ear. Blurg. Uwa. Oh, Blurg. Charlotte was startled by the sound and quickly shifted her gaze to the side. The next door uncle was clutching his stomach while vomiting out everything in his tummy. His wife was beside him, gently patting his back with a concerned expression on her face. A sour, stinging stench strong enough to make Charlotte instinctively block her nose wafted about. The girl formed a worried expression of her own. Tom Ajussi is also sick. The autumn and winter seasons were the time of plagues. Even Charlotte's father was struck down by the illness himself and was suffering in pain right now. Don't worry my girl. I'll be fine after a week or so from an illness like this. Charlotte trusted her father's words. In all honesty, she too had contracted a plague last year and had to go through a tough time, hadn't she? However, look at her right now, wasn't she still alive and well? This was nothing more than a trial for one to overcome so that they could enjoy another year in health. While feeling worried, Charlotte tried to talk to her neighbors. Hello there. The neighbor Ajima flinched at Charlotte's greeting. She even formed a scowl on her face. 
Without saying a word, she shot back a wary glare and went back inside the house along with her husband. Charlotte felt just a little bit lonesome then. She'd always smile and share greetings with her neighbors, but during the plague seasons, everyone would become as unfriendly as one could get. But then again, they were probably worried about the plague infecting someone else. Even if they were already suffering from it. After thinking of this, Charlotte tried to enter her home in a hurry. Squeak, squeak. She lowered her head and found a rodent busy biting at her leather shoe. She frowned a little and kicked the vermin away. The creature was flung towards a storehouse nearby. This was when she discovered dozens of glowing eyes in the gap of the storehouse's open doorway. Uh! Just as Charlotte formed a stunned expression, the rodent that she kicked screeched out loudly. Kee! The howl was so monstrous that such a little body couldn't have possibly produced it. She was frightened by the screech so loud that it rang in her eardrums. She even dropped the metal bucket she was carrying. Reflexively, she turned around and ran. Dozens of rodents chased after her. She hurriedly dashed inside her home and shut the door behind her, locking it firmly in the process. Slam. Boom. Bang. The rodents slammed their bodies against the door. Mom. Dad. Charlotte's face was pale from fright. She quickly backed away from the door. Even then, she continued to call out to her parents with a frightened voice. Unfortunately, they didn't reply to her call. What did return, though, was a horrifying scream. Charlotte was shocked by what she heard and hurriedly ran into the kitchen. Almost immediately, her whole figure froze up. Her mom, who was holding a kitchen knife and should have been preparing the family's breakfast, she, her neck was being ripped apart by her father's teeth. But, why? Her mom weakly muttered out to Charlotte as tears fell from her eyes. R, run, away. The girl stood in her spot, her entire figure quivering without pause, and yet, she still resolutely shook her head. Run, away. I I L L ask someone for help. Charlotte looked at the front door. Rodents were still pounding away on it. This meant she couldn't go out that way. She quickly approached the nearest window. Through the shut window, she shouted out as loudly as she could at the neighboring houses. Help us. Mom, she. My dad. She saw people peek out from each of the houses. However, it was only for a short while. They closed their curtains and ignored her. Woo. Oh. Uh. It was then that she heard a bizarre grunt coming from behind her. Flinching ever so slightly, Charlotte slowly turned around to look. Her dad was unsteadily standing there. His mouth, which was ripping into her mom's throat only a second ago, was now dripping with blood. His now dead eyes were staring straight at Charlotte. Ah! Her zombified father pounced on her. She couldn't remember what happened properly after that. In the faint, fragmented bits of memories flitting in and out of her mind, she was running into the kitchen to pick up the knife. That's where she confronted her now zombified mother. Charlotte wielded the knife, and when she finally came to, both her father and mother lay dead, filled with stab wounds. She stood there, dazedly staring at the two unmoving corpses. S. Save me. Boyeg. I, I need medicine. What, what's this? So many rats. The screams of the villagers reverberated outside the window. Charlotte turned her head towards the front door. The vermins had gnawed through it to create a hole. Once the door broke, the pack of rats, with their crimson teeth, pounced on her. Heo. Charlotte opened her eyes and shot up from the bedding. Cold sweat rolled down her face as she quickly scanned her surroundings. Her hands reflexively flailed about in the empty air. Somewhat embarrassingly, no rodents were pouncing on her. Charlotte panted heavily, her complexion deeply pale. Where was this? Her shifting gaze took in the sights of the monastery's interior. What happened? And then, the aunties and old ladies were taken slightly aback after seeing her wake up and came closer. 
006. Imperial Prince is Busting Heads Minus 2 Fin. Chapter 8, 007. Imperial Prince is Busting Heads Minus 3. Charlotte, how are you feeling? An auntie and grandma came closer to check up on Charlotte's current condition, and asked her. Oh my goodness! Look at all this cold sweat! Oh! Her fever has gone down! That's a relief! Why don't you lie down for a little while longer? You must be starving! Here, have a potato at least! We only have these right now! The auntie gave her a plate with a potato and a kitchen knife on top of it. Charlotte felt confused and flustered by these ladies and their nursing attempts. What happened? Where was she? Why was she here? What about her mom? Her dad? As her unbridled confusion intensified, she shielded her forehead from the pounding headache. Just as she grew more flustered. Kaaaa! Someone suddenly screamed out. Charlotte was startled awake and she reflexively shot up from her spot. A woman was pointing outside the window while backing away in fear. They, they're coming. No. They're already here. All the women inside the monastery looked outside their closest windows. Charlotte too had quickly shifted her gaze outside and observed the current situation. She saw numerous zombies lumbering towards the monastery. There were so many of them too. The complexions of everyone inside the building grew as pale as a white sheet. Some screamed while a few others hurriedly looked around the area, perhaps searching for a place to hide. However, Charlotte reacted differently from them. Zombies. She reflexively reached out and grasped the kitchen knife next to the potato, just before she started dashing towards the monastery's exit. The womenfolk were stunned by her actions and quickly stopped her by hugging her from behind. Charlotte, it's dangerous outside. You mustn't. Even though they were trying to stop her, they ended up getting dragged forward instead. Charlotte seemed to be gradually getting stronger with each passing step. This was a display of sheer physical strength that no 16-year-old girl could produce. The boys watching this scene play out also intervened and they finally managed to stop her. Uh? Uh-huh. Charlotte flinched in surprise and ungainly flailed about. A part of this was because she finally lost out in strength, but at the same time, she didn't want to accidentally harm the others with the knife. This was why she stopped struggling. Even then, her gaze remained fixed outside the window. Her wide open eyes were locked on a certain boy standing outside the building. She saw him jump high up while raising his shovel. And then, he slammed it down. The head of a zombie split open as it collapsed to the ground. What are you all doing? Aim for their heads. This ain't the time to worry about preserving the corpses or whatever. The boy's yell prompted the terrified villagers to grit their teeth and start swinging with their farming tools. Soon, all sorts of tools began to land on the zombies. Eventually, though, someone lost in the contest of strength against the zombies and got bitten. The boy gritted his teeth and grabbed the back of the man's neck to forcibly pull him away. He then swung the shovel. It landed splendidly against a zombie's head, making it stagger before collapsing on the ground. The boy raised his shovel high up and smashed apart the downed creature's skull. This sight deeply stunned Charlotte. A boy about the same age as her, no, maybe one or two years younger even, was stepping up to hunt down the zombies before the older and stronger men could. Don't let up. If you've got time to complain about the pain, then kill one more zombie instead. His manner of speech was also quite unrefined too. The grown UPS glared at the boy but still, they attacked the zombies nevertheless. One by one, they took down the pack of undead. These slow-footed, staggering zombies were subjugated unbelievably easily. The boy must have been feeling quite fatigued as he barely managed to stand by leaning against his shovel, his breathing heavy and rough. It was around then, the ladies that stopped Charlotte earlier clicked their tongues. What's this? That Imperial Prince Nim. He knew how to hunt zombies. Well, he's a prince from the imperial family, so of course he should know how to hunt down zombies. 
the still scared ladies continued to chat among themselves. Their words stunned Charlotte again, though. He was an imperial prince? Now that she thought about it, she did hear about a rumor that a Mangnani imperial prince Nim had come to visit the monastery in the hills some time ago. She locked her gaze at the boy's back once more. TL, in first person POV. The villagers bellowed out scream like howls. They swung the farming tools held in their hands to stab and smash down. Every time this happened, the zombies' skulls were crushed and shattered. As rotting flesh splattered everywhere, the villagers backed away with expressions uncomfortably close to despair. Their breathing were extremely heavy and disarranged, but their eyes were still diligently scanning the 100 or so zombie corpses strewn about everywhere. Some plopped down on their butts, perhaps no longer having any spare energy left to even remain standing up. Others embraced the headless corpses while sobbing, too. The respective corpses must have been their family members or acquaintances. Even though everyone suffered from the pain of grief, we somehow managed to defend against the zombie attack. I confirmed the conditions of the villagers. Some were injured, but no one died. Now that's a relief. I stabbed the shovel on the ground, leaned my back against it, and spat out a long sigh. This was tough. Seriously tough. If I knew what was in store for my future, I would have chosen the warrior profession during that game testing part time job instead. It'd been infinitely more preferable than this necromancer one where I had to mind everyone else's glares just to use a skill or two. Alternatively, how wonderful would it have been if I arrived in this place as a superman? One that boasted sky-high skill proficiency too. You worked hard, your highness. One of the farmers came closer to me to pass along a leather waterskin filled with water. Oh, thanks. I gladly received it and washed my hands and face before quenching my itching thirst. During all of this, I kept glancing at the farmer. And through mine's eye, I confirmed his name. You said your name was Grill. The farmer Grill flinched and asked back with a puzzled expression. Did I tell you my name before, your highness? Yeah, you have. Nope, you haven't. Maybe he was happy about me remembering his name, because Grill suddenly formed a grateful expression on his face. Thank you, your highness. There's no need to thank me. However, an imperial family member remembered the name of a measly farmer like me, so I... Hey man. You should hold your own profession in a higher regard. Let me tell you, being a farmer is an important job. Grill seemed to be a bit stunned. After a few seconds, he nodded his head energetically, looking as if he was flustered. Now that I think about it, didn't this guy take away that girl who got infected earlier? What happened to that girl? Did she survive? That girl? Ah, you mean Charlotte, your highness? She's safe and sound, and I think the ladies inside the monastery should be taking good care of her. That's a relief then. I glanced at the monastery. For a moment there, I felt someone's gaze lock on me from one of the windows but I couldn't see any faces. Should I blame my current state of mind for that feeling? I glanced back at the extremely dead zombies again. The stench was so bad that I ended up deeply frowning. The level of demonic energy they had was simply too much for mere corpses that became the walking dead literally overnight. How strange. What is? Your Highness. This plague, I mean. Even if a plague was spreading around recently, a zombie wave of this scale suddenly showing up couldn't have been normal at all. Hell, I'd wager that a plague on the level of biblical proportions wouldn't be this severe. Even if we're near the land of the dead spirits, it's too bizarre to see these many zombies to pop up like this. It was a really close call this time. If this keeps up, though, will be completely annihilated. When, when you say completely annihilated, you mean. Everyone except me will die. Grill's complexion greatly paled. If we don't find the cause quickly, that'll happen for real. I'd say around two weeks minimum for the fiefdom of Rania to detect something was off and dispatch people over here. I wasn't sure whether we could last that long or not. Grill hurriedly asked me in a petrified voice 
W. What should we do next? Well, we'll have to endure somehow. Or find the cause. But that's for later. Let's give them a proper burial first, starting with cremation. You mean right now? I looked at the villagers before glancing back at Grill. Everyone was dead tired right now. Even this guy was making the face of a man asking for a lengthy break. However, if they rested now, it'll get only harder to perform a proper purification ceremony later. We better finish up quickly when we still have many willing hands available. Also, I stared at the unmoving corpses and slightly frowned. They're suffering even now, you know? We should ease their pain as soon as possible. I directed the villagers to dig out a burial pit next to the cemetery. The mass funeral was simple and concise. After gathering the corpses, they were cremated, and then the remains were poured into the pit and buried. A lone wooden signboard acted as their tombstone. Now normally, a high-quality headstone would have been used instead, but unfortunately, we lacked enough energy to make one. While everyone was watching, I stared at the new grave and offered a silent prayer, my hands still holding onto the shovel. This was the purification ceremony remembering the departed, and praying for their comfortable, eternal rest. I worked until the following morning to finish up. After offering the last prayer to the grave, I turned around to address the villagers, let's take a break for a little while before hunting down the rest of them. It'll be better to trim their numbers as much as possible. Even though I was in the middle of my speech, I didn't forget to study the villagers' reactions. A gaze that I didn't enjoy receiving landed on me first. Some looked rather dazed while the others looked quite surprised. I tilted my head, and this caused the villagers to either cough awkwardly or avoid my gaze. I frowned a bit and summoned the village chief. Hey, Mr. Village Chief. Yes, Your Highness. Is there something bothering you? The chief sauntered over and formed an awkward but still considerably smooth smile. Something about this atmosphere felt weird to me. I formed a slightly pouting expression as my reply. The chief simply waited for me to finish what I wanted to say, completely disregarding whether I made such an expression or not. Did any strange events happen around here in the last few days? When you say strange events? Like, for example, a strange object showed up or maybe a stranger came to visit the village. Hmm, I wonder. I don't remember anything like that. The plague started doing its rounds about a month ago, but there wasn't anything suspicious back then. In that case, did this contagion really spread through the already infected vermin or the wild birds? However, I had this strong suspicion that rather than Mother Nature, someone had artificially set this crisis in motion instead. Is there a necromancer nearby or something? I muttered to myself, but my words caused serious panic and fear to spread among not just Grill and the village chief, but to the rest of the villagers. In this place, necromancers were literally calamity personified. The grim reaper of the plague, the soul-stealing devil, etc., etc. With the exception of a particular kingdom, everyone else in this continent branded them as criminals. One of the laws of this land even stipulated that you wouldn't be tried for murder if you killed a necromancer without a good enough reason. To put simply, I'd be as good as dead if my profession as a necromancer was to be revealed here. A uh, and necromancer. Oh my god. You think that such a disgusting thing has been hiding in our village? Oh, I'm sorry for being so disgusting. It wouldn't be strange for your head to go flying for lace majest against the imperial prince though. It's just my conjecture, I calmly responded. But if there really was one, that would certainly be troublesome. Because if he decided to lay low for a while, then everything would go down the crapper for sure. However, there was a pretty good chance that he was nearby. You'd have to be close by in order to control zombies after all. Too bad, I had no idea how to search for him. Unless we were talking about a dedicated search team composed of priests and paladins, sending these clueless villagers out there to search was basically the same as feeding the man tasty new treats. Well, I could be wrong with everything and this whole situation could be a naturally occurring plague that simply spiraled out of control. Either way, 
the problem remained the same how do we find the origin of it all? Let's stay put for one night and observe. Tell everyone to take a break. Ah, and we'll need rotating sentries just in case. We were all as tired as anyone could be. We fought off the horde of zombies, then dug the ground the whole day and moved the corpses, and finally, we even went and performed a mass funeral too, so our physical and mental limits had been reached already. At the moment, none of us could really do anything. I'm going to catch some ZS. If something happens, come and wake me up. I told both the village chief and Grill before turning around to head towards the monastery. Kayak. A scream resounded alongside a thunderclap. I was startled awake from my sweet slumber inside the monastery. The pitter-patter of raindrops rang around in my ears. My vision remained dark and dim, but the momentary brightness brought on by the lightning strike illuminated a person's face right before my eyes. Pale white hair and crimson eyes alongside an expressionless face like a sheet of ice all of these belonged to a certain girl. As if she was taken by surprise, her brows rose up higher as she stared at me. What is it now? I asked her. The girl showed some signs of fluster as she quickly left my side. It was then, the monastery's doors burst open and Grill rushed in. Your Highness! Are you trying to make me deaf? Perhaps due to all the fatigue, my whole body felt as heavy as a wet sponge. Even my mind was drowsy right now. The farmer's loud shouting-like voice rang inside my head and I was getting dizzy from it. What happened? I asked Grill, but at the same time, took a glance at the girl. She was openly looking at me with a pair of sunken eyes while squatting by a corner. The glare she had was cold and sharp. Wait a second, that girl, wasn't she the one who ate all those zombie rats and survived? Her eyes were filled to the brim with venom. She's not blaming me for something, right? Your Highness. I'm listening, okay? What's going on here? What's with all this ruckus? The farmer grill then urgently updated me on the situation. Someone's been kidnapped by zombies. 007. Imperial Prince is busting heads minus three fin. Chapter 9, 008. Imperial Prince is hunting a witch minus one, part one. Kidnapped by zombies. With a dumbfounded face, I looked through the monastery's window. It should have been the middle of the day right now, but thanks to the relentless downpour, it was quite dark outside. Since it was so poorly lit outside, one's range of vision should be impaired because of it as well. It kind of felt off that the zombies took advantage of the weather to not kill, but kidnap a person instead. Now normally, zombies wouldn't try to age a person like a fine wine before devouring the poor sucker, so they must have been aiming for something else here. However, just a single villager? Did you say it was just one person? Grill nodded his head. He continued on with a deeply flustered face, yes, just one. It's a young lady who moved into the neighboring village around three months ago. She's. You know, that person you tried to score with. I tried to do what now? This was my first time hearing about this story. Grill snuck glances at our surroundings before whispering in my ear, Well, she's such a looker after all. I'm not sure if you can remember what happened, but after you got rejected by her, the shame led you to you know, hang yourself. I couldn't help but squeeze my eyes shut just then. Aargh, this was so damn embarrassing. The dude killed himself not because he felt despair at his doomed fate, but because some girl rejected him? I could now understand why the Holy Emperor abandoned this foolish grandson of his. Since he probably treasured the family's honor more than his life, he would have definitely wanted to forget all about this Mang Nani grandson for good. I groaned helplessly as I massaged my temples. Okay, so how did she get dragged away? Pardon? T that is. Grill looked flustered, unsure. Actually, the person who was feeling more flustered than him was me. Villagers were now standing guard outside the monastery. So, it'd be safest to stay indoors anyone even thinking of stepping foot outside right now was obviously not right in the head. 
The young lady is very kind-hearted you see. Her personality won't let her forsake any injured people around, and this was why she said that she'd go and procure some medicinal herbs a and d. What was up with this annoying development? A bite wound wouldn't pose any threat whatsoever with a sip of holy water. And yet, this woman personally went out to procure medicinal herbs? Grill continued on, that's why the villagers wish to form a search party. Aren't you guys scared of the zombies? She was the village's herb gatherer and many people were saved due to her hard work, you see. Many of us are indebted, A and D. She's one of the most beautiful women in the village too. And also single, your highness. Meaning, all the love-struck men wanted to rescue her? Actually, there was something bugging me about this as well. If the zombies really kidnapped her, then I should find out what they were really up to. I needed to find out whether this was a mere simple kidnapping or perhaps that woman and the zombies were involved in something shady. I get it now, but can you guys even track her down? We have an experienced hunter named Hans with us. If it's him, then it should be possible. What will you do, your highness? Form the search party. I'm coming too. You're going with the search party. Grill formed a surprised expression. Yup, he was probably taken aback by the fact that the imperial prince wanted to go rescue a maiden who rejected his advance. Especially so when he already knew what the boy's personality was like. Never mind whether she rejected me or not, I can't even remember it anyway. Besides that, a person's life is much more important, don't you agree? I said, sounding quite righteous for a moment there. Honestly though, I was thinking of something else there must have been a reason for the zombies to not devour the woman right away, but instead drag her somewhere else. I thought that just maybe, searching for the kidnapped woman could lead us to the solution to this crisis. Something just felt off to me, which was why I needed to investigate it. A search party had been hastily formed. It's this way. Over here. While wearing a pair of worn-out leather shoes and a robe, I made my way across the rainy, soggy forest on foot. The location the ten members of the search party arrived at while wielding burning torches, was a cave located pretty far from the monastery. The hunter named Hans nodded his head as he looked at the bits of flesh and blood left on the grass, as well as the muddy footsteps on the ground. It must be here. Wow, you sure have located it so quickly, haven't you? I retorted sarcastically. Actually, it wasn't so much as having located it quickly, but more like lured to this place, or so I thought. These zombie assholes were smart as hell, so they must have deliberately left all these breadcrumbs for us to follow. What was their goal though? Was this a diversionary tactic to split the villagers? If not, maybe lure away small numbers and hunt them down one group at a time? I stared into the cave's interior, my mind still filled with several questions. It was a pretty deep negative field where the outside light couldn't reach. No matter how deep it was, though, it failed to disguise the stench of rotting corpses busy stinging my nostrils. Although faint, I even sensed demonic energy too. Without a doubt, we discovered the den of the zombies. This place is definitely it. The origin of the plague must be in here too. Never mind the zombie rats, there was a pretty good chance that the zombified humans and animals could be found inside. Us stepping inside this cave was basically the same thing as presenting a veritable buffet for the zombies to enjoy. There was no need to trigger the trap if you knew it was waiting for you. Should I go and get the oil for cremation from the monastery first? With that, I should be able to get rid of the zombies in one go. The cave even sloped downwards too. By setting a fire and letting it burn for half a day, maybe not all of them but hopefully we'd get to kill about half of the zombies inside. However, my opinion brought about a nervous question from the villagers. Your Highness, what would happen to Morian in that case? Morian. When I mouthed the unfamiliar name, Grill next to me whispered the answer, that's the name of the kidnapped lady. Was she still even alive at this point right now? The men were clearly getting anxious as they nervously paced about. That lady was their benefactor, and also the object of their crush. 
so yeah, they should be anxious all right. Too bad, I simply couldn't endanger everyone just to rescue one person. I lifted the torch and pointed it at the interior of the cave. Look, you can tell that this place is a negative field even with just a casual glance. Which means it'll be seriously dangerous. It's where the undead can receive buffs, you know. Buffs. The men tilted their heads. They were puzzled by such a strange term. I replied. It's where the undead can grow stronger. More importantly, it was so dark in there that you couldn't see properly. The staggering, flailing zombies would present a greater danger than before in such an environment. At the very least, I had no reason to risk this much uncertainty. Grill studied the reactions of his fellow villagers before whispering back to me, What will you do now, your highness? This cave was just too suspicious. Hmm, I hope there isn't a zombie bear or something in there. It'd be a definite no-no if that's the case. A damn zombie bear? The current me wouldn't be able to properly defeat such a thing. I wasn't even a warrior, so what was I supposed to do against such a monster if it really appeared? The villagers were now looking at me. I guessed that they wanted me to make the final call. Even they judged it to be too dangerous to just blindly rush into the cave. Right now, it'd be for the best if we step back. Since we now knew where the origin of the plague was, we could afford to go and prepare ourselves adequately first. We weren't just going to sacrifice ten lives to rescue one villager. We return to the monastery for now. Marching straight in there will only result in needless casualty. It was then a seriously thick stench suddenly stabbed into my nose. While stunned silly, I instinctively looked behind me. A chill ran down my spine. Just as my eyes shifted towards the forest, a black shadow pounced on me and bit into my shoulder. Stab. Sharp fangs dug in and tore into my flesh. Soft skin ripped open and my muscles were gouged out, shoulder bones were crushed in the process, too. Oh, wow. I screamed out loudly. Then, my vision rotated upside down. Something was forcibly dragging me into the cave while biting into my shoulder. Chapter 10, 008 Imperial Prince is Hunting a Witch-1, Part 2 Imperi Nim P.R.I. Rask Villagers had no time to react at all. Their voices grew increasingly distant. My vision grew darker. A huge wolf was biting into my shoulder, its eyes glaring at me. With the awful stench of a rotting corpse and disgustingly thick demonic energy added on top, too. God damn it, it was a zombie wolf. Let me go. I held the shovel shorter and stabbed it into the creature's neck. Because my posture was all wrong and also with my bitten shoulder, I couldn't muster enough power behind the strike. My attack didn't even inflict a small nick in the monster's thick hide. Getting dragged any deeper would be too dangerous for me. By being isolated inside the cave all by myself, it would mean I'd become surrounded by zombies and get devoured for sure. Screw this. I focused divinity on my hands, and then activated the skill horrifying curse. I felt the divinity immediately drain out of my body. As the sense of dizziness filled my head up, I could hear a faint voice. You have granted a blessing. Now wasn't the time to mind my anemia or whatever. The blades of the shovel glowed softly. My digging tool was now imbued with the reverse effect of the horrifying curse, blessing. You stinking son of a b asterisk tch. The shovel carrying the aura of divine blessing stabbed into the zombie wolf's neck. Stab. Forget about the smell of burning flesh, the dang thing actually melted away. The sensation of a heated metal chopstick melting down plastic got transmitted through my fingertips. The shovel dug in even deeper. However, the zombie wolf still didn't let me go. You stubborn son of. I pulled the shovel out and stabbed the damn wolf again. Eventually. Boom. I finally managed to extricate myself out from the damn thing's maws after its neck completely melted away and its body collapsed into a heap. I rolled ungainly on the floor several times. The pile of bones and rotting corpses acted as cushions to soften my landing. 
while pressing my head on the ground, I screamed out, Oh why ya? This f asterisking hurts. This. Son of a b asterisk tch. Seriously man, the pain was no damn joke. My trembling hand reached up to my wounded shoulder. I flinched when my fingers touched the gouged out flesh. Almost as if I got burned by something, intense heat rose up from the wound. I couldn't tell whether I was screaming out or grunting from the pain when I muttered to myself, why do I have to go through this sh asterisk t anyway? I held my shoulder and injected divinity into the wound. This was the basic healing skill that most priests possessed. I also added the skill horrifying curse on top, too. No, maybe I should just rename it to blessing instead. I felt the divinity drain out of my body, and in turn, the wound healed at a visible rate. The demonic energy permeating within my muscles caused a negative reaction and my skin ruptured, but that only lasted for a short while. Broken bones realigned as new flesh grew to replace the old one. That freaking hurt. This adverse reaction between divinity and demonic energy healing the undead spite wound would always be accompanied by horrible pain. Only after the wound was completely healed without a scar did I breathe a sigh of relief. No, hang on. I shouldn't be relaxing right now. Maybe I should blame the instinctive fear I felt for the sudden bout of talking to myself syndrome. I scanned my surroundings, but my vision remained dark. I couldn't see anything properly at all. But that too lasted for only a short while as well. I quickly got to confirm the locations of the creatures shuffling towards me thanks to mind's eye. Cool. <laughs> yup, it was a horde of zombies. Zombies, halfway to becoming skeletons after most of their flesh had rotted away, were currently staggering and shuffling towards me their jaws falling open as if they discovered a tasty treat in front of them. I'm screwed. I was already pretty fatigued, but now I had to fight them too? Ah, the goddess of love and mercy, Gaia. Please, please just spare me once, will ye? I begged the silent goddess as my hands grasped the shovel tighter. The whole cave was filled with a disgusting stench. Rotting corpses and discarded bones were literally rolling around on the ground. As an added bonus, I could even sometimes see the walking dead snack on them. Zombies that were busy feasting on the discarded bones and flesh discovered me and stood up from their spots. They staggered while coming in closer. Thankfully, there were no fleet-footed zombified animals among their midst like the one from before. Man, I might go crazy at this rate. As it turned out, I got dragged pretty deep inside the cave. This meant that I shouldn't wait for the villagers to come and rescue me. I raised the shovel up before stabbing it down on the ground. The divine puddle has been summoned. With the shovel as the center, a holy water-filled puddle gushed up from the ground. It rapidly spread all around me in a diameter of around 5 meters. The approaching zombies stepped into the puddle and began to unsteadily totter about before falling face first to the ground. They then slowly melted away. Unfortunately, another zombie stepped on top of the fallen zombies and got closer. Using their fallen comrades as footholds, these damn things slowly shuffled towards me. What a bunch of tenacious evil creatures, mere slaves to their instinctive desire to devour the living despite knowing that they would also perish in the process. This was why I felt so spooked too. I quickly swung the shovel at the ones coming in closer towards me. Along with a dull crack, a zombie's head shattered, its rotting brain matter scattering about. I knew that this was simply me buying time and nothing more. I needed to completely, utterly destroy them, and do it over a wide area too. The plague of debilitation. I took a deep breath before muttering these words out. After raising the shovel up, I stabbed it back on the ground and closed my eyes. A large rune letter suddenly appeared on the ground beneath the zombies, and then, particles emitting bright light exploded upwards. You have carried out a wide area blessing. The light particles that rose up from the ground came in contact with the zombies, causing their rotting flesh to burn away. One by one, the undead turned into ashes and dispersed away. One, two, seven, ten. Nice. It's working. At this rate. 
too bad, just as the hopes of survival formed in my heart. Boom! My bright expression turned gloomy in an instant. I raised my head up. Cool. The damn thing was at least three meters tall. It had shaggy fur covering its thick hide, alongside large arms and a humongous torso. A bipedal creature that possessed hook-like claws now stood before my very eyes. I muttered to myself, utterly dazed by this sight, a goddamn zombie bear. Yup, it was indeed a zombified bear. I didn't know which species of bear it was, but... Name, King of Gluttony. Age. Speciality, biting, crushing, smashing, scooping out internal organs. Plus currently strengthened through necromancy. This guy wasn't something I could handle at the moment. A pretty vicious creature had turned into a zombie, it seemed. Yup, I'm losing my mind here. Every time the zombie bear took a step forward, I in turn also took a step backward. Even though the light particles from the white area blessing touched its body, the damn monster had no problem moving its body. It then crushed the melting zombies underfoot and stepped into the puddle of holy water. Its fur did somewhat melt, but due to its thick hide, the effect was minimal, to say the least. This guy was on a whole other level altogether compared to the zombies I had been dealing with so far. Should I run now? However, if I showed my back against it, I got the feeling that it suddenly pounced on me with a frightening turn of speed. The scarier creatures other than humanoid zombies were the undead predators. Why? Because they possessed faster movements than regular humans, that's why. If I tried to run towards the sloping exit of the cave, my back would be ripped apart in no time at all. And I'd probably get killed in an instant. I gritted my teeth while my hands held the shovel even tighter. A man can die once, but for a second time. Dying once from electrocution was already more than enough for a lifetime. I definitely didn't want to die again after being crushed by a damn zombie. I extended my hands as I gathered more divinity. The resurrection of the dead dot. As soon as my words came to an end, the divinity quickly spread around the cave's interior, causing the corpses found within to writhe. Undead zombies slowly stood up while emitting white light particles, their breaths filled with divine aura. Oh, oh. And then, the cave was rocked not by the bone-chilling howls of the undead, but pure and clean hymn-like singing instead. 008. Imperial Prince is hunting a witch minus one, part one and two, Finn. Chapter 11, 009. Imperial Prince is hunting a witch minus two, part one. Ten holy zombies appeared before me. The shoulders of the newly summoned zombies were slumped forward. They raised their heads slightly upwards and took in the sight of the surroundings. Then, their jaws dropped wide after spotting the zombie bear. Each of their mouths opened so wide that the jawbones actually dislocated and their cheek skins almost tore up. And then... Kiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiiii
their attack capabilities were also far higher than regular zombies from what I could see. Yes, this was the correct answer. As expected of the necromancer profession, going for the numbers game was the best way. Didn't the various Takuzatsu and Daime dozen RPGs amply demonstrate this? The dirtiness of five or more characters cracking open a can of who pass on a boss monster. Now that's the truth folks. 1. The numbers game didn't care whether you were a superhuman or not. That's why. The zombie bear suddenly raised its paw and smashed down at the holy zombies. Crack. Accompanied by the sounds of something rupturing wide open, the upper torsos of two holy zombies got torn in half, and they flew away to crash into the rocky walls of the cave. My expression froze right there and then. I shifted my gaze over towards the broken zombies that were smashed into the walls before looking back at the zombie bear. The hulking creature smashed its paw down once more. Its wide and heavy front paw smacked and ripped apart a hapless holy zombie's body like a piece of worn-out rag. And then... While the zombies were doing their best to gnaw at the undead bear bit by bit, the dang thing simply flung its entire body at the rocky wall. Boom! Three of the holy zombies that were clinging onto the bear were crushed flat and went splat in an instant. Maybe it was now too annoyed to care, because the zombie bear simply ignored the rest that were still clinging onto its body, and began to march straight towards me. I could only stare up dazedly at the approaching monster. I'm screwed. I had no freaking clue that this thing was so powerful. I mean, wasn't it way too overpowered even if it was a zombified bear? Whatever, I needed to get out of this place. This guy wasn't something I could fight head on. I better start running. The zombie bear's eyes abruptly widened before quickly lowering its posture. Like a spring, it leapt up after kicking the ground. Even though it possessed such a large and heavy body, it was probably the quickest out of all the predators when it came to its ability to charge forward. Huge, lengthy claws that I nearly mistook for actual scythes took a swift swipe at me. Son of a! I immediately granted the blessing on the shovel. I tried to raise my only equipment up to defend myself, but the bear's paw struck me and my entire body tilted to the side. Bang! My hands ached. No. Hang on a minute it felt more like the impact force was akin to all of my bones popping out from their sockets instead. You ugh. A short scream leaked out from my lips, any semblance left of consciousness almost abandoning me. That attack just now, it was more than vicious enough to break the shovel and rip my body in half. However. A rune letter was engraved on the shovel with a faint light oozing out from it. Divine aura has activated. Your equipment has been temporarily enhanced. What? Divine. What are you talking about? My eyes nearly popped out from their holes after hearing the message resounding inside my head. The shovel didn't break. Instead, I felt this wriggling sensation in my hands, the shovel's shaft feeling even more secure within my grip. On the other hand, the zombie bear's dangerous looking claws developed big cracks before shattering into pieces. Of course, it wasn't as if I managed to block out the entirety of the impact. I did defend against the attack, but I still ended up crashing into the rocky wall of the cave, almost like some kind of a deflated ball. I vomited out blood as pain that could be compared to my whole body ripping apart tore through me. What the hell? I survived? I glanced down at the shovel. The shining rune letter gradually disappeared. What was it again? The message definitely said Divine Aura, didn't it? Such a thing wasn't among the skill set provided in the game. Hang on, now wasn't the time to sweat over something like this, was it? I defended the attack with the shovel, but the intense, horrible pain from my innards made me wonder if all my internal organs had been destroyed or something. You you you. I inadvertently leaked out a painful moan, my gaze shifted back to my front. I heard loud, thudding footsteps the zombie bear was staggering towards me. At this rate, I would die for sure. I attempted to use the shovel as leverage to stand up, but I plopped down on the ground again when I tried to do so. Ah! I'm definitely screwed. I couldn't muster any strength in my legs. Damn it, 
if only my skill proficiency was higher. I should have at least meditated seriously and tried to absorb a lot more divinity or something while staying in the monastery. If I did that, I could have enjoyed a chance to overwhelm the zombie bear with the real numbers game. The bear switched to walking on all four legs. Perhaps realizing that its target couldn't escape anymore, its gait became rather relaxed too. The creature soon stopped near my position and looked down at me, the corners of its lips arcing up. Ugh, this crazy son of a... I saw the creature's expression and realized the truth the unknown necromancer was busy controlling this very undead right now. The bastard must have been watching everything through the monster's eyes all along. So, the kidnapped woman was definitely just bait, then? It didn't take a genius to figure out that the woman was probably dead by now. My opponent probably only wanted to show everyone that the woman was kidnapped alive. After all, keeping someone alive wouldn't be much useful to a necromancer. If she was still alive, then she might end up becoming some sort of a guinea pig, most likely. Or, she's already been killed off and turned into another undead, used as a tool to lure more hapless villagers to their doom. What a cheap and underhanded method it was. As expected of a necromancer. The zombie bear opened its maw wide. What kind of nonsense was this? I couldn't be sure of whether this was a reincarnation or possession, but here I was, already hellbound only after three months of living in this place. Ah, ah, dear Gaia. If you're watching, can't you help a poor man out for once? I mean, you're a goddess, aren't you? The goddess of love and mercy no less? In that case, you can certainly show me some love and mercy by saving my butt, right? A lovable grandson of the Holy Emperor is about to get killed, so are you really going to let just it happen? All sorts of nonsensical stuff filled up my head. I should probably blame the fear of death on this one. My complexion paled and I ended up muttering out the thoughts bubbling in my head, God damn it, there's no way I'd be rescued by reciting a dumb little prayer. Q the zombie bear's wide open mouth was about to pounce on me, but then. But then, I saw it. I saw a whitish object sneak out from behind the zombie bear. No, hang on a minute, isn't that a person? Moreover, it's a girl. She also happened to carry a kitchen knife too. Chapter 12, 009 Imperial Prince is Hunting a Witch-2, Part 2 At a stupid-sounding gasp jumped out of my mouth all on its own. H. Hey, where did this girl pop out from? Even as my brain failed to fully process this sight, the girl hanging onto the bear's neck proceeded to stab the knife into the creature's eye. Stab. Was it because it lost its sight now? The zombie bear howled out loudly and violently shook its head. She yanked the knife out, and then stabbed it down again in the monster's eye socket. Her movements were super quick and violent, also unervingly precise too as she stabbed over and over again. Flesh and blood splattered everywhere. I finally regained my wits at this point and raised the shovel up high. This was my chance. If I didn't take it, then I'd really die here. Get out of the way. Did my voice get to her? Or was it because of the zombie bear's movements? The girl was flung away from the creature as if she was thrown away. She crashed roughly on the ground, perhaps because she didn't know how to land properly. Using the small gap created between that moment and the bear turning its head in my direction again, I managed to inject some more divinity into my shovel. Although faint, pure white aura permeated into the ends of the tool's blade. I summoned all of my strength and stabbed it into the creature's forehead. Stab. I was initially greeted by this disgusting sensation of contact and that was followed by the sound of something snapping in half. Any semblance of resistance from the bear suddenly stopped. The shovel's edges pierced past the monster's thick hide and penetrated straight into its skull. And just like that, the creature stopped moving altogether like a stuffed animal. The housing used for the demonic energy to animate the undead, the skull, had been destroyed. This cut off the flow of energy from the necromancer. I glared deeply into the eyes of the zombie bear that gradually lost its light. 
I was sure that the damn necromancer was watching me through them even now. I spoke while staring straight into those eyes. Sit tight and wait for me, because I'ma pay you back in full for all the sh asterisk t you just put me through. I then released the shovel. Boom. The zombie bear lost its balance and fell to its side. The demonic energy that made this big hunk of rotting flesh move had completely dissipated now, and the remote control was cancelled as a result. Arg, so bloody tiring. I plopped down on my butt once more. What kind of unnecessary hardship was this? I heard that MCS from other fantasy novels who were caught in this kinda situation would suddenly turn into munchkins, but I... I have to go through this crap. This was patently unfair. Why wasn't I given a once-in-a-lifetime talent or something? I was certain that there weren't any stories with such a sweet potato-like plot progression nowadays. 1. I sat there, inwardly complaining bitterly about the unfairness of it all to the high heavens, only to notice that someone was approaching me. I raised my head to see that it was the girl from earlier. She now stood before me. Her white hair was dyed in blood. She stared at me wordlessly with her equally crimson and sunken eyes. The bear's fur and bloody flesh remained on the kitchen knife in her hand, blood dripping down from it. What now? My words caused the girl to flinch a bit, and she for some reason, raised the knife in her hand and waved it around. Her lips twitched as it formed a grin. Could it be that she was trying to greet me? Well, that's the kind of a grin a serial killer from a slasher film might actually make. I suddenly recalled the incident of me ruthlessly smacking her in the head with the shovel not too long ago. Maybe I should have held back a bit back then? You, uh, you ain't trying to stab me with that knife, are you? Imperial Prince Nim. Your Highness. Are you all right? Rather belatedly, the voice of salvation entered my ears. What nice timing this was, since I couldn't even move my body properly at the moment. It'd be very difficult to emerge unscathed if I got attacked by something hostile in my current condition. More importantly, though, I needed someone to do something about this awkward atmosphere between me and the girl. The villagers eventually got to my location. They discovered the zombie bear and froze up instantly. Mr. Hunter was among the rescue party and after taking one look at the unmoving bear, his complexion became ashen white. This... Isn't this the King of Gluttony? What a scary title that was. I just had to ask our Mr. Hunter about it, you know about this thing. Hunter Hans alternated his gaze between me and the zombie bear, then replied with an awkward expression on his face, This thing, it's one of the most dangerous creatures roaming out here, your highness. It lives in the land of the dead spirits and it mainly preys on zombies. According to him, this bastard of a bear enjoyed such a thick hide that it could easily withstand dozens of zombies attacking it at the same time. As a matter of fact, it was so scary that, were it to find a mate and get itself a little offspring, they could even hunt down an actual troll too. That's why it was so strong, hey. Did you actually kill this thing, your highness? No, it was already a corpse when I got here. I simply shrugged my shoulders. Things might get complicated if the villagers learn that I killed the monster by relying on necromancer skills. Hang on, now that I thought about it, there was a witness here already, wasn't there? I shifted my head and looked at the girl. She looked back at me while tilting her head. There was a pretty good chance that she saw me summon the holy zombies. However, she didn't say anything about them and simply stood there. It could be either she wasn't the talkative type or she actually didn't see anything. The villagers looked at the girl with the kitchen knife and then at me while forming strange expressions. Why is this little girl here? I asked, and my question prompted Grill to form a troubled expression on his face. He replied, we had no idea she was following us either, your highness. Just as you got dragged inside the cave by the wolf, she jumped out from the bushes. She surely couldn't have chased after me thinking that she didn't want to lose the target of her vengeance in this fashion, right? A rather ominous thought decided to make camp in my head. The knife in her hand seemed to gleam even more so for some reason. 
I smiled awkwardly and tried to get back up. However, I staggered about unsteadily as I still had no strength in my legs. She quickly reached out and held me up. I flinched and looked back at her, only to discover a smile creeping up on her expressionless face. Her lips might have curled up, but there was no movement in her eyes whatsoever. Anyone could tell that she was forcing out a smile, and this only managed to send a chill down my backside instead. Please, please. Someone else help me out here. This girl, she might suddenly stab me in the stomach with the knife you know. It was unknown whether Grill knew what my current thoughts were like or not. He simply alternated his gaze between the girl and me before pointing towards the exit of the cave. Well, let's get out of here for the time being. You look really tired, your highness, so let's go back and rest before. Why do you want to leave so quickly? We should see this thing to the end now that you're all here. Pardon me. I pointed to the deeper parts of the cave. Let's end this right now. Be but. Grill looked at the bear with the imposing name of the King of Gluttony. Even though I said that the creature was already dead when I found it, he didn't seem to believe me. But then again, there was a hard-to-miss shovel sticking out of its forehead, so anyone with eyes could tell that it was killed by someone. The villagers must be scared of another possible zombified bear potentially hiding deeper within. The girl seemed to be blessed with quick wits, because she helped me move towards the shovel. I struggled a little before finally managing to yank it out from the dead creature. I'm guessing the other side doesn't have any more zombies left, I tried reassuring them. Your Highness. I was merely guessing. There weren't any guarantees that our enemy no longer had undead troops left. However, I already came this far and there was no freaking way I'd let the bastard escape. There aren't any more zombies. Even if there are some left, they should be on the same level as the ones you fought off back in the monastery. Not only that. I took a look around our surroundings. Only then did the villagers notice the strangeness of the cave they were in. The cave where not a lick of light should exist, was brightly lit up. This was all thanks to the faint trace of divinity that still remained in the surroundings. That B asterisk starred will escape if we don't act now. Since the whole cave was washed with divinity, any lingering zombies shouldn't present us with problems. I studied the deeper parts of the cave that were shrouded in darkness and spoke, that necromancer, that bastard is somewhere in this cave. That's right, I simply couldn't back off until our enemy was caught. I needed to make the fool pay for putting me through such a ringer. 009 Imperial Prince is hunting a witch minus 2, part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 13, 010 Imperial Prince is hunting a witch minus 3, part 1 The villagers all held their breaths the moment they heard Necromancer come out of my mouth. After exchanging glances with one another, they then gripped the farming tools in their hands even tighter. The light in their eyes turned hostile. Well, they finally figured out where the bastard that destroyed their lives and their homes was hiding, so without a doubt, their anger should be boiling like crazy right about now. What should we do about Charlotte? Grill looked at the girl. However, the latter simply shook her head. Her tightly shut lips parted just a little, I, go with you. It'll get very dangerous. That's why you should. I'm coming with you. Charlotte, you're putting us in a spot here. Don't be stubborn, A and D. She stared at Grill with a completely emotionless face. Her crimson eyes didn't flicker even once. I'm coming with you. The air seemed to get so much heavier just then. This was the kind of pressure that no young girl should be able to emit, but despite that it came bearing down on us regardless. The man feeling the most of her sunken and emotionless gaze was Grill, he hastily swallowed back his saliva. A short while later, the villagers including Grill all turned their heads away and avoided meeting her eyes. Got it. When confronted by a venomous snake vying for blood, the hapless puppies the villagers got petrified beyond salvation. She then asked me nonchalantly as if she had finally gotten her permission from the adults. I'll support you but will that be all right? I didn't say anything as I quietly studied her for a while. 
even though our gazes were interlocked, she didn't try to avoid me. Well, she used a kitchen knife to fight off zombies, so this much was kinda understandable. If we were to run into more undead later, then this girl should prove to be far more reliable than these healthy menfolk from the village. Besides, she was the only one who could support me properly anyways due to our similar height. Grill could carry me, but one wrong reaction from him and I might get inadvertently killed, so that's a definite no-no. I deliberated on my choices, but in the meantime, the girl took my silence as a tacit agreement. She spoke up. Let's get going then. She supported me and began walking forward. Naturally, the villagers started following us too. As I expected, we didn't run into any zombies. That zombified bear must have been the necromancer bastard's final line of defense. What a relief that was if a monster even scarier than the bear popped up, then we would have been totally annihilated, that's for sure. Eventually, we managed to reach the deepest part of the cave. Looks like we're here. Indeed it had to be, since we could see a wooden door at the end of this dank cave. The farmer Grill and the hunter Hans stood before the door and exchanged glances with each other, and then cautiously opened the door. The villagers tensed up as they gripped their farming tools tighter. It was quite dark inside, so the men raised their torches and cast some light in the interior of the chamber. We were then greeted by an incredibly foul stench coming from rotting corpses strewn about everywhere. Also, scrolls and grimoires written in unknown runic characters were messily discarded on the ground too. I guess magician types aren't really fond of tidying up hey, I commented upon seeing the mess. Well, we were talking about a necromancer here. Even among the magician types, necromancers were probably known as hardcore invalids who shut themselves up in a dark, dank corner of a room somewhere. It was then, Grill suddenly cried out, Ah! Oh my goddess! The villagers hurriedly ran towards the corner of the chamber. On a certain rocky wall of the cave, we found a naked woman strung up by her arms and legs so that she'd be left dangling in the air. Her body was riddled with wounds as if she had been tortured. Who, is there? With some difficulty, the woman opened her eyes and asked us. It seemed that her vision hadn't gotten used to the lighting provided by the torches yet. She failed to discern that these were her fellow villagers. Her question elicited loud answers from Grill and the other men. It's me, Grill. Morian. I came to rescue you. What are you on about? This is Hans. In order to rescue you, I risked my life too. I became dumbfounded at the spectacle that was happening before me. I knew that they were somewhat excited right now but shouldn't they act a bit more rationally than this? Hey, you lot. Before you start yapping on about stuff like that, why don't you untie her first? Looks like she's been tortured pretty good. Ah. Uh. T that's right, the Imperial Prince Nim is here to rescue you too. The villagers quickly untied the rope and supported the woman away from the wall. Imperial. Prince Nim did. She looked in my direction with a surprised expression. She was a looker for sure. Pale, blemish-free skin, clearly defined facial features, plus black hair and eyes which were rare in the continent. She was certainly alluring, all right. There wasn't even any need to mention her figure too, abundant breasts, hand-spun waist and rather supple buttocks. It was like looking at a fine sculpture, really. Any hot-blooded male would dearly love to, uh, share their love with her at least once in their lifetime. She was that kind of a woman. However, I began to massage my temples. You dumbass grandson. I simply had to insult the original owner of this body. Sure, the boy's eyes had opened up to the joys of carnal activities to the point of even becoming blinded by a gorgeous beauty, but seriously? This woman had to be in her early thirties, man. To think that he tried to hang himself just because he got rejected by a woman twice his age. What the bloody hell! I couldn't help but helplessly sigh as I thought of this. It was then something tugged at my mind, so I shifted my gaze back to the woman once more to use mind's eye on her. Name, Morgana. Age, 63. 
specialty, honey trap, necromancy, dissection, hexing, assassination. Plus currently in an extremely tense and agitated state. 63 years old. Necromancy? Dissection? Hexing and freaking assassination? The Imperial Prince Nim came for me. The woman formed another surprised expression on her face. She sneakily brushed aside the villagers helping her and approached me. Is it true? You really came for me. She began blushing a little. Then, with an enraptured expression that belonged to a maiden experiencing her first love, she embraced me. Her smile was so alluring that the heart of any man who saw her would totally go wildly out of control. Ah, eh. Uh. Your Highness, thank you. I wordlessly pushed away the silver-haired girl supporting me and grasped my shovel. With every ounce of energy I could muster, I smacked the woman on the head. TL, in third-person POV. Understandably, the villagers freaked out and their expressions stiffened in an instant. Even the usually taciturn silver-haired girl had to open her eyes wide. The woman staggered from the shovel shot to the head before collapsing on the floor. Her trembling hands rose up to touch her wounded head. Maybe she still hadn't comprehended this situation properly yet, because she kept staring dazedly at the Imperial Prince. Arg, I should have hit her with the shovel's blade instead. The prince's mutter caused Morian's expression to instantly pale. She reached out to the other villagers and flailed about. H help me. T the prince has lost his mind. Please. The imperial prince strode over to her. I was thinking that something stank really hard here. If only I knew earlier, I'd have searched each and every villager thoroughly. The imperial prince cracked his neck and shoulder muscles. And while gripping the shovel, he glared at the woman and snickered, so what should I do with you? Beat the living sh asterisk t out of you and then tie you up? Or, just bury you six feet under so that you won't have a chance to get smart again with me? The woman screamed out loudly again. It was at this point that the villagers finally regained their wits and stepped forward to protect the woman. They confronted the prince and spoke up. I Imperial Prince Nim. What are you doing this? Why? How could you wield your shovel against a frail young lady? As soon as the villagers stood up for her, Morian quickly hid behind them as her body shivered like a frightened kitten. Meanwhile, the prince formed a dumbfounded expression as his eyes scanned the villagers. Get out of my way. I'm gonna finish this. Or else, you fools are going to get hurt. The village men quickly shook their heads. To them, the prince right now had lost his mind. The boy's sharp glare, rude and harsh tone of voice all those belonged to a neighborhood thug, not a prince. He was renowned for his mangnani personality, sure. But lately, though, people began thinking that he had somewhat improved, but as it turned out, nothing had actually changed. A mangnani would always be a mangnani, indeed. But then, the Imperial Prince said something completely unexpected to them. Did you just say she's a frail young lady? This B asterisk TCH is 63 years old. She's old enough to be your mother, and then some. Morian's expression froze up in an instant. Her body began shuddering as well. Chapter 14, 010 Imperial Prince is hunting a witch minus 3, part 2. This boy prince, what was he even saying? He knew of her real age? But how? Also, her name's not Morian or whatever. Was it Morgana? I heard that she showed up in the village three months ago. She must have been preparing to start this horse asterisk t ever since then. What a scary b asterisk tch she is. As expected of a cowardly and cheap as asterisk hole though. Morian's eyes grew cold right away. He even knew her real name. The villagers formed flabbergasted expressions. But that was understandable she worked as a pharmacist in the village and saved quite a lot of villagers in the process. So, between a pharmacist and the Mangnani Imperial Prince, who would you trust more? It was obvious that the villagers would find the prince insane. Your Highness, could you please explain what you mean? 
The Imperial Prince pointed at Morian and spoke, to put it simply, that B TCH is the necromancer. With this one announcement, the whole cave fell into silence. The villagers stared at Morian with hardened expressions on their faces. Even Grill sneakily distanced himself away from her as cold sweat trickled down his face. Such a scene left Morian utterly flustered. Uh! What's this? They actually believe the words of a crazy prince. Such a thing couldn't happen though. She worked so hard for the village's sake until now, and yet they trusted her even less than the Meng Nani prince. Morian hurriedly shouted out, That's not true. That's not possible. I've been kidnapped by the zombies. Isn't that weird, though? It's not like they were trying to mature a bottle of wine or something, so why did they kidnap a woman and let her live? T that's because I'm the bait. There's no need to keep you alive in that case. I mean, you already served your purpose when people saw you get kidnapped alive, right? There's no way a necromancer would keep a bait alive when it could potentially escape and become an annoyance later. T that's because the evil magician was using me as a hostage. In that case, there should be someone else besides you here, no. Morian finally shut her mouth up. Cold sweat drops traveled down her cheek and pooled on the tip of her chin. Her trembling eyes quickly scanned the surroundings. Even the villagers that initially believed in her innocence were distancing themselves away from her. Why? Because they definitely hadn't run into anyone resembling a necromancer during their journey through the cave. The only person they met was Morian here, waiting for them. She hurriedly shook her head and stepped back. No, it's not true. I'm not lying. This is a trap. A trap laid out by that evil magician. Why, why don't you believe me? Sob. She covered her face with both of her hands and began sobbing away. The villagers saw this and exchanged sympathetic glances with each other. Could they have made a mistake? Such thoughts entered the villagers' heads. However, they had to change their minds the moment the imperial prince said these following words. You idiots, are you all wild animals or something? Don't listen to your base instincts and use your heads a bit more. You actually believe what she's saying in this situation. The prince harshly criticized them before shifting his gaze over to Grill. Hey, Grill. Do you still have any holy water with you? Do you mean your holy water? Yes, sir. I still have some left. The farmer nodded his head as he pulled out a vial of holy water from his inner pocket. The imperial prince snatched it away and tossed it to Morian. She hesitantly caught the vial, looking quite confused. Drink it. It's holy water. Morian shut her mouth up. Just taking one look at the holy water caused her to involuntarily cover her nose. Even though the vial's cap was securely shut, the stench wafting out from it was truly extraordinary. This couldn't have been any OL regular holy water. No, it must have been created by a high-ranking priest praying for several days and nights straight. Indeed. It was an incredibly dangerous poison to a necromancer who contained a sizable amount of demonic energy. You're injured all over too. You were probably tortured by the cowardly necromancer, right? Drinking that should fix you up right away. However, if you're actually that very necromancer. The moment she ingested this liquid, her innards would start incinerating. Morian took a look around her. The gazes of the villagers were now focused on her. If she didn't drink this holy water right now, things would become very bad for her pretty quickly. She lowered her gaze and stared at the vial with trembling hands, after taking the lid off, the stench stung her nostrils. Just where did that unhinged fool of an imperial prince get himself such powerful holy water? She now could tell that the liquid was imbued with an otherworldly amount of divinity. She then abruptly realized that the divine power used within the cave couldn't have come from an ordinary priest too. This bastard of an imperial prince, something about him had changed three months ago. Ah, well, I... She deliberately loosened her grip. Clang. Smash. The vial of holy water oh so naturally slipped out of her grasp and shattered on the floor. 
Morian feigned shock and shouted out, Oh no! I... I was too tense and lost my grip. There's no need to fret. The Imperial Prince glanced at Grill once more. The farmer hesitantly looked around and pulled out three more vials of holy water. He had enough spares on hand, in other words. This sight caused Morian's complexion to considerably darken. Her eyes trembled greatly, agitation clearly written in them. You son of a b asterisk tch of an imperial prince. She gritted her teeth. This was a complete unexpected turn of events. She was supposed to assassinate the exiled prince, but had now found herself in danger instead. In order to dispel the villagers' suspicions, she behaved like a saint and worked as a pharmacist for the past three months, but everything had gone down the drain in one moment, just like that. It was almost time for the tide of death to rise up from the land of the dead spirits. The Holy Imperial family wouldn't have enough leeway to investigate the death of the prince, in simple terms. She planned this event to coincide with that very moment, but now, things had become tangled up beyond repair. Morian's eyes slowly shifted over to the wall behind the Imperial Prince. This was where the only exit of this cave could be found. Her gaze then gradually lowered to the floor. The glass vial that used to contain the holy water had shattered into several sharp pieces. Although there were traces of holy water on them, if she roused up all of her demonic energy and dyed them with her blood, she was confident of changing their nature. Her previously terror-filled expression suddenly crumbled away. The corners of her lips curled up, and with madness-filled eyes, she glared at the prince. You stinking imperial prince dog! Was it because of those words? The villagers immediately pounced on her. See catch her! Unfortunately for them, though, the first one to make a move was Morian. She quickly picked up a glass piece from the floor. Her skin burned away from the holy water. She quickly injected her demonic energy in the glass and pounced at the imperial prince. Blood oozed out from her hands, and she quickly scattered it all around the boy. As the blood dyed the floor, she quickly recited the spell in her head. It was a necromancy spell, one designed to summon an undead stained by eternal resentment. Demonic energy rapidly escaped from her body. Her once firm skin instantly shriveled up to form countless wrinkles. Her stamina also quickly abandoned her and even the remaining vitality left her body in droves. As her reserve of demonic energy was consumed in haste, she aged at a visible rate. Morian sensed her body growing heavier. She knew she'd have to work hard for a while after growing old again, but it'd be fine she only had to steal the life force from another living person after all. She might not get to extend her life, but at the very least, she should be able to maintain her youthful looks. A magic circle was drawn in the blink of an eye around the Imperial Prince. A large runic character suddenly appeared, then the earth overturned to reveal bleached white bones. Your Highness! Oh my God! Save the Prince! The villagers stopped trying to arrest Morian and instead, tried to rescue the boy Prince. However, it was already too late. The skeleton grabbed onto the prince's hand and leg. She wasn't able to use the proper summoning magic, so only the upper torso had been summoned to capture the prince. Despite this, it was already more than enough. Morian extended her hand. She aimed the bloodied glass piece at the boy's neck, and then... Bang! The imperial prince instantly crushed the summoned skeleton with his shovel. As the monster's bones shattered and flew apart, the boy bent down and spun around to swing the shovel, as if to borrow the momentum from the centrifugal force. The blade of the shovel accurately flew towards Morian's head. You insane bastard! There wasn't a shred of hesitation in his actions. If she got hit by the shovel, half of her head would be split apart by the blade and she'd die. Don't make me laugh. Do you think I'd get killed that easily? Morian gritted her teeth. She was an assassin after all. Starting from a young age, she learned necromancy, hand-to-hand -hand combat, as well as assassination techniques from the Black Order. This level of attack from the young boy was nothing to her. She simply ducked her head lower and dodged the shovel. It was finally done. 
the prince was now exposed after making such a huge move. If she went in right now and cut the boy's neck before making her escape. It was then. Something approached Morian from her side with frightening speed. A set of slender-looking fingers suddenly grabbed her hair as well as her scalp. Pain accompanied her senses soon after. The unexplainable oppressive pressure caused Morian to look towards her side. A girl with platinum white hair was glaring at her with a pair of goosebump inducing red eyes. Hey! The girl held Morian's head in her grip and slammed it down hard on the ground. 010. Imperial Prince is hunting a witch minus 3, part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 15, 011. Imperial Prince is hunting a witch minus 4, part 1. Bang! Morian's head smashed into the hard, cold stone floor. Her teeth came loose and her nose bone broke. The girl then brandished her kitchen knife and brushed it against Morian's neck. Accompanied by a chilling sensation, the skin on Morian's neck split apart slightly, and blood began dripping out a little between the cold metal and human flesh. Since Morian studied human anatomy, she immediately realized that even the slightest resistance would result in her artery being cut wide open. She was suppressed even before she had enough time to even shiver from fear. The Imperial Prince looked at the platinum-haired girl with a surprised expression before walking over to Morian. Man, that surprised me. The boy looked down at the captured necromancer, Morian, with a slightly flustered expression. The latter's shaking eyes alternated between the prince and the girl. They were both carrying icy cold glares. Morian quickly looked around her vicinity and saw the villagers standing nearby. Having found out that she was the necromancer, their eyes were just as cold, even containing clear hints of killing intent too. They obviously hated her for utterly decimating their village and ruining their lives. Morian found them far more terrifying than the boy prince or the girl. She gritted her teeth. She was captured in the end. At this rate, she'd die for sure. S spare me. The villagers wouldn't let her live. She was the culprit who caused the deaths of all their loved ones, after all. If she wanted to live, then she had no choice but to appeal to the imperial prince. Even if she sounded shameless, she needed to beg for her life here. What do you mean spare you? You were so busy trying to kill me, you know. You getting tortured before being burned at the stake wouldn't be enough to make me feel happy here. The imperial prince lightly waved his hand. The platinum-haired girl must have understood what this gesture meant, because she began pushing Morian's head down even harder against the ground as if to protect the prince. It felt as if Morian's skull might shatter from the sheer physical force alone. Such strength couldn't possibly have come from the small hands of a young girl. Oh my god! Just who is this girl? Where is she drawing this monstrous strength from? Morian couldn't budge an inch anymore. It was clear that her opponents didn't plan on letting her off the hook. Without any doubt, she'd be reported to the Theocratic Empire. The relevant authorities would be informed that an assassin dared to harm the grandson of the Holy Emperor. She became desperate after thinking about her future. She wasn't just any other criminal, and if the Imperial Court really got a hold of her, then it wouldn't simply end with her execution. Please. I beg of you, let me go. The corners of the Imperial Prince's lips twitched. Why should I? I finally caught you after going through so much crap, meaning I don't have a reason to do so. Why should I spare a B asterisk TCH who tried to kill me earlier anyway? Morian gritted her teeth. She needed to survive. In order to do that. If you let me go, I'll tell you everything. I'll tell you who ordered me to kill you. Aren't you curious about that? Kill me. The Imperial Prince looked stunned at this sudden revelation. But that made sense since this particular prince already had no chance in becoming the successor of the Holy Emperor. He had been basically abandoned by his family. So it was a little wonder why he'd be surprised to learn that he had became a target for assassination. Hope began blooming in Morian's heart upon seeing the changes in the prince's expression. If she played her cards right, then she might get to seduce this naive young boy again and escape from this situation. 
her confidence shot up since she had already charmed the boy once before. T that's right. I was told to seduce you and make it look like you killed yourself. It wasn't suicide. The Imperial Prince seemed flabbergasted, but regretfully, that was all he might be confused by these revelations, but he showed no signs of any willingness to let her go. This wouldn't do. What she did wasn't enough to convince him. She needed something far more stimulating. Morian quickly recalled the reason why the Imperial Prince had been banished in the first place. He was just a naive and immature kid, yet his interest towards women was in full swing. He was dumb, and extremely easy to seduce too. That's why. You were interested in me, weren't you? I can become your slave. If you want, you can do whatever you want to my body. She should continue seducing him. He was a boy going through puberty. He'd definitely show a reaction when a healthy and slender beauty was seducing him. I'm not interested in fooling around with a 60-year-old granny. Morian bit her lower lip. She was currently in an aged state, so this sort of response wasn't that surprising. She couldn't seduce anyone with her current appearance. In that case, she should try that. I... I won't tell anyone. I won't tell anyone about the magic you used earlier. This boy, he summoned zombies. She wasn't sure how he did it, but well, if rumors of the Holy Emperor's grandson summoning a bunch of zombies got around, then never mind the grandson in question, even the Holy Emperor would feel the heat. If she used this fact to negotiate with him, then... Eh, uh, that's right. This B asterisk TCH, she saw that, didn't she? The glare in the prince's eyes grew even colder. Something went wrong just now. Morian needed to retract what she had said or else. Just as she hurriedly opened her mouth, he forced his shovel inside her jaw instead. Morian's trembling eyes were now looking up at the prince. I advise you to reply promptly to the questions I'm going to ask you now. If you get it, blink once, the boy said. Morian blinked her terror-filled eyes. Three months ago, were you the one who hung me up on the tree? She blinked her eyes once. Back then, she seduced the imperial prince and lured him into the forest. The dumb prince fell for it and followed after her. She then subdued the foolish prince who showed up all alone and hanged him on a tree, thereby making it look like a suicide. In case something unexpected happened, she even confirmed that his heart stopped beating too. She left after feeling confident of his death, and yet somehow, the imperial prince came back to life. Paladin soon showed up afterwards to protect the boy, thinking that he tried to hang himself. They stayed around for a month to guard the monastery, but fortunately enough, the prince couldn't remember anything from the incident, and thus, Morian was able to escape from their suspicion. Even after the paladins went away, she remained under the radar for the next two months to avoid further doubts. And the result of all that was this. The imperial prince sighed in relief. So that's what happened. He formed a bitter grin and threw out the next question, the one who wanted me dead, do you know who it is? Morian remained still for a bit there, her eyes wide open. She didn't know who it was exactly. However, she could speak about the organization she was a part of instead. The imperial prince seemed to have read her mind, seeing as he raised the shovel up a little. Oh? In that case... What is it that you wanted to tell me then? Now that her mouth had become less restrained, Morian was able to speak what was on her mind, the organization I belong to. What's the name? It's the Black Order. They ordered me to assassinate the seventh grandson of the Holy Emperor. The answer came out way too easily. In fact, it was even more suspicious precisely because of how quick she fessed up. That came out way too easily. I don't believe you. Rather than being caught and tortured by the theocratic empire, being honest is far more preferable right now, Morian replied. The theocratic empire's heresy inquisitors were basically a bunch of inhumane demons. They were supported by not some piffling little organization, but the entire empire. As far as the human physiology was concerned, 
they possessed far more intimate and detailed knowledge than the necromancers who dealt with death itself. Such as, how to not kill a person while still inflicting the maximum amount of pain, or how not to destroy one's mind while still placing the poor person in the maximum load of stress, etc., etc. Their mercilessly cruel and evil torture methods were infamous for making 99 out of 100 confess to their crimes. They would torture you until they got the exact information they wanted, and then, they would start performing strict and precise live experiments until the victim's life ran out. Basically, they were worse demons than the necromancers. They were a group of people clearly at odds with how the holy men and women of faith should behave, in other words. So you want me to spare you with only this little information? Please let me go. I beg of you. Once I'm certain of my safety, I'll provide you with all the info I can on the Black Order. I'll even report back to you on who wanted to kill you. Who'd be dumb enough to believe that? This had to be a lie that's what the Imperial Prince thought. If you want, we can perform the soul contract. I mean, it'll be troubling for you if your magic gets known to other people, right? The soul contract. A type of pledge that necromancers could make while using their souls as collateral. A promise would be made by risking a certain amount of one's remaining lifespan, and in case the promise was broken, the contract ensured that one's soul would be torn to tiny little pieces. Morian, now in the appearance of a shriveled-up granny, pleaded with him desperately. The prince looked at her and nodded his head, as if he too agreed with her sentiment. Right, if that gets out, things will become annoying for me too. Why you see? Soon, paladins will show up here after realizing that something has gone wrong. It would be infinitely more preferable to kill herself rather than get caught by those bastards. Let me go before they show up, please. If I were to get dragged before the Inquisitors, they'll find out about the magic you used and. And? That's why it's dangerous to let you live, right? My bad, but why don't you just die instead? Morian's expression hardened upon hearing this. The young Imperial Prince was grinning right now. The way the ends of his lips curled up, that was definitely not the smile of a devout cleric who worshipped a deity. No. That was a cowardly, vulgar smirk that belonged to a devil. This bastard, he never planned to let her live from the beginning. Chapter 16, 011 Imperial Prince is hunting a witch minus four, part two. You son of a b asterisk tch. You used necrom. Before she could finish her words, the shovel smacked her in the face once more. Despite blood dancing about everywhere, she didn't die. The prince looked down on the dazed and bleeding Morian before speaking out loudly, I shan't be the one to judge you, but my fellow villagers will. He then stepped aside. Even the platinum-haired girl released her grip on Morian. Before long, the villagers approached her from all sides. She looked at their expressions and her own complexion paled greatly. P please, SS spare. She was quickly gagged and then dragged out from the cave. Eventually, the group returned to the monastery. The remainder of the villagers were informed of her evil actions. The enraged people stoned her mercilessly. Once she became a broken wreck, they tied her up and hauled her back to the forest before dangling her up by the neck and abandoning her to her own demise. Some time later, starving beasts passing by tore into her flesh and devoured her. Three days later, she herself became a zombie. While still hanging on the tree, she flailed about ungainly. The imperial prince looked at that spectacle and clicked his tongue. Even if this is a fantasy world, the medieval setting sure can be scary. The zombified Morian who was dangling by the neck continued to flail away while howling out loudly. Without a priest to perform her purification ceremony, she'd have to remain as an undead for decades, maybe even for hundreds of years. This was the fate waiting for a necromancer who relied on the magic of death. That's too bad though. I wanted to find out what that Black Order thing was all about, but oh well. If only he possessed a skill to talk to souls like a real necromancer, that would have been real nice. Unfortunately, he wasn't blessed with such a descriptive ability. It didn't matter at the end of the day though, 
since he was still an imperial prince. After he was banished to this place, his influence as a potential successor to the throne had pretty much disappeared. Even then, there were still some people who made a move to eliminate him, perhaps fearing that despite his current state, he could pose some threat to them. If that was the case, then he could certainly think of a few likely suspects. Such as My brothers, hey. His siblings from the Holy Imperial family who were eligible to inherit the Holy Emperor's throne it was possible that they were targeting him. Damn, how cold-hearted. I didn't expect to get tangled up in a power struggle. The Imperial Prince clicked his tongue again as he shook his head. Nevertheless, the curtains on the Witch Morgana incident had closed with this. They were in the northern frontiers land of the dead spirits. The time for the tide of death the moment when the instincts of the dead awoke, were closing on them once more. Charlotte grew interested in the boy referred to as the Imperial Prince. During the defense against the zombie horde, and during the mass funeral, she observed him from a faraway distance. She heard stories about him. One of them being that while she was still unconscious, the prince took care to move the remains of her parents and sincerely performed their funeral. She quietly watched the boy prince tirelessly perform numerous funerals throughout the night. Even when everyone was dog-tired, he didn't rest and continued to work. He prayed with great care so that the dead souls could find some peace in their afterlife. While seeing him like that, she felt a certain frustration well up in her chest. He was her life's savior, her benefactor. And he was also another type of a savior who saved her parents by performing their funeral rites. What kind of person is the Imperial Prince? Charlotte's question was answered by the older girls and aunties of the village. He was a mang nanny, a maggot, an irredeemable trash, a dumbass who killed himself after failing to seduce a woman. All sorts of criticism aimed towards his direction were whispered right into her ear. She frowned deeply after hearing them all. This wasn't what she wanted to find out. Charlotte ended up glaring at the village's womenfolk. Well, it does feel like he's somewhat changed since three months ago, actually. Yeah, he performed my father's funeral with such care back then, too. That's right, he even saved everyone this time, didn't he? They were grateful towards the Imperial Prince Nim. And they also seemed to be relying on him, too. Charlotte recalled the time she supported the Prince Nim back in the cave. He was so small and young. Indeed, his figure felt tiny and very light. He was even more immature than she was, with a face that looked younger than her. And yet, with such a small body, he fought off against that huge bear. Even though he was injured badly, he still tried his best to rescue the kidnapped woman. He's actually very caring. But then, that woman named Morian betrayed his faith in her. She lunged at the boy prince and tried to kill him. Charlotte quickly stepped in to stop that from happening. It all transpired in the blink of an eye, really. By the time she regained her wits, she was already leaping high in the air, grasping the woman's hair, and then slamming the woman's head down on the floor. She even pointed the knife at the woman's throat, almost slicing it wide open. She herself was shocked by her own agile movements. Was my body this light from the beginning? As it turned out, the woman was a necromancer. Charlotte found that out after the woman and the imperial prince conversed for a while. Charlotte couldn't understand what they were talking about, but she was sure that this female necromancer was targeting the prince's life. And for that purpose, many, many villagers had to die. The imperial prince didn't forgive such a person. In the end, Morian was hung by her neck in the forest while she was still alive. It was a truly gruesome fate. That's how this incident came to an end. Charlotte and the rest of the villagers began rebuilding the village and hunted down the still unaccounted for zombies. Then, they helped the Imperial Prince perform the funerals for the dead. When the situation had somewhat normalized, Farmer Grill came to speak to her. Charlotte, if it's all right with you, why don't you stay at my place? He smiled awkwardly while asking her. She had no place to stay anymore, and that's why she nodded her head to express consent. But still, 
she looked in the direction of the Imperial Prince in the monastery. Is there anyone there helping the Imperial Prince Nim? Helping His Highness? What? Ah, oh, you mean as a gravekeeper? She shook her head. She didn't just mean the role of gravekeeper, but someone to clean the monastery, managing it, as well as performing other sundry chores. Wasn't such an environment just too unforgiving for a young prince to live alone? Shouldn't someone at least try to lend him a helping hand? Ah, you wish to work as a maidservant. Charlotte nodded her head in response. But Grill formed a troubled expression on his face. The thing is, the paladins told us not to place a servant near him. The reason being. Because he was a Meng Nanny, he was banished so that his personality could hopefully change for the better. The paladins said that having a maidservant would only cause the boy to become even more arrogant, rather than reflecting on his past and grow remorseful about it. Grill pondered the situation for a moment before addressing Charlotte once more, there's one other way. Maybe it might work if you decide to become a nun. A nun. Well, it's a monastery, right? If you enter it to study faith, then the paladins might not mind. Charlotte nodded her head. The next day, she went back to the monastery. She found the imperial prince by the library. He was busy going through the written records recovered from the necromancer's cave. How complicated. At this rate, I'll get assassinated for sure. Without a shield to protect me. I'll definitely get killed. As for my skill proficiency, I got a... A shield? Not only that, assassination? Charlotte approached the boy prince. He flinched after sensing the presence of another human and sneakily hid the book. She tilted her head as she stared at him. He replied to her with a heavy frown. What's this? Why are you here? I don't have any funerals scheduled for today, so why can't you let me take a break for at least a single day? I wish to pay my debt. What debt? She inwardly went, ah, I made a mistake. Debt wasn't the right word to use here. She should have said the kindness he had shown her. While regretting her choice of words, Charlotte tried to open her lips again. Wait, are you talking about back then? The prince said. He looked really surprised just then. For some reason, he quickly retreated and sneakily reached out towards his trusty shovel too. Why was he reacting like that, though? Ah, perhaps he still had unfinished business he needed to attend to? It'll be better to forget about the past, all right? I mean, our first encounter wasn't all that memorable as a shared experience, am I wrong? As expected of the Imperial Prince, his heart was secretly generous. He was even telling her to forget about the kindness he had shown her. But, how could she dare to do that? He saved her life and ensured that her parents could rest peacefully, didn't he? I wish to serve you. At. Eh. And, also. Charlotte recalled the word shield. She remembered that this boy prince had been exiled here. And not to forget that woman necromancer spat out the word assassination too. Someone was trying to murder this young prince. Without a doubt, his banishment had to be that person's underhanded trick as well. There was no way that a prince like this boy could be a Meng Nanny. Charlotte's gaze shifted towards the books that were lined up on the bookshelf. The Imperial Swordsmanship Tutorial The Imperial Self-Defense Technique and Practice Drills the methods to operate and control divinity for paladins. There were several books here. A shield, he was searching for it. He was searching for someone to protect him. However, if she came out and openly said it, he'd reject her. Because it'd be a dangerous task, that's why. I'd like to offer my services in this place as a nun. This didn't mean that she should give up though. No. She definitely had to protect this person. In that case, she should masquerade as a nun instead. As a nun, she would study his religion and train herself so that she could protect him when the time came. A young girl might not be able to properly defend an imperial prince, but still, she decided to give it her all regardless of this fact. Besides, 
there could be a way for a nun to switch to a paladin by learning swordsmanship. This would be the only way for her to repay the kindness he had shown to her. She would protect the boy prince who had no one to rely on. That's why. Charlotte smiled at him. I'll be in your care. 011. Imperial Prince is Hunting a Witch-4, Part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 17, 012. Imperial Prince is Toiling Away-1, Part 1. An undead will evolve as time elapses. I flipped the page of the book I was reading. When a zombie fully decomposes, it will become a skeleton. However, if it manages to preserve its body somehow, it will become an even more powerful creature, a ghoul. I continued reading the paragraphs below. If their bodies are exposed to the negative field, the existing demonic energy lingering in the location will greatly accelerate the evolution. Their skin will become tougher and their bones stronger. MMM. A skeleton will reach a certain level of intelligence and start wielding a weapon. Meaning, it will evolve to either a warrior or an archer. If they do not reach the afterlife as soon as possible, then they will continue to grow even stronger over a lengthy period of time. I flipped to the next page. They instinctively crave for stronger demonic energy. They also wish for a stronger body. And that is why they all head towards the land of the dead spirits. The warmer seasons of spring and summer serve to weaken the bodies of the undead. The demonic energy would dissipate when subjected to warm sunlight, and not to forget, the negative fields would be exposed under the bright light too. That's why the undead would travel to the land of the dead spirits as it was a basically a huge negative field filled with demonic energy. And also, once autumn ends and winter arrives, the undead will finally awaken their instincts the ones they had been suppressing all this time. The instincts of the undead. The avaricious desire to devour the living and the drive to propagate their numbers by turning others into fellow undeads. This is the tide of death. Once every year during the coldest spell in winter, the undead that have been roaming the continent will be drawn to the land of the dead spirits, their instincts soon to be unshackled. It is the season where their bodies won't rot and remain as they are. They would scatter around the rest of the continent to devour the living. And the time for that will be. Around one month left until D-Day, hey. I closed the book while muttering this. I got up from my seat to return the book to its original place somewhere within the monastery's small library. Let me take care of that, please. However, a silver-haired girl stopped me from doing that. The girl kitted out in a neat nun's habit picked up the book while carrying her trademark expressionless face. Her name was Charlotte, and for some reason, she began visiting the monastery quite often after the end of the zombie wave incident. I heard that the farmer Grill accepted her as his adopted daughter or something. That guy initially detested the very idea, but now, he must have decided to take responsibility and look after her. Okay, sure thing. The girl nodded her head and placed the book back on the shelf. I couldn't tell whether she was suffering from the shock of losing her parents or something, but for some reason, she decided to enter the monastery and requested to work as a nun here. Never mind my breakfast, lunch, and dinner, she even took on the menial tasks of cleaning the monastery as well as maintenance of the graves too. It was convenient for me, sure, but every once in a while. I'd recall the sight of the bloodied kitchen knife she wielded back then and chills would travel down my spine as a result. Wheel, her unpaid voluntary service shouldn't last for that long. She'd probably leave on her own volition once she gets sick and tired of playing my maidservant. Maybe. Not everyone could become a nun after all. This world believed in several different religions. As long as it didn't harm anyone, an order would easily be acknowledged as a religion. On the other hand, if it actually did harm other people, then it'd be quickly labeled as a heretical cult. Also, another thing to take note was that you could get married even if you were a nun. So this silver-haired girl before my eyes would leave the monastery after falling in love with a boy or something. My expression remained as a sullen pout as I looked at her, before I walked straight past her. I opened the door to the library to go outside, only to find some people blocking my path. What now? I asked. 
they were knights kitted out in pure white armor from the top of their heads all the way down to their feet. These were the paladins of the Theocratic Empire's imperial court. Also the monitors of the Holy Emperor's seventh grandson slash imperial prince as well. Which was me, obviously. A week had already passed by since the zombie wave incident. I was so preoccupied with searching for every zombie wandering around in addition to performing all the funerals that I ended up gradually forgetting about the passage of time. It was only yesterday that we finally finished settling everything. After our relative safety was assured once more, the village chief sent the word out to the nearest fiefdom. It usually took over a full day's journey to travel back and forth, and yet, in just less than half a day later, these paladins had already shown up. They perused me top to bottom before shifting their gazes to Charlotte over at a distance. A nun. This monastery was empty before I showed up. They were puzzled by the appearance of a nun ostensibly studying their religion. I deliberately spoke in a sarcastic tone of voice. Yet, yeah, she's sent by the local village. She's also studying the faith quite diligently too. Ah, she's volunteering her services for my sake. And she doesn't seem to care whether it's day or night either. Not to forget, she even made sure to take care of my meals during breakfast, lunch, and supper, too. Well, what can I do? She's not a servant, but a nun. How can I reject a fellow believer in the goddess, right? I continued to speak in a slimy tone of voice. The head paladin looked away from Charlotte and stared at me. We were informed that you captured the witch Morgana. Hey! Would you look at this guy? Not even a simple greeting, but straight to the topic, eh? Are you taking me lightly just because I lost my status as the Holy Emperor's successor? Ah! That's right. The villagers caught that damn woman. Yes, we heard, he spoke without a hint of emotion like a cyborg while nodding his head. We heard that along with the villagers, you fought tooth and nail for their survival. I fought tooth and nail along with the villagers? Well, if you're talking about the battle against zombies near the monastery, then. We also heard that they surrounded the king of gluttony and fought it off with their farming tools. At Despite having hundreds of zombies surrounding them, the villagers still managed to defeat the undead in the end, and eventually located the necromancer. Especially so for that man named Grill. He said he defeated over thirty zombies and even cast holy water on Witch Morgana, thereby driving her to a corner. Grill, oh dear Grill, since when did you become such a peerless, fearless farmer capable of spewing bullsh asterisk tea to that degree? I guess the sight I witnessed of you sobbing and wailing like a little baby, unable to even properly take down a single zombie, was all a lie? I had no idea that you had tendencies like those munchkin MCS that hide their powers for one stupid reason or the other. I know it's all an exaggeration, but, the head paladin continued on while his gaze shifted over to the monastery's window. He could see the newly erected graves that went up over the past seven days containing several hundreds of the dead. But, it seems to be true. That's just pure exaggeration. You're supposed to be a paladin, right? You shouldn't just haphazardly believe every story a stranger tells you. Of course, this guy wouldn't even dream of a possibility that I killed all those zombies by myself, which includes the King of Gluttony too. It might have been heavily exaggerated, but the tale wasn't a lie since the villagers really did help me during the struggle. Anyways, you probably didn't come here to confirm that. Am I wrong? I said with a little scowl. Were you aware that Morgana was affiliated with the Black Order? Yeah, she told me after I interrogated her. What the hell? I could have learned that from these guys instead? That Morian woman, she was talking like it was the greatest secret in the world or something. She was a truly malicious, vicious villain suspected of decimating five other villages in the past. Wowzers, she's actually a genocidal witch. Oh I I I I, what the heck? I was fighting against such a crazy b asterisk tch. What happened to the witch, your highness? Didn't you hear it from the villagers? She was beaten up half to death and got hung in the forest. Did you do that, 
Your Highness. Nope. I immediately denied it. Are you mad? How could I, a young boy with a frail heart, do something so cruel and savage? My heart is as pure as a maiden's. Naturally, I didn't say what was really in my head. This guy would definitely start retching if I did just that. Which was why I went with a different routine instead. Chapter 18, 012 Imperial Prince is toiling away minus one, part two. I approached Charlotte and hugged her while behaving like a spoiled brat. I was sitting on my butt, busy wetting my pants from the fright, you see. Oh my goodness. It was so terrifying, I tell you. That damn chick. She was even trying to seduce me earlier you know? But then, she treated me like a stinking scumbag, so she really got what she deserved. Wowzers, what a relief that I didn't sh asterisk t my pants back then. I even yelled out loudly to amplify the effect even further. I didn't forget to sneak a couple of glances at the paladins in the meantime, of course. The leader paladin was lowering his head, and I could hear him sigh grandly. Nice. What a disgusting sight this must be for him. This spectacle of me clinging onto some girl and shivering away in fear while loudly yapping on and on. Even I found such a sight rather disgusting, if I say so myself. In any case, oh my dear paladins. Report this sorry sight in its full glory to the Holy Emperor. Oh, and don't forget to send suitable greetings to my brothers too. Please do your utmost best to convince them that there's no need to send more assassins like that which in my way, okay? The head paladin pulled out a leather pouch from his inner pocket and placed it on top of the shelf nearby. I asked. What's that? It's the reward for Morgana's head, your highness. There's eighty gold in total. About fifty silver would be enough for a commoner to live off for a month in this world. When considering that fact, you could say this reward was quite a hefty amount, all right. With this small fortune, I should be able to lounge around for a while. Hey, so there was a reward. By any chance, did you find any magic-related tomes in the witch's possession, your highness? What about M? We need to confiscate them. Don't have M. Didn't like the way they looked, so I had them incinerated. I was bullsh asterisking obviously. Do you think I'd hand over such nice educational material like magic grimoires to the lot of you, just like that? I risked my life to get my hands on those. I wasn't dumb enough to go ah, oh, how wonderful, and hand them over, you know? I could use them to their fullest myself instead. Of course, it was unknown whether I could learn anything from them or not seeing that I possessed divinity instead of the demonic energy needed for necromancers. I see. Before the paladins left, their leader looked back at me for one last time. Winter is coming and the weather is only getting colder, so please do take care to remain healthy, your highness. I know. We're in the middle of a mountain and it gets so f asterisking cold up here. Also, the tide of death will soon be upon us. Yeah. I read about that just now. A wave of undead that happens every winter, is it? It happens around the 25th of December when it's so cold that it's more like a bloody ice age, and that's when this tide thing is supposed to happen, right? I'd rather much prefer that Santa showed up on that date instead, but well, it was more like Halloween where all sorts of specters rampaged about. I spoke with a refreshing grin on my face. This caused the head paladin to stare at me without saying a single word. He was probably sighing under his helmet from my lack of dignity. Please prepare to evacuate from here. We shall escort you. Oh, oh. Really? I'm finally leaving this boring, stuffy place for good? Where are we going, then? Were we headed to the nearest neighboring country? Or to another city? I'd love to go on a tour of this world. Didn't matter where, I was dying of curiosity anyway. Since the paladins would be accompanying me, I might as well make them cough up the expenses, too. The ultimate other world travel log where the protagonist stays only in the best hotels and eats only the tastiest food. All the while protected by trusty escorts. 
How romantic was that? I was getting sick and tired of playing around with corpses anyway. Surely they wouldn't mind me going on a vacation, right? We shall accompany you to the Rania fiefdom, your highness. What? Yo, hang on. What's this? That place. Isn't that right next to this village? Wasn't it a city only half a day's travel away? It had no tasty local delicacies and nothing interesting to look at. No, it was simply a fortress built as a shield against the tide of death. About half of its populace were convicted criminals, so understandably, its public order was the absolute worst. It was even commonly referred to as the abandoned domain, or the castles of sacrifices set up to appease the evil spirits. Hang on a minute. Were they actually planning to send the holy emperor's grandson to that kind of place? During the dark days of the tide, many casualties will rise, your highness. Therefore. Eeiii, there's no way. Please tell me it ain't true. Don't you dare say anything else. For the sake of those noble sacrifices, we'd like you to perform their funeral rites, please. This is the will of His Majesty, the Holy Emperor. Oh. My. God. It wasn't just you, go there but instead, you, go there and perform hard labor. Eh, oh, you crappy rotten grandfather of mine. Well, you aren't my real grandfather, but biologically we're still blood related, anyway. Are you planning to kill your poor grandson through overwork? W wait, could it be that Morgana was sent by him instead? I could only sincerely pray that wasn't the case. If the Holy Emperor decided to kill me for real, then I'd die without making a sound, that's for sure. Once the paladins left, the villagers came to see me. They were hammering away. Tools and materials were quickly brought in as the worn down and weathered furniture were taken out. The monastery was currently going through the necessary renovation slash repair work. What a relief that it'll be the undead attacking us and not some bandits. The undead advancing forward due to the tide of death would ignore run-down houses or buildings that lacked tangible signs of life. This meant that the village or the monastery would be spared as long as no one remained in them. So, there was nothing to lose by fixing up the old building and filling it up with new furniture. These are the village's best carpenters. Although it won't be like a brand new building, they should at least ensure that there are no more leakages and help prevent the roof from collapsing. The village chief showed up to honor our prior agreement. Not only did he bring people to fix the monastery, he even brought along enough firewood to last through the winter too. As a bonus, there were new ingredients for food waiting for me to collect them as well. Cooking used to be my hobby in my previous life so you could say that fooling around with the various local ingredients found in this world had become my new pastime. Having said that, Charlotte was taking care of my meals lately, so I didn't really have to lift a finger anymore. I pushed forward a small coin pouch towards the village chief. Your Highness, this is... There are five gold coins inside. My words caused the old man's eyes to open up extremely wide. As such a large amount of money is. Apparently, there was a reward on the which you guys hunted down. This is a portion of that. Of course, I took the liberty of swallowing up the rest for myself. Sure, the villagers killed that witch, but didn't I play a huge role in her capture in the first place? It was a fair percentage, I thought. It should also be seen as the price for not soiling my hands too. We can't accept this. We're all in your debt as well, your highness. So this money. The village chief formed a bitter smile. I'm not just giving it away, you know, I responded. I'm paying you up front. For the repair work on the monastery. I shook my head. You mad? That's for free, innit? I pointed at the various headstones that were haphazardly erected here and there in the cemetery. Look, you can see that they're all pretty sloppy, right? Bring in some people and materials from the nearest town, and have them make proper ones. I've already performed the necessary purification ceremonies for all of them, so the only thing you gotta do now is to tidy up the graves. 
I can't be bothered to work on them anymore, so do what you think will be okay. What I was saying here was that, since I couldn't be bothered, the chief should go and hire some laborers. With their share of the reward no less. I understand. The village chief accepted the money. If you try to pocket some, Emma break your hands, okay. But of course. The village chief chuckled good-naturedly. With that, the work was all done. The bothersome paladins left too. I also took this time to study some magic as well. In a month's time, this world's version of Halloween would begin. Although, it wasn't some fun festival of sorts but a real march of the undead, which was a big bummer, I guess. The season of rampaging corpses that wouldn't rot. And the time when they would try to spread to the rest of the continent. To prepare for my future which was potentially filled with endless labor, I should utilize this off-peak season to rest my weary soul and further increase my skill proficiency. If I don't, I'd probably suffer hellish torment with no respite later. That's why. I guess I should start experimenting, then. Now was the time to learn all those necromancy skills found in the grimoires that Morian or Morgana, or whatever her name was, had left behind. 012. Imperial Prince is toiling away minus one, part one and two, Finn. Chapter 19, 013. Imperial Prince is toiling away minus two, part one. The time to relax eventually came to an end, and the peak season arrived with vengeance right at my doorstep. From here onwards I needed to steal myself and perform a continuous stream of one funeral after another. Not only that, I'd be doing that during the coldest and harshest time of the year too. We came here to escort you. The paladins showed their mugs again as promised after a month. I wrapped myself in a cheap blanket and climbed aboard the horse-drawn carriage. God damn it, it's so freaking cold. I might get frostbite while working in rubbish weather conditions like this. It'd be a huge relief if I didn't have any of my limbs cut off from a hapless mistake or something. After going past the forest of the steep mountainside, we finally reached the village nearest to the monastery. The villagers had all packed up their luggage and were slowly marching out of their homes as well. Grill and Charlotte were also among the group. She was carrying luggage far bigger than herself, which was quite an amazing sight to behold. She saw me in the carriage and bowed her head a little, either out of respect or as a casual greeting. Wow! Hey you! You're pretty strong, aren't you? Probably much stronger than me, right? I inwardly clicked my tongue. All the villagers here were also evacuating to the Rania fiefdom, to escape from the upcoming tide of death. Just how big is the scale of this tide of death anyway? I had this feeling that most of the books I read about this subject were works of pure unbridled over-exaggeration. However, if it really was as dangerous as they say, then it no doubt become rather troublesome for me. The exact scale is still unknown, your highness. However, we are certain to be attacked continuously for a month to coincide with the coldest day of the year. Last year alone, we had about 5,000 undead creatures showing up to attack the fortress over the span of one week and on December 25th, the day when the necromancer king died, we recorded the highest number of undead throughout the tide itself. 5,000, was it? How many people are stationed in the fortress then? The Rania fiefdom boasts a combat force of about 20,000 strong at all times, with more convicts regularly being shipped in to supplement that figure. We also have additional criminals, numbering around 2,000 or so, scheduled to join our ranks in the near future, Your Highness. Well, in that case, it shouldn't be all that dangerous, right? I shifted my gaze over to the distant fiefdom. Unfortunately, the fortress wasn't as big as I had hoped. It was rather shabby, if I was being brutally honest with myself. The castle walls were actually a collection of wooden palisades and stone barricades, and they were only around 12 meters high. But they still surrounded the fiefdom with nary a visible gap, as if to emphasize their role of protecting the city hiding within. This place was referred to as the Castle of Sacrifices, right? The place where all the sacrifices were gathered to placate the anger of the dead? 
if only these walls were like the wall from the game of XX. With the authority of the Holy Emperor, a fortification wall that dwarfed the Great Wall of China in scale could have been built already. Of course, building such a grand wall didn't mean its enormous length could be effectively policed, and if one spot were to receive a focused attack, the wall would have been easily breached anyway. This was why it was wiser to gather the living to lure the huge hordes of the undead to a single spot, and stop them right there and then. One month. In one month's time, the tide of death would significantly weaken. If we managed to endure that long, that was. And, when the warmer spring and summer season arrive, the dead would shuffle back to the far north once more to the land of the dead spirits in order to preserve their bodies from rotting away and to gather more demonic energy in the process. There really are a lot of convicts here, I commented. A lengthy procession of shackled together prisoners and slaves were being ushered into the Rania fiefdom at a similar time as our traveling group. They were the so-called soldiers who were assigned to defend against the soon-to-be arriving tide of death. Every single one of them were supposedly serious felons saddled with heavy sentences, such as capital punishment or life imprisonment. All sorts of convicts had been brought here, from murderers, rapists, to armed robbers they were rather well suited to serve as sacrificial tools. In a way, this was a smart and logical way of dealing with the matter at hand, but... It was a misunderstanding. I only stole a loaf of bread. I didn't kill anyone. That, that bastard Perrin, he framed me. One of the prisoners resisted bitterly, only to get beaten up black and blue by the soldiers stationed around the area. I had no doubt that there were a fair few wrongly accused people among the shuffling procession. Regardless of what the truth was though, their sacrifices should ensure that the rest of the continent enjoys yet another year of relative peace. Hang on a minute. I won't be fighting on the front lines, now will I? Since such a thing could happen, I felt compelled to get some clarification on the matter as soon as possible. The head paladin spoke up. Of course not. Your Highness. Only the prisoners will be forced to fight on the front lines. Well, that's a relief. Your role will be to heal the injured and perform the funeral rites for the deceased, Your Highness. Every year, we see around two to three thousand victims. Well, that's not a relief at all. What about other clerics who will assist me? There are about eighty priests available besides you who are also able to perform the purification ceremony. However, the soldiers will assist you with the funerals, Your Highness. Are you seriously suggesting that a measly 80 people should heal at least 2,000 people, while also performing purification ceremonies for the dead on top of that? Your Highness, if you take into account all of the undead that are coming from the land of the dead spirits, your estimate should at least be tripled. Although you might encounter a few from our side dying from overwork every now and then, It'll work out favorably in the end, Your Highness. Hey, you. Be honest with me. You're an assassin sent by the Holy Emperor, right? I glared at them with pure dissatisfaction, but perhaps wisely, the paladins all ignored my clearly discontent-filled eyes. We soon reached the fiefdom and I was immediately summoned by the lord of the place. The feudal lord happened to be a well-rounded man in his mid-forties who boasted a rather extravagantly groomed mustache. I heard that he was demoted to this place on the suspicion of diverting a portion of taxes meant for the imperial palace. Was that the reason why? W. Welcome, Your Highness. The feudal lord treated me quite affectionately for some reason. There, there. Please have some tea, Your Highness. We have other refreshments available for you to enjoy as well. Ah, you might be feeling weather-beaten, so how about taking a relaxing bath with warm water? Forget about being a feudal lord, he acted more like a manservant with how he kept bowing his waist and rubbing his hands. I already had a pretty good idea as to why he was acting so openly friendly towards me. Most likely, he desperately wished to return to his original domain by borrowing the power of the Holy Emperor's grandson, the Imperial Prince. Which was me. I've begun sensing that maybe, I used to enjoy a status far, far mightier than what I initially thought. I recalled how the villagers acted around me so far, 
then glanced at the paladins still ignoring me. Yup, they were still standing around in utter silence. Would you look at these cheeky bastards? Well, your highness. We'll prepare a warm meal for you in a minute, so. Give me a room. Your highness. I want to rest for a bit, you see. And I'd also like someone to serve me during my stay. A maid servant approached us and placed a couple of snacks and cups of black tea on the table. I looked at her with a slimy grin etched on my face. She flinched in surprise and began shivering away. Chapter 20, 013 Imperial Prince is Toiling Away Minus 2, Part 2 This caused the feudal lord to form a troubled expression on his face, then he sneaked a glance at the paladins. He said, Why your highness, that might prove to be quite problematic. An evil feudal lord wouldn't have hesitated to serve up a measly little maidservant as a sacrifice. However, what with the paladins tasked with being my monitors hanging around us during this little meeting, he wouldn't be able to do something so blatant like that. This feudal lord was really quick on the uptake, and I liked that. That's right, it would indeed prove to be problematic if a maidservant came to visit me in my room at the wrong time. That could potentially end up as a huge problem for me. Don't be mistaken. I merely wish to relax, that's all, I reassured him. The feudal lord formed an awkward smile. Aha, ha ha. I is that so, your highness? In that case, please allow me to show you to your quarters. He jumped up from his seat and called for his servant. Meanwhile, I sneaked a glance at the head paladin. He was observing me through the holes of his helm. I could just about sense him furrow his brows. That's right, take a good look, buddy. I'm still a horny fool. So, like, can you go back home and nicely convince any would-be assassin hirers? I mean, they should have plenty of competition back home already, right? Can they even afford to spare a moment to worry about a banished fool like me? I really wanted to live a simple life here. Living the life of constantly running away from bloodthirsty assassins was a fate I'd like to avoid at all cost, you know? I was soon guided to my room. A manservant, which was clearly not a woman, had been ordered to serve me while a paladin stuck close as if he would be my observer from now on. The room I was brought to was quite clean and somewhat plain. But at least it did feature a far, far cushier bed than the hard wooden board that I used back in the monastery, and there was even a fireplace to keep out the cold, too. I found this arrangement to be quite satisfactory. I turned my head and stared at both the manservant and the paladin. The latter stood like a statue tasked with guarding the door, while the former was nervously waiting for my commands. This made sense though. This grandson of the Holy Emperor was infamous for suddenly slapping servants around. Various unsavory stories of the Mang Nani Prince must have done its rounds already in this place before my arrival today. Rather unsurprisingly, the manservant sneakily covered his cheeks and anxiously waited for me. Go fetch me clean water. Water, your highness. The servant formed a surprised expression. Right. And also. MMM, get me some booze too. The paladin then sneaked a glance at me. What's the matter? I'm not even allowed to drink now. He shifted his gaze away and returned to his duty. Hey. Hang on a minute, could this guy be a bloody term my asterisk -ater instead and not a human being? Not too long afterwards, the servant brought along a bottle of liquor and some water that I requested. Oh, thanks. You can go now. T thank you, your highness. He quickly closed the door and escaped from the room. I then carefully studied the room again. This world shouldn't have hidden cameras or stuff like that, right? I wanted to make sure, but since I couldn't sense any divinity, demonic energy, or mana in the room, I should probably be fine. I went ahead and emptied the bottle down the toilet. Then, I poured the water into the empty bottle before injecting divinity into it. I'll die of overwork if things go the way I imagine. Only 80 priests were stationed in this place, and we were tasked with purification ceremonies meant for several thousands. Are you bloody insane? 
priests were supposed to be upper-class citizens in this world. But despite that, what a crazy notion of slave labor this was. I better make some pick me UPS while I still have the chance. This world unfortunately didn't have energy drinks like re asterisk BLL or BACSF. So, it would be a smart thing for me to self-create some and then drink them later on. Sure, it was tiring to create holy water, but nothing came close to reinvigorating one's body stained by extreme bouts of fatigue. 1. And I should take a closer look at this thing too. I extracted the necromancer's grimoire from the empty air. It's so convenient that my skills and the item window all function exactly like a game. What a fortunate thing it was, not having to worry about reaching the storage limit. Of course, there was a restriction on what could be stored depending on the item's size, but still, that was more than an acceptable compromise in my book. I flipped open the necromancer's records. It seemed that necromancy of this world sacrificed demonic energy and lifespan to summon the undead. This could be the reason why necromancers boasted a high level of magic control that easily overshadowed any other types of magicians. As I enjoyed the game-like attribute, I had pretty much nothing to do with the lifespan part, but on the flip side, I had seriously poor divinity control. I mean, didn't I grant blessings inadvertently back then? What I needed right now were two things one, items that either recovered my spent divinity or even greatly increased it. And two, learn to perfectly control the amount of divinity I use at any given situation. So, this thing is basically telling me to inject demonic energy into water and refine my control that way. It emphasized that breathing was the connecting chain of one's soul. Apparently, the demonic energy injected via breathing technique would allow me to exert the greatest level of control. But that's the story for necromancers, right? I mean, will it even work for a priest like me? After pouring the water into the liquor bottle and breathing into it, I was suddenly slapped in the head with a pop-up message. It said that blessing had been activated. Subsequently, I now got myself a new bottle of holy water. Compared to how anemic I felt the last time, this process felt a lot more easier. Hey! I guess there was a reward for training for the whole of last month, then. For sure, the necromancer's way of magic control was the absolute best out of everyone else. It was a day and night difference from how priests would just stupidly dump as much of their divinity they can handle in one go. But then again, this made a lot of sense your life was on the line after all so if you were sloppy with magic control, you wouldn't even last a single year as a necromancer. That's just how this profession was like. Yup, as expected of the profession stuck in the extreme end of the scale, the necromancer. This was perfectly fitting for the job class where one needed to put up lifespan as collateral before being allowed to use magic. I nodded my head while perusing the necromancer's grimoire once more. This was truly excellent. When I'm done with this sucker, I should sell it off. I was thinking that it'd earn me some pretty penny later. Ever since the zombie wave incident, I worked quite hard to greatly increase my divinity reserve so that I could survive into the future. I kept praying, even though I barely held any faith whatsoever, and tried my best to absorb as much divinity as possible. And then, I'd sneak off to the forest by myself and diligently focus on summoning various undead, thereby increasing their numbers. All to prepare for that off chance of something unsavory happening later. My current problem, though, was the potential fate of me dying from overwork in a short while. Which was unfortunately not related to all the hard work I had recently put in. The more I thought about it, the more pissed off I got. How did anyone expect me to perform funerals for thousands of people, anyway? No, hang on a minute. I pondered my dilemma for a while but eventually, shook my head. There was no need for me to diligently do what they told me in the first place, right? Besides, this place wasn't my jurisdiction, as it were. All I had to do was simply go, Agu. I'm so exhausted that I can't go on anymore, and everything should be fine after that. By pretending to be ill, I wouldn't need to risk my life by performing this so-called volunteer slave service anymore. 
to think that there was such a wonderful method to cheat the system. Nice. I should just pretend to work hard, up to a certain point. When that happens, even the paladins would have no choice but to let me off the hook. Just who was I, anyway? Even if it was just the shell, wasn't I the holy emperor's grandson? Even if they knew I was just faking an illness, none of them were in a position to force me back to work. Still. Just in case, I should still create a few more energy recovery drinks. This world was, figuratively and literally, extremely fantastic. No one knew what might happen at any given time, so it'd be wiser to get myself some insurance. While creating more holy water, I shifted my gaze towards the side. There was this one thing that kept nagging me in the corner of my mind. And that was. Yup, that's a gun, all right. It was none other than a musket rifle hanging on the wall as decoration. 013. Imperial Prince is toiling away minus 2, part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 21, 014. Imperial Prince is toiling away minus 3, part 1. I've read in a book that guns existed in this world, but I didn't really figure it'd be so commonplace. Firearms were probably the best, and at the same time, the worst invention humanity has come up with so far. Unlike weapons such as swords or bows that required one to be proficient with them, using guns as weapons of war were far easier to familiarize yourself with. As a matter of fact, a person only needed to pull the trigger to kill your opponent. However, the guns in this world were treated as more of decorations, and for a good reason, too. Instead of using gunpowder, these musket rifles relied on the concept of requiring mana to fire, which was why they were used mainly by the magicians. Did that mean only they used it, though? Nope, wrong. Whether you were a knight, a mercenary, or even a commoner, as long as you knew how to wield mana, divinity, or even demonic energy, you could potentially use guns. Many magicians and alchemists spent the past 200 or so years researching the ways to further refine this advantage of firearms. And the eventual result arising from all that was, them being simple decorations. What was the reason for this, you ask? Utterly nonsensical mana consumption. Firing just one shot consumed an exorbitant amount of mana, that's why. I read that even the most skilled magicians would exhaust all of their mana reserves after firing only about five rounds or so. It was also said that you'd need at least five minutes to gather enough mana to generate a bullet, too. Meanwhile, the firing range was even more pathetic at only around 50 meters. And so, a question related to this whole thing that required an answer, was it powerful enough to compensate for its shortcomings, then? Nope, wrong again. Right after firing, the coagulated mana would begin breaking down and scatter away in the air. It wouldn't even be able to fatally wound an enemy 50 meters away. Investing that 5 minutes in casting an AoE, area of effect, attack magic instead would actually deal a greater level of damage to your enemy. When considering the required mana expenditure, you could safely say that this method was much more efficient overall. Nevertheless, guns still existed in the world and there were two reasons for it. 1. For the purpose of dieting. There wasn't any proof of a correlation between one's fatty tissues and mana, but even so, I learned that ladies of nobility had taken up range shooting as it was apparently a good way to lose those extra kilos. Another one was with affluent nobles and their maniacally obsessive hobby of collecting stuff. The firearms served well as decorations, and since rich nobles only wanted the authentic stuff, so I assumed that magicians were probably crafting these firearms as expensive ornaments and nothing more. It seemed to me that these nobles could be pretty dumb sometimes. They would invest a hefty chunk of coin just because they wanted to put the guns on display, even though these things didn't serve any other purpose than losing weight. Well, plenty of normal people also collected all sorts of junk for the purpose of their hobbies so there's that, I guess. I wonder. How much was this particular musket rifle? I heard that each one of these things could cost an arm and a leg. Still, what a waste. If only I knew how to make gunpowder, I'd be living large as a munchkin by now. 
what could I even do? It wasn't as if every cat or dog could learn how to mix and match chemicals, and I certainly didn't think about studying the related subjects while knowing that I'd be thrown into another world. I lightly shook my head and moved to put the musket rifle back on the wall, but then, I had a change of mind after sneaking a glance around. Should I try firing it, at least once? All of a sudden, I felt unnecessarily curious. It was fun to mess around with a musket rifle of this world, but it might be even more fun to actually fire one. Besides, I figured that injecting a tiny sliver of divinity wouldn't result in anything too powerful anyway. I'd probably just scratch the furniture or some such. With this thought in mind, I sneakily took the rifle off the wall once more. Rather than shoving an iron ball and gunpowder down the barrel using a rod, this particular rifle was a breech-loading type. The reason for a lid in the chamber must have been to let off the heat accumulating inside it after firing, or so I thought after looking at the design. I took the rifle, and quietly breathed into where the bullet was supposed to go in, or in this case, mana. A bullet has been generated through the usage of Divi. You have entered divinity control state. Divine Aura has activated. The equipment will temporarily be enhanced. An even more precise bullet has been generated. Hey? Messages began filling up my head. Since I had already seen some of them pop up like this before, they didn't really fluster me, but the Divine Aura one did. One loved by the gods, or the one blessed by the gods, whatever that was one of those unexplainable powers where all kinds of modifiers found in this continent would be attached to. The Divine Aura. This ability was a supernatural power unrelated to mana, divinity, or even demonic energy. It's supposed to be treated like some kind of superpower in this world, right? Hang on, could it be that this body wielded this power even before I took over? Sure, he belonged to a super-duper important bloodline, but still, I didn't expect him to possess such an ability despite that. How mystifying! Now that I thought about it, I involuntarily used this power while facing off against the zombie bear back then, didn't I? My shovel got reinforced and I was able to defend against the monster's vicious attack. So it temporarily enhances any equipment. I guess that it's quite similar to reinforcement. Maybe that was the reason? The divinity consumption wasn't as high as I feared. Although I did feel a bit dizzy. It wasn't as bad as when I created holy water. I had no trouble moving my body afterward too. The time it took to generate a bullet was about a minute or so. That could be because I ended up making a rubbish bullet, but I had no way of knowing that yet. Even the skilled magicians supposedly needed around five minutes to do this, so there was no way that I could have done it in only one. I raised the musket rifle and aimed it at a vase resting on a shelf. I was really curious about its firepower now. I felt like a little kid experimenting with his newly purchased BB toy gun. With an expectant face, I pulled the trigger while murmuring a soft little sound effect. Bang! What started off as me fooling around? Boom! Ended up becoming a huge problem. A humongous explosion noise reverberated throughout the mansion. I fell on my ass with a dumbfounded face as I let go of the rifle. Not because I was too shocked, but more to do with the fact that I couldn't deal with the weapon's recoil. I heard servants and maids scream outside the window. They were shocked by the sudden explosion. Bang! Bang! Your Highness! What happened? In the next second, I heard the urgent voice of the paladin from beyond the door. He sounded rather different from his previous machine-like calmness. Yup! He must have been shocked silly by the explosion a second ago too. Since my response was late, the paladin simply decided to break open the door's lock. What ha! I quickly got up and pushed the paladin back out of the door before he could set foot inside. It's nothing, I responded. Pardon? But, your highness. The paladin's eyes quickly shifted inside his helm, trying to observe the state of the room. It seemed like he wanted to confirm something, so I summoned all of my strength and pushed him back. Come on dude. It's really uncool to intrude the room of a boy going through puberty, 
you know. I actually had half a mind to kick him in the shins if it meant making him retreat. Of course, I knew it'd be my leg bearing the brunt of the pain from that action due to his armor, so I could only pound on his chest plate and push him back. After finally forcing the paladin outside, I quickly shut the door. While breathing a sigh of relief, I alternated my gaze between the musket rifle lying on the floor, and the hole as big as a person's head in the nearby wall before frowning deeply. Decorative ornament, my ass. Who the f asterisk ck was it? Who said that these guns were useless ornaments only good for some diet routine? With that much firepower, a regular person or even an undead would definitely get killed in a single shot. Chapter 22, 014 Imperial Prince is Toiling Away Minus 3, Part 2 Early next morning, Paladin Harmon, who was tasked with escorting the Imperial Prince to the Rania fiefdom, got right down to preparatory work. He stared at the priests standing before his eyes and deeply furrowed his brows. There were a total of eighty of them. And every single one of them was a sly as fox type. The entire group consisted of either those currently being punished by the Humayat Academy located in the central part of the continent, or were priests who got caught cheating on the job. Harman shifted his gaze. Among these miscreants was the Imperial Prince, Alan Allfalls, currently shivering away from the cold. He's the seventh grandson of the Holy Emperor, and the Meng Nanny who tried to rape the granddaughter of an archbishop. He was the worst out of this ragtag bunch of miscreants. His infamy being widely acknowledged throughout the continent was no exaggeration, either. Thanks to this boy, even the great Holy Emperor had to suffer from severe bouts of migraine. He doesn't seem to have changed at all. Back in the monastery, Harman saw a girl near the Imperial Prince who was there with an excuse of training to become a nun. The boy also began drooling over the feudal lord's maidservant as soon as arriving in the fortress, too. Harman swore inwardly that, once this crisis was over, he'd send his full report back to His Majesty the Holy Emperor, and grill that silver-haired nun for the whole truth. He'd ask her, were you forced into this position by the Imperial Prince? Well, he's... He's changed a lot, actually. This was what Paladin Harman had heard from the villagers while investigating the Witch Morgana incident. During this simple follow-up inquiry, he got to hear more about the young prince rather than the subject of his investigation, the dead witch. Haven't you also noticed it, Sir Paladin? He changed a lot ever since that suicide attempt three months ago. I'm not sure if it's due to the mental shock, or maybe because he lost his memories. But regardless of what, it's as if he turned over a new leaf. Sure, the boy had really changed. When Harman paid him a visit back in the beginning of the banishment, the Imperial Prince tried to kick him in the nuts. And then, while complaining about the pain in his leg, the boy picked up a farming tool and tried to stab the paladin with that. It was none other than Harman himself who subdued the irate boy and then locked him up in his room, telling him to repent by praying, while drinking only water as his punishment. Well, His Majesty the Holy Emperor gave his express permission to Harman, telling the knight to do whatever he saw fit, so what he did was fine. Hell, he was even told that, as long as the boy remained breathing, it'd be alright to break his arms and legs, too. He's been doing a wonderful job as the grave keeper here. And when the zombie horde appeared, he was the first one to step up and hunt them down, too. And then. The villagers all told him similar stories with warm smiles on their faces. He protected us. Most importantly, he didn't take a break or even rest once as he sincerely performed the funeral rites of our loved ones. If you can't feel gratitude and only feel hatred for a person like him, then you're not a human being but a trash who doesn't know what kindness really is. Paladin Harmon couldn't help but deeply frown again after recalling those words. That testimony made no bloody sense. The Imperial Prince actually hunted zombies down? He personally stepped forward to take down zombies when he used to get so scared by the sight of a single mouse? And also, he turned over a new leaf? You'd only say that when the person at fault finally realized his past mistakes and repented for them. 
just because the prince was suffering from amnesia didn't mean his record was wiped clean. It wasn't as if he was absolved of all of his past transgressions. He's probably using the excuse of amnesia as a pretext to return to the imperial palace. There was a good possibility that he requested the villagers to tell a matching tale based around the opportune happenstance of the Witch Morgana incident. The odds were high. He could be trying to create a way to return to the Imperial Palace by using the achievement of capturing a witch. However, there was something off about that explanation. Morgana the witch had already decimated several other villages in the past. Even if she was a necromancer known to be weak against close quarter battles, she couldn't have been so weak that the mere villagers were able to overpower and beat her half to death. The Black Order was an organization that fostered assassins. An agent of such an order wouldn't get caught by measly villagers just because she got careless. It also didn't mean that the Imperial Prince was responsible for capturing the witch, though. Perhaps that farmer named Grill wasn't exaggerating, but actually quite strong. Even though his older age posed an issue, but well, Harmon figured that it wouldn't be a bad idea to write a letter of recommendation, so that Grill could take the apprentice paladin selection test later. Harmon shifted his gaze back to Imperial Prince Alan once more. The boy pulled his cheap blanket around him even tighter, his dissatisfaction towards the cold weather clearly written on his face. He then shot a glare back at Harmon that seemed to say, What are you looking at? Yes, he doesn't appear to have changed at all. The Imperial Prince, who loved fooling around with a woman even before the eyes of his monitor, resembled a local hoodlum. This was how the boy acted before Harmon, so what kind of even more sacrilegious acts would he be involved in when no one was looking? However, just what happened yesterday? During the previous evening, Imperial Prince Alan had a short meeting with the local feudal lord and got himself a room. Not too long after he entered it, something inside exploded. Even if the boy was a Meng Nanny, he was still the grandson of His Majesty, the one Harman swore his undying loyalty to. The prince might have been exiled, but he was also under Harman's protection, so if something untoward happened to the boy during his watch then it'd be akin to deeply disappointing that one person he swore his allegiance to. This was why he tried to break the door down and enter the room, but to his surprise, Prince Alan was fine, and even more surprisingly, the boy actually pushed Harman out of the room. But in that very brief moment, he saw it. He saw a large hole in the wall. It was a hole that featured the unique signs of a magical attack that no swords, spears, or arrows could make. Just what was that? Was the prince responsible for creating that head-sized hole? If so, how? There was no way that the imperial prince was in possession of such a powerful magical skill or even a dangerous artifact. And, with a monitor like himself around, he couldn't have secretly mastered new magic too. There were magic grimoires and sword training manuals left behind in the monastery's library, but not only did that fool of a prince not peruse them once, none of those books were low-classed enough for an amateur to master them in the span of only a few months, either. Could it be that he found a suspicious item inside the necromancer's cave? If that was the case, then things could become rather dangerous. He should go through the prince's belongings later. Paladin Harmon shifted his gaze away toward the soldiers next. They were wearing rags as their attire, but were also fitted with quite thick cloth armors too. Indeed, they weren't just regular soldiers, but convicts dispatched to the Rania fiefdom. Next to each of these people was a large rucksack, a shovel, and a water canteen. Rania's prisoners. If they managed to survive the winter here, then their sentences would be either reduced, or they could even become free men. This method was necessary to maintain a steady stream of combat personnel for this cruel and unforgiving sacrificial castle, as well as to suppress the convicts themselves. Of course, if someone wished to rebel, then... UHT. Hey, that guy's running away. One of the convicts that arrived recently in the fiefdom tried to escape in a hurry. The real soldiers fired their arrows and killed the escapee without a shred of hesitation. The remaining convicts witnessed this sight and shrunk back from the shock. What happened just now was the fate awaiting those who dared to resist. 
if you obediently endured the winter year after year, then your crimes would slowly be washed away. On the flip side, you'd be executed on the spot if you rebelled regardless of how big or small your original crime was. Because their role was to serve as sacrifices and decrease the rage of the undead so it didn't matter whether you were alive or not. The convicts were nothing more than expendable pawns. The convicts stared at the dead escapee with tense expressions on their faces. Paladin Harmon then spoke up, What are you all doing? Get rid of the corpse and distribute the uniforms. This was merely the beginning. Between the beginning of the winter and 25th of December, the date when the necromancer king died, countless undead would descend upon this fortress. The living had to build a stronghold here in preparation for that, and then, eliminate the waves of the undead, thereby stopping them from spreading to the rest of the continent. Harmon lifted up a rucksack and tossed it to Imperial Prince Alan Allfalls. This contains a special medical uniform designed to ward off the plague, Your Highness. Please put it on and join the other priests in their tasks. The young prince frowned heavily, perhaps not liking what Harmon had just told him. However, this sight only reaffirmed the paladin's beliefs. Just as he thought, the prince's dissatisfied glare hadn't changed at all. 014. Imperial Prince is Toiling Away Minus 3, Part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 23, 015. Imperial Prince is Toiling Away Minus 4, Part 1. I took a look at the rucksack the Termin Asterisk Tor Paladin threw in my way. The huge leather bag was filled with water and food, plus a sleeping bag and a shovel, rounded off with a strange-looking mask and the aforementioned medical personnel uniform. This, was basically a soldier's gear, minus the gun of course. I shifted my gaze away. What a cold wintry day it was. The sacrificial castle Rania was slowly being submerged under the white snow and the convicts were busy shoveling away all that said snow. Next to them, I could see the real soldiers busy yelling out slogans and catchphrases while jogging in groups. Not too far away, I saw other groups of convicts receiving their gear that included spears. At the same time, they were also getting all the rules drilled into their heads. This, this was without a shadow of doubt, a freaking army. That's right, a real, bona fide army base. God damn it, why are you reminding me of that godforsaken nonsense boot camp? 1. Holy sh asterisk t. Oh, dear Gaia. Why are you throwing me into this sort of trial? I'm wallowing in the pit of sorrow for having to do hard labor in my second life, and yet, you want me to join the army for the second time too? Are you that resentful of me, you cheapskate goddess? F asterisk CK me. If you're putting me through this ordeal just because I swore at you once, then you'll see. Imma slag you off for generations to come. Of course. I'd only do that sort of stuff in my head. If the goddess really existed and could hear me flipping her off, then an even worse misfortune might slap me in the face later. Just like how magicians needed to chant their spells, priests needed to worship, or even go as far as to exalt the deities they believed in. Doing that allowed them to display an even stronger level of divinity than they previously could. When considering this simple point, you could say that gods really did exist in this world. It's your overalls. Please put it on and join the other priests in their tasks, your highness. I became utterly dismayed by what the paladin said. Sure, my status and power might have been temporarily taken away from me, but he actually dared to chuck a rucksack at an imperial prince? Would you look at this crazy bastard? I heard that this guy was a pretty renowned vice-captain of the Theocratic Empire's paladin corps. I'm not sure how different the standards of this world and the South Korean militaries were, but this guy couldn't be higher than, say, a measly lieutenant colonel, or maybe even a colonel. However, seeing him focus only on me did give off the feeling of a non-commissioned officer somehow. Hey, you. I'm the Holy Emperor's grandson. If this was South Korea, I'd be like the son of the president entering the army. I don't expect you to bend over backward for me, but still, how dare you? Your itinerary includes, from 6 in the morning till 9, construction of the fortress, 
maintenance of the graves, purification of the deceased, a and d. My dissatisfied glare was completely ignored by him as he continued to mouth off my schedule. Hearing him gave rise to this sense of anxiety in my heart. There was always someone like this found in every field, wasn't it? It doesn't matter whose son you are. I'll simply stick to the field manual. You could always find people with such a mindset everywhere. Someone who didn't care about looking good to those in power to advance their careers, they would stick rigorously to their set of beliefs and toil away. Holy moly! I have such a powerful backer, and yet I won't get to enjoy a smooth sailing army life? What the freaking hell? Hey, theocratic empire! Why aren't you more corrupt? Please, do some of that military corruption thing already. And you, might as well forget about it. I spat out a lengthy groan and picked up the rucksack. By the way. Hmm? I turned my head to the side to look at a place a bit further away the Rania fiefdom city center. For some reason, I caught a disgusting whiff of a rotten stench coming from there. Are there any undead within the city too? My silent mumble to no one caused the paladin to tilt his head. What do you mean, your highness? Well, it's a bit faint, but there's this stink, a and d. It was then, a wagon emerged out from the city. And it was packed full of dead bodies. I wordlessly stared at the corpses, and that prompted the paladin to speak up. Every now and then, you'll see people dying after failing to adapt to the environment, whether it be during the process of training, or from hard labor, your highness. I heard that in reality, about double the amount of people died from hard labor than from the tide of death itself. The domain of convicts with no human rights, that was Rania in a nutshell. What a perfect way to deal with serious offenders. However, I can't just blame it on the atmosphere, though. Hopefully, there ain't any zombies hiding in the middle of the city, I said. The paladin nodded his head confidently. Something like that won't happen, so please rest easy. There may be cases of prisoners dying from hard labor, but they'll still be afforded the proper funeral process. What a relief then. I still felt this uneasy air coming from the middle of the city, but it was simply too faint. It could have been really the atmosphere or something. Why don't you strengthen the city's public order just in case? I suggested quietly. The city's public order, your highness. The paladin tilted his head, looking somewhat puzzled, but nodded his head in the end. Understood. There should be times when corpses aren't recovered promptly and left to rot unattended. If a portion of that turns into the undead, then it could spread anxiety among the fiefdom's citizens. Ah. Uh -huh. And here I was, thinking that you were an uptight fool. I guess you were actually the type who listens to other people's advice. If you don't have any more questions, please start with your task, your highness. As soon as I was done praising the man, I wanted to hurl profanities right back at him. Well, I should do what I was told, at least for the time being. I didn't want to get smart and then get saddled with even tougher jobs instead. Since I was a priest, as well as the holy emperor's grandson, my duties should be on the lower end of the toughness scale. After fully opening the rucksack, I pulled out the mask and the coat. Funnily enough, I recognized the mask right away. Hey, it's that bird beak mask. Alongside the white texture, it had two holes for the eyes, and a protruding beak it was a mask that actually existed during Earth's Middle Ages, and also an item that appeared often in fantasy games, too. I heard that people during the Dark Ages believed they wouldn't contract the bubonic plague by putting this mask on. Of course, most of them still kicked the bucket anyway since there wasn't such an effect on the mask itself. While looking at this thing, I suddenly felt that regardless of which world it was, people's minds still operated in similar ways. Wasn't there any proper equipment we could use rather than this decorative toy, though? Hey, man. Does this thing even have any special effects? It contains a filter imbued with purification magic, as well as charcoal and sand plus a few others. It can purify most poisons emitted by an undead or prevent diseases it might carry from infecting you, 
your highness. Hey. So, it's this world's version of a gas mask then? As expected, the treatment priests got was a step above that of the convicts. Even our equipment was properly sorted out too. I put on the beak mask and the fur-lined robe. After looking around, I caught the sight of other priests within my now narrowed field of view. Everyone was wearing the exact same get-up. I couldn't help but recall the army once more. If you stood in line with your head cleanly shaved, you wouldn't be able to tell who was who, and that was the exact same feeling I got right now. Please perform the same duties as your colleagues, your highness, the paladin said. Same duties, is it? The paladin nodded his head. Currently, we have quite a few who have died from the diseases as well as from overwork. Wah! Dead from overworking already? I spat out a lengthy sigh under my mask. The paladin spoke up to here before turning around to leave, then began issuing commands to the convicts. Thankfully, it seemed that he wasn't going to monitor me twenty-four sevenths. Was this his way of showing me some consideration? I couldn't help but wonder. I continued looking around and spotted the familiar villagers. There were quite a lot of people gathered here, as a matter of fact. This indicated that refugees from other villages beside the one near the monastery had also arrived in the fortress. There must have been well over several thousands that were assigned to perform all sorts of manual labor. Unlike the convicts, these villagers were law-abiding citizens of the theocratic empire so they were provided with proper winter clothing. Chapter 24, 015 Imperial Prince is Toiling Away Minus 4, Part 2 Men were either carrying heavy luggage or were maintaining and fixing up various equipment, while the women were handing out food. Imperial Prince Nim I quickly shifted my gaze to discover the familiar silver-haired, crimson-eyed girl carrying a basket. She also spotted me and quickly trotted to where I was. Maybe the cold weather was to blame, because the tip of her nose and her cheeks were all flushed pink. Whitish steam escaped from her lips as she stood wordlessly before me, her eyes wide open and waiting. Hang on, how did she recognize me when I was wearing a mask and this thick robe? Could it be that I'm the Imperial Prince was written on my back? Just before I could sneak a glance behind, she pulled something out from the basket and presented it to me. Please, eat this. It's still warm. It was a baked sweet potato. Charlotte carefully wrapped a few in a piece of cloth so that their warmth could be retained for longer before giving them to me. Oh. Thank you. Work hard, okay. I received the sweet potatoes and lightly waved my hand at her. She slightly bowed her head and went away to distribute the rest. I took a bite out of the sweet potato. So sweet, and warm too. A smile subconsciously bloomed on my lips. A little while later, I headed to the public cemetery located in the city center with the other priests. They were cleaning out the snow and digging out the burial pits. Wagons carrying corpses arrived. The convicts carefully examined every single one of them to make sure that none had been zombified, and after finishing their inspection they then carried the corpses to lower them in the pits. The priests extended their hands towards the graves, and while holding on to the holy scriptures, they started reciting something or rather. What the hell? That's the proper purification ceremony. It was actually more cumbersome and complicated than I thought. I only silently prayed for the dead as written in the books found in the monastery, but was I doing it wrong all this time? However, I did look through mind's eye back then and confirmed that all the souls had been purified, so silent prayers must have been enough. All right then. Should I get cracking, too? I'll just pretend to work a little bit before giving up halfway. Oh I I, mate. Hey, man. I stopped shoveling and looked behind me. That's when I spotted a certain group among the laboring priests that proved to be especially lazy as in, they weren't even bothering to do any work whatsoever and were actually using the corpses as chairs to sit around. They had long discarded the shovels and were busy chatting amongst themselves. I sneaked a glance at the other soldiers. For some reason, they didn't seem to care. Well, 
most of these soldiers were actually convicts and also were commoners, to begin with. These priests might be criminals in their own right, but no soldiers would dare to order them around even in this place. I slung my shovel over my shoulder and approached the group. You should take it easy, fella. It's not like we'll be rewarded for working our butts off in this damned place, anyway. A well-built boy around 16 or 17 years old said that to me. He was right about that. Forget about being rewarded, working my ass off would only reward me with sore muscles come tomorrow morning. I sneaked a glance at the paladin. He was too busy issuing commands to other convicts, to the point that he didn't seem to have any leeway to mind this side. This meant that he wouldn't really care if I kicked back and took it easy. I guess you're right. I nodded my head. The boy priest then removed his mask and took out something to eat from the rucksack. He drank some water before spitting it out. Ugh, man. Isn't there booze in this place? He glanced at the soldiers in dissatisfaction, prompting one of them to hesitantly approach us to sneakily hand over a certain bottle. Oh. Oh. Nice. That's right, fella. Goddess Gaia will bless you with her graces. Your crimes will soon be washed away. T thank you. The soldiers bowed their heads. The boy priest said some unconvincing things and chased the soldiers away with a dismissive wave of his hand. God damn it, what the EFF is up with this crap. I should have been promoted to the second year in the academy by now. To think I'd be disciplined for something so small like that. F asterisk CK. He began chugging down the alcohol. Maybe it was stronger than he thought, because his complexion reddened almost immediately and he began staggering a bit. He spoke a bit forcefully, probably worried about how he looked to the others here. He then pushed the booze towards me. Why don't you have a sip too, brother? It's pretty damn good. Well, you're only giving me this because you couldn't handle it, aren't you? He was pretty quick with his bluffs, I must say. I took the bottle since I was feeling thirsty anyway, and this would be my first time tasting alcohol ever since coming to this world too. I took off my mask and took a swig. A strong taste stung my throat and nostrils, and this heat rushed all over my body at the same time. Hiya. This was actually pretty good. Did I make a mistake by throwing away the booze the manservant brought along? It could be the cold that enhanced the booze's taste, but still. How about it? It's good, right? The boy priest asked. Yeah, it's not bad at all, I responded while handing the bottle back to him. Haha, <laughs> we should help each other out when we can, right? I can see that you're an offspring of a noble household as well. Which family are you from? I'm. The Holy Emperor's grandson. If I said that out loud here, how would everyone look at me afterwards? Would they look at me as if I was an unsightly mangnani? Or would they start prostrating before me? I was kind of getting curious about their potential reactions. I'm from a small noble family out in the sticks. Despite being curious, I decided to go with bluffing myself. Haha, <laughs> so you were a country bumpkin then. I knew it. There's no way any high-ranking folks would be sent here. The boy priest laughed loudly, prompting the surrounding priests to agree with him enthusiastically as well. The boy priest continued, All right then. Even if we're stuck in this place, getting acquainted with each other may bear fruit at a later date. Your name is? It's Alan. My pleasure, Alan. I understand that you're embarrassed about your last name so you don't have to tell me. I shook his extended hand. That's great. If you wish to spend your days here as untroubled and as safe as possible, then you gotta listen to what I say, all right? My name is Hayes, the oldest son of Count Hedron that serves His Majesty, the noble and great Holy Emperor of the Theocratic Empire. I was quite impressed by his declaration. Oh, ah. Uh -huh. So I'd really get to spend my time here relaxing without a care in the world, then? I guessed that there was no need for me to come up with other excuses now. My status and power had already been stripped off from me, 
but it'd be a different story with the eldest son from a count household. Even the paladins wouldn't dare to treat him poorly, right? I grinned brightly and spoke, I'll be in your care then. You made the right choice. I settled down on the ground. The corpses might have belonged to convicts, sure, but I still wasn't so keen on sitting on them. Hayes next to me yapped on and on non-stop. His stories made him out to be some kind of a hero from fairy tales. He kept himself busy by telling me that he used divinity magic when he was merely three years old, and was called the genius of sword when he was seven he continued to spin several tall tales that would have been better suited as munchkin web novels. I relaxed more and more while listening to his tales, only to catch the next part of the conversation taking place between the priests. Lord Hayes, is it true that you are here because the Academy is disciplining you? I heard that you decided to bestow your blessings to a lowborn girl. But rather than feeling grateful, she instead took revenge. Hayes flinched nastily and stared at that priest. The former's expression hardened quickly. Uh? That? Ah, uh, uh, well. Ha ha. You're right. Actually, it's so unfair, right? Damn, why am I in the wrong for raping a maid doing lowly chores around the academy anyway? I stared at him. Hayes must have sensed my gaze, because he suddenly exploded into a peal of loud laughter as he carried on, I mean, maids can only continue to survive because we take good care of them, no. The priest asked him. So, like, what happened? Uh? Ah, uh, that? Uh, so the thing was, Hayes began stuttering in a fluster. Before long, he seemed to have recalled something and spoke in a hurry, Oh of course I tried to lie with her. She got scared and began begging me then. Please let me go, spare my life. Ha ha ha. I got so turned on after hearing her go like that, you know? I guess I'm a hopeless pervert, Ed. I ended up slightly frowning after hearing him. He must have been bluffing from the way he said those things. But then again, seeing how he was sent here as punishment, he probably tried to rape a maid exactly like what a certain Mangnani son of a noble family did. I was in no position to criticize him, but well, I kind of found him a bit of an eyesore. 015. Imperial Prince is Toiling Away Minus 4, Part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 25, 016. Imperial Prince is Really Toiling Away Minus 1, Part 1. Spare her? It's not as if I was trying to kill her or anything. I just slapped her around a bit and pushed down on her head. I rubbed my forehead upon hearing this. Art, <laughs> God damn it. I made the wrong choice, didn't I? Why did I have to go and choose this clique out of all the others? I stood up from my spot to leave. It seemed like Hayes didn't seem to care about someone like me from the get-go, judging from how he continued to spin his yarn. I was so damn aroused by her futile resistance, you know? So, like, I tore up her skirt like this. But then, F asterisk CK, those stupid student council idiots had to show up and ruin that wonderful opportunity. And you, what a sad fate my life is. Those assholes, acting as if a girl doing lowly chores around the academy was someone important and then handing me this punishment and all. Mm, by the way. Hayes shifted his gaze in a certain direction at a girl working diligently with a group of villagers at the distance. Specifically, at a girl with silver hair and red eyes yup, it was none other than Charlotte. She might have been only 16 years old, but her calm demeanor made her seem much more mature than her age. Hayes stared at her in an entranced daze. Before long, he snickered and called out to her. Hey, girly over there? Why don't you give me one too? He spoke in an arrogant tone and beckoned her with his finger. Charlotte must have heard his voice because she made her way to him. She presented him with a still warm sweet potato and bowed her head as a greeting. However, Hayes didn't seem to care about things like some sweet potatoes, and simply stared at her intently before stuttering a bit. M.M., ah, uh, well. Uh, young M. Miss, how old? What the hell? 
you ain't even a drunken boomer, you know? I didn't expect to hear such a lame pick-up line by someone so young and eager. Charlotte didn't answer and simply stood there in silence. Hayes seemed to be mindful of the surrounding gazes as he urgently spoke up again, Hey Aya, you're really pretty, aren't you? It's almost to the point where it's a shame to let you stay as a lowly commoner. How about we talk some more after you finish work? I'll treat you to a warm cup of tea. Please work hard, sirs. Even before Hayes could say anything else, she lightly bowed her head and turned around to leave. The priests began chuckling after he got so wonderfully shot down. Maybe he got ticked off by their mocking laughter, because he suddenly reached out and grabbed Charlotte's hand with a heavy scowl on his face. She wordlessly stared at Hayes's hand, and then glanced at me. Her eyes were actually trembling. Although there weren't any changes in her expression, I could kind of tell that she felt rather perplexed by this development. What's this? You want me to help you? I scratched my head while thinking. Oh well, although I wasn't really a fan of getting involved in headache-inducing matters, she's from the same monastery as me so I should probably help her out. Also, that Mr. Terman asterisk tore Paladin wouldn't me. Even before I could step up, though, Hayes's hand was crushed. At. I ended up muttering out a stupid-sounding gasp after witnessing that sight. It hurts. A small and frail-looking hand was gradually and oh so slowly crushing a much larger and thicker hand. It hurts. It f asterisking hurts. Erg. Hayes went down on his knees. The surrounding priests couldn't understand what was going on and tilted their heads. Obviously, none of them were thinking that such a slender girl was really crushing a much larger hand than hers. Charlotte let go of Hayes and then, rubbed her hand against her clothes as if she touched something unclean just now. Please excuse me. She bowed her head again and tried to distance herself. However, Hayes quickly held his crushed hand and roared out at her, Stop right there, you commoner. Charlotte's steps came to a stop. SH asterisk T. How dare you, you lowly commoner. How dare you ignore me. You monster like B asterisk TCH. She glanced at him. Her cold, crimson eyes landed on Hayes, and he froze up instantly. T that, uh, what was it again? Why you aren't even a man in a drag, so how come? W well, aren't you a rather strong girl? Ha, huh, how absurd. Are all lowborns strong like you? I, the eldest son of a count, Sir Hayes deigned to show you a passing interest, so you should have taken it as an honor. How dare you insult me this way? God damn it. You ain't even a little kid, so what gives? I'm aware that you're a boy going through puberty, but that way of talking isn't cool even if you're scared, dude. The other priests also slowly shook their heads on the side. A series of laughter soon followed after, and Hayes's complexion reddened even further. I saw how he chose not to blindly rush forward and guessed that he was indeed scared by Charlotte and her strength that easily crushed his hand. With this, I didn't have to step forward anymore. If Mr. Eldest Son of Account decided to get smart at a later date, I should just call up that uptight paladin and say a few things to him. I mean, the Holy Emperor's grandson was lending his support to someone, so which son of account would dare to raise his fist at the person in question? Charlotte must have known this too, and that was probably why she didn't bother to confront Hayes here. If she did, then the matter would have blown out of proportions later. Yup. I should get back to work now. I raised my shovel after thinking of this. Meanwhile, Charlotte ignored Hayes and began walking away once more. The latter anxiously bit his lower lip and shouted out again, Hey, you. Both your mother and father are lowborns, aren't they? It was then that her steps came to a sudden halt, her fists tightly clenched. Her glare had gotten so much sharper now. I ignored what was happening between those two and scanned my surroundings. I really needed to get back to work, but somehow couldn't see a nice enough spot to dig. Ah ha That's right. You're just a lowborn, and that's why you will never amount to anything. 
Ha! Huh. I guess that's why you lowborns stick around this accursed land of the dead spirits. Charlotte quietly squeezed her eyes shut. She seemed to have calmed herself down because she ignored Hayes again. That was a wise decision on her part. You avoided SH asterisk T not because you were scared of it, but because it was dirty. But this action of hers only served to trigger Hayes even further. I can already tell, they won't live for long before getting killed off by the undead. Ah ha ha. I hear that half of those who die in the land of the dead spirits turn into zombies. With just one word from me, and the gravekeeper of your village, plus the resident priests, will all shut their mouths up. And you'll become an orphan, all alone in this cold and harsh land. Wowzers, he sure has a grating voice, doesn't he? Something he said also reminded me of the memories from my past life too. I slung the shovel on my shoulder and rubbed my neck. Why don't you come here and flirt with me instead? I'll hire you as my personal maidservant. With how your lowly life is right now, I can certainly improve it, at least by... Hayes reached out and grabbed her arm again. With her physical strength, he wouldn't be able to stop her no matter how hard he tried. She knew that very well. Charlotte could have simply ignored him and walked away but this time, she chose to look back at Hayes and say something. I'm already an orphan. Charlotte's curt and cold reply caused his expression to harden. Besides all that, I really gotta start digging out a burial pit for my job, but, millimeter. Ah, that's a pretty good spot. Over there should do, right? I slammed down on Hayes's foot with my shovel. His leather boot got crushed. Both Charlotte and Hayes froze where they stood. The latter dazedly looked down at his toes before raising his head back up again to look straight in my face. He seemed rather dumbfounded at the moment. What's this? It didn't hurt? I hit you at that spot so that you'd feel some pain, but I guess it wasn't as effective as I hoped. But that won't do. I mean, I stomped on you to hurt you. I raised my shovel again and slammed it back down. Hayes's complexion was increasingly getting paler by the second. As a matter of fact, cold sweat began trickling down his face now. Ah! Uh -huh. Finally, some reaction. Time to say something appropriate then. Oh oopsie. My mistake. I covered the mouth portion of the beak mask with one hand, and with the other, ruthlessly cranked the handle of the shovel currently crushing the sucker's toes. Eventually. Just as he screamed loudly and reflexively stood upright, I swung my shovel and smacked him dead in the face. Mr. Priest staggered unsteadily on his feet before falling rather lamely into the pit next to him. Oops, my hands seemed to have slipped a bit. Are you all right there, buddy? W what is the meaning of? Don't get in the way of my work and just quietly lie down there, will ye? If you're going to act like a corpse, why don't you do a proper job? I fixed my mask back in place and began shoveling dirt on top of Hayes or whatever his name was. Chapter 26, 016 Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus one, part two. This fool. What the hell do you think you're doing right now? His gang started rushing towards me. In response, I raised my shovel and pointed at them. These brave priests all fell back, clearly startled by my actions. Want me to bust your heads too? Be bust our heads. I shifted my gaze downward. I saw Hayes trying to crawl out from the pit, so I kicked him back inside. He screamed noisily while stumbling back into the pit, then shouted at me in pure rage. You son of a b asterisk tch. Do you know who I am? And? Do you know who I am? What? I squatted down and glared at the fool through the beak mask's eye holes. I said, did you know who I was before you raised your voice at me? Hayes forgot about his pain just then and shut his mouth up. What's going on here? A few soldiers and the paladin quickly rushed over to where we were. I watched them approaching and shrugged my shoulders. Hiya, what a coincidence that was. 
The foot of this dumb son of AB asterisk TCH was in the exact spot where I was shoveling, you see? I couldn't avoid it and accidentally ended up hitting him. Tisk. Tisk. Why did you have to place your foot in such a location, my man? Oh oh I I I. Sir Paladin, this insane fool hit me on my foot. You need to punish him, immediately. I'm none other than Hayes Hedron, the eldest son of the Count Hedron household. Hayes roared out, causing the paladin to glare at me through the gaps of his helm. His eyes were filled with dissatisfaction at the fact that I caused yet another incident. He probably thought I was the one at fault here. But then again, he didn't have any good impressions of me in the first place, so his reaction wasn't all that surprising. The paladin sighed and spoke up, Please, you must apologize to. Oh I I, paladin. What's your name? I abruptly cut him off. I was the grandson of the holy emperor. My status and power might have been stripped away from me after my banishment, but that didn't mean I had fallen so low to the point where I had to apologize to some no-name trash like this kid. That's right, I would never apologize to trash in my life. The one being apologized to should be me, instead. The apology for making me feel like crap, that was. TL, told from third person POV. Paladin Harmon stiffened up in an instant. He was the vice captain of the greatest knight order personally led by the Holy Emperor, the Holy Cross Knight Order. As he was someone acknowledged even by the Holy Emperor, Harmon wielded a rather sizable influence himself. Measly nobles from the remote territories wouldn't even dare to meet his glare. It was the same story for the exiled imperial prince as well. Harman was responsible for grounding the imperial prince who was rampaging around unchecked. After locking the boy up in the monastery, the paladin forced him to pray and drink only holy water to repent for his actions. The prince must have realized that Harman's status couldn't be scoffed at because he began showing a much milder attitude after this incident. His docile behavior after his suicide attempt could have been due to the memories of that house arrest still faintly lingering in his mind. That's what he thought until now, but... I asked you what your name is. The boy's voice was low. Heavy, even. Despite this, it reverberated so powerfully that his words were being engraved deep within Harmon's head. The paladin swallowed back his dry saliva. His eyes wavered and his whole body felt heavy and lethargic. No, it wasn't just him, but the surrounding air was getting a step heavier too. Harman immediately realized the cause of this phenomenon. The imperial prince's voice was thickly permeating with divinity. Oh my goddess, a voice filled with divinity? How can the imperial prince use spirit speech? Harman didn't know how to answer his own question. Meanwhile, the order the Imperial Prince had issued remained firmly rooted in his ears. Harman. I'm Harman Dayan, Your Highness. As he spoke his name, cold sweat drops began trickling down his face. Due to the nervousness, he even slightly stuttered his words. What exactly was happening here? There was a son of some noble house inside a burial pit. Then there was a girl standing around looking deeply flustered. And finally, the likely instigator of this incident, the Imperial Prince, was standing right before Harman's eyes. What happened here? No, before that. This person, is he really His Majesty's grandson? The boy was wearing a mask, but his voice matched that of the Imperial Prince. This person was, without a doubt, Alan All False. However, the atmosphere oozing out from him was entirely different than his usual self. He was completely different from the Meng Nanny, well known for his cowardice and penchant for looking down on others. In that case, Harman Dayan, speak of what my status is. The Imperial Prince's pair of piercing eyes stared deeply at Harman from beyond the beak mask. They were unwavering. Those eyes contained. This is an order. The imperial decree that none could disobey. He might have been exiled from the imperial family, and yet somehow, he still exuded the dignified and irrepressible aura that could only belong to them. As if he was entranced by it, Harman opened his mouth and began speaking, Why you re? Alan. 
All false, his voice sounded like a helpless moan now. The seventh grandson, of His Majesty, the Holy Emperor. In the end, the paladin couldn't keep maintaining eye contact with the Imperial Prince anymore and lowered his gaze. However, his answer was still more than enough to shut the mouth of the Hedron family's eldest son. The prince's shoulders lightly jiggled as if he was satisfied by Harmon's reply, See? See? The one you labeled as a country bumpkin was actually the Holy Emperor's grandson. So how was it? It's freaking awesome, right? With that, the heavy atmosphere was gone in an instant. The prince squatted down and glared at Hayes still inside the pit looking stunned. He then began forcefully poking at the bigger boy's head with his finger. Someone like you was busy calling me a bumpkin? And what else? A son of A.B. asterisk T.C.H.? Imma crack that numbskull of yours, you hear me? You heard that dude, right? S.H. asterisk T, man. I'm the emperor's grandson. How dare you raise your voice at me? Should I bury your whole family while I'm at it, ah? His current appearance was so vulgar that he might as well be a local thug rather than a nobleman. Harmon was now swimming in this powerful sense of incongruity. Right now, the boy prince looked like a typical irredeemable trash. However, he was completely different only a few seconds ago. Didn't he feel that heavy pressure that the boy exuded just now? For a moment there, he even hallucinated that he was staring at the shadow of the Holy Emperor the great hero who led a massive army to defeat the necromancer king. And that was why he involuntarily heeded the former prince's orders. Does this mean that his majesty's blood flows through his veins, even if it's only a little bit? T that, that is. Count Hedron's eldest son couldn't even string along a proper sentence after finally learning the truth. Oh, so you want your family to be exterminated, then? Hedron boy's eyes opened up wide. He bit his lower lip. He heard that the seventh grandson had no influence. Also, there were rumors of him being banished doing the rounds too. Meaning, even if the boy decided to raise a fuss here, he shouldn't be able to harm the Count's family. However, there was always the case of what if. Since he couldn't see into the future, Hayes quickly made up his mind and became cautious in his approach. He urgently lowered his head and opened his mouth. I, I am truly sorry. Your Highness, the Imperial Prince Alan Allfalls, please accept the humble apology of this lowly one, the eldest son of Count Hedron's household, Hayes Hedron. Very good. Alan nodded his head. Harmon also let out a sigh of relief while watching this sight. If the heavy atmosphere of before continued persisting, then he knew he wouldn't have been able to do anything which was why he'd be much obliged if this incident came to a close in this fashion. The eldest Hedron boy might have his toes damaged, but he'd be fine after receiving medical treatment. So, with this, everything should be over nice and ea. Hum? You only want to apologize to me, eh? Fine. I'll accept it. And now, just die. Eh and it wasn't over yet. The soldiers and Paladin Harmon quickly acted to stop the Imperial Prince and his shovel from rampaging around. That's how yet another noisy day came to its conclusion. 016. Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus one, part one and two, Finn. Chapter 27, 017. Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus two, part one. Chat. I ended up getting thrown into solitary confinement. Being locked in a prison cell meant that for now, I could only stare at Paladin Harmon through the iron bars. Hey man. What's my name again? It's Alan Allfalls, your highness. And my status. You're the seventh grandson of His Majesty the Holy Emperor. I grinned in contentment after hearing that. Well. It was my first time going on a power trip while relying on my background, after all. And you know what? It felt better than I initially expected. The end result was a bit unfortunate though, to say the least. Why is a personage such as myself rotting inside a prison? Your Highness, since you committed a crime, you need to serve your time. 
Please spend the next seven days in here. Don't make me laugh. I scoffed and addressed Harmon directly, by the way, is that Mr. Eldest son of Count Watts his face still alive? Fortunately, yes. If I really killed him, what would have happened to me? You'd be locked away in a prison, your highness. For how long? Around half a year. Oh, oh. Such a short time even though it's murder? Hat, I might no longer wield any influence as a holy empire's grandson, but I still get to enjoy some benefits, don't I? A count should be ranked pretty high up in the nobility hierarchy, too. It's a pretty good deal to relax inside a prison cell for a while, right after getting rid of human trash too. While inside a prison cell, I didn't have to lug around rotting corpses, I could even read all I want, eat in peace, and exercise whenever I want. I was the Holy Emperor's grandson, and since the feudal lord was treating me nicely, my standard of living should be guaranteed to be high in this place. Still. I should have castrated that dumbass. If you did, your highness, it'd be me shouldering the full responsibility, instead. Harman removed his helm and wiped the sweat away with a handkerchief. Indeed, this paladin would be the one at the chopping block if I really managed to kill that fool for real. He was my guardian after all. I quietly observed Harman. This dude who came across as the term in asterisk tour was slowly revealing his emotions bit by bit. I was satisfied with this progress. There were very few things in this world as fun as making a fool out of an uptight person. No need to get all sweaty, my man. If I truly wanted to kill him, I'd have gone for the head instead. I merely disciplined him a little, that's all. But why, your highness? Just because. Just because. Rather than a full answer, I formed a refreshed grin on my face instead. Harman could only massage his temples. I see. By the way, he then stared straight at me and asked, When did you learn to use spirit speech, your highness? Spirit speech. I tilted my head in confusion, and upon seeing my reaction, Harman's expression became even more confused than mine. It's nothing, your highness. Please don't mind it. In the meantime, please cool your head in here for a week. All right, I'll do just that. Ah, I'm feeling kind of peckish, so get me something to eat. Also, something to read too. History books, if you will. It reminds me of reading fantasy novels and that kinda makes me feel good. You see. I nodded my head and waved at Harmon as the paladin got further away from the prison. A week, was it? An unexpectedly long holiday landed on my lap. I scanned the interior of the prison. It was tidier than I would have expected. As a matter of fact, it wasn't your run-of-the-mill prison filled with gloomy, soggy atmosphere and an unbearable stench. I guessed that a disused storage area was cleaned out for my use. Hell, it even had a bed too. Also, there were no other prisoners, either. Other than some indistinct murmurs coming across the wall every now and then, it was rather quiet in here. It seemed that I was separately imprisoned. Meaning, a location must have been specifically emptied out just for my sake. So, although this was nominally a prison cell, it was more like a small one-bedroom flat. It gave off a cozy overall vibe. Spending a week in this place should be a cinch, then. Actually, I was in need of some me-time at the moment. Well, I was deeply engrossed in studying magic lately, you see. For some reason, it was quite fun learning this kind of stuff. In my past life, I was what you'd call, academically challenged, but now? The sense of accomplishment I'd get after learning magic and successfully using it was nothing to scoff at. Just as I extracted the necromancer's grimoire from the item window, someone entered the prison. It was Charlotte. She must have gotten permission from the paladin to enter here. Because she hardly ever showed any emotions on her face, it was tough to get a beat on what's in her mind, but at least this time, she seemed troubled from the way her forehead had all wrinkled up. I'm truly sorry. Because of me. Charlotte lowered her head. What are you on about? 
I wasn't planning on helping her out anyway. From the get-go, this girl had really quick wits about her. Even if I hadn't done anything, it was pretty obvious that she'd have come out swimmingly from that situation anyway. I always end up receiving your aid. I really had no clue what she was saying here. To be honest, I didn't think I have been specifically helping her out so far, so. Ah, was she thanking me for our first encounter, back when I saved her life. I tilted my head but Charlotte just stood there, not saying anything else while simply staring at me. I muttered with a slight pout, fine, fine. Just go and get me something to eat, will ye? Not the stuff they distribute in this place. I mean, I'd rather have the food you used to make back in the monastery. They tasted pretty good, you see. Her cooking skill was first rate. She was so good that even with just the common ingredients found in rural areas, she was able to produce something really delicious. So, with the much higher class ingredients the feudal lord handed out, her cooking should be even better than before. If you tell the feudal lord that I sent you, he should let you use the kitchen as well as some ingredient, too. I'm feeling quite peckish right now, so bring me something appropriate, will ye? Understood. Charlotte smiled gently and bowed her head. TL, in third person POV. Paladin Harmon was currently commanding the convicts outside the walls of the Rania fortress. The blizzard was so strong that he was nearly walking blind at the moment. This weather was extremely dangerous the snow piled up far too high because of the ongoing blizzard. Rania's walls were on the low side, at only 12 meters high. If the fallen snow hardened, it basically gave the undead access to bridges to cross over the walls. Which was why they needed to work fast and plow the snow away. It's been a week already. After his job was done here, he'd go and free the Imperial Prince. Imperial Prince Nim only did those things because of me. Please pardon him. The girl from the monastery actually came to see Harmon first. She explained what happened that day. Of course, he had to doubt his own ears. According to her, the one to instigate the incident was Hayes, the eldest son of Count Hedron, and the Imperial Prince merely tried to dissuade him. Rather than dissuading, it looked more like a simple act of violence to me, but. In the process, the Imperial Prince displayed a new side of him. For a brief moment there, he showed to everyone present that he still had the authoritative air and dignity that befitted the descendant of the imperial family he proved to be someone who had indeed inherited the noble bloodline. No, the boy went even further than that and he ended up using spirit speech. He loaded his voice with divinity and caused the surrounding air to become heavier, which gave the sense of sheer pressure to all those listening to him. But it seems that His Highness isn't conscious of it. Only a handful of commanders overflowing with charisma was capable of using spirit speech at will. And those who could subconsciously spit it out was even rarer, regardless of whether you were a student of magic, a believer in the divine, or even a possessor of demonic energy. Harman had a lot of questions he wanted to ask the Imperial Prince. He was really curious about how the boy could even use spirit speech, and where he learned to use it in the first place. Did something in him really change three months ago, after that suicide attempt? However, it was impossible for anyone to change their ways in such a short period of time. Harmon frowned deeply and discarded all the unnecessary thoughts out of his head. He then shifted his gaze back to the convicts busy doing their jobs. They were wielding their shovels and plowing the snow away. It's too quiet. The violent snowstorm continued to hinder his vision. It was eerily quiet and the only sound present was the noise of the winds angrily howling about. No, there were also the grunts of the convicts and their echoing shoveling noises too. This was too strange. The 25th of December. The day the necromancer King Amun had perished. It was also when demonic energy would become its strongest within the land of the dead spirits. Even then, the horrifying moans and screams died in pain belonging to the undead weren't reverberating throughout this cursed land. As a result from these days of relative peace compared to last year, the convicts were all carrying relaxed expressions. However, Harmon was inwardly worried. 
This was exactly like the calm before the storm. It was too peaceful as a matter of fact. The Rania fortress should have been visited by at least hundreds of undead already. And yet, not even a single one could be seen. Something is definitely wrong here. An event like this must be its first ever since the death of the Necromancer King. It had already been fifty years since the great hero, the current Holy Emperor, Kelt All Falls, had slain the Necromancer King. In the ensuing decades, events of the undead repeatedly gathering in the land of the dead spirits and dispersing continued every year. And on the very day that the Necromancer King died, the 25th of December, the undead should be rampaging about more viciously than ever before. However, everything was so calm that he was getting goosebumps instead. Chapter 28, 017 Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus two, part two. It might be better to report this to His Majesty right away. The current peace was just too unervingly ominous for his liking. Something was wrong. Even though he wished for this peace to be a good omen, if it was exactly the opposite of that then he couldn't sit back and do nothing about it. While thinking like this, Harman called out to the convicts. It's lunch time. Everyone, return to the fortress. They stopped shoveling, the expressions on their faces changing as if their messiah had arrived. With their shoulders hunched forward, they began shuffling towards the Rania fortress to escape from the cold. Heek. A sudden noise startled a convict, he then quickly took a look behind him. After tilting his head, he suddenly realized that his colleague, who was walking behind him, had disappeared somewhere. The convict continued to tilt his head this way and that while peering deeper into the blizzard. The falling snow was more like a thick fog at this point, almost completely obscuring his view. Eventually he spotted a distinct humanoid shape within it. The convict thought that it was his colleague and shouted out. Oh I I I. Hurry up. I'm dying of cold here. And starving too. Let's go and get something too. The humanoid shape finally revealed itself. It was a humanoid-type monster boasting a physique at least two meters tall. Various bits of its body were missing, or were simply rotting away. Its face had melted away while its back was hunched forward. Its long arms extended down to its knees, and there were unnaturally long claws at their ends. The monster looked at the convict and formed a horrifying grin with its melted face. The poor man's complexion paled in an instant. Oh, why, ah, ah. The sudden scream caused Harman to quickly turn his head. Other convicts also looked in the direction of the sound. The two-meter-tall humanoid monster had penetrated through the convict by then. Claws resembling scythes easily punctured straight through the man, lifting his body up. The undead proceeded to bite and tear off the man's neck right before its rotting eyes shifted around to look at the other convicts in the vicinity. I it's a ghoul. Run away. Oh, ah, ah. The sudden intrusion of the undead drove the convicts into panicked confusion. They began running away at full tilt. But then, many more ghouls began popping out from the thick layer of snow beneath their feet. The convicts were stunned beyond comprehension by the sudden appearance of these monsters and they began stumbling back instead. Kiiiiaa. Claws were swung and convicts died in droves. Monsters pounced on them, pushed them down, and bit them to death. The once pure white snow was quickly dyed in the crimson hue. The source of the current calamity was allowing the convicts to go outside the fortress walls to clear out the snow. Everyone, evacuate. If you wish to live, run. Even though the situation was critical, Harman remained calm. He unsheathed his sword, closed his eyes, and quietly murmured to himself, Oh, the god of Warheim! Grant this servant your power. He opened his eyes to find a ghoul's claws arriving right before his nose. Harman lowered his waist and dodged the attack, before deftly swinging his sword to sever the monster's wrist. Kaya? The ghoul tilted its head while looking at the severed wrist. Right after doing so, it looked back at Harman. But by then, his sword had already cut its head off. The headless undead monster collapsed on the ground. Harman quickly shifted his gaze away. 
More ghouls were rising up from beneath the snow covering the land. And from beyond the blizzard, others ghouls were rushing forward as well. They ran on all fours, and with preternatural agility, began hunting down the convicts one by one. There were too many of them for him to fight back. Damn it! Harman quickly turned around and made his escape too. He dashed towards the fortress as fast as he could. Even then, he didn't forget to inject divinity into his entire body while murmuring out, Oh, the god of Warheim! Grant your blessing to this unfortunate poor lamb! He spoke the words of exaltation of the god he worshipped and as if to prove that his god was answering his prayers, the divinity within him circulated even more vigorously. His legs moved much quicker than any other convicts around him. However, numerous ghouls suddenly rose up before him. These monsters that were hiding within the snow roared out and pounced on Harmon. He gritted his teeth. How were they hiding all this time? Snow had been cleared out yesterday as well. But no one discovered anything. Did they infiltrate during dawn? If so, did they really suppress their instincts even when living humans were walking around on top of them? The undead not submitting to their instincts? How could such a thing even be possible? Harman twisted his torso and dodged a ghoul's claws, cut it down with his blade, then continued dashing forward. Soon, he could clearly see Rania's straight walls. Soldiers were urgently moving in the gap of the open gate. Fire! Arrows fired by the soldiers struck the ghouls down accurately. Their arms and legs were pierced, and their bodies and eyes were stabbed through. Unfortunately, an undead with an intact head didn't know the meaning of fatigue. It would simply rush forward towards its prey without stopping. Close the gates. Harman's roar prompted one of the knights to command the convicts. Shut the gates, now. However, the convicts struggled against the pulley controlling the outer gates. They loudly cried out, their complexions pale. I it's stuck. The chains, they're all frozen up. Their flustered voices even reached Harman's ears. Damn it! I repeatedly told them not to be negligent with the maintenance, didn't I? One of the knights quickly unsheathed his sword. Step aside. He shoved the convicts away and swung his blade down at the pulley holding the gates open. The chain snapped and the heavy gates rapidly closed shut. With nary a hair's breadth, Harman slipped past the closing gates and entered the fortress. The ghouls chasing after him were squashed to death by the gate's weight. Blood and flesh splattered everywhere, and the convicts stepped back in pure shock. Meanwhile, screams resounded out from beyond the shut gates. Prop the gates! Harman roared out towards other soldiers. Get into formation! Knights, command the convicts, no, the soldiers! His bellow prompted the knights to cry out loudly as well. All personnel, get in line. Form the ranks. Go up to the walls. Hurry. The convicts quickly heeded the knight's orders. While sloppily wielding shields and spears, they hurriedly ran up to the top of the outer walls. Harman too quickly checked the status of his equipment as he climbed up to the top in measured steps. He was wondering why things were so quiet, and now, here they were. Soon it'd be the 25th of December. The day the necromancer King Amun drew his last breath on the land of the dead spirits was almost upon them. Soon, around two, maybe three thousand undead would. Harman's expression hardened the moment he arrived on top of the fortress walls. He could hear the uneasy mutterings of the soldiers near his position. Two, three thousand? No way in hell. This was more like... Even Harman fell into a state of chaotic confusion. Every year, he'd travel to this place to combat the undead menace. His enemies were the walking dead. They knew no fear and simply lost themselves to their primal instincts. Not only did they lack the proper equipment to siege this place, they also didn't know anything about battle tactics or military strategies. That's why things hadn't been that dangerous during the previous years, but... Kyoha but it wasn't the same story anymore. His eyes were now taking in the sight of an army of undead. Boom. 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 
booming beats of a war drum resounded out. More and more undead began revealing themselves from beyond the whipping snowstorm. A tottering zombie was beating on a drum made out of leather and bones. And surrounding it were weaponless zombie hordes flailing about while marching forward. Beyond them were creaking skeletons, outfitted with crude equipment, glaring at the living with their hollow eye sockets. There were roaring ghouls running around at high speeds among their ranks too. Kawik, Kiha, Keek. There were also four meter tall zombie ogres among them. This combination wasn't any different from before. However, their actions certainly were. They weren't acting compulsively at all. The ones that suffered from eternal starvation, as well as hatred towards the living, had now formed proper ranks and were on standby, perhaps waiting for orders from their commander. And this army was well over 20,000 strong. An army that, although shoddily put together, also possessed siege weapons. Harman clamped his mouth shut tightly and scanned the field with his trembling eyes. Naked slave zombies were laboriously carrying a sedan chair as the snowstorm continued to rage on. And on top of this chair sat a bizarre creature commanding this army. Oh, ye yeah living ones, hear me, fear me. It wasn't just Harman, but the other knights and the subjects of the Rania fiefdom as well as the convicts, that felt the demonic energy-laden spirit speech, undead's echo reverberate within their heads. It could drown out one's heart and awaken the emotion of fear. The complexions of the soldiers and citizens grew pale in an instant. Be envious of death, and long to be freed by it. Harman glared at the creature roaring out those words, at the overweight monster sitting on top of the sedan chair carried by the tottering zombies. It had a huge frame at least three meters tall, its body wide and flabby. It had the triple chins with noble's clothing stained with blood draped around its rotund figure. Around its thick neck, he could see a bone necklace. And as if to imitate real nobles, its white hair was all rolled up. The monster that was seemingly combined with a human and a swine used a shield placed before the chair as a serving plate. This creature treated a corpse lying on it like a slab of steak by cutting it up and devouring it. We are the judges of this world. Harman knew what this monstrosity was. That thing was an undead too. However, it wasn't just any undead, but one that existed as the final evolved form for all undead. And I'm the messiah that will save this world through death itself. A zombie would evolve to a ghoul, while a skeleton would become either a warrior or an archer. We are. The final evolved form of a zombie was. The inheritor of the god of death, Yudai's will. A vampire. This great me, the Count, shall save you all from the despair of living. 017. Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus two fin. Chapter 29, 018. Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus three, part one. The vampire Count ripped into the corpse lying on the shield and swallowed it up. A rotting right arm got chewed rather noisily. As he savored the wonderful taste in his mouth, his huge body suddenly wobbled a little. Zombies were holding up the sedan chair from below, but they found it difficult to maintain smooth balance. The vampire count clicked its tongue and shifted its eyes back to the Rania fortress. Ah, ah. I can feel it. The count could sense the aura of the living. The fresh meat it couldn't taste for the past fifty years was waiting to be plundered just over yonder. How many people were cooped up in fearful huddles over there? A few hundreds? Thousands? Maybe even tens of thousands? How fresh would their flesh and blood taste in its mouth? How much stronger would the army be after all those humans were killed off and turned into the undead soldiers? This monster had been waiting for an opportunity for the past fifty years. It started off as an egoless zombie that only moved according to its instincts, then it became a ghoul, before managing to morph into a dull Ahan, and then, to a zombie lord. Eventually, it became a vampire. Long story short, it had become an existence that was able to think and make judgments for itself. Just how long did the vampire count wait for this moment? To think that it possess enough power to command an army of undead, as well as to wield an enormous level of demonic energy too. 
the aristocratic classification among the vampires was based upon the level of demonic energy they possessed. Although this particular monster hadn't been acknowledged by other vampires yet and therefore did not earn its rank normally, it still felt confident of boasting as much power as a vampire count did. A count? No, I'm above such a rank. Look at this amassed army. Even a vampire with the marquee rank wouldn't be able to amass an army of over 20,000 undead. That's right, I'm no mere count. I'm more than enough to become the vampire lord, no, the king. The vampire count slowly stroked the necklace that hung around its neck, a skull of a mountain goat, one that was much larger than that of a human being's. This is it, the skull of the necromancer king, Amun. Here it was, the tool that transformed this creature into a vampire count. A normal zombie wouldn't even be able to become a vampire after collecting demonic energy for the next 100 years or so, and yet this skull managed to do the job in only a few decades. It helped the monster with numerous things such as, gathering demonic energy, preserving the creature's body, and strengthening it even further. Very soon, it should be able to exceed the ranks of a count and step onto the road towards becoming a vampire king. And this very moment would be the first step in its path towards kingship, something it had been preparing diligently for the past few decades. I am the monarch, the inheritor of the god of death, Yudai's will. The vampire count spread its arms wide open elegantly and exploded in a peal of bizarre laughter. Suddenly, light began exuding from the eye sockets of necromancer King Amun's skull. Demonic energy spread out seemingly everywhere. The undead, who sensed the aura of death, raised their heads up high while issuing creaking noises. Oh, my dear undead! The vampire count pointed its chubby and thick finger at the Rania fortress. Go now and punish. The monster smirked and roared out. Those that suffer the trials of life. The moment its words came to an end, all the undead moved simultaneously. The army screeched and howled as they marched towards Rania. In first person POV. It's been exactly one week since I got imprisoned here. I should have been released already, and yet for some reason, no one showed up to free me. What's going on here? At the very least, Charlotte should have already come here with my breakfast in tow. I grasped the iron bars and sneaked a glance at the outside. Oi, is anyone out there? You should at least give me something to eat. I'm starving here. It was then, I heard a noisy clamor. Hurry. Hurry up. The feudal lord, accompanied by his soldiers, was quickly approaching my location. Although he still enjoyed a somewhat rotund physique and elaborately styled beard, his complexion was as pale as one could be. The same applied to his escorts, as well. They hurriedly ran over towards the prison as if they were being chased by something. One of the soldiers quickly tried to open the cell's door with his trembling hands. God damn it! Why isn't it opening up? The frustrated soldier yelled out loudly. He was so fraught with fear that he even momentarily forgot about the fact that the feudal lord and the imperial prince were nearby. What's this? Did something happen? My question caused the feudal lord to flinch. He quickly wiped away his cold sweat and replied. I it's nothing much, your highness. Ha, ha ha ha. It's nothing much? If so, why are you sweating so profusely when it's this cold? Also. I can see that your eyes are trembling from anxiety too. I frowned slightly and checked the feudal lord's name through mine's eye. Name, Jeanald Repang, Viscount. Age, 43. Specialty, Offering Consolation, Communication Skills, Merciful. What the heck? Wasn't he demoted to this place because he diverted taxes meant for the imperial court? If he did that, then what's up with all those Buddha-like attributes? The feudal lord, Jeanneld, patted the shoulder of the frustrated soldier. See calm down, man. Yes sir? Ah. Of course. The soldier grinned bitterly before finally managing to unlock the cell door. He probably found that the scene of his lord trying to calm him down while being more fearful than he was, rather pitiful to behold. Meanwhile, 
the feudal lord forced a smile and spoke to me, W. We came to escort you, your highness. Please, let us leave this place as soon as possible. While listening to those words, I exited from the cell and headed to the plaza along with them. Next to us, I could see hundreds of the fiefdom subjects moving somewhere under the guidance of many soldiers. I naturally became puzzled by this sudden change in the fortress atmosphere. Janal then issued new commands to his soldiers, send the word out to Sir Harman that I've secured His Highness the Imperial Prince. Yes sir. This soldier must have been the real deal and not a convict, judging from the way he strictly adhered to the protocols by saluting the feudal lord properly. After doing so, the soldier quickly rushed elsewhere. Your Highness, shall we get going? Please allow me to escort you to a safer place. Just what is going on here? I scanned my vicinity once more. Soldiers were busily moving about in the streets. Some of them were definitely evacuating the citizens, while others fully kitted out in their combat gear, were hurriedly running in the opposite direction. It's because of the tide of death, your highness. The tide of death? Ah, that's right. It's almost the 25th, wasn't it? Indeed this would be when the undead would grow even more vicious than ever before. I thought that it's not an event worthy of this much hullabaloo, though. Didn't the information say that we should be fighting against three or maybe four thousand undeads at most? Besides, those monsters didn't even possess siege weapons and only relied only on their base instincts, too. As long as you stayed behind the fortress walls, it shouldn't be all that dangerous. That's right. Those monsters were such pushovers that even the shoddy walls and convicts without that much training could easily stop them. Unfortunately for me, though, Viscount Janald sighed helplessly and replied as if to put an end to my naive thoughts. The situation is completely different this time, Your Highness. Their scale is on another realm altogether. Okay, so. How many showed up, then? It's over 20,000. In the past week. No, this is merely the number that showed up today, Your Highness. All of them made their moves simultaneously today. I became utterly speechless upon hearing this. What the hell? Wasn't it supposed to be safe if you just remained behind the fortress walls? Whatever the case may be, let us leave together, Your Highness. Although it is unlikely, the fortress could get overrun so I must escort you to a safer location before it's... My lord. A knight hurriedly ran up to us and whispered something in Janald's ear. We, we're surrounded. There are about three thousand undead monsters waiting for us near the rear gates, my lord. Have they attacked yet? No, but as implied, they are on standby. It's as if they are waiting to devour anyone hoping to evacuate, my lord. What the hell, so it's really dangerous now. Kahum, your highness. How about we return to my mansion? We shall. Swoosh. Kabuhum. Chapter 30, 018. Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus 3, part 2. Right then, something large flew in and crashed into a nearby large house, thereby rudely interrupting Janald in the middle of his words. Bricks tumbled down as debris flung about everywhere. Both Janald and I flinched at this sudden disaster. At first, I thought it was a large boulder or something. But as it turned out, it was a lump of meat instead. It began wiggling before breaking apart into smaller pieces. The intertwined arms and legs reached and touched the solid ground. The once meshed together bodies began crawling on the soil, trying to free themselves. Zombies staggered back up to their feet. The numerous pairs of crimson eyes were looking around, their slack jaws bobbing up and down. I was so stunned that I ended up muttering involuntarily, my eyes wide open. What the hell? Did they really catapult zombies inside? Uh. How did these undead get inside the territory? Even the feudal lord was making a dazed, lost expression. It's the undead. Chaotic screaming soon resounded out. Citizens fell into unchecked panic and began running away in all directions. This was bad. 
If these zombies managed to hunt down the panicking citizens, then a lot more undead would start roaming around within the interior of the fortress. It already sounded like the undead outside the walls were plenty dangerous enough, so it'd be game over if the inside was filled up with them too. Get into formation. Soldiers quickly gathered around to fight against the zombies. W wait. Listen, everyone. This place is safe. It's dangerous to go anywhere else. Hurry, head towards my mansion. Viscount Janald shouted out at his citizens. However, they failed to hear him after fear took control of their hearts. He gnashed his teeth and spoke to a knight, I shall entrust you with a new task. Protect the denizens and guide them towards my residence. But my lord. We're here to protect you. I'll be fine. What's more important is for you to protect them first. Janald's voice got louder. The knight quickly bowed his head. He then took a portion of the soldiers away to rush towards the panicked citizens scattering in all directions. Please rest easy, your highness, Janald said as he unsheathed his sword. I didn't say anything and simply stared at him. Other than their high physical strength, zombies are weak, you see. How dependable you sound right now, mister. If we use their sluggishness to our advantage, we can easily subdue. Janald was saying these things to calm me down, probably. But. Boom. Cough. Cough. The doors to many houses shattered open one after the other. I quickly shifted my gaze beyond the open doorway of one house, only to discover a hole in its floor and the droves of undead emerging out from within said hole. These were undead with melted faces, thin and spindly bodies, long arms and claws resembling scythes. They were ghouls. The feudal lord, Viscount Janald Repang, dropped the sword in his hand. The dependable air he exuded just a second ago was now gone, his complexion now paler than a sheet of paper. He was suddenly jolted awake from his stupor and quickly picked his weapon back up. P please rest easy, your highness. E even if it's a ghoul, as long as we stay sharp. Sorry, but I don't think I can trust you anymore. I massaged my forehead, recalling the aura of death I sensed a week ago. It seems that what I sensed back then must have been these guys. To think that they would show up through the underground tunnels. Kururu Rug. The jaws of the ghouls clattered noisily. Their gazes were now focused on the soldiers as their disfigured eyes formed chilling smiles. This was an expression one would make after discovering delicious prey. On the other hand, the soldiers were shrinking away like a pack of rabbits that ran into a vicious predator. I squeezed my eyes shut. It seemed that my relaxing week-long holiday was an omen of things to come. Our dear goddess Gayanim must have been dying to put me through hell from the looks of things. In third-person POV. Uh. Uh. In front of them, zombies. In the rear, ghouls. The soldiers hurriedly faced behind them right after judging that the ones appearing there possessed a higher degree of danger than regular zombies. Numerous ghouls began exploding out of the houses to pounce on the location of the soldiers. A man was forced down, then his shoulder was pierced through by a raised claw. Oh wow. Kill it. The other soldiers thrust their spears out and stabbed at the figure of the ghoul, only for another one to rush in and crash into them, flinging the human soldiers away. It then viciously swung its claws everywhere. The formation was breaking down. Gather around. Don't break the ranks. We need to drag in the injured. The soldiers showed an immediate reaction after hearing Viscount Janald's shouts. Which wasn't surprising since they were properly trained formal soldiers, and not some ragtag bunch of convicts. In other words, they were true elites who had enough real-world combat experience and had undergone training to deal with all types of undead monsters. They quickly created a circular formation with the feudal lord and the imperial prince as their center. The first line wielded shields and swords, while the second was equipped with spears. The feudal lord Janal dragged in one of the injured, tore off his own clothing to stem the bleeding and stop it from endangering the soldier's life any further. We're in danger. 
his body continued to tremble in fear at the situation laid out before him. What should he do? What could he do, realistically speaking? He was just a feudal lord who ruled a small territory in the frontier. It had already been two years since he got demoted to this place, yet he still hadn't gotten too familiar with the land or his job. He felt lost with not knowing how to command the troops in an event like this one. If only an experienced knight was alongside him, that could have been a huge relief. Unfortunately, he already sent that one away due to the severe shortage of manpower, all in order to combat the zombies trying to invade the fortress. That meant that he now had to take command. But I... The inside of his head was as blank as a fresh sheet of paper and he had no clue what to do next. It was then, the group of undead finally pounced towards them. A zombie bit into the shoulder of a soldier. By relying on its physical strength, it forcibly dragged the poor man out and began biting into him. Oh wow! His shoulder was torn up, skin, muscles, flesh, all of them ripped away as a fountain of blood sprayed out. H how can this be? Wh what can I? Janald fell into a state of panicked confusion. Oh wow! Oh wow! One of the injured soldiers grunted in pain and wobbled unsteadily. He forced himself to maintain their formation, raising his shield up no matter what happened. The undead focused their attacks on the injured soldier, attracted by the stench of approaching death. They grabbed onto the shield and tried to break the formation by yanking it away. The supporting soldiers behind him quickly thrust out their spears and pierced the undead to incapacitate them. However, Different zombies grabbed onto the weapons and continued their attacks. The shield-wielding soldier should have lent his own support by swinging his sword by now. Unfortunately, he couldn't raise his weapon due to the injured shoulder. A and D. The zombies didn't miss this opening. Kairug. The undead monsters reached out to rip the shield away. Four of them grabbed it at the same time. The soldier gritted his teeth and did his best to hold on but as expected, he alone wasn't going to be enough. Just before the shield was torn away from his grasp. Plague of debilitation. Wide area blessing has been activated. All of a sudden, the hands of the zombies that were holding onto the shield began melting away. Kyrie. These zombies staggered back ungainly. They stared at their arms that had already melted down to their forearms, then shifted their gazes back to the soldier. The human who was almost at death's doorstep began emitting a bright glow. His torn shoulder ballooned up and exploded, the sign of the after-effect of divinity forcibly interfering with demonic energy trying to invade one's body. A short while later, the soldier's deeply gouged body part rapidly filled up with muscles, strands of flesh quickly growing like dancing tentacles. New skin instantly covered everything up after that. Was that all? Similar things were happening to other soldiers as well. The wounds that were inflicted on their bodies while they maintained formation healed up at a visible rate. Their fatigue was also getting washed away in just a few moments, as well. Then, bright light glowed from their shields, swords, and armor. Their wavering minds recovered in an instant. The nearly dying soldier couldn't figure out what just happened and simply stood around in a daze. Suddenly, he noticed a ghoul swinging its claw at him and reflexively raised his shield to defend. The claw crashed into the shield, bouncing away before shattering apart into pieces. Kairuk. The one to get flustered wasn't the ghoul, but the soldier instead. I I blocked it. 018. Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus 3, part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 31, 019. Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus four. The physical strength of a ghoul was said to be equivalent to four adult men. However, this soldier was able to easily defend against an attack from such a monster. But, but how? The soldier shivered after sensing an aura permeate within his body. He felt light. All of his wounds were healed too. And, in addition, he even felt much stronger than ever before. He sensed the divine aura emanate behind him and shifted his gaze towards it. Right beside the feudal Lord Janald stood the Mangnani Imperial Prince. 
No one knew where he got it from, but he had stabbed a shovel down on the ground while emitting countless particles of bright light from his whole body. The boy prince then muttered with a fed-up expression, Please, please be nice to me at least this one time, please. His voice contained some hints of resentment, but the soldiers couldn't figure out who those words were meant for. However, they were sure of one thing. This incredibly powerful blessing had to be something their imperial prince brought to reality. This caused the soldiers to fall into a pit of confusion. Be but, how can the imperial prince use such magic? Wasn't he an irredeemable trash and an inept mangnani? These soldiers encountered many priests come and visit the sacrificial castle for the past several decades. That even included some high-class priests who possessed amazing abilities as well. But even then, not one of them was able to cast a blessing of this caliber and not only that, over such a wide area too. Besides all that, was the blessing spell supposed to last this long? It wasn't just one's body that got blessed swords, spears, shields, and even armors, every single one of them was enveloped in divinity. It was a wide area divinity magic, plus, it had enough power to imbue itself into inanimate objects too. W. What is the meaning of? All of the soldiers carried disbelieving faces. Even then, they began recalling a certain tale they heard while growing up. The Necromancer King, Amun. The king of the undead who led a massive army of several hundred thousands. And the great hero Kelt All False, who defeated Amun fifty years ago. The imperial prince behind them was the grandson of Holy Emperor Kelt All False a boy whose veins were flowing with the blood of the great hero. This immense and beyond measurable divinity must have come from that noble bloodline. You lot, fight hard. I'll be casting all the heal you can handle like a petrol station pump, all right. The soldiers weren't sure what the prince was yapping on about. However, they still could feel the power flow within them. A hero's grandson was watching them from behind. The descendant of the great hero responsible for killing the necromancer King Amun was now protecting them on this very land, the land of the dead spirits. At this very moment, confidence overflowed in them as if they had all become the fearless knights fighting alongside the great hero. Oh, oh oh. The soldiers all loudly bellowed on. Kaiiiaa. On the other hand, the undead were screeching out. Soldiers tightly grasped their shields and lowered their postures. Ghouls rushed in and zombies staggered quickly towards the human soldiers. Soon, the waves of undead collided with the wall of living. Shields were forced back. Don't falter. Hold the line. The supporters who were standing behind the first line shouted out. A soldier on the front lines holding a shield gritted his teeth. This isn't a problem. Indeed. Nothing could stop him. Because. Fewoob. Because, they were no longer regular soldiers. His feet firmly planted on the ground faltered a little but he managed to withstand the assault. A ghoul pounced and swung its claws at the soldier to rip the shield away, and yet, he shoved the monster back instead. The ghoul lost its balance, its arms flailing about ungainly in the air. Oh my goddess! Did he just shove a ghoul back? The supporting soldier at the back was also stunned at what he just witnessed but still didn't forget to quickly thrust out his spear. Stab. The spear blade penetrated through the ghoul's flesh with goosebump inducing ease. Kee After the weapon was pulled out, a huge hole opened up in the ghoul, and ash began falling out from it. The monster howled in sheer pain, and while grabbing its wounded shoulder, quickly backed away before emitting a loud screech filled with wariness. The soldiers who saw this sight all had their brows shot up high. It can feel pain. An undead felt pain? The supporting soldier looked at his spear. Particles of gentle light were slowly leaking out from the weapon. They were supposed to mere soldiers. Not knights, but measly grunts. Obviously, they had never learned how to utilize mana nor were they taught to use divinity. Simply put, they were trained only to rely on their physical abilities. But now, they were wielding weapons draped in divinity, almost as if they had suddenly become paladins. Ha! Ha ha! Ha ha ha! 
The soldier involuntarily laughed out loudly. What the heck is this? I, I can use divinity. The rest of the soldiers shifted their glares at the monsters. The zombies and ghouls that scared them before now looked weak and pathetic. On the flip side, it felt as if they had really turned into the objects of their yearning, the mighty paladins. We can do this. Indeed, they could. We can win. Indeed, they could. All of the soldiers roared out together. They didn't even bother to remain in their formation anymore. The feeling of adrenaline and excitement made them rush out from their ranks. With speeds they themselves could scarcely believe, the soldiers quickly arrived before the zombies and ghouls to swing their weapons. Numerous blades sliced past the flesh of the undead. It was as if they were slicing tofu, their weapons cut down their enemies so easily. As the undead's flesh cracked apart, their body parts burned away from the divinity, becoming ashes while scattering away. Ha ha ha! The soldiers grew beyond confident and straight into the realm of arrogance. It was no longer time for the undead to hunt the living, but the living soldiers to hunt down these infernal undead instead. As a soldier thought like this, he sensed a certain presence behind him and quickly took a look behind. Hey! His head flew away, a surprised expression forever etched on his face. The other soldiers flinched and quickly shifted their gazes. It was a monster with a height of 2.5 meters, in its right hand was a longsword, while in its left, its own head. An undead knight kicked out in full plate armor stood imposingly. He eek. The soldiers discovered the presence of the dull Ahan and cried out in panic. Only then did they wake up from their temporary delusions and go straight back to reality. It was then, someone stepped on a soldier's shoulders and leaped up. Hey! The bladed edge of the shovel gleamed under the light. The imperial prince swung his shovel with a sharp and focused glare in his eyes. However, the dull Ahan easily smacked the shovel away. What the foo? The imperial prince was flung into the air. Once Janald witnessed this sight, he hurriedly shouted out, P protect his highness, now. The soldiers quickly recovered their wits and caught the prince as he fell back to the ground. M. Maintain formation. All of you, wake the hell up. Janald's loud orders brought the excited soldiers back to reality. They were just regular soldiers, not real paladins who could display overwhelming martial prowess against undead monsters. Once they realized this fact, fear quickly filled the soldiers up again and they urgently retreated. Gooooooha! The Dullahan's head in its own left hand suddenly exploded out in a bizarre howl. Its massive long sword was raised up high, before smashing down. Heo. Two soldiers within the formation raised their shields and defended against the long sword together. As the heavy attack landed, the soldiers wobbled unsteadily. The dull Ahan swung its sword once more, this time slicing upwards. However, the monster's second attack was defended as well but the shields ended up developing noticeable cracks. The soldiers who ably withstood the ghouls and their vicious attacks couldn't endure the strike and were lifted up into the air, before crashing back down on their rear. The formation was broken and a huge opening was created. The spear-carrying soldiers behind became deathly pale in an instant. S stab that thing! With these words, the panicking soldiers grasped their spears tightly and thrust them forward. The weapons enhanced by divinity broke past the armor and pierced into the monster. The dull Ahan howled out in pain, but it didn't stop swinging its sword in every which way. God damn it, that stinking little. The imperial prince jumped back up to his feet and tried to rush forward. However, Janald hurriedly held him back. No, your highness. Our opponent is a dull Ahan. The headless knight. It's in another realm compared to the ghouls. Janald quickly shut his mouth up because the boy prince frowned and then suddenly extracted something out of his inner pocket without saying anything else. The feudal lord's eyes widened after realizing what the imperial prince had taken out. Somehow, a long, stick-like weapon came out from the prince's pocket. It was rather shocking to see something that shouldn't fit the volume of the small pocket emerge so nonchalantly like that, but what shocked him even more was the type of the weapon itself. It was, a rifle. 
What was he doing with that decorative piece? Guo. The ghostly glare in the Dolahan's eyes burned fiercely. When it swung its sword again, two soldiers were flung away helplessly. The formation broke down once more, which enabled the ghouls and zombies to go on the offensive again. The Dolahan raised its head and snickered derisively. Its dead eyes shifted around, until it spotted a small framed boy among the humans. Kyirik? Just as the monster realized that the child was pointing a long stick at itself. A blinding flash of light exploded, and at the same time, the Dolahan's head exploded as well, only to scatter away as bits of ashes. With its head gone, the Dolahan went down on its knees and toppled weakly forward. Thought as much, shouldn't have stepped forward. The Imperial Prince must have been feeling exhausted because, while still holding onto his musket rifle, he plopped down on the ground while tutting unhappily. As he stood on top of the fortress wall, Harman swallowed his dry saliva. It was well known that the positive field repelled the demonic energy, while the negative field attracted it. As long as the sun blazed overhead, an undead couldn't exhibit that much power. However, even that is disappearing. Harman looked up at the sky. The violent snowstorm accompanying the black clouds was blocking the sunlight almost as if to devour the sun itself. He could sense a faint trace of demonic energy from them. These dark clouds were most likely a fog created by the vampire. Not only that, the sun is about to set too. The battle that commenced in the morning showed no signs of ending any time soon as evening approached. Boom. 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 A zombie wobbled as it continued to beat the war drum. Every time the drum made out of human hide resounded out, zombies and skeletons screeched and howled out in rhythm. Fire! One of the knights issued his command and the convicts quickly fired arrows and crossbow bolts. The advancing zombies and skeletons were bombarded with countless arrows. The monsters raised shoddy shields up to protect their heads. Soon, the falling arrows penetrated their various body parts arms, legs, even their torsos. Monsters faltered and fell, or even knelt down from the impact. However, that was about it. The arrows and bolts couldn't pierce past the shields. No, some of them did, but only went as far as going through the monsters' arms. None were able to touch their heads. Normally the undeads were not able to run, yet, they advanced with quick steps and reached Rania's outer walls. By using ladders made out of wood and bones, they began climbing up. Kaiik, Keek! Stop them! The arrows and bolts were now aimed at the zombies and undead climbing up the ladders. The helms of the monsters were finally pierced as they tottered unsteadily before falling back down. More undead blankly stood at the bottom, and waited for their turns while protecting their heads with shields. They knew no such thing as fear. They didn't feel any pain either. No, they simply moved according to the orders given. If their heads weren't accurately struck, these monsters would simply continue to climb up the walls. This was the essence of an undying army. And that's what made the undead such troublesome enemies. Damn it. Harman watched this scene unfold and spat out an expletive. The other side was completely ignoring their own safety. As long as the heads filled with demonic energy weren't destroyed, these undead monsters could move again and again. So, the enemy was taking advantage of this situation by going for a drawn-out war of attrition. No, wait. The real problem isn't them. The catapults noisily shook about among the zombies. At the same time, something large flew in and fell inside the fortress. Harman shifted his gaze over to the landing area. A large ball made out of something destroyed a house and continued to roll forward on the ground. A short while later, it split apart and humanoid creatures scattered in all directions. Zombie projectiles. What flew in wasn't some boulders used to destroy the walls and equipment, but it was a lump of rotting flesh. Zombies, in other words. God damn it. Harman looked at the far off distance outside the fortress walls. Kiwohaha. The four-meter-tall giants, zombie ogres, continued moving. They scooped up the zombies swarming around them, and as if to create an anagiri, 
began shaping their fellow undead into a ball. Noises of bones and flesh being crushed from the ogre's strength resounded out loudly. In some cases, zombies exploded while rotting blood dripped out too. The zombie ogres then loaded the masses of flesh onto the catapults. After this was done, the creaky skeletons tugged and wounded back the pulleys, before letting go. Quarriru Ruk. The pulleys turned and the catapults shot forward. Once the soldiers witnessed this spectacle, they freaked out in despair. Oh oh, my god! A portion of the catapulted flesh crashed into the outer wall and crumbled down below. The ball of zombies bunched up together, split apart, and scattered to the ground. KK, Kaiik. After landing inside the fortress walls, these zombies started moving again despite their crushed limbs. They staggered back to their feet and dispersed in all directions. Stop them! Numerous soldiers desperately thrust their spears out and defended against the zombies climbing over the fortress walls. There was a good possibility that the terrified regular citizens would get devoured without offering any resistance or be reborn as more undead. Use the ballistas and stop those things. The convicts quickly took aim with the ballistas installed on the outer walls. Huge bolts were loaded and quickly fired at the zombie ogres. Some brushed past, while other shots landed accurately on the ogres' bodies, but such a thing wasn't threatening enough for the undead. The zombie ogres wobbled only for a little while, and then, simply ignored the bolts penetrating their bodies and continued scooping zombies up to load them onto the catapults. Harmon gritted his teeth at this sight. With how things were, he couldn't even claim to have locked the gates. Enemies were continuously streaming into the Rania fortress's interior, after all. At this rate, we'll be overrun. His glare shifted over to the vampire count once more. The corpulent monster was simply roaring in laughter atop its sedan chair. We need to stop them, no matter what. At the very least, we need to stall for time until the Empire learns of the situation in this place. Until they send us reinforcements. However, Harman still couldn't think of a way. A minimum of two weeks would be needed before the Theocratic Empire learns of this situation. By then, this fortress would have been completely overrun. Just as he clenched his fists out of sheer frustration and rage, a certain girl brushed past his front. Harman flinched and quickly looked at the girl with silver-white hair. 019. Imperial Prince is really toiling away minus four fin. Chapter 32, 020. Imperial Prince is bestowing divine protection minus one. The silver-haired girl ran around assisting soldiers while carrying sheathed swords in her hands as well as a quiver full of dozens of arrows slung on her back. Harman became rather stunned, and couldn't help but dazedly stare at her carrying all these equipment that even grown men would find difficult to lug around. For a slender, frail-looking girl to do something like this, her physical strength and stamina must have been quite considerable. But, wasn't she a daughter of a simple farmer? He knew her as both the daughter of Grill the farmer, and as a nun serving in the monastery where the imperial prince had been staying. She was lending her support to those soldiers currently doing their best to protect the citizens who failed to evacuate to the feudal lord's mansion in time and remain stuck near the city's outer walls. Her focus was on delivering the necessary equipment or healing the injured. Harman could only smile bitterly at this. Even the child of a farmer, despite not being a soldier, was giving it her all. Yet how dare he stay weak and unfocused like this? We can endure. We will defend against them. And in the worst possible scenario. Harman shifted his gaze away. Several hundreds of undead were surrounding the vampire count like a defensive wall. I'll break past that and cut the count's head off myself. Harman tightly clenched his fist. But then. The zombie projectile landed in the area behind the silver-haired girl. They rained down from outside of the wall, on top of it, and on the inside right after. Harman flinched and hurriedly searched for her. Because of the zombie projectile, all of the soldiers and convicts on top of that part of the wall were thrown down to the ground below. There were many zombies starting to crawl back up to their feet behind the girl. Damn it! Startled by this sight, 
he quickly unsheathed his sword and rushed towards her position. In the meantime, she sensed movements behind her and looked back. A zombie blankly stood around, looking down at her. She must have been so surprised because she ended up dropping the swords and arrows she had been carrying. What are you doing? Run, child. Harmon roared out, but the girl didn't budge. Without a doubt, she must have been terrified silly. She quietly sized up the zombie. In the next instant, the undead monster finally moved. Its jaw opened wide as it reached out towards her. Damn it, I won't make it. Harmon gritted his teeth. I shall use divinity and then... Oh, the god of Warheim. Grant your power to protect a poor lamb. As divinity rushed out of Harmon's body, white particles wrapped around his arms, legs, and his sword, increasing his speed greatly. Just as he tried his best to reach the girl, her eyes suddenly became as sharp as a snake's. She picked up one of the fallen swords and rolled on the ground to evade the zombie's reach. While maintaining her steady breathing, she moved the weapon to her rear and unsheathed it. Oh, the goddess of mercy and love, Gaia. Although faint, her sword was now emitting gentle light. Harmon's expression froze right away even as his legs were still taking him closer to her. Grant me the power to protect your precious one. After kicking the ground and powerfully pouncing forward, she rapidly dug into the zombie's unguarded torso. Her right leg was planted on the ground, and using it as a pivot, her entire body spun 360 degrees. Her blade easily sliced the zombie's head off. That strike was so clean and fast that it left behind the sword's afterimage in the air for a moment there. Only then did Harmon's steps come to a stuttering halt. Her attack was both clumsy and shoddy, almost as if she learned to imitate the movements by looking at a sword training manual. He felt that she managed to execute the unfamiliar sword technique just through her sheer strength alone. However, it was rough, but at the same time, truly sharp. As if to display her explosive power, two-thirds of the zombie's severed neck was cleanly cut through, but the remaining portion looked serrated and rough. It seemed like she had to forcibly cleave through the rest. The zombie's head rolled around like a ball near her feet. The headless creature staggered ungainly before finally faltering down on its knees and crashing to the ground. Harmon's eyes twitched as he took a look at the zombie's neck. That was definitely... It was the Imperial Swordsmanship, passed only through the ranks of the Holy Cross Knight Order that protected the Imperial family for thousands of years. How could a girl from a rural village use the Imperial family's sword style? The girl, Charlotte, looked at the dead zombie and sighed in relief. Her heart was still pounding hard. Although she froze a little due to the fear, she still ended up pulling through in the end. My training, it was worth it. She briefly recalled the contents of the books back in the monastery records that contained all sorts of techniques known to the Imperial family. They were placed there so that the exiled Imperial Prince could at least try to learn them. Of course, he only cursorily glanced at them before completely giving up on learning any of it. What His Highness has failed to do, I can do it in his stead. Feeling elated by this achievement, Charlotte turned around only to spot Paladin Harmon standing still. Is something wrong? She tilted her head and asked him but Harmon simply stood there frozen stiff. We, we won. The soldiers who were protecting the feudal lord's residence looked at the pile of zombie and ghoul corpses right before their eyes. Even though they had a few casualties, it was still a miracle for these regular soldiers to win so convincingly against ghouls and a dull ahan. I really thought I became a paladin just now. The soldiers spoke in exhilaration while looking at their own bodies. The divinity seeped out of them as if it knew its job was over. However, they still couldn't calm down from the high they were feeling after living the dream of becoming a paladin for a brief while. The one who felt really confused and flustered here was Janelle, though. He was a noble well-tuned to the affairs of the ruling class, which was why he heard more stories about the imperial prince than anyone currently present here. His reputation says that he's easily scared, extremely lustful, and an incompetent child who doesn't even know how to properly wield divinity, but... 
Easily scared? A kid using a shovel to attack a dull Ahan was named a scaredy cat? No, that would be an act of insanity. And he didn't know how to wield divinity? Oh my god, just how high are the standards in the imperial family that they judged the seventh imperial prince as an incompetent failure? Someone who can't even use divinity. Could it be that the blessings from the science of the imperial family can heal hundreds of people at once, a and d? Perhaps even revive a dead person? Is it something of that scale? Could it really be like that? Jeanald inwardly clicked his tongue. He thought that such a thing was nonsensical, but when looking back at the level of divinity the imperial prince displayed earlier, his imaginations didn't seem so outlandish anymore. Hell, he even began thinking that all those tales from fifty years ago, about the legendary feats the holy emperor had achieved, couldn't have been baseless fantasy anymore. Good. Utilize this momentum and evacuate the rest of the residents to my mansion right now. Escort His Highness the Imperial Prince as well. Jeanald wiped the sweat off his brows with a handkerchief before shifting his gaze to the Imperial Prince. He wasn't there. The feudal lord was stunned by this sudden turn of events and quickly scanned the surroundings. He called out to some soldiers to inquire about the prince's whereabouts. My lord, you wish to know where His Highness is. He was definitely heading off somewhere along with a company of soldiers. I thought he obtained permission from you, my lord. He went with some soldiers. Jeanald asked. Yes, my lord. Uh? Why yes, he, definitely did. But, uh? The soldier's eyes kept looking around in confusion even as he spoke. He could see that the number of soldiers in front of the residence was the same. However, only the corpses were gone now. But then, the prince left with a company of soldiers? Jeanald and the soldiers' expressions turned blank, almost as if they had fallen for a specter's spell. But this lasted only for a second as Jeanald realized that the prince could be in danger. He started shouting out loudly. Ten of you, follow me. We must locate his highness. The feudal lord and his soldiers hurriedly set out into the city to find the imperial prince. T.L. Back to first person POV. Give me a freaking break. I gulped down the holy water and discarded the empty bottle. How many have I drunk so far? Maybe around five bottles? Although I feel grateful to be alive, I also feel really bloated right now. Somewhat like how energy drinks were supposed to work, I sensed the divinity charging back up inside my body. I continued walking around the interior of the city and chased after the stench of death. Quoo! A nearby door shattered and a ghoul jumped out. Its torn mouth opened wide while its claws were ready to cut me down. Too bad. Kai Irik. The ghoul found itself suspended in the air. After casting its gaze lower, it finally discovered dozens of spears stabbing through its torso. I looked at the dozens of dead spirit soldier units surrounding me. They were kitted out in the same outfit as the Rania fiefdom soldiers. Since they were wearing armor, their faces were hidden behind veils and helms. Now normally, I'd have summoned skeletons created out of divinity. However, I tried to conserve my divinity reserve and so, ended up recycling the available corpses with my skill, which led to the reanimation of these undead with their hides fully intact. The spear blades permeating with divinity in them caused the ghoul to shiver rather noticeably. Another dead spirit soldier unsheathed its sword and leaped up, rotated its body, and cleanly sliced the ghoul's head off. What a nice looking beheading, that. Although a bit crude, it's useful in its own way, I guess. That was the basic swordsmanship of the imperial family. When I tried to do it in the past, I lost my balance and fell over ungainly, and yet, these dead spirit soldiers could perform them fine, albeit in a clumsy manner. I sniffed the air again. We were currently going around the city, searching for the demonic energy-filled holes in the ground to destroy them. Because there weren't that many and most of them were located near each other, locating them wasn't all that difficult. As I continued to walk while sniffing out the stench of death, a seriously disgusting stench hit me hard and I had to cover my nose from how bad it was. I frowned involuntarily. 
even before I noticed it, I had reached the Rania fiefdom's outer walls. The most intense battlefield at the moment, in other words. Hurry and ready the equipment. People, probably the civilians, were busy carrying around quivers filled with arrows on their backs, while spears and swords filled up their hands. Oil. Bring more oil and fire. We need more stones. Damn this, F asterisk CK. Those things are still coming. SH asterisk T. Oh wow. I've been bitten. I got bitten. Even though the convicts yelled out loudly, they still didn't forget to fight against the hordes of undead infiltrating the city from the top of the walls as well as below it. I and need healing. There are too many injured. Since the venom and demonic energy permeated into his flesh, we need to slice it off. Numerous priests could be seen busily running around here and there, moving the injured and healing them. A complete madhouse, eh, I commented before putting the beak mask on. Sure, my dead spirit soldiers looked completely different from other zombies, but still, I'd be in a heap of trouble if they got found out. I mean, Hiding my identity just in case wouldn't be such a bad idea. Since everyone here was wearing the same masks, differentiating who was who should be impossible, I thought. I approached the group of priests urgently healing the injured. Large pieces of cloth were placed on the ground. The wounded soldiers and convicts were laid down on them. The priests, wearing beak masks to ward off both the venom and contamination from the demonic energy, rolled up their sleeves cold sweat continuously dripping down their bodies. Demonic energy and toxins have invaded his internal organs. What about letting him drink holy water? No. His body is too weak. Drinking holy water will only damage his internal organs from the adverse reaction. He'll die at this rate. Damn it. We're cutting open his stomach. Get ready to operate. Bring me recovery potions, not holy water. What about anesthetics? We don't have the time. The operation has to be done without it. We need to cut out the demonic energy invading his internal organs. If not, his intestines will start rotting away. Those wearing the beak masks hurriedly moved around while pulling out scalpels and all sorts of medical tools for operation. They then proceeded to cautiously cut open the patient's stomach. Uwa. Uwa. The soldier's eyes grew increasingly larger as his belly was sliced open. The poor sob now had to witness his body being dissected in real time. Man, this wasn't even a scene from one of those Saw movies, so why? How gruesome. No, don't. Stop. Why you re-killing me? Since he wasn't on ice thetist, he unsurprisingly began thrashing about in pain. Ah. Uh. Arg. I I don't want to die. I still haven't. I haven't, confessed to her yet. Hey, dude. That's an obvious death flag. I began staring at the dying soldier in sheer dumbfoundedness. Just as I began thinking of that, the whites of the guy's eyes could already be seen, his breathing threatening to cut out at any given second. I couldn't stand by and watch this happen anymore. After taking out a bottle of holy water from my item storage, I went up to them. Damn it. Hold on, man. I said, hold on. If you lose your consciousness now, it's all over. Eh? Who the hell are you? I simply poured the holy water into the opened up stomach. The other beak mask wearing priests were stunned by this sight and freaked out. It was understandable, though. Because the internal organs tainted by demonic energy immediately exploded from the adverse reaction, that's why. Blood splattered everywhere as bits of flesh landed on the priest's masks. Heog. W. What they? You son of a b asterisk tch. One of the priests angrily grabbed hold of my collars. He probably was earnestly trying to save the man's life, regardless of whether his patient was a real soldier or a convict. What the hell are you doing? This isn't time for your pran. I lightly tapped his mask in a way similar to knocking on a door and pointed at the dying soldier. 
The priest stared at my finger for a second as if entranced by it, before following it to look at the soldier on the ground. What the hell is this? The damaged internal organs began regenerating. The exploded parts disappeared only for the newly grown organs replace the void. Ow! Ow! Oh wow! It hurts! It freaking hurts, man! F asterisk CK, what the hell? My stomach, it's... SH asterisk T, you stinking priest bastards! What the hell have you done to me? Oh wow! It hurts! Oh wow! You sons of B asterisk shiz. You devils. The soldier, who was on the death's doorstep a second ago, suddenly roared out in unbridled pain. Eventually, though, he couldn't endure it anymore and passed out. What are you doing? He's going to die like this. You better stitch him back up right away. My polite suggestion caused the priests to flinch a bit. They hurriedly began closing the man's open stomach and sewed it shut. Then, they injected their divinity to heal the injury. The soldier must have survived since his breathing seemed calmer now. I took out another bottle of holy water from my item window and tossed it at the priests. Dimension, magic. The priests alternated their gazes between the holy water on the ground and me. Make sure there are no more casualties. No need to unnecessarily increase the number of undead, now is there. I said. Why yes, we understand. The priests replied politely and nodded their heads. It seemed like they were dying to ask me lots of questions, but at the same time, they must have realized that now wasn't the right time judging from how they all returned to caring for other patients. Just how bad is the situation that it's gotten to this point? 20,000 undead. Even if they possessed siege weapons, wasn't our side wasting too much time dealing with these slowpoke creatures? I led the dead spirit soldiers up the fortress outer wall. 020. Imperial Prince is bestowing divine protection minus one fin. Chapter 33, 021. Imperial Prince is bestowing divine protection minus two. Another zombie projectile crashed into the outer wall just as I was about to reach the top. The zombies that were scrunched up as a ball scattered all over the place. A portion of them flailed their limbs and blocked my path. Get rid of them. The dead spirit soldiers slightly bowed at me before dashing forward. They sliced and diced the zombies with their swords. As for those holding spears, they forced the rest off the outer wall itself, thereby clearing up my path. The convicts on top of the outer wall witnessed the company of the dead spirit soldiers led by yours truly and cried out. P. Paladins. H. Hey, the paladins are here. These cries soon led to a commotion breaking out on top of the outer wall. All of the convicts and soldiers shifted their gazes onto me. I ignored them for now and focused my attention on the army of undead on the other side of the walls. Gee whiz, now that's a lot. I clicked my tongue beneath the mask. You see, 20,000 were by no means a small number. The undead army had completely filled up the front of Rania Fiefdom's fortress. Monsters that were wielding long spears, swords, shields, crossbows, and siege weapons were emitting a scary glow from their eyes. Even I couldn't help but get tense while staring at this spectacle. My heartbeat seemed to synchronize with the pounding drum too. I felt this urge to cover my ears just then. Screams of the dead were resounding out from everywhere. This damn passive skill of the necromancer. Thanks to this damn skill, not only was it not enough to look at the rotting exterior of the undeads, I even had to endure the screams of their dead souls, too. Boom. 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 The undead placed ladders against the outer walls and climbed up all the while zombie projectiles were filling up the sky. The tottering zombies were also firing arrows and crossbow bolts this way. Sure, the fired volleys were slow and inaccurate, but to compensate for that, these monsters showed no signs of fatigue. They ceaselessly rushed in, and until their demonic energy-filled skulls were destroyed, they continued to attack without rest. If this kept up, then we might really get overrun sooner or later. Memories from the Witch Morgan incident sprouted back in my head. 
Goosebumps broke out all over my skin after remembering the ordeal I went through with the zombie bear. Oh dear goddess Nim. This is just too much, you know. This was almost impossible for job classes other than the necromancer to deal with. I mean, with what miracles were you supposed to defend against 20,000 undead enemies? Oh, dear goddess of love and mercy, I know you have a grudge against me, but you're really going overboard here, wouldn't you say? Could we really defend against this tide? I shook my head. Nope, utterly impossible. Soon, night would come. Once sunlight recedes away, the undead would grow even stronger after receiving the power of the negative field. And, in addition to this, the 25th was only two days away. The day that the necromancer King Amun was killed. The one fondly referred to as the King of All Undead. In other words, the day when demonic energy found in the continent would get thicker and start running amok was just around the corner. It'd be the end for us when that day arrived. The undead would grow even stronger, and the Rania fiefdom would be overrun. And then, the undead monsters would slowly spread out to the rest of the continent. What a nonsensical game this is. My opponent was an immortal army. Their soldiers enjoyed infinite stamina and also feared nothing. Not to mention, they would spread around diseases when they died, and they also carried toxins to turn the people they killed into more zombies. They were hard to kill with conventional weapons, and since communicating with them was impossible, you should forget about negotiating too. In other words, convicts with zero real-life combat experience couldn't possibly stop this army. So then. There's only one way to win, Et. However, even against such opponents, there would always be a way to win. Even a moron should know of this method. And that was. To kill the damn commander. I shifted my gaze to where hundreds of undead had gathered for some reason. In the center of that particular horde, a whole bunch of naked slave zombies were unsteadily holding up a sedan chair. I could see a monster seemingly made out of nothing but fat sitting on it. I activated mine's eye to peer into its status. Name, Vampire Count. Age. Traits, Biting, Demonic Energy Emission, Necromancy Magic, Arrogance, Currently in Highly Excited State. Plus I'm the Legion, and I'm the existence who shall become the Vampire King. Something seems to have changed. Information gleaned from mind's eye seemed to have changed a bit. The speciality had now turned to traits, and some other useful stuff seemed to be added at the end too. Kill that swine monster bastard. I glanced to my side. A convict operating the ballista took aim at the vampire count. I'll blow away that layer of fat for you. The large bolt was fired and flew towards the vampire. But then. Hey. The bolt crashed into a purple-colored barrier midair and shattering into pieces. As it turned out. A barrier created out of demonic energy was protecting the corpulent vampire. Yup, I thought as much. That bastard was the commander. It even cast a magical barrier to completely shut out any and all long-distance attacks. However, if you went for a close-range attack, all those hundreds of undead surrounding the vampire count would stop you, ultimately resulting in your untimely demise. So this was the ringleader behind these 20,000 undead the vampire count. I took out the musket rifle from my item window. Not sure if I can make it, but... There was about 400 meters between me and the vampire. Not only that, there was the barrier capable of blocking a ballista projectile too. I should at least give it a shot. The only way to end this war in our victory was to kill that commanding vampire. I raised the beak mask slightly with my left hand. With my right, I brought the rifle's ammo chamber closer to my lips. Then, I quietly breathed into it. A bullet has been generated through the usage of Divin. Divine Aura has activated. The equipment will temporarily be enhanced. You have entered Divinity Control State. Stop reporting everything to me, will ya? You're breaking my concentration. An intricate holy bullet of highly concentrated divinity was created. However, this wasn't going to be enough. I needed to focus more. Much, much more. 
I need more accuracy, and make sure that the recoil won't affect my aim. Divine Aura is getting stronger. Skill, Sharpshooter has been temporarily granted to you due to the evolution of the equipment. Your accuracy will rise. Skill penetration will temporarily be bestowed onto the equipment. No, this still wasn't enough. This wasn't going to work, I wouldn't be able to break past the vampire's barrier with this much. In that case. Oh, dear goddess of love and mercy, Gaia. One of the books I found inside the monastery's library mentioned the methods of gathering more divinity. Among them was a rather interesting theory concerning divinity control for the priests of this world. It contained a quite provocative element. You must pray with all your heart. Pray until your faithful heart can reach the gods. If you do, the gods will grant your wish and bestow unto you a miraculous divine protection. Your exaltation of the gods will soon become your strength. Magicians used spell incantations and mana, priests used prayers and divinity, while necromancers used life force and demonic energy as their basis for performing magic. I was both a necromancer and a priest. I didn't need to use life force in order to use my skills, but I also didn't need to pray to use magic either. But what if I did? What then? I didn't know how to sacrifice life force as of yet, but something like a prayer? I sure could do that. A prayer towards the goddess this was the highly effective divinity control method for the priests which allowed them to gather more divinity quickly, and also spend less amount than usual as well. It was something so simple to explain, yet the book contained far too many pseudo-cult-like phrases for my liking. It kinda made me feel uneasy. However, I figured that praying wouldn't harm me anyway. If I could utilize divinity much more effectively with a simple prayer, then I better go right ahead, no? I beseech you to grant your sacred blessing to this lamb. Divinity is condensing. Through your holiness, I shall subjugate the undead. Bullet is becoming even more precise. So grant me the power to pierce the undead with your divine grace. Suddenly, divinity powerfully whipped about all around me. But it felt calm and soothing almost as if a gentle figure of a woman was embracing me from behind. Right, this much was enough. I no longer needed to pray towards the goddess. If Gaia really granted me her powers, it was now the time to use it. With this, I took aim at the vampire count. The huge monster had its arms spread wide open while loudly laughing out. It was unknown whether he knew what was going on here or not. The corners of my lips curled up. I hope your balls receive Gaia's grace, you stinking vampire. And then, I pulled the trigger. TL, back to third person POV. Harmon stopped staring at Charlotte when he heard the noisy commotion breaking out, and turned his head away to look. A priest donning a bird beak mask was climbing up the outer wall. Soldiers were escorting him all the while massacring the undead in his path. Who are they? They seemed different from regular convicts or soldiers. Although faint, he could sense the trace of divine aura from the soldiers. Were they apprentice paladins? However, why was a priest being escorted by such a group? This would be Harmon's first time hearing about their presence in the fortress. Charlotte, next to him, however, opened her eyes extremely wide and muttered softly. Imperial Prince Nim. Harmon was startled after hearing this and quickly took a look at the girl. That was the Imperial Prince? Harmon's suspicious gaze shifted back to the beak mask wearing priest. And then, both his and Charlotte's eyes grew even larger from the shock. It wasn't only them this time, however. Every convict, soldier, and the fiefdom citizen nearby witnessed it together at the same time. On top of the outer wall, Particles of holy light began gathering all around the imperial prince. Soon, the particles condensed in one spot to form a figure of a woman that gently embraced him from behind. Harmon felt goosebumps break out all over his body. He involuntarily covered his lips. He knew what this phenomenon was. G Goddess Gaia's Divine Protection The blessing of the gods personally bestowed unto their believers, a miracle that even a high-ranking priest might or might not get to experience once in their lifetime. 
and such a phenomenon was happening to the imperial prince right now. This, this doesn't even make any. A prince who blasphemed against Gaia receiving her blessing? What kind of a contradictory event was this? Didn't this mean that the imperial prince was loved by goddess Gaia? It was then. After the boy prince finished his prayer to the goddess, he aimed his musket rifle at the vampire count and spat out this line. I hope your balls receive Gaia's grace, you stinking vampire. Harman froze up while doubting his own ears, but then, an incredibly powerful noise tore into his hearing as a blinding flash of light exploded and blinded his eyes. And then. Boom. The vampire's barrier was struck and visibly distorted before shattering into pieces. One heavy bullet managed to shake the aura of death. Qoo. Divinity spread out all around the area as dozens upon dozens of zombies and skeletons collapsed into ashes. Fuwoop. The vampire count sucked in its breath at this feeling of confusion. Since it was an undead, basically a walking corpse, its lungs didn't operate at all. However, its faintly beating heart suddenly palpitated and let it taste the emotion of fear. The undead monster's eyes opened wide and stared at the light that crashed into its barrier. Soon enough, its irises began quivering. What was that? Just what the hell was that? The Count was so shocked that it tried to get up, but seeing as it couldn't carry its own heft, it fell back on the sedan chair once more. This was strange. By now, its army should have devoured that fortress. It was deliberately taking on enormous losses while pounding away at the target. The human soldiers concentrating on the defenses of the outer walls should have already fallen into chaotic confusion by now since hordes of undead had already infiltrated the fortress interior. However, it was simply too quiet. The Count couldn't even pick up the auras of the undead it sent into the fortress. Could it be that the monsters were destroyed already? But how? How did the humans find all the hidden holes spread evenly throughout on the ground? No. Now isn't the time to worry about a matter like that. Maybe because its brain had rotted away and its thoughts were now formed through the manipulation of demonic energy, the creature's attention kept shifting elsewhere. The Count recalled the bullet that flew in its direction. It contained a truly detestable aura. A power completely at odds with death itself broke its barrier. Goodness! To think that the sturdy shield created out of demonic energy by using the necromancer king's skull was shattered, when not even a ballista could break it. The vampire count quickly moved its gaze around. Its blurry sight stared at the top of Rania Fortress outer walls about 400 meters away. Its eyes couldn't look closely at the countless humans there. But it could sense their auras instead. The sacred aura that drove away death. The incredibly terrifying aura that sent shivers down the monster's back. It was gathering again. This, this. The Count's complexion paled even further. It was gathering again? Didn't the attack end just now? I am must stop it. The vampire Count waved its hand. The barrier generated again as a zombie ogre stood before it too. And then. Yet another powerful flash of light shot out from the outer walls. The barrier which was yet to fully form shattered once more. The zombie ogre's large torso was also penetrated cleanly through. The white light's trajectory was altered by the barrier and the zombie ogre. Which was why, instead of hitting it in the head, the bullet had now struck the Count's nether region. The vampire looked down at its lower half. Its crown jewels were burning and scattering away as ashes. Powerful and hot aura spread throughout its entire body almost as if the monster was on fire right now. Oh, ah, 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 ah. It hurt. It hurt so badly. But... But how could a vampire experience pain? The vampire count thrashed about from the pain it felt for the first time in the past 50 years. Thanks to this, the zombies beneath the sedan chair couldn't maintain their balance and fell before being squashed flat into bloody bits and pieces from the sheer weight of the vampire. Ah, 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 ah. Damn it! Those abominable priests! The vampire count crawled unsightly on the ground. Could it be that the fortress had a group of high-ranking priests? Did they invent a weapon that could fire the divinity they gathered? 
The vampire count screamed out loudly. Our run! Retreat! The vampire count trembled and continued crawling on the ground. Zombies, zombies ogres and skeletons heeded their leader's commands. And after grabbing hold of the count, began dragging the corpulent monster away. Due to its weight, its heavy flesh got dragged across the ground. W wait, wait! Lift me up! The vampire count roared on, but too bad, these undeads weren't so good with carrying out detailed orders. And so, the once triumphant vampire was unceremoniously dragged away from Rania at the hands of the zombies. 021. Imperial Prince is bestowing divine protection minus two fin. Chapter 34, 022. Merry Christmas. Minus one. I frowned deeply after alternating my gaze between the musket rifle and the vampire count currently being dragged away in the distance. I was definitely aiming for the bastard's head. Unfortunately, the obstacles and the distance ensured that the trajectory of the bullet would be altered midway. Thanks to that, the joke of a blessing I said earlier became a reality instead. In the end, I failed to kill it, hey. The vampire count was now out of the rifle's range. However, seeing as it was in that condition, that thing should have some trouble controlling the undead army. Also, I didn't have any energy left whatsoever to gather more divinity anyway. Even now, my legs were shaking hard and I felt really dizzy. I guess I bought us some time, then. At the very least, we had some time to regroup and think about our options. I also needed time to gather divinity and create more holy water as my energy drinks. By the way, when I turned my head around, I realized that everyone's eyes were focused on me. Why is everything so quiet? I could only frown while feeling their gazes landed on me. The soldiers and convicts, the feudal Lord Genald who arrived on the scene a minute ago, Charlotte and Harmon in the distance, etc., etc., were all looking at me with lips tightly shut. TL, back to third person POV. The sun had set and it was now nighttime. Harmon stood alone on top of the outer walls. He was intently staring at the enemy's camp in the distance, at where the vampire count and the hordes of undead were biding their time. He was supposed to think about how they would attack the fortress again and what he should do to counter it. However, his mind was entirely preoccupied by something else. A day had already passed since the battle, and all the wounded soldiers were fully healed by the priests and holy water. Harmon was stunned to learn that, with the exception of serious injuries, everyone had recovered to full health. This isn't any ordinary holy water. He looked at the bottle of holy water in his hand. This small glass bottle contained the highest quality holy water that could only be created when a high-ranking priest gathered divinity for a day and night non-stop. Just one bottle would be enough to cure dozens upon dozens. And he was told that the imperial prince gave it to the priests. Not only that, it's quite high in concentration too. The holy water was diluted with regular water before being distributed, saving a hundred plus lives in the process. This was all thanks to the Imperial Prince. What is the Prince hiding? Harmon had a lot of questions for the Prince. Even if the spirit speech incident could be chalked up as coincidence, he definitely had to inquire about where this highest grade holy water came from. Could it be that, the Prince himself made it? It's simply not possible that His Highness possesses such abilities. But... The Imperial Prince did snipe the Vampire Count, didn't he? Not only that, along with Goddess Gaia's divine protection to boot. It seemed that the other priests didn't know the truth yet. Well, he did try to conceal his identity with a mask, so that couldn't be helped. In all honesty, even Harmon was still unsure of who it really was. He thought that maybe, the man who sniped the vampire wasn't the Imperial Prince but someone else, possibly another high-ranking priest. No, that isn't it. That girl named Charlotte definitely called the sniper Imperial Prince Nim. A child who served the prince wouldn't be mistaken about the one she looked after in that situation. Besides, it also seems that Charlotte isn't an ordinary child either. She knew of the Imperial Swordsmanship. 
when he asked her where she learned it from. I learned it from a book. Was her reply. She obviously didn't tell him the truth. Harman could only chuckle bitterly. She learned it by reading a book? Lies. Such movements couldn't be imitated by simply copying from a measly book for crying out loud. Here was the swordsmanship featuring all sorts of brilliant techniques. One needed to possess a requisite sense of balance, physical strength, as well as quick reactions in order to move like that. A person would need to at least train for many years to reach where she was. Harman was certain that the girl had been training in this swordsmanship style for quite some time now. And it couldn't have been a simple coincidence that such a child was serving the imperial prince from his side. Have they known each other for a while? He wondered if a loyal retainer of the seventh imperial prince secretly inserted her here for the boy's sake. If that's true, then the girl's father, Grill, can't be an ordinary man either. Could it be that Grill was a knight currently on an undercover mission? However, when he conducted his investigation earlier, Harman learned that the farmer had already been living in the land of the dead spirits for many decades. Charlotte too had lost her parents from the plague, which resulted in Grill adopting her as his daughter afterwards. It would be tough to match the story so precisely with other villagers like that. Harman's head was a complicated mess. Everything seemed to be a mystery. And also, the way the prince changed is strange as well. Indeed, the prince himself had gone through a 180 degree turnabout after he got exiled and experienced an assassination attempt disguised as a suicide. He changed after losing his memories. Maybe it's possible that he forgot about his trauma that occurred five years ago. The mother of the first and the seventh imperial princes, Eulizia. She was a commoner from a rural village, and not only that, a mixed blood from the Aslan kingdom down south too. Aslan was at odds with the theocratic empire and the two nations had fought each other during many wars in the past several hundred years. Since she carried the bloodline from such a kingdom, unsurprisingly the gazes from the rest of the imperial family directed in her way couldn't be described as warm in any shape or form. Such a woman fell in love with the son of the holy emperor and before long, she gave birth to the first imperial prince. Naturally, the opposition from the nobles and the clergy were fierce the main sticking point being, the crown prince had chosen a commoner rather than someone from the other noble families. There was also the fact that the blood of the Aslan kingdom flowed in her body, albeit it being only half. Most importantly, the current holy emperor agreed with their sentiments. In the end, the crown prince, the son of the holy emperor, had no choice but to accept two other ladies from noble families that boasted distinguished bloodlines as his concubines. He did this all in order to appease the voracious opposition from his father, the nobles, and the clergymen. Later, these two wives gave birth to many more imperial princes and princesses. The first wife, Eulizia, eventually gave life to the seventh imperial prince. In the year that the boy turned ten years old. On a certain snowy night, the mother of both the first and seventh imperial princes, Eulizia, was the victim of a vampire's surprise attack inside the imperial palace's garden. The first prince managed to narrowly escape death but still suffered a curse of demonic energy invading his heart. Meanwhile, Eulizia tried to protect the seventh prince, only to be torn limb from limb before the boy's very eyes. His beloved mother died in his arms, and even his older brother grew deathly ill. The young seventh prince suffered a huge mental trauma on that day and basically lost his mind. The ten-year-old child known for his gentle personality grew up into an easily scared and distrusting boy one who also enjoyed belittling others around him. Could it be that the witch Morgana incident reverted him back to his original personality? No. Even then, there were several strange points to consider. From the get-go, the boy losing his memories and possessing powerful divinity were completely unrelated to each other. I definitely heard that the noble named Hayes insulted Charlotte, and the imperial prince attacked him after failing to reign in his anger. The prince wouldn't have made his move merely because the girl serving him was insulted. However, the keywords of lowly commoner and dying on the cold floor both of them applied to the seventh imperial prince's mother, Eulizia. 
Could it be that the prince became enraged by those words and ended up beating Hayes to a pulp? When Harmon asked him, the boy simply smiled and replied, just because, but. Could it be that he didn't lose his memories? Or did he move according to his instincts? Alternatively, it was also possible that the boy was using the pretext of amnesia to divert the imperial family's attention away from him. If this was true, then why would he do something like that? Harman slowly stroked his chin. Well, that's a simple answer, isn't it? He could more or less guess the reason. For revenge. To kill the vampire who drove his mother to death, and to avenge all the humiliation she suffered at the hands of the nobles, the seventh prince deliberately got himself exiled. It's a plausible theory. There were plenty of eyes and ears within the imperial palace. Rather than staying there, it might be better to get exiled to a distant and remote monastery to grow one's powers in secret. The imperial prince kept saying that Morgana the witch was hunted down by the villagers, but in turn, they said something completely contradictory. If I think about matters this way, then everything fits. The reason why he behaves so crudely before me was also because of that. Harman wasn't sure how the prince managed to earn the love of goddess Gaia and come to possess such an incredible level of divinity. However, he was certain of the boy wishing for more power and dreaming of the day he'd have his revenge. An unknown noble family must have been supporting the boy prince from the shadows. Charlotte was the proof of this. All the mysteries seemed to be unraveling now. Lady Eulizia. Five years ago, Harman was also present at the garden. He was tasked with guarding them alongside other Holy Cross Knight Order members. Back then, he failed to protect Lady Eulizia and the princes when they went out for a simple stroll. Even if the first prince ordered him to go and summon help, it was inconceivable that he abandoned his duty as their guard. Harman gritted his teeth. He recalled his pathetic self back then and quickly sunk into the pit of shame. I've forgotten all about it already. Yet. The Imperial Prince was trying to become stronger ever since the age of ten for the sake of vengeance. Such a young child, he endured against all that humiliation and got himself exiled in the process. Harman rubbed his face. Eulizia was truly a beautiful woman, inside and out. She treated everyone equally, and her heart was always caring, she seemed to be ordinary at a glance, yet at the same time, extraordinary. Maybe that's why. The reason why both him and the first prince treated the seventh prince, Alan all false, so coldly until now. No matter how deeply suppressed his emotions were, Harman would never tolerate any behavior that insulted Lady Eulizia's memories. But reality was different. If the seventh imperial prince truly wished to take revenge for Lady Eulizia, then... Then... I shall aid him in his quest. Harman clenched his fist tightly. He took a deep breath and calmed his heart down. Revenge. If that goal were to be realized, their current situation had to be resolved first. Indeed, I need to focus on our current situation before all else. He spat out a long sigh before shifting his focus back to the matter of the fortress's security. In the far-off distance, the undead horde had set up a camp. There were hundreds, thousands of ghostly eyes glaring at Rania. Thanks to that, the combat readiness tension couldn't be undone. It resulted in the fatigue level of the soldiers to soar higher and brought down the morale of the troops. And later tonight, the approaching midnight would herald the advent of the 25th of December. The vampire count should start moving again when that time comes. Harman stopped looking at the enemy camp and headed back towards the fortress interior. He could see soldiers going on a patrol while carrying bright torches. Several holes on the ground had been discovered within the city. Since the undead infiltrated through there, it was possible that the same tactic could be used again. To prevent that, the number of patrols had been increased and every house was searched for the presence of these holes. Thirty search parties made up of ten soldiers each were created. The total number of people who were tasked with this job was 300 in other words. However, when Harman surveyed the proceedings from the top of the outer wall, there seemed to be a few more patrolling around at the moment. The fortress should have been suffering from the shortage of manpower, 
so how come? What? He could see that most of the soldiers were moving around with torches, but a small portion of them didn't have any sources of light at all. Why were they patrolling inside such darkness without any sources of light, especially when the moonlight had been swallowed up by the murky clouds above? Now that was incredibly suspicious. Harman climbed down from the outer wall. He picked up a torch and told the nearby knight that he was going out on a patrol before heading off to where those unidentified soldiers were. The soldiers without torches were deliberately picking only the dark areas with no people around. Harman frowned while watching these soldiers enter a darkened alleyway and followed after them. Oh I I, you there. Soldier. Harman's call was ignored. His frown grew deeper as he quickened his steps to catch up to them. He hastily grabbed the shoulder of one of them, pulling the guy around towards him. Oh I I, soldier. What are you doing? It was then, Harman's expression hardened. This soldier was wearing a helmet and a face mask. When hunting down the undead that spread around venom and diseases, it was common practice to wear masks. However, this guy wasn't wearing one to cover his nose, but to hide the entire face instead. Because it was an undead. It was an undead soldier with no light of life found within its eyes. Harman unsheathed his sword and quickly stepped back. Even then, he doubted his own eyes and senses. Be but, how come, divinity? Although faint, he could sense divinity oozing out from the undead. Just what on earth is going on here? How did these monsters? Harman momentarily wondered if he was under the spell of a demon right now. Some vampires were known to be able to cast illusion magic, after all. However, it should still be impossible to fool my senses. The undead soldier that possessed divinity simply ignored Harman and began walking away again. He gritted his teeth and pounced on the monsters. This was no time to hesitate. He wasn't sure why these creatures showed no interest towards him, but leaving them alone like this carried a great risk. Harman swung his sword as divinity permeated within his blade. A regular undead would turn to ashes the moment it got sliced by this blade. However. Clang. His attack was blocked. Harman's brows shot up higher. A mere walking dead was actually using a sword draped in divinity just like he was. The undead's eyes moved. Its eyes which resembled a pair of souls burning from deep within the darkness were now locked on Harman. Then, the dead spirit soldier deflected his sword away. It stepped back before lowering its torso. Almost at the same time, spear blades shot out from the darkness behind. Other undead soldiers were stepping on the walls of this narrow alleyway to surround Harman from both sides, all the while deftly wielding their swords. What? Unhesitant, vicious attacks poured in from his front, left, and right. Harman's expression hardened as he witnessed this. Because these undead were coming at him with a coordinated attack, almost as if they were trained knights. 022. Merry Christmas. Minus one fin. Chapter 35, 023. Merry Christmas. Minus two, part one. A coordinated attack? Harman gritted his teeth and evaded the incoming swords and spears. He then quickly stepped back, but this action allowed the dead spirit soldiers to encircle him. Right afterwards, arrows flew in from the sky. He evaded them as well, but then, the undead began moving in towards his turned body. They were taking advantage of the opening to attack him. Just what exactly are these things? Their skill level was only barely above that of an average soldier. However, their synchronized attacks were flawless, almost as if it was being performed by a single entity. More undead soldiers walked out from the darkened alleyways, all of them carrying all sorts of weapons such as spears, bows, and even maces. With eyes glowing in an eerie blue hue within the darkness, they raised their deadly weapons and pounced on him as well. Facing paladins would be way more preferable than this. Harman blocked the swords and dodged the spears. He smacked the arrows away and retreated even further. But even then, the undead soldiers continued to dig into his defenses from all sides in a simultaneous movement, 
and without any errors too. They used their legs as braces and spun their whole bodies while swinging the swords gripped firmly in their hands. Harman's jaw dropped after witnessing this spectacle. Although shoddily performed, the technique he just saw was intimately familiar to him. The Imperial Swordsmanship His shock didn't have the opportunity to last for long, though. Because he didn't think he was capable enough to dodge every single one of these crude attacks. Dozens of swords were now aimed at him from all directions. I have to go all out from now on. As long as there was an unidentified group acting in the shadows inside Rania Fortress, this city's future would remain uncertain and shaky. He needed to quickly resolve this situation and start investigating who was behind this event. And he needed to do it before the advent of midnight too. Oh, the god of Warheim. He began rousing up his divinity. The gentle and bright light oozed out from his blade and chased away the surrounding darkness. Just as he tightly grasped the hilt of his sword with both of his hands in order to extinguish the undead in one fell swoop. That's enough. The group of undead suddenly halted their movements. Dozens of blades were frozen mid-air, still aiming at Harmon's neck. The paladin also stopped his sword about to cut down his enemies. He then cautiously turned his gaze towards the origin of the voice. From the darkened alleyway, a figure slowly walked out into the light. Harman's expression hardened after realizing who it was. Your Highness. The seventh Imperial Prince, Alan Allfalls, was now standing amongst the ranks of the undead. TL, back to first person POV. I settled down on the edge of the fortress outer wall. My legs swayed in the empty air as I looked below. The outer walls were around 12 meters high. If I fell down from here, it wouldn't simply end with my legs breaking, that's for sure. Those who dropped down from here must have been in a lot of pain. There were quite a lot of corpses that hadn't been recovered yet strewn about on the ground below. Not too far away from this location, zombies were blankly standing around doing nothing, as if they were waiting for the vampire count's orders. Hang on. Isn't that Saint Nim? You're right. As expected. He's the one who distributed that holy water to us. I shifted my gaze towards the source of those voices. A lot of convicts and soldiers huddled around the corner of the outer walls were whispering amongst themselves, all the while sending me fervent gazes burning with, something. And then. Let us pray together. We shall atone for our sins, O oh dear God. They knelt down to pray. These idiots. How were they able to tell that it's me? I could only click my tongue inwardly at this sight. Harmon and the undead soldiers were standing around nearby. And I was currently wearing the bird beak mask to ensure that others didn't recognize me. Yet, despite this nondescript attire, they were praying towards me. Not only that, they also wanted to atone for their sins. I couldn't help but retort in my head. Don't make me laugh. If prayers alone could erase your crimes, then this world wouldn't have any need for police officers and a set of laws in the first place. Why don't you reflect on your bad deeds and offer your services for the greater good instead? Do you think praying to me is your ticket to salvation or something? I stared at the convicts in dumbfoundedness before finally shifting my gaze over to Harmon. Since when did people start calling me the saint? He didn't even bother answering my question. Rather, he was currently too busy massaging his temples to reply. His helm was taken off his aching head quite some time ago. W.H. What am I supposed to do now? The seventh imperial prince, he. Lady Ulysses' son has learned. And necromancy, the burly paladin seemed to be deeply traumatized by what he just discovered, as evidenced by all that muttering directed to himself. Was that how desperate he felt? I didn't even know. What's this? Me, desperate? Hey man. That word suits you better than me right now, wouldn't you say? I couldn't help but get confused by this guy. Harmon was carrying an expression of a man who managed to lose his entire fortune overnight through gambling or something. He seemed to be doubting his own eyes and ears while he kept glancing at me. For the last time, he took a slow, measured look at me and opened his mouth. S so, 
Uh, well. The previously hidden emotions of this robot-like man were visibly shaking once more. His gaze then moved towards the undead soldiers next to me. These undead, did you really summon them, your highness? Oh, them? Yep, that's right. You're pretty sharp, aren't you? So? What do you think? Not bad right? You can't tell them apart from regular living people with a casual glance, right? I smiled refreshingly and answered him honestly. Since I was discovered already, there was no point in lying anymore. Actually, letting him know the truth was probably for the better in our current situation. Very soon, it'd be December 25th. It wasn't the date of Christ's birth, nor was it the one and only Christmas where everyone was having fun all the while receiving gifts from Santa Claus. Nope, it was the complete opposite of that. This was the Halloween where the undead would go on a blood-soaked rampage instead. My summoned undead would prove to be helpful, at least a little bit in the circumstances. In that case, it should be a smarter move to let Harmon know about them beforehand, thereby ensuring that we wouldn't see any unforeseen friction later. Harmon groaned softly. Oh, Lady Eulizia. What should I do now? Who's this Eulizia? I tilted my head. However, Harmon was startled by what his own mouth had uttered out and quickly covered his lips. Even then, he continued to study my reactions. Why did you do it, your highness? His voice asked me in a tone that indicated his need to confirm the truth no matter what. He was probably asking me why I went and learned necromancy. Well, it somehow happened that way. Actually, I'm from another world, you see? I died on that side and when I woke up, I was already inside the body of your seventh imperial prince, you know. And I can also use all the abilities from a video game just fine too. Yup, there's no way he'd believe me if I said all of this. It'd probably be easier to explain by saying, I made a deal with the devil. Probably. Although, the problem with doing that would be me getting branded as a heretic. Did you, make a deal with the devil? Your Highness. This guy, why are you saying some freaky stuff so casually like that? Are you planning to hand me over to the Inquisitors or something? Hi AAA, I'm getting really curious here, you know? If someone really made a deal with the devil, would they be able to produce undead overflowing with divinity like me? I wonder. My words caused Harmon's facial expressions to scrunch up and become even more complicated. Well, it wasn't much of a surprise that he failed to understand what was happening. Undead with divinity flowing in them? Even I was mystified by this, so what about Harmon who had been loyally adhering to his faith all his life? In that case, how did you, these, uh, make these holy undead? Dunno. I can't remember anything before the suicide attempt. Was I interested in necromancy before that thing happened? Are you hiding something? Your Highness. I'm not hiding anything, man. You see, even I don't know what's going on. I spoke the truth to him. If I knew how, then I'd be more like the great sage instead. Harmon stopped asking me questions at this point in time. So I asked him instead. So, then. Are you going to inform the Inquisitors now? Chapter 36, 023 Merry Christmas. Minus two, part two. I couldn't help but get tense even though I was the one who said this question aloud. Depending on his reply, I'd have to seriously consider how I should go about handling Harmon's matter, right here in this very moment. Although there were those convicts over yonder, I figured that with my dead spirit soldiers attacking him and not me personally, something or rather should work out in my favor, somehow. No I won't. Your Highness. Now that was an unexpected reply. Harmon stared straight at me and continued to speak. Even if I did report this in, I don't think anyone will believe me. No, rather than that, making a report stating that I've allied myself with another Imperial Prince to falsely accuse you would carry more weight at this point, Your Highness. Allied what now? Eh, uh, you mean, currying favors to get promoted quicker? 
But you're one of those types that rigorously stick to the field manual, aren't you? Indeed, this guy was definitely not the type to get in bed with someone else to enhance his career prospects. He'd feel offended if he were to be suspected of such a thing, actually. Harmon sucked in a deep breath. He was trying to remain calm as he asked me another question. Do you know the potential ripples you might cause if the truth comes to light, your highness? Well, that. I honestly didn't have any idea what would happen in that case. I guessed that at the very least, the rest of my life would be spent inside a prison cell. At a minimum, I won't be free, as it were. One wrong move and even your older brother, the first imperial prince, will fall into danger. The first imperial prince? Oh, so I had an older brother? Well, I was called the seventh, so yeah, there must be at least six others older than me. Obviously. I remained unperturbed while perched up on top of the outer walls and this scene caused Harmon to spit out a lengthy sigh. I too was a knight-serving Lady Eulizia with the task of guarding you and Her Highness back then. He continued staring at me with fiery eyes. His expression hardened with resolve as he opened his mouth again, I shall serve you and the first imperial prince until the end. I dazedly stared at him for a while there. A dude who stuck to the field manual, he, really seemed to have decided to get in bed with someone, after all. But then again, the allure of a quick promotion was obviously too hard to endure, wasn't it? Haha. <laughs> this guy, he didn't know how to pick the right bed, though. To think he'd align himself with an exiled imperial prince of all people. Much worse than that, it was even a totally suspicious prince who could use necromancy, no less. No, hang on. Could it be that he wanted to find more unsavory things about me? Since he didn't have enough evidence to use against me, was it possible that he wanted to monitor me even more closely? With these thoughts swirling in my head, I became even more wary of Harmon than ever before. He was now looking at me with eyes of compassion for some reason. Just before I could ask him what the meaning of those eyes were, a powerful stench attacked my nose with excellent timing. In any case, I think it's about time, I muttered out. I glanced up at the heavens above. Normally, you could easily look at the positions of both the sun and the moon to roughly estimate the time. But too bad, with all those thick and murky clouds hanging overhead, it made it impossible to tell the exact time now. However, even I could ascertain that the stench of death was rushing towards us to coincide with the advent of midnight. It seems that Christmas Eve is now over. I'd have much preferred to spend my free time with a pretty girl or with my friends, though. As the murky clouds gradually cleared away, the once obscured moonlight slowly revealed itself. Sadly, it wasn't the normal gentle and clear light, but an overwhelmingly eerie crimson hue that sent shivers down one's spine. The thick layer of demonic energy caused the transformation in the atmosphere and brought about this optical illusion. While looking at the moonlight, I muttered to myself, Merry Christmas, Harmon. Of course, I then lowered my head and stood back up before dusting myself off. Enjoying Halloween on the same day is just an added bonus. The undead on top of the snowy fields were finally moving once again. And about 600 meters away, well outside the musket rifle's firing range, the vampire count was standing on its feet, all the while busy gathering the crimson demonic energy within its hand. TL, in third-person POV. The vampire count sat atop of the sedan chair. The monster was currently gnashing its teeth in anger as it looked down at its crotch. The burn stench still lingered, and its most important bits hadn't regenerated even now. But, how come? This creature was far different from all the other undead. It wasn't some measly little corpse that didn't even breathe, or one with a heart that no longer pulsed with life. It possessed ego, and could think before making decisions. Albeit weak, its heart did beat, and through its lungs, the monster could breathe too. It even knew how to enjoy the taste of meat as well. This was what it meant by becoming a vampire, an existence that earned the right to enjoy new life after crawling out from death's pits. Such a creature should have been able to regrow any body part destroyed by divinity. 
however. Even now, its most important bits hadn't regenerated yet. Actually, it was growing back but at a pace even slower than a snail's crawl. At this rate, the wound might take a good few years before fully regenerating. That's how powerful the divinity carried in the bullet that pierced the monster was. That damn abominable priest bastard. The vampire count was enraged. Even though it was destined to become the next vampire king, it had to suffer such a horrendous humiliation. How dare you steal my source of pleasure? The vampire couldn't calm its anger and waved its hand about. After grabbing a nearby zombie, the creature ripped the poor undead slims apart and shoved the resulting matter inside its mouth. Fine. Fine. Once I possess that territory, I should be able to get my hands on an even greater power. By the time the monster succeeds in this dastardly conquest, regenerating the lost bits should become so much easier. The vampire wasn't planning to back away from the fight. Its gaze shifted up towards the sky, at the crimson moonlight falling from up above. Then, it cast its gaze down on the ground. Thick fog carrying demonic energy was criss-crossing the land. The undead who had their feet dipped within this fog noticeably shuddered. And then, the bodies of various zombies began ballooning up, their once emaciated figures were enveloped in newly grown muscles. Thick strands of demonic energy flowed between the bones of the skeletons. Upon witnessing this sight, the vampire count broke out into an eerie smirk. Look at this powerful demonic energy. This was the true tide of death. It was finally the 25th of December. The date when necromancer King Amun died. This was their moment. Finally, our time has come. The vampire count grabbed the sedan chair's armrests and pushed itself up. Its huge body stepped into the demonic energy-filled fog. The creature's legs that used to struggle with its enormous heft were now standing firm and steady. Meanwhile, the demonic energy within the fog was rapidly being sucked into its body. Its previously corpulent figure was morphing into a toned and muscular one. Oh my dear walking dead! Your time has finally come. The undead all reacted to the Count's words and howled out loudly. Go and devour the living. And evolve. The vampire Count moved its large body forward. Step by step, it slowly advanced towards its target. Become vampires yourselves, and crown me, the one who led you to your perfected forms, as your new king. The Count clenched its fists as the demonic energy emitting crimson light swirled dizzily around its hands. The land reverberated as noise loud enough to rupture one's ears exploded out. I am the successor of the God of Death, Yude. And I shall become your vampire king. The Count then raised its right hand enveloped in that crimson light, right before slashing it down. The demonic energy swirling around it penetrated past the undead before the vampire. Then, the gigantic ray of crimson light carved through the wines and reached Rania Fortress outer walls, cleanly slicing into them. And then, a huge explosion occurred. The outer wall made out of wood and stone couldn't withstand the impact force and exploded upwards in a spiral. A section of the 12-meter tall wall then crumbled down powerlessly. Advance. I shall enter the battlefield myself. The vampire count moved its feet. There was nothing to fear during the tide of death. As long as this powerful demonic energy was supporting it, the Count could walk around by itself and enjoy hunting down the living in person. This is my first step towards the conquest of this continent, towards my rightful ascension into kinghood. Kiiiiya! Undeads howled out loudly. They lowered their postures and broke into rapid sprints. The undead with their regular fastest speed that used to be no better than walking pace, were now actually running towards the broken section of the outer walls. There was still about half of the original undead army remaining. Meaning, they numbered around 10,000 and every single one of them were advancing towards Rania like a horde of voracious insects. 023. Merry Christmas. Minus 2, Part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 37. 024. Merry Christmas. Minus 3. I, I beg your pardon, but, my lord, Viscount Genelde. I, I can't fight like this. 
As you can see, my leg hasn't fully healed yet. The eldest son of Count Hedron, Hayes, pleaded with the feudal lord while limping on his perfectly fine leg. L. Look. My leg is still like this. And yet, you want me to partake in the forthcoming battle. I've been reliably informed that Sir Hayes has trained in the ways of the sword back in the academy. Right now, we need every able hand we can find. Please, lend us your strength. Feudal Lord Jeanald made his reply and ignored the boy altogether from then on. However, Hayes didn't give up and chased after him. Be but. Just before the boy could carry on with his words, Jeanald suddenly grabbed him by the collars. You're here due to your transgressions, Sir Hayes, and as such, you must serve your time. This is the reason why the sacrificial castle stands H. It was then. A streak of crimson light sliced past the outer walls. Both Jeanald and Hayes flinched in surprise and quickly turned their heads to look. A huge hole had opened up. The wall began ballooning up around this hole before spectacularly blowing up. Debris of stone and wood rained down everywhere. The soldiers nearby were flung away into the air like rag dolls. Ah! Jeanald couldn't immediately recover from the aftermath of the explosion and shook his head ungainly. A disorienting buzz continued to ring inside his ears. He forced himself to look in the same location again, and his brows shot up greatly soon afterwards. The outer wall had collapsed. Kai. The nightmarish howls of the undead could clearly be heard coming from the other side of the wall. Ah! Ah! I, I can't hear anything. Lord Jeanneld. I can't. I can't hear anything. P please, save, save me. Hayes clung onto Jeanneld's pants, but the latter simply ignored the boy and staggered back up to his feet. He then muttered to himself while looking at the outer wall, M must, stop. The soldiers and convicts got up with the same difficulty as him as well. They were shaking the cobwebs off their heads, still oblivious to what's going on. Stop them! Their feudal lord, Jeanneld, managed to roar out these words. Only then did they realize the current situation. Their gazes hurriedly shifted towards the destroyed outer wall. The ground was vibrating. Hordes of undead were rushing out from the thick fog and not with their usual slow, lumbering steps either they were running madly in order to devour the living. The complexions of the soldiers and convicts paled instantly. Uawachk. As soon as they regained their bearings, they fell back into panic again. All of them were screaming. They either held their heads or trembled from sheer fear. Some who even began running away. None of them were thinking of fighting back. This fear quickly spread among the ranks of the convicts. Even the trained soldiers and knights were trembling right now. The fog containing demonic energy seeped in through the destroyed wall. And from the sky, the red moon cast its eerie glow down below. The atmosphere morphed into one perfectly suited to instill fear in the hearts of men. What are you all doing? Stop! Stop them! Jeanneld shouted out but there were no soldiers who heeded him. Instead, they simply stood frozen in place and dazedly stared at the horde of the incoming undead. The feudal lord gritted his teeth and unsheathed his sword. At this rate, the walking dead would fully invade into the fortress. This would mean the death of his citizens. Damn it, damn it! Oh, dear goddess of love and mercy, Gaia! Please grant us your protection. Even though Jeanneld didn't know how to wield divinity, he did learn how to use mana a really long time ago. He offered his prayer towards the goddess and invigorated the sleeping mana within his body. He took a deep breath and approached the destroyed outer wall all by himself. This kinda reminds me of a tower defense game. Viscount Jeanneld flinched in surprise from the sudden words and stopped walking. What a clear and pristine voice that was. The spirit speech which contained a low amount of divinity spread around and entered the ears of the surrounding soldiers and convicts. Their gazes were focused in one spot. A priest donning a beak mask while wearing a robe walked out from the darkness. With a shovel leaning against his shoulder, he glared at the incoming undead. 
the distance between the wall and the voracious undead horde was now down to only 200 meters. Maybe it'll be easier for us to defend one spot rather than moving about here and there. Their opponents were the undead after all. They were wild beasts that didn't know how to use their heads. Such beings were heavily ruled by their primal instincts, causing them to blindly pounce on any living beings nearby. When fighting against such creatures, it'd be most effective to bury them all at once in one area. The beak mask wearing priest pointed his shovel at the rushing undead. There were only about 100 meters left now. Oh, dear Gaia. Grant me the strength to protect these poor lambs. His shovel suddenly began glowing brightly. The distance had now shrunk down to 50 meters. Swamp of Death. Dot. A single droplet of water formed on the ends of the shovel's blade. 5 meters. That droplet then began falling towards the ground below. 3 meters. The hordes of undead leapt up. They now crossed into the other side of the outer walls. And then. 1 meter. Just as the droplet touched the ground and issued a clear ringing sound. Every single undead who leapt up turned into ashes and were exterminated. Even the darkness dying the surroundings in the black hue disappeared too. The feudal Lord Janelt, Hayes, the convicts, the soldiers, and Harmon who belatedly arrived on the scene, all clamped their mouths shut. The fog containing demonic energy dissipated. In its place, clear and pure water began wetting the ground. A shallow lake soon formed there with the droplet as its center. Every single undead entering the wall fell down as soon as they stepped foot inside this lake. Their bodies enhanced by demonic energy convulsed violently before completely melting down. Kiiiiaa! The monsters howled and flailed about in agony. Despite the lake only reaching up to their ankles, they still all ungainly thrashed about as if they had fallen into a bottomless ocean. T this is! Viscount Janald stared at the lake that extended past his own feet. He could sense an aura of holiness from the water. His initially chaotic head was now slowly growing calmer. He even felt his body getting lighter and stronger too. He gasped and began thinking. This, this is exactly the same as the blessing bestowed by the Imperial Prince. Oh dear Gaia! Janald quickly shifted his gaze back to the priest donning the beak mask, no, the seventh Imperial Prince. Grant your divine protection to those who wish to fight beside you. The boy prince turned around and swung his shovel this time. Plague of debilitation. The moment those words left his lips, white particles of light rushed out from the bodies of the convicts and soldiers. Jeanald's jaw dropped after witnessing this spectacle. The imperial prince was performing a white area blessing without any hesitation whatsoever. This was a miracle that regular priests could never dream of performing. Just how much divinity does he have? Just as Janald thought of this, the imperial prince faltered slightly. He propped the shovel on the ground and managed to retain his balance. He then raised the mask ever so slightly and grabbed a bottle out of nowhere to drink what was contained within. I see, did he exhaust all of his energy just now? Viscount Janald tightly clenched his fist. He was deeply moved by the fact that His Highness, the Imperial Prince, had personally stepped up to protect his citizens. I it's the... Saint Nim. Janald flinched slightly from surprise yet again and shifted his gaze to his side. That's where he found Hayes, previously shivering in fear, mutter to himself in a daze. I it's really the Saint Nim. Janald turned his head back. This time the voices came from the convicts and soldiers. The Saint Nim that defeated the vampire. He's the one who gave me the holy water. The silent whispers soon grew louder and became noisy clamors. With this, everyone recovered their wits. The terror and fear they experienced just now had disappeared. Janald's heart pounded away. He knew that now was the time. He needed to do something when everyone's fear had gone away. But how? And do what exactly? He, Janald finally opened his mouth, the saint, he, will be with us. His voice was small. No one could hear him. He gritted his teeth, and then shouted loudly enough for the veins in his throats to bulge up, the saint Nim will. 
Hayes, the convicts, and the soldiers all flinched in surprise before looking at their feudal lord, Jeanneld. He will be with us. The eyes of soldiers and convicts grew larger and larger. The saint who received the blessing of Goddess Gaia will fight with us. He is the grandson of the great hero, His Majesty the Holy Emperor Kelt All False. The seventh imperial prince will fight for our sake. Jeanneld roared out as he pointed his sword at the collapsed outer wall, at the undead falling over after stepping into the lake, and at those stepping over the melting corpses below only to melt down themselves. He was pointing at the army of undead that was gradually inching closer to them. Let us fight with the saint, and exterminate the undead. He then ran forward. For the glory of his majesty, and for the glory of Gaia. All the soldiers and convicts quickly unsheathed and pulled out their weapons after witnessing their feudal lord personally rush into the fray. Oh, hoo hoo hoo. Hayes was initially confused by this development, but then, he too became drunk in the atmosphere and yanked out his sword. Every single one of the soldiers and convicts rushed towards the undead. The two sides collided and blood splattered everywhere. While witnessing this spectacle, the imperial prince scowled deeply within the mask. He was trying to conceal his identity here, and yet that fool of a feudal lord had to go and grandly advertise it to everyone else. This somewhat pissed him off. Are you all right, your highness? Meanwhile, Harman approached the prince, clearly worried about him. I spent way too much divinity. After seeing the prince chug down the holy water, Harman could only smile bitterly. He then summoned some soldiers and ordered them to escort the prince away. While swords and spears sliced, diced, and stabbed into the surging horde of the undead, arrows and crossbow bolts rained down from either side of the destroyed wall. Oil was poured down and lit to burn away the creatures down below. The undead who continued rushing in without any thoughts were quickly killed off. Saint Nim is with us. The bloodline of the great hero, Kelt All False, is helping us. His Highness has stepped up as the vanguard. Their fighting spirit was soaring higher. Whether it was a soldier or a convict, they all had fully broken free from the shackles of fear. TL, back to first person POV. Well, that's amazing, all right. I was sitting on a chair located not too far from the destroyed outer wall to watch the ongoing battle. I heard from somewhere that people were animals of the mood of the moment. Apparently, we would feel fear because of the pressure emanating from the surroundings, or start feeling rapture after being incited. And right now, it kind of felt just like that. Inciting them is all good and well, but... Let Gaia's blessing be with us. His Highness the Imperial Prince is with us. The Holy Emperor's grandson, Alan All False, has become the saint and he will save us. Why do you all keep mentioning my name? And who the EFF is a saint? What's all this nonsense about saving you and the whatnot? It seemed that the folks of this world were rather unstoppable when it came to interpreting things their own way. I couldn't help but click my tongue. Basically, they lost their reasoning once more right after escaping from the clutches of fear. Could it be that divinity had a similar effect to psychedelics? Well, thanks to this, I can't even summon my undead now. Yup, with the things as they were, I couldn't summon my undead. But then again, I didn't really need to make a move of my own now, so it might be as good a result for me in the end. Thud. Thud. Loud footsteps could be heard from the distance. I turned my attention towards the outer walls. It's a zombie ogre. A four meter tall giant, an ogre, made its entrance. A tottering monster with rotting flesh stepped across the lake filled with divinity. It then swung the mace held in its hand. With each of its swings, four or five soldiers and convicts flew away while screaming, only to crash back down on the ground. I winced and closed my eyes briefly after witnessing this sight. Getting struck by something like that meant you wouldn't have enough time to feel pain, as you'd be pretty much dead right away. The soldiers thrust their spears forward. However, the monster's hide couldn't be pierced with only such strikes. However, a figure leapt up towards the monster during the opening. Oh, the god of war, Haim. The paladin, 
Harman, draped his divinity over his sword, and as his eyes flickered coldly, he cleanly cut the ogre's head off. The severed head flew up before crashing back down to earth. I spat out an exclamation after witnessing that sight, wow! So damn strong! Harman alone quite easily got rid of a zombie ogre that dozens of dead spirit soldiers couldn't win against. With how things were going, I figured that I didn't need to step up here anymore. The blessing should persist on for a good while. Even if it did come to an end, these soldiers who were behaving as if they were drunk on the effects of psychedelics wouldn't lose their fighting spirit any time soon. It seemed like I didn't have to summon any of my own undead to defend this PL. You lowly living things that defile this world. Pay for your sins with your lives. I reflexively covered up my nose. A truly disgusting stench stung my nostrils. I turned my head towards the outer walls. There was a muscular three meter tall monster walking in an unsteady gait, all the while sporting the white rolled up hairstyle of medieval nobles and wearing blood stained formal clothing. It was the vampire count. The hulking monster's eyes burned in rage as it swung around its hands emitting crimson light. A powerful explosion threw off dozens of soldiers in the air before they helplessly hit the ground. They must have died instantly as none of them moved afterwards. It only lasted for a short while, though, the fallen soldiers suddenly convulsed and then stood back up as zombies to pounce on the living soldiers and convicts. What the hell? Hang on. Is that guy really the vampire I sniped a couple of days ago? That fat body was now filled with rippling muscles. As far as my memories go, it couldn't even stand on its own two feet earlier and had to get dragged away by the other zombies. Yet now, it's standing tall on its own no problem. The bastard was swinging its demonic energy-laden hands everywhere to subjugate the living soldiers. You damn vampire! Harman roared out and rushed towards the vampire count. However, the monster simply deflected the swung sword with its hand glowing in crimson light. Where is that bastard? Where's the priest who inflicted upon me this unforgivable shame earlier? The vampire count was furiously scanning the battlefield. I naturally shrank back from that sight. What the hell? That guy's looking for me? I said. Where's the damn priest who humiliated me earlier? Yup, it's 100% me. Holy cow! You're supposed to be a vampire count, and yet, what a small-minded guy you are. Searching for me just because I landed a hit on you once. I mean, what I did couldn't be that bad, right? Well, I guess it was pretty bad. I inwardly clicked my tongue. Meanwhile, the vampire count swung its hands again, flinging dozens more soldiers away before flinching grandly and stared straight in my direction. I sense a disgusting stench. Holy sh asterisk t. Do I smell that bad? I quickly took a look at myself. Only then did I realize that the particles of divinity were still drifting off of me, perhaps because I had been activating blessing for a while now. Son of a. I shot up from the chair. The vampire count smirked and ran in my direction while shoving aside the soldiers in the way. You bastard! I shall personally devour you alive! I quickly summoned the musket rifle. I wasn't planning on fighting the vampire count head on. Doing that would be a certain death, after all. Doesn't mean I'm gonna let you kill me, though. This was my struggle for survival. I raised the rifle and took aim at the vampire. 024. Merry Christmas. Minus 3 Fin. Chapter 38, 025. Merry Christmas. Minus 4. Blood splattered around, flesh got sliced apart. Farming tools were used in hacking away at the moving corpses. Charlotte and Grill were participating in the battle near the outer walls alongside the other villagers. The groups of soldiers and convicts got into a messy tangle with the undeads. However, not a single one of them displayed signs of fear. Their roller coaster of emotions controlled by the atmosphere were enough to drive away the terror in their hearts. Charlotte and Grill had been supplying equipment to those in need until early dawn, and that was why they happened to be near the outer walls. After grabbing a nearby farming tool with his fellow villagers, 
they began hacking away at the undead that managed to get past the destroyed outer walls and the soldiers defending it. You bastards! You bastards! You bastards! Shh. After hacking down at the fallen undead, Grill continued swinging his farming tool at the horde of zombies approaching him. Ha ha! Ha ha ha! As a matter of fact, he even had a smile on his face. Soldiers were roaring out in the ecstasy of victory even in the middle of the battle. Grill was affected by this atmosphere and seemed to have forgotten all about the undead's terror. While delivering various equipment, Charlotte glanced at the wagon filled with steel shields and swords. Just before she could reach out and grab one though, Grill called out to her. Charlotte! It's dangerous, so stay behind me. I'll protect you. After accepting her as his adopted daughter, Grill became extremely protective of her. It wasn't just because of the weight of responsibility he now felt, but also because he treated her like his real daughter, that's why. Charlotte could only smile wryly at him. The way Grill fought against the zombie horde looked really amateurish. She prayed that he wouldn't force his body too much and hurt himself trying to protect her. It's the vampire. Protect His Highness the Imperial Prince. Charlotte reacted immediately when she heard the words Imperial Prince. Her gaze quickly shifted to the distance and took in the sight of a giant entering the outer walls while crushing the soldiers fighting over there. Its hulking physique was well over three meters tall. Demonic energy poured out from its hands and by using that, the monster rode past the crowd of soldiers before it. So that's where you've been hiding, you accursed priest. I shall repay you for the humiliation I suffered. The vampire roared as it looked at someone. Its expression was hideously contorted out of sheer rage. Using its tall height, the monster discovered the whereabouts of the imperial prince. You vampire! A man's enraged voice could be heard next. Paladin Harmon stood before the vampire to fight it. His divinity cloaked sword clashed noisily against the hand enveloped in crimson demonic energy. The two opposing forces collided, creating a powerful explosion. Harmon was flung away from the impact and crashed into the outer wall. He groaned in pain but even then, his eyes never left the vampire. He gritted his teeth and tenaciously resumed his attack. His sword, brimming full with divinity, cleaved a portion of the vampire's leg flesh. The monster wobbled unsteadily before glaring at Harmon. You bastard! What are all of you doing? Take care of this pest. The vampire's roar caused dozens of dull ahans to break through the ranks of soldiers and appear near their future king. The headless knights filled with spear, sword and even arrow wounds attacked and tied Harmon down on the spot. He quickly looked around the surroundings. Viscount Jeanelt. Jeanelt, while flailing about breathlessly among the zombie horde, heard the paladin's call. He responded by turning his exhausted body towards the ladder. His Highness is in danger. Only then did the Viscount sense the urgency of the situation and looked around as well. The vampire was clearly targeting someone by breaking through the army to get somewhere. Knights, protect the Imperial Prince. The feudal lord's cry prompted the knights to quickly make their move. They shoved aside the undead around them and urgently rushed towards the vampire. However, you lowly insects dare to. The vampire count suddenly sucked in a deep breath. Its neck and cheeks ballooned up like a bullfrog's. The swell of crimson demonic energy could be seen through its thick hide before the monster spat it out. The breath of death enveloped the knights, soldiers, and convicts below it. Fuuu! Their bodies instantly began rotting away. But then, the dead men instantly rose back up as an undead and howled out loudly. The vampire count watched all of this happen and began guffawing grandly while grabbing its stomach. Only two things remained on the path it treads on become either the meat paste of human remains, or an undead that would serve the creature. Just as the vampire expressed satisfaction over its own creations, a bullet containing divinity flew into the creature. The barrier made out of demonic energy shattered into fine pieces and scattered everywhere. The vampire's grin was wiped off in an instant. It recalled the horrifying wound inflicted upon it a couple of days ago as it quickly turned its head towards the source of the bullet. You bastard! 
a priest carrying a musket rifle was busy running deeper into the fortress's interior. And as if to protect him, groups of knights formed a cordon around the vampire. They secured huge steel shields on the ground and raised their spears. This is as far as you go, vampire. What a humorous bunch of fools. The vampire count quickly made its move. It didn't need to worry about these small fries after all. However, that particular priest was another story. That human was capable of firing a divinity projectile which was capable of smashing through the protective barrier made out of demonic energy. Leaving him alone was simply too dangerous. The vampire then threw its hefty frame forward. It stomped past the knights blocking its path, and with ungainly steps, ran towards where the imperial prince was. Charlotte, who was watching the proceedings from afar, gritted her teeth. The imperial prince in danger. She unhesitantly picked up a shield and a sword resting on the wagon. See Charlotte. As Grill watched her rush into the alleyway, he alternated his flustered gaze between her distancing back and the outer wall. Before long though, he was chasing after her, the farming tool still tightly gripped his hands. TL, back to first person POV. Why your highness, you need to escape. Knights shouted out as they stood before the vampire. The hulking monster continued to come after me, its eyes gleaming in madness. Holy sh asterisk t, that's terrifying. I slung the rifle on my shoulder and hurriedly ran deeper into the fortress. But I didn't forget to sneak a glance behind me though. Another huge explosion ensued and knights were flung into the air. They were crushed by the vampire's feet, and their heads were ripped off after getting ensnared by its huge hands. Those dead knights with intact heads invariably stood back up as zombies and scattered in all directions. What a horrifying scene straight out of a horror movie that was. That'll be my fate if I get caught, hey. Still, running with such a huge body would be a bit too much, right? If I focused on moving through narrow alleyways, I should be able to lose the damn thing. Not only that, defeating 10,000 undead should become a much easier job with the vampire leaving the destroyed outer wall. As long as I succeeded in luring away their commander, our side should emerge victorious. After quickly entering a narrow alleyway, I then took a look behind me. Son of a b asterisk tch. The vampire count continued chasing after me by destroying the houses on either side. Its hefty physique acted like a bulldozer as it mowed down everything blocking its path, all just to get closer to me. I thought the damn thing wouldn't be able to advance that fast, but then, it was closing the distance at a considerable speed all thanks to its long gates. Blood was staining all parts of its muscular body. What a horrible looking monster it was. Oh dear Gaia. Grant me the strength to pierce thee. I brought the rifle near my lips and breathed into it while offering my prayer. But then, my entire back suddenly felt a creepy chill. I turned my head back only to discover the roof of a house flying in my direction. Oh, she. I reflexively leapt into the alley next to mine. The spot I was in only a moment ago was swept away by the roof crashing down. The entrance of the alleyway was now blocked by the debris. I raised my head to look around. My eyes caught the sight of a hand grabbing the corner house of the alleyway before a huge head abruptly peeked out from around it. A disgusting smirk was etched on its chubby cheeks. You rat-like bastard. And you're a stinking monster, dude. I hurriedly scrambled back up and started running again. It seemed that the enemy was rather sensitive towards divinity. Well, it did fling a whole roof in my way as soon as I tried praying to gather more divinity, so this hypothesis could very well be true. Creating a bullet by gathering divinity would take at least one minute, and if I were to add the praying bit on top, then I'd need another 30 seconds, too. Trying to attack it even once this way would probably result in me getting killed instead. I didn't really have much of a choice here. Now that things have gotten to this stage, I might as well run around and waste time until a rescue party shows up. It was then, a huge shadow was suddenly cast down on me. I shall turn you into dust. The vampire was floating in the air. It spread its arms wide open and was sucking in a deep breath. That thing 
could fly? Hang on, isn't that, what I saw just now? That breath thing? My complexion turned deathly pale. Even I had no way of defending against that. Become an undead. The breath of death shot out from the vampire's mouth. Its crimson breath, eerily similar to huge swelling flames, crashed into the alleyway and left me with no immediate escape route. It was then, someone suddenly dashed out from behind me. The figure pushed me down by my shoulders, and then stepped in front of me while raising a humongous steel shield that was far bigger than her slender physique. Charlotte. Her eyes were as scary as that of a venomous snake's. She planted her feet on the ground as firmly as she could. Her actions caused the ground below her to cave in. After she stabbed the sword down, both of her hands grabbed the shield's handle, securing her grip on it. Her slender arms were now bulging with thick veins. Awaaaa! Grill popped out from the alleyway before I even noticed him, then quickly supported the shield along with Charlotte. Once I saw what they were doing, I reflexively supported them from behind as well. Right then, the breath of death smashed into the steel shield. The weighty impact of the strike forced all of us to slide back. From the tips of our fingers, our bodies began rotting away little by little. Woo woo Charlotte and Grill shut their mouths in agony. We couldn't defend against this attack like this. I even sensed that the shield was beginning to melt down. In that case, I reached out and touched the shield. Give it your all and push back. Divine Aura has been activated. Equipment will temporarily be reinforced. A blood vein-like symbol appeared on the shield as divinity began swirling within. Just reinforcing equipment? No, this alone wasn't going to cut it. Oh Gaia! Charlotte's, Grills, and even my hand, were rotting away. Grant me your power to protect these poor lambs. More divinity poured out and permeated into all of our bodies. Our flesh repeated the pattern of rotting away before fully regenerating. Grant us your love and mercy, and lead your flock to light. More divinity gathered with these words. On the other hand, it also felt like divinity inside my body was rapidly drying up. With your power, grant us a shield strong enough to protect us against the undead. The huge shield started developing large cracks. Your faithful servant, Alan Allfalls, offers this prayer. The shield eventually shattered. But at the same time, another shield created out of divinity replaced it. Two opposing forces divinity and demonic energy collided against each other. The vampire count still spitting out the breath of death witnessed this event and its brows shot up much, much higher. And no, it mustn't. A humongous explosion resounded out. Every single structure nearby was forced back before exploding into millions of pieces. The vampire's mouth, used to spit out its breath of death, was viciously ripped apart by the blast. Its demonic energy barrier shattered too as its hefty figure crashed down to the ground below. The once narrow alleyway had now resembled a wide open field. The sacred shield protecting the three of us couldn't endure any more and shattered while dissipating into light particles. I no longer had any energy left in my legs. Before I fell down, Charlotte with wide open eyes hurriedly propped me up first. Are you all right? Of course not. Right now, I didn't even have enough energy to stand up straight. Not only that, it felt like all of my bones had turned into powder, too. I glanced to my side and discovered that Grill had passed out on the ground. Oh, how envious I felt just then, wishing I could just collapse and pass out like that, but... Ah! Ah, ah, ah! But the vampire count was still alive. Various parts of its body were ballooning up as if boils were growing on it. Those growths then began rupturing noisily next. While screaming in agony from the holy flames burning it, the vampire desperately rolled around on the ground. Holy water. I barely managed to summon a bottle of holy water from my item window. However, I didn't even have enough energy to hold it and ended up dropping it on the ground. Charlotte picked the bottle up and cautiously tipped it against my lips. And that's how I got to drink my stash of holy water. My body recovered to a certain extent after that 
allowing me to move again. However, my current divinity reserve was still empty. Even if I prayed, I wouldn't be able to use any skills whatsoever. It'd be a prudent idea to run away from this place before that damn vampire recovered itself. To be honest, I'd much prefer if soldiers showed up and lent us some help right about now. I mean, this would be the most optimal time to kill that vampire, what with its current condition and all. Let's retreat for now. At this rate, things will get dange. I took a step back while saying this, before sensing my foot touch something. A weird emotion flooded my mind as I stared at a certain skull rolling around on the ground next to me. It was the skull of a mountain goat, a type of animal that always seemed to be used as a symbol of the devil. It was so big that one could probably wear it like a full face helmet. It was also the item the vampire wore like a necklace too. But why was it here? Did it land here due to the explosion? I continued getting this strange hunch from it. Even I could tell that it wasn't just an ordinary skull. Is it a, magical item or something? I used mind's eye on it. Regular items wouldn't show any response with this skill, but what if it was a magical item instead? Necromancer King Amon's Skull Abilities, depending on the user's standard, demonic energy is amplified by between the minimum of 20% to a maximum of 200%, plus the addition of a 10% recovery effect. All abilities related to demonic energy will increase by 10%. Dot. The results were in. And I became utterly speechless by what I saw. This thing amplifies demonic energy by 20 to 200%. Alongside 10% recovery. Not only that, all skills and abilities improved by 10% too? What a legendary class item this was. Hang on, demonic energy was it? Did that mean I couldn't use it? For some reason though, I didn't feel any rejection from this item, despite it being supposed to be operated only on demonic energy. I cautiously pushed Charlotte away, and as if in a trance, picked the skull up. The remaining divinity in me was smaller than a rat's tail. Even if I roused it up by giving it my all, I still wouldn't be able to use a single skill. Instead, I activated Divine Aura and reinforced Amon's skull. Equipment will temporarily be reinforced. Temporarily reinforced Necromancer Amon's skull. Abilities, depending on the user's standard, demonic energy amplified by between the minimum of 40% to a maximum of 400%, plus the addition of a 20% recovery effect. All abilities related to demonic energy will increase by 15%. Possible to summon the armor of the dead souls. An exclamation left my lips all on its own. I began stroking the skull of the necromancer king. Maybe because of divine aura, I had the feeling that I knew how to use this item, too. There was a type of activation code for this thing. My body moved instinctively as I placed the skull of the mountain goat on my head. I bowed slightly. I am the legion said I as my eyes locked on the vampire count while it was ungainly standing back up. And I am Gaia's inheritor. 025. Merry Christmas. Minus 4 Finn. Chapter 39, 026. Merry Christmas. Minus 5, Part 1. The pain the vampire felt was so brutal that it thought its soul was burning away. Divinity dug into every little corner of its large body and caused it excruciating pain that couldn't be described in mere words. You stinking priest bastard. However, that much was still fine. This level of agony was still tolerable. That explosion should have also left the priest bastard in tatters as well. Even if he managed to somehow survive it, he probably wouldn't have enough energy left to gather any more divinity. This was what the vampire count thought as it raised its upper torso. I am the legion. But suddenly, it could hear someone mutter out these ominous words. The vampire flinched nastily as its whole body froze up right there and then. And I am Gaia's inheritor. Right at that moment, this incredible pressure materialized out of nowhere, one almost heavy enough to crush the vampire's whole body and the atmosphere kept getting heavier and heavier with every passing second. A deathly chill ran down the monster's spine. Its body, 
which was completely covered in goosebumps from head to toe, instinctively refused to move. W. What is this feeling? The vampire count swallowed its dry saliva and looked behind it. The monster now could see a figure standing tall over there while grasping the hilt of a great sword stabbed into the ground. Another figure, also standing tall but had a long sword attached to its hips. There were more, figures wielding bows and crossbows, ones with spears slung over their shoulders. Even some with maces and shields, etc. About thirty undead beings gripping onto various weapons could be seen now. However, even at a casual glance, one could tell that they were no ordinary undead. All of them wore matching white armor. Some were using the debris from the destruction earlier as their chairs, while others remained standing. Bluish wisps of breaths leaked out from around their mouths. Their eyes gleamed fiercely as if they were still alive. They then opened their mouths. Or more correctly, it was their jawbones that bobbed up and down, their teeth clattering against one another. I can smell the odor of death. This quiet murmur contained traces of divinity. It was spirit speech, something an ordinary undead could never ever hope to produce. These existences, these holy knights, shifted their gazes over to the imperial prince. Is he the master responsible for our creation? If so, what is our purpose? What is the reason for our creation? They all possessed ego and were capable of thoughts. They turned their heads, their glares locking onto the vampire. The bluish light in their eyes narrowed as if to focus on the giant but immobile monster. It's a heretic that goes against the rules of this world. And so, is this the reason for our creation? A creature no better than a mere germ that maintains the balance of this world wishes to imitate a living being. The vampire froze up after meeting their glares. Just what are those? Although what it heard was a mere whisper, the vampire definitely did hear the priest say the activation phrase. What he said, though, wasn't the call to the god of death, Yude, but one meant for the ears of the god of life, Gaia. And that was the strangest part of it all. The necromancer King Amun worshipped the god of death. But calling out to Gaia while summoning these undead through that person's skull? This, it does not make, any sense. The vampire stumbled backwards all the while denying reality unfolding right in front of its eyes. This event simply couldn't happen. It mustn't be allowed to happen, either. The human priest might have called out to Gaia, but she was the goddess of life and as such, she simply couldn't have possessed the powers to rule over the undead. Those creatures, they were such incongruous and inconceivable existences that even the goddess herself should be freaked out by their mere presence alone. It's only obvious why we have been created. As I thought, we should abide by the commands given to us. The holy undead knights gathered and formed an orderly line. And then, they stood before the boy wearing the mountain goat's skull, cautiously kneeling and bowing their heads. This was completely different from the usual display of bowing before their sovereign. No, it was far closer to the sight of fervent believers filled to the brim with unbreakable faith, earnestly waiting for their next divine orders. Your command. Their master didn't say anything when the holy undead asked. He simply showed it with his actions instead. The priest donning Amun's skull raised his hand and pointed at the vampire. Then, his raised thumb pointed downwards. It was truly a simple gesture, something that no one else in this world would have understood. However, these holy undead knights were connected to their master and they indeed fully understood what this order entailed. They stood up. They raised and cocked their heads to the side. And then, started glaring intensely at the vampire. We. Their blue eyes were set ablaze. Detest death. Pure unbridled and naked terror began dying the vampire's expression. Kuo. The moment the holy undead knights roared out, divine aura flooded out from the gaps of their white armor. The vampire count urgently covered its ears. It was suddenly struck by spirit speech containing divinity. The roars were so powerful that the undead's eardrums almost ruptured and even its soul was shaken to the core. The holy undead knights lowered their posture with their weapons raised up. They kicked the ground and dashed towards the vampire. Why you monsters? 
the vampire's complexion paled instantly. Undead that possessed divinity. Just where did such hybrids even show up from? This was definitely an extraordinary phenomenon. These knights called the vampire a heretic that went against the rules of the world, but their existence itself was the true contradiction. Because they were definitely the beings that went against the rules in this case, were they not? These creatures utterly shattered the logic governing this world. You cursed undead knights. You're the true heretics that insult the will of the god of death, Yude. The vampire used all of its strength and gathered whatever demonic energy it could. Then, it slammed its hand filled with the reddish energy down on the ground. The land below split apart and a large rune letter was generated. Hordes of undead began crawling out from the depths of hell. Zombies, skeletons, ghouls, and even dull ahans there were about 200 individuals that crawled out, screeching towards the heavens above. Go and punish those heretics that betrayed Yude's will. The vampire waved its hand. The mob of undead howled out and dashed towards the holy knights. The knight wielding the great sword stomped its foot. The ground below crumbled and buckled as it swung the massive blade with both of its hands. Eternal rest for the undead. With just one swing, many undead were thrown into the air, only to turn into ashes and scatter away. The blessings of Gaia, the one who extols all life. The holy knights wielding crossbows and bows pulled the triggers and let go of their strings to fire their projectiles. The volleys of light penetrated through multiple undead creatures in an instant. We are Gaia's spears and shields. The holy knights brandishing shields created an impregnable wall of iron, and the spear wielders began thrusting their weapons forward from behind them. Every undead that came in contact with the shields all burst into flames without a single exception, and those stabbed by the spear blades blew up spherically like bursting balloons and were exterminated immediately. Two hundred or so undead versus thirty holy knights, the vampire held the obvious numerical advantage, but it failed to even leave a single nick on the armors of the holy undead knights. Ah, ah, ah. The vampire was overcome with terror and grief again. It knew that getting captured by those things meant certain purification for itself. The life it struggled so hard to acquire for the past fifty years would be snuffed out so quickly, just like that. Owaea! The vampire count yelled out, but then, it suddenly closed its mouth tightly. Its stomach bulged greatly. This disgusting-looking bulge traveled all the way up from its belly to its throat, then went past its throat and into its mouth. Demonic energy leaked out from the torn bits of flesh hanging around the creature's jaw. And with every ounce of its energy, the vampire spat out another breath of death. No, it tried to. Kuuuuu. A holy undead knight swung its great sword upwards. From the vampire's bulging stomach all the way up to its jaw was sliced apart. Demonic energy leaked out as the monster's flesh burned and turned into ashes. Owaea. Arrows and bolts connected by chains flew in and pierced through the vampire's body. These sharp projectiles stuck out like the needles of a hedgehog, the connected chains serving to rob the monster of its freedom. The vampire's large frame was quickly dragged down as it crashed face first into the dirt. The waiting holy undead knights then slammed down and crushed both of the fallen creature's legs with their shields. Aaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
the boy in front of its eyes couldn't have been older than 15, maybe 16 years old at most. However, he was definitely no ordinary human. The expression on the young priest's face was more sinister and cruel than any other devil in existence. His eyes, his lips, they were smiling. This devil, seemingly filled with madness, slowly opened his mouth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The barrel lined up right in front of the vampire's eyes. This indescribably horrifying and ominous divinity began coalescing in the weapon again. And then. Hey. Mr. Vampire. Merry Christmas. Give my regards to Gaia when you reach hell, okay? The boy priest said some things that could either be construed as pure blasphemy or words of exaltation for the goddess, and then firmly squeezed the trigger. December 25th. The morning sun was steadily rising up in the sky. Warm sunlight drove out the effects of the negative field and ushered in the aura of the positive field. The fog filled with demonic energy still lingered. However, even that added to the feeling of staring at a beautiful snowy field emitting a gentle light. A convict stabbed his sword on the ground to support himself. While breathing heavily, he took a look at his surroundings. He could no longer see any undead beyond the outer walls. Those infernal creatures had all scattered away. The only remaining undead were the ones slowly melting down within the lake made out of holy water. Various levels of fluster filled up the faces of the convicts and the soldiers. However, this only lasted for a brief moment and their expressions soon began quivering next. The corners of their lips trembled. Convulsions broke out on the muscles surrounding their eyes. And finally. We. We won. The feudal Lord Genald forced his hand up and declared their victory, despite having trouble moving that very arm. Ah. 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 I, made it. I'm alive. Every single one of the soldiers and convicts roared out in celebration. Even the citizens of the Rania territory as well as the refugees from other villages also cried out loudly, their cheers filled with unbridled happiness. Despite staggering somewhat, Harman continued to move. But when he got to the center of Rania fortress, which now resembled a devastated and empty plain, his eyes nearly popped out of their sockets. Because, he witnessed several undead knights made out of pure light standing still in the center. Unfortunately, this scene only lasted for a second. They vanished by scattering away as light particles. On this desolate and ruined empty land, one boy could be seen supported by a girl. An unconscious man was also laying on the ground, too. Finally. The Vampire. Starting from its head, Harman could see the vampire slowly turning into ashes and scattering away in the wines. The paladin clamped his mouth shut and shifted his gaze back to the imperial prince. The boy, while being supported by the silver-haired girl, was sleeping like a dead log, a satisfied grin etched on his face. On a hill not too far from Rania Fortress. The theocratic empire dispatched its most elite legion, the Holy Cross Knight Order after sensing that something ominous was afoot in the northern region from the unlikely report of no undead being sighted in the land of the dead spirits for the past month or so. And only on the morning of the 25th did they finally manage to reach their destination, Rania. An old man stood tall in front of the troops and while staring at the fortress, he muttered with a disinterested expression. Are we already too late? He was outfitted in a set of armor so thick that it bordered on being excessively hulking. Quite unlike the scale of the white armor he was wearing, though, the old man's body under all those layers of protection was on the thin side. It seems so, my lord. I was wondering what was going on. When I heard that a strange phenomenon was afoot in the land of the dead spirits, I feared the revival of the necromancer king had occurred, but... The old man narrowed his eyes as he took in the sight of Rania Fortress. It was nothing more than some measly little prank of a vampire. Rania Fortress was mostly made up of convicts and civilians. So the vampire failing to overrun such a fortress could only mean that the creature in question didn't possess all that much power, to begin with. I do not know how the vampire managed to command 20,000 undead but that must have been the extent of its powers since it couldn't even win against the sacrificial castle. However, 
that is indeed a bizarre aura. The old man had been sensing a certain aura for a while, long before he and the army reached this location. This aura could have only come about from the chaos caused by the collision of powerful divinity and demonic energy. This phenomenon seemed to indicate that the vampire must have wielded a considerably great amount of demonic energy. It also indicated that a person wielding equally powerful divinity had fought off that very undead. Since the entirety of the fortress was cheering raucously of their victory, that unknown person of considerable divinity must have killed the vampire off in the end. The old man stared at Rania Fortress while muttering to no one in particular, did a saint descend here or something? A god breaking off a fragment of themselves to give birth to an existence, all for the purpose of their entertainment such beings were called saints, or saintesses. Since they couldn't remember or weren't aware of the reasons for their existence, almost none of them had any inklings of who they were. It would be nice if that's indeed the case. The war between vampires and humanity had persisted for the past several millennia. As time continued to pass, the forces of the undead monsters began finding craftier and craftier ways to infiltrate the society of the living. So, it would be great to have a figure like a saint or saintess acting as the rallying point in the ongoing efforts to stop those monsters. The old man smiled wryly. He was beginning to hold baseless hopes as his own demise crept ever closer. The death of a single vampire couldn't possibly herald the advent of a new saint after all. Dispatch the priests, healers, and apothecaries to the fortress. Prioritize healing the citizens, and when they are finished doing that, give the convicts the opportunity to survive. It didn't matter whether or not the convicts and slaves were killed off. However, the safety of the regular citizens here still worried the old man. Understood, Your Majesty. The paladin replied and bowed deeply. We shall head back, the old man said while turning around. He mounted a sturdy warhorse just as another paladin addressed him. But Your Majesty, the seventh imperial prince should be there as well. He was asking if the old man wanted to stop by and meet the boy before leaving. However, the old man's expression crumbled at that inquiry. He glared at the paladin as if he had run into a mortal enemy. I don't have any reason to see a foolish child who keeps insulting the memories of his own mother. Without a doubt, he must have been hiding within the feudal lord's residence, cowering away in fear. It'd be a relief if the boy didn't sh asterisk t his pants during the chaos. We're leaving. I'll listen to Harmon's report on that subject matter at a later stage. Summon him back to the Imperial Palace so that I can grill him for more detailed information. Understood, Your Majesty. Indeed, this old man was none other than the Holy Emperor of the Theocratic Empire, the great hero who killed Necromancer King Amun fifty years ago. Kelt Allfalls took one last look at Rania Fortress before setting off. My rotten little grandson. Holy Emperor Kelt Allfalls made his way back to the Imperial Palace. About two weeks later, Paladin Harman showed up to submit his account of what happened. Inside the Imperial Audience Chamber so huge that it could qualify as a royal castle on its own right, Harman bowed deeply towards Holy Emperor Kelt Allfalls sitting on the throne. The Paladin then opened his mouth. His Highness the Imperial Prince was the one who hunted the Vampire Count, Your Majesty. The Holy Emperor's mouth clamped shut after hearing this. 26. Merry Christmas. Minus 5, Part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 41, 027. Imperial Prince is going home minus 1, Part 1. Paladins were standing in a line on either side of the Imperial Palace's audience chamber. And towards the rear, the high-ranking members of the clergy, the scions of the Imperial family, and lastly, many important nobles could be found in large crowds. They had all congregated here today to listen to the strange occurrence on the land of the dead spirits. However, the things Harman said just now wasn't exactly what they had been expecting to hear. The nobles' eyes showed their shock despite their lips being firmly shut. His Highness the Imperial Prince hunted a vampire. There was an Imperial Prince dispatched to the land of the dead spirits. Various whispers could be heard being exchanged within the nobles' ranks. Meanwhile, 
the scions of the imperial family were exchanging glances with each other. They began shaking their heads to indicate that it wasn't them. The Holy Emperor finally opened his mouth, when you say the Imperial Prince, could you perhaps be referring to the seventh, Alan all false? The nobles wouldn't dare openly smile in front of the Emperor, so they chose to quietly shake their heads instead. Although, they couldn't prevent a faint grin from leaking out as if they heard an amusing joke just now. The seventh Imperial Prince? There's no way that's true, then. It'd be a relief if that boy didn't wet his pants in some corner of a room somewhere. That is indeed so, Your Majesty. Harman's response caused the brows of the gathered nobles to furrow deeply. Even the imperial family's sons were narrowing their eyes. Paladin Harman slowly raised his head and observed the emperor's dignified countenance. The latter's lips were firmly shut and his eyes wide open after being rendered completely speechless. Harman could more or less guess what the Emperor was thinking about right at this moment. For obvious reasons, the latter couldn't believe it. A foolish Imperial Prince who got himself banished for trying to lay his hands on a lady-in-waiting managed to hunt down a vampire. Even Harman would have found the notion quite ridiculous if he hadn't witnessed it himself. Harman. Up until this very moment, I always saw you as a man more virtuous than any other. However. It seems that I was mistaken. Right now, you, the Holy Emperor Kelt all false frowned deeply, hints of displeasure clearly written large on his face. Have you decided to throw in your lot with him? With that rotten basta? Ahem. A fake cough resounded out from beside the Holy Emperor. An old man in his mid to late seventies wearing a white robe stood there while propping up a crozier. He was probably trying to stop the Holy Emperor from blurting out a word that might lower his station. Holy Emperor Kelt all false glanced at the old man, the Archbishop, in unhappiness before shifting his attention back to Harman. Could you perhaps have decided to support the Seventh Imperial Prince's cause? Although he couldn't openly say it, the Emperor was asking if the Paladin had really chosen to sponge off the Seventh Prince. Harman could only smile wryly just then. Indeed, blood is thicker than water, is that it? That boy was definitely the grandson of this emperor, he surely inherited the same fiery blood of the old man. The holy emperor's current attitude was an exact copy of the amnesiac imperial prince. No, your majesty. I merely speak of the truth. Kelt all false wordlessly stared at Harman kneeling below. The latter's eyes which were filled with unshakable faith showing not a single sign of wavering. This paladin used to protect Eulizia in the past. Such a man shouldn't be harboring any untoward thoughts. Archbishop. What is your take on this matter? Harman shifted his gaze over to the Archbishop, Raphael Astoria. He was considered to be one of the ten most influential individuals in the whole theocratic empire. And unfortunately, the seventh imperial prince had a prior record of attempting to rape this man's granddaughter. Such a thing is simply impossible, your majesty. His declaration basically condemned Harman as a liar. The paladin gritted his teeth. This wasn't surprising at all. He already knew that it wouldn't be a cakewalk to stand by a Mang Nani prince like that boy in the first place. However, Raphael Astoria suddenly began gnashing his teeth. He must have felt his rage boil over after recalling the sight of the seventh imperial prince trying to assault his precious granddaughter. Despite this, he suppressed his emotions and continued on. I've received a report that Rania's citizens are now supporting the seventh imperial prince. It seems that some have even taken the action by calling him the saint as well. It was then, someone chortled inside the audience chamber. The origin of that noise was from where the imperial princes and their retainers were. The culprit, the third imperial prince, recognized his slip-up and hurriedly clamped his mouth shut. He swallowed back his dry saliva and lowered his head to acknowledge his mistake. Raphael Astoria carried on from where he left off. It is also an undeniable fact that Your Majesty did detect a bizarre aura emanating from Rania Fortress. As such, there is a need to investigate this matter thoroughly. Kelt all false replied. Are you implying that the aura back then was the seventh imperial prince's power? No, 
Your Majesty. I merely wish to prevent the seventh Imperial Prince from snatching up any accomplishments that belong to someone else. I see, the Holy Emperor responded before fixing his gaze on Harman. Whether your report is false or not has not been verified yet, but it is indeed true that you made great contributions in the defense of Rania Fortress. Therefore, the Emperor raised his hand slightly and made a declaration. The current feudal lord of Rania, Viscount Jinald Repang, shall receive the title of Count. Paladin Harman Dayan shall be bestowed with a small but adequate territory in the northwestern region. And finally, he lowered his hand before letting a heavy silence stew the area for a while. The Emperor's eyes were closed inside this silence. He then softly spoke as if he was talking to himself. I shall reduce the term of banishment for the seventh Imperial Prince, Alan All Faults. The moment he recovers to full health, he is to be brought back to the Imperial Palace immediately. I shall converse with him in person. Archbishop Raphael Astoria's brows rose up higher at that declaration. He seemed to have something to say, but the Holy Emperor raised his hand once more and stopped the clergyman. Any objections? Harman. No, I do not, Your Majesty. Harman Dayan bowed again in response to the Holy Emperor's question. The next location Harman sought out was an isolated room situated in a deep, dark corner of the Imperial Palace. He opened the door and stepped inside, only to be greeted by a familiar voice. Is it you, Harman? It is indeed I, Your Highness. Even though it was still the middle of the day, the windows had all been boarded up, causing the interior of the room to be dark. Harman lit up a lone candle on the candlestick standing tall on a shelf nearby. A gentle light illuminated a young man sitting on the edge of the bed, his whole figure wrapped tightly in bloodied bandages. Although it was not easy to guess the young man's age, based on either his physique or voice, he could have been anywhere between mid to late twenties. Have you been well, Your Highness the First Imperial Prince? This was Ulysses' first son, as well as the elder brother of the Seventh Imperial Prince, Luan All Faults. The young man glared straight at Harman and replied, Been well, you say? Ha ha ha, you certainly do know how to jest, Harman. Surely, you know as well as the others what my current state is like. Indeed, technically I'm still alive. However, I'm now living a fate of suffering intense pain born out of a horrifying curse. It wouldn't be strange for me to die tomorrow, or even today. The first imperial prince, Luan All Faults, had his heart struck by a curse. The demonic energy penetrated into his actual, physical heart and had taken root there. The curse continued to shave away at his life force even now. His skin rotted as all of his senses throughout his body gradually became paralyzed. He had already lost the sense of touch, smell, as well as taste. The remaining two sight and hearing were slowly deteriorating with time, and it wouldn't be strange if he lost them at any moment now. And since the demonic energy was hiding in his heart, treating him was deemed impossible. This meant that he was gradually turning into a living corpse. I've been informed that you tried to stand up for the seventh imperial prince. That is indeed so, your... Luan suddenly reached up and grabbed Harman's collars. The young man's glare burned fiercely. You dared to speak up for that trash who caused our mother's death, the trash who constantly tramples on her legacy? You fool! Are you insane? What's wrong? Have you finally realized that I'm not long for this world and decided to throw in your lot with that bastard? Ha ha ha! If so, then you've chosen poorly. A mang nanny like that can never become the next holy EMP. The first imperial prince flinched in surprise and let go of the paladin's collars. Although he exerted his strength only for a brief moment, droplets of blood already began falling down from his hands. Luan gritted his teeth and began massaging his forehead. I was out of line. Forgive me. You're not a man to stoop so low after all. The seventh imperial prince is not to blame, your highness. I was responsible for Lady Ulysia's passing. If only I remained to protect you back then. Do remember that it was I who gave you that order. I ordered you to bring us extra support, 
didn't I? Even if it was your command, I still failed to protect you, your highness. It's the same thing as having run away from my duties because of my cowardice. If you hadn't brought along the reinforcements needed back then, both I and the seventh imperial prince wouldn't have survived. The vampire targeted Eulizia and both of her children. If either the first or the seventh showed any signs of escaping, then the undead creature would have hunted them down first. Since that was the case, the correct decision was to send Harmon away and seek help from more paladins. Of course, Eulizia was already dead and the first prince was struck by the curse of leprosy by the time they arrived, but still. Harmon cautiously spoke up, Your Highness. Do you? Lewin shifted his gaze back to the paladin. Do you hate the seventh imperial prince that much? Chapter 42, 027 Imperial Prince is going home minus one, part two. Isn't that obvious? Why do you ask something so apparent? Lewin tilted his head. He couldn't figure out the intent behind that question. Harmon continued on. What if the seventh Imperial Prince has been hiding his true self all along? What if he accepted the fate of being treated like trash for the sake of Lady Eulizia? So that he could, raise sufficient strength. He, acted like a Meng Nanny, A and D. Deliberately got himself banished. The first prince looked at Harmon with a pair of pitying and sympathetic eyes. It seems that dealing with that fool for too long has tainted even your mind, Harmon. The road must have been long and tiresome. You must be feeling fatigued from the recent events, as well. Not to mention, dealing with that fool would have been exhausting, too. You should take your well-deserved rest. It was exactly as Harmon thought. No one believed him. Well, all the things the seventh imperial prince had done were beyond acceptable, after all. However, the paladin didn't give up. The young seventh imperial prince was still polishing the dagger of revenge even now. No matter how much strength you shored up, it would crumble down quite easily if no one provided a sturdy pillar of support. A pillar, a necessary backer for the boy, simply had to be found somehow, somewhere. Harmon sighed under his breath. He planned out a new itinerary and quickly headed back to the land of the dead spirits. Several weeks had gone by since the end of the tide of death, yet the Rania fiefdom as a whole still hadn't regained its normalcy. Grill frowned deeply as he organized the corpses that had thawed out from the ice. Just for how long am I supposed to do this? He was a farmer, not some corpse caretaker or some such. However, he couldn't voice his complaints too loudly, because... Fiu The feudal lord of Rania was personally overseeing the disposal of the undead corpses along with his knights, that's why. How did a personage such as him get demoted to this place? How? Grill could only click his tongue in dismay. While he was doing that, his fellow villager... Hans the hunter, sneaked closer to him. Grill. Hurry, my man. Take this. Hans pulled a piece of paper out from his inner pocket and forcibly shoved it inside Grill's clothing. What's this? It's something that came out of an undead. Hurry up before the guards say something. What on earth? Hans seemed to have already lined his pockets well, since he was carefully putting away a bulging pouch within his clothes. I'm telling you, there are plenty of valuable things to be found here. Grill sneaked a glance at the soldiers currently engaged in their duties before taking a closer look at the piece of paper Hans had given him. As he was never taught how to read, he had no idea what was written on this thing. But regardless, the paper itself seemed to be the luxurious sort that the nobles often used. It seemed old with the way it was torn, and the ink blotted and smudged. That only made it look more valuable, though. Grill carefully tucked this scrap of paper back in his inner pocket. He still had no clue what this was, but he figured that it'd be a good idea to ask Charlotte to have the Imperial Prince take a look at it at a later date. And it'd be really great if the item could fetch him some coin, too. Grill smacked his lips in anticipation and returned to his job of disposing the corpses. Back to first-person POV. As I thought. It tastes really great. 
I sat on the edge of the bed and stared at the feast placed on top of the table right before my eyes. The first thing I did was to use a spoon to take a sip of the soup, and slowly cut into the slab of steak with my amateurish knife skills. Then, I brought the chunk of meat into my mouth. Ah, I'm getting all choked up with emotions here. That's how happy I felt right now. This was the sense of satisfaction I was longing for. This sense of happiness. It wasn't something I could feel back when I worked as a gravekeeper in the monastery. Not being able to move freely is still a bummer, though. I took a look at my own body. Currently, my arms, legs, whole torso, and even my head were all wrapped up in swathes of bandages. It was like looking at a mummy, really. According to the priest in charge of taking care of me, I'd been in a coma for the past three weeks or so. It's a case of divinity exhaustion, your highness. It was severe enough that a normal person would have ended up as a cripple, but, it seems that you're in a stable condition now. Just how much divinity did you use anyway, your highness? Apparently, I was fed a combination of holy water and various medicines during my three-week-long coma. Even then, my bones hadn't fully healed yet. There was some residual mental fatigue to worry about too, which was why I needed to rest for a good while longer. That's what I've been told anyway. Whatever the case might have been, it also meant that I now didn't need to partake in the community service work of sorting out Rania fiefdom's situation. You could say it was a pretty good result overall. Are you happy with how it tastes? I glanced to my side after hearing that question. Charlotte stood next to the bed, staring at me. Her face remained emotionless as usual, but her eyes at least seemed to be filled with anticipation. To me, it felt like she was waiting for my honest impression on the meal she had painstakingly prepared. I lightly waved the spoon around and replied, It tastes freaking good, actually. Thank you. Charlotte smiled faintly. Upon seeing her once more, I could only frown somewhat. This kid, no matter how I looked, she was definitely not an ordinary person. Let's say that the witch named Morgana was weak because she ran out of her demonic energy reserve. Even if that's the case, the event with the vampire would obviously be a whole different story altogether. The feat of blocking the vampire count's breath attack with nothing but a steel shield was a heroic sight, something that you'd only get to see in some legendary tales. Sure. Both Grill and I helped back then, but here's the thing the strength to withstand that attack for even a few seconds all by herself simply couldn't have belonged to a regular girl of her age. Your Highness, did you know about this girl? Numerous priests, apothecaries, and healers were dispatched to Rania fiefdom. My treatment, as well as Charlotte's, was taken up by the most skilled of that bunch, a healer directly employed by the Imperial family. This child is definitely not ordinary, your highness. At this rate, it'll be rather difficult to classify her body as a human's, sir. That was the conclusion the healer arrived at after examining Charlotte. She wasn't just not ordinary, but difficult to classify as a human being too? By any chance, was this child exposed to both divinity and demonic energy at some point? Yeah, that did happen. Charlotte ate zombie rats back in her village and ingested demonic energy. And then, she got thrown into a puddle made out of divinity. In such cases, your highness, what would normally happen is that you'll either die, become disabled, or end up as a cripple. However, I've seen one single case similar to what we have here. It happened about fifty years ago when His Majesty the Holy Emperor fought the necromancer King Amun, and fell into a comatose state. I scooped up the spoonful of soup and continued to recall what the healer told me. Back then, His Majesty broke through the limit that all humans are born with. The collision of demonic energy and divinity destroyed his body, and yet it was rebuilt again. That process had been truly bizarre to behold. It was as if his physical body was going through an evolution. Through demonic energy, the Emperor experienced death, then he was revived through divinity. His bones were crushed and hardened, his skin rotted away before new ones grew out, he vomited out dead blood as new blood replaced it, and then. Even though his exterior is the same as us, 
he had become a superhuman that exceeds the limits of a regular human body. The reason why His Majesty was able to defeat Necromancer Amun was precisely because he ended up acquiring that superhuman physique. Apparently, the great hero Kelt All False was Superman. I stared openly at Charlotte and at the same time, activated the mind's eye. Name, Charlotte. Age, 16. Traits, cooking, hardworking, extreme concentration, sloppy swordsmanship, superhuman physique, a versatile talent. I'll work hard so that I can assist him. Charlotte tilted her head and touched her face, seemingly wondering do I have something on my face. So, the mythical total rebirth of one's body only seen in Xianxia novels do happen in this world, too. It seemed that this girl was destined to become a hero or something later on. Just as I decided to return to my stake and finish it as soon as possible, someone knocked on the door and entered. Please pardon my intrusion, Your Highness the Seventh Imperial Prince. Paladin Harmon stepped inside. He now observed proper etiquette which was rather different from before. I was wondering why I couldn't see this dude for the past few days or so, yet here we were. Okay, so? What's up? Surely he wasn't here to tell me that I gotta go back to the monastery and resume my role as its grave keeper. Or maybe worse, offer my services to Rania fiefdom still in the middle of reorganizing itself, right? I'd definitely decline such an invitation. Seriously, he wouldn't force a patient still wrapped up in bandages to do manual labor, right? However, what Harman said next was completely out of my expectations. His Majesty the Holy Emperor is summoning you, Your Highness. Wah! His Majesty, Holy Emperor Kelt All False, has issued an order of your immediate return, Your Highness. I ended up dropping the fork in my hand after he repeated his words. 027. Imperial Prince is going home minus one, part one and two, Finn. Chapter 43, 028 Imperial Prince is Going Home Minus Two, Part One Liu Bei had to visit Zhejiang three times and kneel before the latter's residence just to reel in the famed tactician to his side. That's right, even someone like Liu Bei would no doubt be earnest in his efforts and do his utmost best to convince Zhejiang. And such dedication did move the latter so much that he had step out of his residence. However, your Highness. When the attempts go beyond the level of sincerity and straight into stubborn persistence, it'd be only normal for you to get pissed off about the whole damn thing. Honestly, Liu Bei wouldn't have displayed that legendary patience of his when visiting Zhejiang three times just for laughs, now would he? His Majesty is. I shoved Harman outside the monastery's door after he showed up yet again. He's Sumo. Charlotte go and fetch me some salt. She went and brought some salt in a small bucket after I shouted out loudly. I couldn't help but ruefully smack my lips at that. Although salt wasn't all that expensive, it was still a bit of waste regardless. But as long as I could stop this damn paladin from talking, then. I emptied the whole bucket of salt on the man. Ning Yu, your highness. However, this damn guy still finished what he wanted to say. His eyes staring at me were twitching noticeably. Initially, I figured this wouldn't last long. I used the excuse of not feeling well to send him away a few times. But then, he began showing up here not just once, but three times in a day. During breakfast, lunch and then supper just before I'd sit down for my meal, he'd show and start muttering, back to the Imperial Palace. To make matters worse, He'd always open his mouth in his trademark deadpan face just as I pick up my spoon to dig into my food. You try listening to that for a month. How would you feel afterwards? This sour mood I felt caused the previously delicious meal to no longer taste as good, and every time I took a bite, it felt like indigestion would hit me in the face again and again. Hell, he'd even stand outside the window near my bed and glare straight through it just as I'm about to hit the sack, too. It was already a small mercy that his term asterisk nature mug hadn't shown up to torment me in one of my nightmares so far. I'm telling you, he's a bloody T-800. Seriously. 
Did you send him away again? As Charlotte placed the plates and cutlery on the table, she asked me this question. I simply waved my hand dismissively at her. Forget about it and let's just eat. Despite nodding her head, she still glanced at the door. I figured that this kind-hearted country girl was concerned about Harmon outside. Go and give him something to eat, then. She nodded again before placing a couple of her handmade sandwiches on a plate. After opening the door, she presented them towards Harmon, who was still standing outside like some kind of a log. I thank you. He gladly received the plate and shifted his gaze over to me to open his mouth once more, His Majesty is Sumo. I slammed the door shut right away. After the Witch Morgana incident, as well as the Rania Fortress adventure, I found myself with not much to do in the monastery. Indeed, I was finally enjoying some peace and quiet. About three months had gone by since the winter's onset. The passing of time brought the seasonal plague to its close and allowed the warmth of spring to approach us. I wasn't stupid enough to give up on this peaceful and calm lifestyle. After finishing my meal, I immersed myself in reading the grimoires until supper time. Phew! I was brushing up on the magic theory of the imperial family related to divinity control. Author, Raphael Astoria This dude, he must be a religious quack or something. Written in the book was a theory on divinity control that easily rivaled the necromancer's method. My issue with this tome was that it seemed to be filled to the brim with this over-the-top adulation of the goddess bordering on unhealthy obsession. Sure, I did manage to make that vampire eat a good one all thanks to this book, but even then, it just left a sour taste in my mouth. However, even this book doesn't say how I can properly control Amun's skull. I was in a need to find a way to control a far greater amount of divinity in the future, somehow. I thought about the skull I acquired back in Rania fiefdom. It was one heck of an ominous looking mountain goat's skull, that's for sure. For the purpose of testing it, I went to an uninhabited open field, put the skull on, and used my skills. That's when I learned that I didn't need to offer up a prayer or even gather extra divinity. Quite literally, I could spam my skills without worrying about cooldown time. Its option of amplifying divinity indeed proved to be outstanding. But my issue was. The hangover is no bloody joke, man. The after effects of using the skull was too severe. It did amplify my divinity, as well as my healing factor for a limited time. However, I ended up collapsing from divinity depletion afterwards. Every time that happened, the healer who remained behind in Rania Fortress had to hop over here. While doing his best to save my butt, he asked me this. Just what exactly are you doing to deplete your divinity to this extent, your highness? This happened not just once or twice, either. And to think that you'd deplete yourself so much that you could even end up as a cripple. Thanks to my experiments, I had to stay confined to bed for three or maybe four days in total. This isn't going to work. If using a couple of skills as a test run leaves me in that state, I have to find a better way. With this idea in mind, I shifted my attention over to the other grimoires. Divinity and Resuscitation, A Study on Revival Author, Raphael Astoria This fella, he seemed to be knowledgeable on a pretty wide range of topics, didn't he? It looked to me that he had researched not just divinity control, but even the various healing techniques in depth as well. The book contains several theories based on magic spells recorded in various myths. But why is it so thick, though? It was as thick as two encyclopedias stacked together, actually. I could only click my tongue at that. When I was about to reach out to it, someone addressed me from behind. I'll be retiring for the night, Imperial Prince Nim. I looked behind to see Charlotte wearing a substantial winter robe and a scarf bowing down towards me. I muttered out my reply, Ah, it's that late already. The day had already darkened considerably when I looked outside the window. Charlotte stared at me for a little while before cautiously opening her mouth, Pardon me, but, will you be heading back to the Imperial Palace? Why would I go back to such a dangerous place? I still didn't know who sent that witch Morgana here. And not only that, 
the emperor must still be pretty displeased with his grandson, too. You could easily tell that by him forcing me to provide voluntary service to Rania fiefdom. Going there would surely provide me with some answers. However, it didn't take a genius to figure out that I'd receive the cold shoulder treatment if I went there. The fellow imperial princes wouldn't just look down on me with cold and sneering gazes, but also with murderous glares while painting a bull's eye on my back. A dangerous place. Charlotte murmured to herself. Then, she formed a wry grin and bowed again. Hey, be careful on your way home. I accompanied her on the way to the monastery's gates. That was where I discovered Harmon standing around, waiting by the road leading to the village below the hill. I tut loudly while looking at the guy. What a stalker he was. Still. I shall escort you home. It was commendable that he waited for Charlotte and escorted her home, ensuring her safety at night. I watched as she and Harmon disappeared down the road. TL, in third person POV. After returning to her home in the village, Charlotte started undoing the scarf, eventually changing into a comfortable nightwear. Even as she did this, her eyes remained narrowed in contemplation. Danger. The Imperial Prince mentioned that it was dangerous. As she suspected, the Imperial Palace must have been a dangerous place for him. The ones responsible for the Prince's banishment, were they still targeting the boy's life even now? It could very well be that the Prince knew about this, and that explained his strong reluctance to go back there. She had no way of knowing the ills troubling him. If only he let her in and shared a little bit of his honest thoughts with her. That would have certainly been wonderful. But, would I be of any help even if I listened to what's troubling him? Charlotte clenched her fists. She recalled the figure of the Imperial Prince confronting the Vampire Count back in Rania Fortress. The knight's emitting bright light appeared to suppress the vampire. Then, the prince oh so easily blew away the head of the suppressed undead. While all of this was happening, she was unable to do anything. There was little doubt that the imperial palace should be littered with people wielding devastating strength capable of threatening the prince's life. But here she was, a child who believed that she could somehow protect him. I need to put in more effort. She wasn't good enough yet. Indeed, she needed to put in more effort. Before she stepped outside her room, she noticed a piece of document resting on a shelf. As if it had been abandoned for decades, it was stained and caked with blood and dirt. The ink had been smudged to the point of the letters being hard to make out. Charlotte saw this paper and could only tilt her head. She stepped outside the room and saw Grill and Harmon chatting with each other. Grill. Do you have any thoughts of entering the Imperial Palace? Her eyes nearly popped out of their sockets when she heard this. The Imperial Palace? Grill? Why? Chapter 44, 028 Imperial Prince is going home minus two, part two. Grill went past the state of fluster and straight into freaking out. Why you mean, that Imperial Palace, sir? I've been informed that you provided crucial aid to His Highness when he hunted down the Vampire Count, as well as during the Witch Morgana incident earlier. As you're a representative of the Empire's citizens, it is only correct that your accomplishments are properly recognized. T that isn't right. I haven't done anything so grand. Grill's denial only made Harmon shake his head. How could he even say that he hadn't done anything? Judging from the recent events, the farmer went on to hunt thirty-odd zombies as well as the King of Gluttony. He then even managed to corner Morgana the witch afterwards. And according to the Imperial Prince's own testimony, this supposed farmer even defended against the vampire's breath with a mere steel shield too. These series of feats were almost too good to be true. Not only that, even his daughter is extraordinary. Charlotte even knew the Imperial swordsmanship. Without a doubt, this grill was a guardian knight sent by an as yet identified noble house to protect the imperial prince. If this arrangement was put in place with good intentions, then all was great but if not, then it was Harmon's duty to stop this man. To get to the bottom of the matter, grill simply had to be brought to the imperial palace. Charlotte alternated her gaze between Harmon and grill, 
an awkward expression floating upon her face. She could tell that Grill was deeply troubled by what was happening. Excuse me, Grill? May I ask what this is? So, she decided to butt in, hoping that she could help him out somehow. M.M. Ah, that. Grill lightly scratched his head after spotting the aged document she was currently holding. That thing showed itself while we were taking care of the undead remains back in Rania fiefdom. Mr. Hans gave it to me, and since I figured it could fetch us some coin, I brought it back home with us. I'm not sure of the details, however. You shouldn't have done that, Grill. If you carelessly handle items found on an exterminated undead, it can bring about a powerful curse on you. H ha ha, ha ha, why you think so too? You know, since I didn't know what it was, I was thinking of asking you to show that thing to the Imperial Prince Nim, so that he can check it out later. Something like what Charlotte said would occasionally happen. Items that zombies or skeletons used back when they were still alive would sometimes drop after they were defeated. And oftentimes, random villagers or travelers would end up picking those items up. However, most of the time, those recovered items would be plain and ordinary. But in some rare circumstances, the recovered items could carry a curse. Charlotte frowned as she stared at the document again. Thankfully, it didn't seem to be a cursed item. She then proceeded to read the biggest letters that were still legible on the document, Count He. Hera. Harai. Harmon's brows shot up high when he heard Charlotte's voice. He then quickly walked over to her to take a closer look at the document in her hand. The document that seemed to be abandoned and forgotten for a very long time just so happened to be a certificate of authentication, one that featured a genuine emperor's official seal, proving that the one holding this paper was a noble. And this certificate, it used to belong to. Ha ha, ha ha ha. It's nothing to worry about. W wait, now that I think about it. Aha, you must be starving right now, Sir Harmon. My good neighbor shared some of their fresh bread, so how about we have some? Grill worked suspiciously hard to hide the document away. Oops. I can't boast about something I pilfered from a corpse like some dummy in front of a paladin, now can I? Harmon watched this scene play out while standing there dumbfounded, his expression somewhat dazed. They. Hira I's family. That noble household was renowned for their skill with the sword. Their undying loyalty to the theocratic empire was the stuff of legends, too. The family also happened to be in charge of the land of the dead spirits fifty years ago, and tragically, the whole household was massacred during the bitter battle against necromancer King Amun. They had become a near-forgotten footnote in the annals of history. Harmon continued to dazedly stare at both Charlotte and Grill. Is something the matter? The farmer and the nun began tilting their heads in puzzlement. I see. So that's what happened. Harmon slowly rubbed his face. These two, they were none other than the remaining survivors of the Hira-Eyes bloodline, their true descendants. Were they the unknown noble house supporting the seventh imperial prince? Was this the true reason why Charlotte knew the imperial swordsmanship? Everything seemed to make sense now. Grill hid his true identity, and while living on this land of the dead spirits, he faithfully carried out his duties and protected the North. His daughter, meanwhile, was protecting, supporting, and serving the prince from the boy's side. Despite being forgotten, and with fifty years of lengthy history going past them, their loyalty to the Holy Emperor and his family still remains strong to this day. How happy would His Majesty be when he gets to meet the Hira-Eyes family's descendants after all this time? Without a doubt, the Emperor would bestow a great reward upon them. However, this was not a decision that Harmon could make on his own. There must have been a reason for them to hide their identity. It'd be too much of a waste to let the world forget about this family, however. Grill kept his true identity a secret. There was the chance that the reason why he didn't openly support the Seventh Imperial Prince could be that he wished to let the family's duties end with his generation. Even if that was the case, Harmon's gaze shifted over to Charlotte. This child still wished to serve the Imperial Prince. 
Just this fact alone was enough for this family to be recognized. Harman broke his silence, I shall write a letter of recommendation. Pardon. How about sending your daughter to the Imperial Palace? Grill's jaw nearly hit the floor, oh oh my goodness. As a maidservant working in the palace. Harman shook his head. No. I'd like her to join us as a knight. Wait, as a paladin, actually. Excuse me. I shall also inform His Majesty the Holy Emperor and urge him to bestow her with a suitable peerage. If you wish, I can also write a letter of recommendation to the Academy as well. There shouldn't be any obstacles for this. They were from a ruined noble family, after all. Since they weren't originally commoners to begin with, the other nobles shouldn't be that vocal in their opposition, either. Harman pressed on, so? How about it? Grill forgot what he wanted to say and stared at Charlotte. His lips did bob up and down from sheer mental shock, but from Harmon's point of view, the farmer seemed to be waiting for his daughter's opinion on the matter, instead. With this understanding in mind, he too looked at Charlotte and asked her. What do you think? If you wish, the imperial swordsmanship will be taught to you properly. It also means that you will become a great help to His Highness. His words caused her brows to shoot up high. I can become a great help to Imperial Prince Nim. But of course. You will be bestowed with the title of a paladin after all. If you want, Harman narrowed his eyes. I'm even willing to hide your true identity and disguise you as a mere nun, maybe even as a maidservant. I'll lend you my assistance so that you can serve and protect His Highness from his side. Those words put an end to Charlotte's hesitation. She nodded and responded back, however, I'd like to remain by the Imperial Prince Nim's side. It sounded as if she was unwilling to go to the Imperial Palace without the Prince by her side. Harman replied to her, that's obvious. I'm planning to escort His Highness back to the Palace no matter what it takes, so you can allay any fears you might have. Charlotte formed a slightly troubled expression when she heard Harman. How did their conversation end up going down this route? Harman nodded his head, looking even more determined than ever before. He now had more reasons to escort the seventh imperial prince back to the capital. Later that night, he wrote a letter and had it delivered to the theocratic empire. Back to first person POV. It had already been two months since the vampire incident. The weather remained chilly even then. Currently, I was staring helplessly at the bookshelves. I have no choice do I? There simply weren't enough books here. The grimoires found in the monastery were too limited to satisfy my thirst for knowledge. However, this guy, he sounds like he definitely knows something. I stopped reading a grimoire related to healing techniques and took another look at its author. Author, Raphael Astoria. I had seen this name before. After thinking about it for a bit, I began rummaging through other books next mostly historical records. Finally, I found it. He was one of the historical figures who stood alongside Holy Emperor Kelt All False and fought against the necromancer King Amun. He was also one of the five archbishops in the Theocratic Empire, too. Raphael Astoria the dude that everyone referred to as the Empire's best when it came to healing techniques and divinity control. This guy might be able to provide me with some hints on how I can control a huge amount of divinity without facing a heavy rebound. I mean, surely he must have penned other grimoires besides these ones here. Wait, maybe it'd be better to personally talk to him, instead. Knock, knock. Suddenly, a knocking sound could be heard coming from the door. While still holding the grimoire, I stood up and opened it. I came to escort you. Your Highness. As usual, it was Harman saying the exact same thing. However, there was one big difference this time. A big crowd of paladins and priests were standing before my eyes. There was that unmistakably huge horse-drawn carriage on standby too. Charlotte, kitted out in a maid's uniform, was looking a bit baffled while shifting her worried gaze in my direction. Harman stood in the center of this crowd and bowed before me. Let us get going, your highness. It seemed to me that this guy was done asking me for my opinion. 
I stood still in a daze before looking down. Specifically, at the grimoire written by the author Raphael Astoria still held in my hand. Fine. Let's go. My short answer prompted a stunned expression to form on both Harmon and Charlotte's faces. The corners of my lips curled up when I saw their reactions. Well, I guessed that going back to the Imperial Palace was an unavoidable fate for me. Actually, this was probably for the best. Someone like Raphael Astoria probably knew how to control Amon's skull, that's for sure. 028. Imperial Prince is going home minus 2, Part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 45, 029. Imperial Prince is going home minus 3, Part 1. I continued reading the grimoire even though a loud yawn broke out of my mouth. Then, I muttered to myself. Never guessed that an actual paladin corps would be dispatched here to fetch me. From what I heard, this whole gang was assembled in order to find out the real party responsible for the meritorious deed of hunting the vampire count. That didn't mean I should speak the truth, though. I should probably only mention some things that I can say then pepper in some make-beliefs somewhere in the middle and hope that everything would work out fine afterwards. Your Highness. You seem to rather enjoy studying magic. Harmon, sitting next to the sleeping Charlotte leaning against the carriage's wall, asked me. M.M.? Ah, this? You know, it's kind of fun once I got started, you see. The original reason was so that I could increase my strength in order to survive, but in all honesty, I did find the magic of this world really interesting to learn. Plus, the sense of accomplishment I'd get from learning the magic itself was rather extraordinary, so it became a hobby of mine pretty quickly. Isn't it difficult, Your Highness? Well, it's all right. I brushed the topic off and flipped through another page of the considerably thick grimoire. Then, I sneaked a glance at Harmon. He was looking back at me with a rather meaningful stare. It was right then that a knocking sound came from outside the carriage. I opened the wooden window panel and was greeted by a paladin bowing his head right outside the door. Your Highness, we've arrived at the capital of the Theocratic Empire, Laurensis. Upon hearing this, I opened the door wide and leaned the upper half of my body outside the carriage. I then let out an impressed sigh right afterwards. Oh ho! Since this was the capital of a religious state, I figured it'd be the city version of a stiff upper lip the kind that had humorless square streets everywhere. But boy, was I wrong. A city so eye-catching and flashy that the medieval ages of Earth could never even hope to match its splendor, was spread out before my view. Around it, various small to large villages surrounded the capital. Beyond them were outer walls that easily reached 20 meters in height extending around the capital to protect it from the external forces. Despite the tall fortress-like walls, I could clearly see the statue of the goddess located on top of a hill, and beyond that was the Theocratic Empire's imperial palace, its pointy tip piercing the heavens above. The architecture of the structures was truly amazing, simply overflowing with grand scale and sheer beauty. As expected of a capital city that belonged to a fantasy world filled with magic. This was the holy land of the faithful, Laurensis, the center of this empire's faith where this body was born and also where my brothers from the imperial family were waiting for me. I'm getting all tensed up here. My muttering brought about a wry grin on Harmon's face. The massive outer gates were wide open to allow the travelers and citizens to come in and go as they pleased. We went past the huge steel gates that were at least 15 meters tall and stepped on the well-laid-out avenues meant for horses and carriages. The gazes of numerous tourists and the denizens were directed towards our ride. I guess there isn't going to be a welcoming party for me, then. Now normally, flower petals should be raining down and the Empire's citizens would be lining the sides of the streets to cheer for the triumphant return of the Imperial Prince. At least that's how things were like in the novels I've read. If I was being honest, I did anticipate some sort of a flashy welcoming party, but all of their expressions kind of implied that they had no clue who was even riding in the carriage. Harmon coughed uncomfortably at my question and formed a troubled expression on his face. His Majesty has never prescribed to such pretensions, and that's why. 
Ah, so that's how much I'm being resented by him, hey. I inwardly told myself that it'd already be a huge relief if my grandfather didn't start nagging me to death the moment we met. With these thoughts percolating in my mind, I shifted my gaze outside and observed the city streets. They were spotless and clean. Numerous kids were running around having fun in the markets, all the while the citizens were selling or buying things with bright expressions on their faces. Some men who looked like mercenaries were guffawing about something while holding each other's shoulders. And the sights of some folks kitted out with spears and shields, probably paladins patrolling the streets, left me with a pretty deep impression. I got some inkling from having met Harman earlier, but well, this guy called the Holy Emperor, Kelt all false, must have been a wise and benevolent ruler who knew how to lead his subjects splendidly. It was fairly easy to come to this conclusion from all the energetic faces found in the capital's streets. This isn't so bad, said I. Harman looked at me, and with a smile on his lips, nodded his head. I continued on, it's great that there are plenty of things to sightsee here. Is that so, your highness? The paladin spoke in a rather pleased tone of voice. I had no idea that I'd feel like an amazed tourist despite this place being my hometown. I also couldn't help but wonder what my expression was like right now while taking in the sights of these streets. Probably one of an immature little kid, I thought. This was how much anticipation and heart-pounding excitement had pervaded into my emotions. Although the distance we had covered wasn't really all that much, it still felt like I was traveling all around the world. Unfortunately, such emotions didn't last for long. I reflexively covered up my nose. My innards almost tumbled from the sudden onset of this disgusting and twisted stench. The feeling of sheer displeasure welled up inside me almost uncontrollably. After quickly retreating away from the windows, Harman came in closer to pat me on the back. Are you feeling all right, your highness? Perhaps you're coming down with motion sickness. Let me ask you something, Harman. Yes, your highness. He tilted his head in pure puzzlement. However, his response only made the corners of my lips quiver. Could there be, undeads hiding in the capital of the theocratic empire? His expression instantly hardened upon hearing my question. Our group's march came to a halt in the middle of the street and I stepped out from the carriage. Charlotte woke up from her nap, and along with Harmon, stayed very close to me as I made my way forward. This is a Yaleua fruit. It's only worth five bronze coins. Oi, little miss. I'll discount this thing especially for you, so please buy it. Ha ha ha. That's right. I really did it. I confessed to her and she said yes. The marketplace was truly lively. I silently walked on these laughter-filled streets as Harmon, Charlotte and the other paladins approached me while carefully studying my mood. Your Highness, did something happen? Harmon cautiously asked me, but I paid him no mind. I couldn't stop myself from moving my legs, all because of this ominous foreboding. Soon, we stepped into an alleyway that branched off from the lively market. There were hardly any people walking around here. Various articles of laundry and drying sheets were hung between the narrow alleyway's walls. Despite it being in the middle of a bright day, the shade cast here was pretty dark. It was also quite gloomy and far too quiet for my liking. This whole area felt far removed from the lively marketplace found just around the corner. I stopped walking here and with my gaze fixed to our immediate front, I spoke up. And what could that be? There was a beautiful woman. A rapturous expression was etched on her face, while her eyes were tightly closed with tears streaming down her cheeks. Just as striking was the gorgeous arrangement of flowers around her severed neck resting on the ground. I carefully studied the arrangements of roses as well as her severed head before raising my gaze upwards. There it was a headless body that I suspected to be hers dangling along on the clothing lines. It resembled a dried-up mummy as if all of its blood had been sucked out. The headless body danced around in the winds blowing up there. Harman shouted out in sheer surprise, What is the meaning of? Charlotte averted her gaze at this sight. 
the paladins following us from behind also stood still with hardened expressions, their jaws dropping to the floor. A heavy silence descended in our midst after none of us managed to escape from the shock of this scene. However, the first one to break this silence by opening her lips was the woman's severed head. Kaiiaaa. She suddenly opened her eyes, and her eyeballs began frantically searching about the area. When it spotted our group, it then began screeching out. The bodiless head was repeatedly opening and shutting its mouth. It was an undead, to be more specific, a zombie with only its head remaining. I placed my hand on the woman's head and injected some of my divinity. It began melting down and turned into ashes that scattered away, leaving behind only the bleached skull. Since the disgusting stench was still lingering around here, I hurriedly shifted my gaze to scan our vicinity. The creature that killed this woman and turned her into a zombie was still nearby. I got up and dashed out of the alleyway. Your Highness! I summoned my trusty shovel and gripped it tightly. Before long, I found myself back in the marketplace. Amongst all the crowds bustling about, my piercing glare singled out the back of a certain individual, a man in his early to mid-thirties with a striking set of red hair. He was walking among the crowd, and yet, he flinched in surprise for some reason before shifting his gaze behind him. I could see his lips bob up and down briefly just then. Looks like I've got myself a tail. It was right then the disgusting stench thinned out, and just like that, the odor of death vanished into the air. As for the man, he too vanished without a trace within the crowd. I stood there as if in a trance from that spectacle. After regaining my senses, I lowered my shovel helplessly and groaned loudly. Ah! I'm so screwed. The only reason why I came here was to learn some magic, but it seemed that I got myself mixed up in a bizarre event, instead. Chapter 46, 029 Imperial Prince is going home minus 3, Part 2 the paladins had set up a cordon around the crime scene. People from the marketplace gathered around and whispered to each other. Is it another murder? Didn't something like this happen last time too? Just what are the patrolmen doing these days, I wonder. I observed their behavior while sitting inside my carriage. The vehicle soon set off again. Please do not worry, your highness. The paladins will surely get to the bottom of this and deal with the matter appropriately, Harmon said while looking at me with a concerned expression on his face. You seem to be rather greatly shocked at what happened, your highness. I shifted my head after hearing that. A deeply sunken pair of eyes reflected in the mirror mounted on the carriage's door stared right back at me. Shock? Yup, that sounded about right. Quite huge, in fact. However, it wasn't because I witnessed a scene of murder. I've already ran into hundreds, no scratch that, thousands of zombies before. And not to forget, I even blew apart a vampire's head too. All thanks to the characteristics of my class as a necromancer, my nerves were pretty tough. If you wanted to know what's been bugging me. I held my head in despair. I can already see so much hard labor coming my way soon, that's what. Charlotte sitting next to me formed a puzzled expression. In the meantime, the carriage finally arrived at the Imperial Palace. The impressive front gates of the palace opened up and we smoothly entered inside. Countless mates and manservants had created a pair of long lines with their heads bowed deeply. After we all exited from the carriage, Harmon spoke to a person who looked to be the Chamberlain. His Highness the Imperial Prince is fatigued from the long journey. Please guide him to his quarters while I shall personally speak to His Majesty A.N.D. After that brief chat, Charlotte was promptly allocated a separate room for her to rest in. As for Harmon, he seemed to have left to speak to the Holy Emperor. As for me, I too was guided to the room I'd be staying in from now on. While my feet strode on the glittering passageways of this impressive imperial palace, my mind was still occupied by all sorts of complicated thoughts taking root in there. 1. About the severed head and the bloodless body I saw in the alleyway. 2. Regarding the thick demonic energy and the accompanying disgusting stench I smelled earlier. I was pretty familiar with all of them, actually. 
I did smell something similar back in Rania after all. The stench belonged to an existence that transcended the regular undead. A vampire, in other words. A stench very similar to that vampire was wafting around in the capital of the theocratic empire. I'm so screwed. Really, seriously, definitely screwed. Holy sh asterisk t. To think that vampires could even exist in the capital of the mighty theocratic empire, a city where the statue of Gaia stood so tall and imposing. Wait, could this whole thing be because Gaia's love and mercy even extended to those creatures too? What's up with this messed up act of all-encompassing mercy that even covered every damn cat and dog under the sun? I better bounce. Yup, I needed to escape out of here. I simply refused to go through the same hellish crap that I experienced back in Rania. No matter how much I coveted more knowledge on magic, my life took priority over everything else. I called out to a maidservant. Why yes, your highness. She seemed to be really tense. It made sense though, since the story of the seventh imperial prince trying to assault a lady-in-waiting should still be doing the rounds within the imperial palace's walls even now. It was obvious that the ones guiding me would be terrified. I asked her. Do you know where the library is? Even if I was planning to run, I should at least borrow a few expensive grimoires before doing so. This would be the wiser thing to do. In fact, I also wanted to meet this Archbishop Raphael before leaving, but if I did exactly that, I'd have even less of a chance to escape afterwards. I refused the kindness of the maids who tried guiding me there. I simply memorized their directions and headed towards the library on my own. Since I already had a bit of money on me now, after getting my hands on some useful grimoires, I should be able to find a horse or even a carriage in the city later to take me far away from here. Fooling the eyes of those escorting paladins should be easy, since I could just say that I'm going sightseeing in the city. As for Charlotte, there should be no problems on that end because Harmon was here. She'd be treated well before being sent back home, I thought. While thinking this, I looked around with a somewhat dazed expression. I'm lost, aren't I? The Imperial Palace was much bigger than I thought. Not to mention, the corridors were a series of complicated mazes, too. The location I somehow ended up in was the Imperial Palace's garden instead. A small and intricately sculpted bronze statue of a woman stood all alone surrounded by well-maintained trees and flowers. With a benevolent smile on her face, she was gently stroking the heads of two boys. She doesn't look like Goddess Gaia. She certainly seemed different from the imposing goddess statue erected in the center of the city's plaza. I quietly read out the letters engraved near the bottom of the bronze statue. Eulizia. Was she a person of this imperial palace? She must have left this world about five years ago, judging from the birth and death dates engraved on the statue. Egugu. My back. Darn it. I let my underlings take care of things so why did they do such a sloppy job? I might as well cut off all of their heads and put them on a spike near the castle gates or something. I shifted my head in the direction of the series of loud complaints. And here I was, expecting something good since they were new hirings. To think that the punks making a living out of the citizens' taxes would be this lazy. An old man was up on a ladder, busy pruning the landscape with a garden shear. After climbing down, the old man began massaging his back. A couple of seconds later, he discovered me and flinched, his expression visibly hardening. Actually, this was good. I might as well ask this old man the way out of here. Ah, I beg your pardon on this intrusion. I merely wished to ask you about. If you were here, you should have greeted me first, you fool. The old man suddenly yelled at me. It was my turn to flinch and stare dazedly back at him. Besides all that. You beg my pardon? What on earth has gotten into this fool? Ah, those things over there, bring them to me. The old man pointed to a spot next to me. I looked at the spot and found a hoe plus a metal bucket filled with soil. What are you doing? You don't want to bring them over. I was utterly dumbfounded. 
just how many people still alive would be able to order around the seventh imperial prince like this. While thinking about this, I glanced down at my current attire. What a big surprise, it was the same shabby traveler's outfit that I wore even back in the monastery. Harman did hand over a far flashier outfit earlier, but I didn't put it on since it felt too burdensome to do so. Did this old man mistake me for a new gardener or something? What are you doing, boy? Hurry up, will ye? I licked my lips. The old man rolled his sleeves up after I brought the bucket and the hoe. He then crouched low to the ground to tender the garden next. Watching him at work gave me this strange, incongruent vibe. This old man, he, came off as oddly familiar, somehow. Was he someone the original owner of this body knew well? A little while later, the old man dusted his hands and stood back up as if he was finally done with the gardening. Judging from how fast he was, he probably was already in the process of wrapping things up before I showed up. Phew woo. Whitish air exhaled out of his lips. His hands were rough and calloused, looking as if it endured long years of labor. He rubbed the dirt off his hands on his overalls. But since I couldn't bear to watch the pristine clothing get dirty, I pulled out my own handkerchief to clean up his hands instead. While doing this, I spoke to him. Are you the only person here, old sir? How can only one person be responsible for such a large garden? Although still awkward, I tried to imitate a princely manner of speech. I was being mindful with this place being what it was, but man, this act of putting up a refined personality just didn't suit me at all. I tutted softly and looked at the old man's face. Even if the theocratic empire was supposedly righteous, abuse of power still existed, it seemed. The head gardener of this palace must not have been a very good person, judging from how a single old man was left alone to deal with everything. He did mention something about new hirings, but seeing that none of them were here, I figured that they dumped everything on this old man's shoulders and were goofing off somewhere. The old man had a really stunned expression on his face. He stared at me for a good while before finally opening his mouth, I see, the story of you losing your memories is indeed true. These words made me do a double take at the old man. Not only did your personality change, you can't even recognize your own grandpa. I flinched nastily at his words and hurriedly activated mine's eye. Name, Kelt All False, Holy Emperor. Age, 105. Traits, Crushing, Destroying, A Truly Massive Divinity Pool, Thunderbolts, An Overwhelmingly Monstrous Physique. A Thurret. I should have done a better job with my family. A Wu. The top ruler of the Theocratic Empire, referred unabashedly as the great hero who killed the necromancer King Amun fifty years ago. The man who was technically my grandfather, Kelt All False, was now standing right before my eyes. 029. Imperial Prince is going home minus 3, Part 1 and 2, Finn. Chapter 47, 030. Imperial Prince is attending a banquet minus 1, Part 1. I really did try to escape. However, I simply couldn't. The gardeners showed up belatedly and freaked out after discovering that their holy emperor was tending to the garden. As for me, I was quickly shown to the imperial audience chamber, or more like I got dragged there against my will. A huge number of paladins were all lined up on either side of the humongous chamber. The high-ranking aristocrats and members of the clergy were shooting their piercing stares at me, but I resolutely kept my own gaze fixed to my front. Hmm. The old man was no longer kicked out in the shabby clothing from earlier. Nope, he was now properly dressed as the Holy Emperor, a crown perched on his head, and a luxurious white robe laced with golden engravings adorning his figure. While sitting on an impressive throne, he took a good look at me, his head cocked slightly to the side. It has been a while. Seventh Imperial Prince, Alan All Falls. At those words, I ended up sneaking a glance to my sides. The nobles were whispering amongst themselves. Is it really true that he hunted a vampire down? The seventh imperial prince did what? How? From what I heard, 
the vampire in question possessed a level of demonic energy easily as great as a count, no, maybe even greater. A whole order of paladins surrounding it wouldn't have been enough to quell the thing. It's rather obvious that the army and Sir Harmon were responsible for accomplishing the deed. However, aren't Rania's citizens raising their voices of support for the prince? A hidden expert or someone like that must have been responsible. It's quite clear that the imperial prince merely snatched this achievement for himself. The imaginations of this world's denizens seemed pretty robust. Since I had no idea what the correct decorum of the imperial court was in the first place, that left me deeply troubled on what to do next. The holy emperor studied me for a little while before opening his mouth, I was informed that you have successfully hunted a vampire down. How true is this information? All right, so. How should I answer him? A vampire was currently existing in Laurensis, the capital city of the Theocratic Empire. Since the shoppers in the marketplace were throwing around words like again in their conversations, it should be pretty safe to assume that the Imperial family already knew of the existence of this creature hiding in the city. Honestly speaking, there was a higher chance of this occasion being a ruse to find out if I was someone who can hunt vampires, rather than getting my accomplishment in the Rania fiefdom publicly acknowledged. That's what I thought, anyway. Besides, there was already an air of suspicion on whether or not Harmon and I had really hunted that vampire down, anyway. Yes, it is true, Your Majesty. Despite nodding my head, I didn't forget to make a troubled expression and lower my face at the same time. It's just that, I alone could have never hunted down a creature like that in a million years. Such an event was only possible through the aid of countless others. I can only thank Harmon, Charlotte, feudal Lord Jeanald Repang, and additionally, the numerous citizens of the Rania fiefdom for their help. I should acknowledge the truth, sure, but I also needed to make it someone else's achievement at the same time. The only people who witnessed me take out the vampire count in person were Charlotte and Harmon. However, many did see me snipe the undead creature from Rania's walls. Even if I was going to lie, I needed to mix in some truths in there. A surprised expression floated up on the Holy Emperor's face. He then rubbed his chin, almost as if what I said was quite intriguing. Oh, so it was all thanks to other people, is that it? Of course, Your Majesty. It is all thanks to their hard work that I stand before you still alive and in one piece. Also, that's how we got to prevent the tide of death as well. I see. The Holy Emperor nodded his expression a mixture of complicated and vague thoughts. He glanced in the direction of the aristocrats, as well as his loyal retainers. They were murmuring to each other while sending mocking sneers in my way. So that means the imperial prince wasn't responsible for hunting it down? Who helped what now? He was probably hiding in the corner of a room somewhere and only showed up after everything was over. However, some hidden expert must have used powerful divinity, for sure. I heard that the feudal Lord Jeanald identified him as the Imperial Prince. The man was supposed to be wearing a mask, so it's not possible for anyone to identify the true identity of that hidden expert. Although I did expect the cold shoulder treatment, never did I imagine that this level of mockery and contempt would be directed in my way. It seemed that the seventh Imperial Prince was despised by pretty much everyone around here. Around then, one of the retainers who was studying the uneasy atmosphere cautiously made his way towards the Holy Emperor. This person whispered something in the latter's ear, prompting the Emperor to cast his gaze in my direction once more. He spoke. You must be feeling tired from the long journey. Go and take a good rest. I thought I'd be interrogated to death or something today, but the Holy Emperor didn't pursue the matter anymore and sent me away to my room. I inwardly sighed with relief and turned around to leave, but before exiting the Grand Hall, I decided to ask just in case, ah, and by the way, right here in Laurensis. Everyone's gaze focused on me. This also included the Holy Emperor's, his expression one of puzzlement. I addressed the issue at hand. There's a vampire in the city, so please do something about that. The citizens are living in fear. What I said caused the Emperor's expression to stiffen up. 
not to mention, the atmosphere in the hall had become icy cold in an instant too. Eh? What's this, maybe I wasn't supposed to openly mention that. I lightly tutted, thinking that maybe I butted unnecessarily in a matter that these fine folks would have taken care of on their own. I finally exited from the grand audience chamber. TL, in third person POV. Kelt all false recalled what the seventh imperial prince said before exiting the audience chamber a minute ago. The boy was such a coward that, only a half year ago, he would stay on his knees and not even dare to raise his head at his own grandfather. But someone like that was now standing tall and proud today, even shooting a pointed glare at the emperor. And then, forget about monopolizing the accomplishment of hunting the vampire, he even acknowledged receiving help from the others. Would someone's personality really change that much if they lost their memories? As for the duo Grill and the child named Charlotte. Kelt Allfalls had received a detailed report from Harmon not too long ago. Apparently, they were the last surviving descendants of the Hira-Eyes bloodline. Certainly, hunting down a vampire count would be more than possible if the boy had help from those two along with Harmon. However, it is still bizarre. Indeed there was something that just didn't make much sense. The House Hira Eyes was a martial arts-oriented family that had mastered imperial swordsmanship. They certainly were not capable of freely pouring out divinity as they pleased in the past. There was another report sent from Rania, compiled by feudal Lord Jeanald Repang. That report contained various peculiar testimonies. When His Highness the Imperial Prince used divinity, Numerous soldiers on the brink of death were all fully revived. Reviving soldiers who were about to die? What an unbelievable claim that was. The Imperial Prince didn't even know how to properly cast any healing magic, so how could he possibly save a soldier who was about to die? Not only that, he even apparently located all the holes in the ground that the undead used to invade the fortress. The Emperor ended up snorting in derision when he read those things. Since feudal Lord Jeanald was under suspicion of tax evasion, he probably was hoping to return to his original territory by sucking up to the seventh imperial prince. After His Highness the imperial prince offered a prayer to Goddess Gaia, she bestowed her divine protection on him, thus enabling him to pierce through the vampire's limb, Your Majesty. To top it all off, the boy apparently used a musket rifle, a trifling decorative ornament, to penetrate past the vampire's defenses. If the magicians and alchemists that researched the potential of magic projectiles for the past 200 years heard this, they would guffaw non-stop from how funny the joke was. The Holy Emperor decided not to believe in any of this. He was already prepared to completely disregard feudal Lord Jeanald's report altogether. These are the testimonies of numerous eyewitnesses, Your Majesty. They all say that a person, suspected to be His Highness the Imperial Prince, managed to pierce the vampire's abdominal region with a musket rifle. This was the result of the investigation performed by the Imperial family's knights going undercover. On top of this feat, the boy went on to save hundreds of lives by distributing holy water. Then later on, a lake made out of holy water even made its grand entrance as well. Indeed, this was almost on the level of a saint bestowed with the goddess's fragment manifesting into the world. None of these testimonies sounded even nearly believable. They had to be lies. Without a doubt, these reports had to be all wrong. Even with such thoughts swirling in his head, Holy Emperor Kelt Allfall still held a tiny ray of hope in his heart. What are your thoughts on this matter? The Holy Emperor asked his loyal retainers gathered before him. They are all lies. Your Majesty. Not one shred of hesitation could be heard in their response. There's no doubt that His Highness was present at the Rania fiefdom. However, no one can say with any certainty that they have seen him during the battles, Your Majesty. All they saw was an expert wearing a mask. It is too much of a stretch to identify that person as His Highness the Imperial Prince, Your Majesty. They didn't need such a thing as reason. All the retainers here unquestioningly denied the possibility altogether. It was obvious why they were riding on the same boat as the other imperial princes currently standing beside them. Chapter 48, 030 Imperial Prince is attending a banquet minus one, 
Part 2 Holy Emperor Kelt Alfals closed his eyes and massaged his forehead. The thought process of these people were too biased. With how much older and closer the Emperor got to the day of his abdication, the easier it became to see all the behind-the-scenes maneuverings of the nobles. They were doing it all in order to win over the heir apparent to the Holy Emperor. As for Archbishop Raphael, someone who staunchly maintained his neutrality, he was currently confining himself in his room solely because he did not wish to run into the smug face of the seventh imperial prince. Who should I listen to in moments like this? Have you eaten yet, Your Majesty? I've prepared some sandwiches, so would you like to? Holy Emperor Kelt Alfal slowly opened his eyes. He ended up recalling the first crown princess consort, a woman who everyone thought is a lowborn, and was even treated as such. Eulizia. He could only lick his lips in bitterness after recalling her always smiling face. The first imperial prince Luan, who carried her bloodline and grew up under her gentle wings, was a smart kid and possessed the disposition of a benevolent and wise king. However, since his life could end any day now, the throne could not be handed over to him. Kelt felt even more bitter when his thoughts reached that far. He should have been more worried about the health of his own grandson so he couldn't help but feel that it was truly selfish of him to care more about the emperor's throne and the well-being of the citizens living in this vast empire, instead. That doesn't mean I can relinquish my throne to the other princes, however. There were lowly and disgusting vampires hiding within the theocratic empire. It was unknown just how deep they managed to infiltrate society of the living while hiding behind the masks of normal human beings. In order to stop them, someone with a suitable level of qualification had to become the emperor. Ah, and by the way, there seems to be vampires hiding in Laurensis, so please do something about that. The citizens are living in fear. Before exiting the Grand Hall, the seventh imperial prince said this. He sounded as if he had seen the vampire in question already. Kelt all false shifted his gaze. Most of the nobles were still sneering at the seventh imperial prince. However, some of them seemed to be agonizing over something, judging from their current expressions. These aristocrats knew the truth. They knew that there was a vampire hiding in the midst of this imperial court. Maybe there's still a chance. What if? Just what if? What if the seventh imperial prince still possessed a tiny little speck of talent to succeed as the emperor? And what if the boy also possessed the power to eradicate the vampires too? Would it be the correct decision to relinquish the throne to the boy if that was the case? This loyal servant wishes to address his majesty even at the risk of committing offense. Someone then called out to Kelt Alfal still swimming within his thoughts. The man asked for an understanding from his fellow retainers and cautiously stepped out from their ranks. The emperor recognized who it was and a smile naturally floated up on his lips. It was a nobleman in his early to mid-forties with a set of striking crimson hair and red eyes Count Farmer. He was also one of the forces that supported Ulysses's son, the first imperial prince Luan. Farmer knelt down and lowered his head before speaking up, There is still plenty of time, Your Majesty. May I be so bold to suggest that a more in-depth investigation be launched into this matter? The anniversary of Lady Ulysses's passing is in two months' time as well. I beg of you to let His Highness the Seventh Imperial Prince remain in the capital for that day, Your Majesty. His words caused a deep frown to edge on the faces of the other aristocrats. On the other hand, a grin formed on the Emperor's countenance. I've heard that His Highness the Seventh Imperial Prince wishes to return to the land of the dead spirits in order to reflect on his sins. However, this servant is of the opinion that His Highness has already atoned for his past mistakes, through the great contribution of hunting down a vampire. Count Farmer raised his head and carried on with a smooth grin. And as such, may I suggest a celebratory banquet to honor those who have rendered meritorious services in Rania. Kelt all false nodded his head. It was indeed too premature to make up his mind on the seventh imperial prince. The boy needed to be kept at a close enough proximity, so that he could be carefully monitored. In addition, the emperor also thought that it wasn't such a bad idea to personally listen to feudal Lord Jeanald Repang's accounts as well. Then, 
let it be so. Inscrutable are the Emperor's favors. 1. Kelt All False decided that the fate of the seventh imperial prince would now depend on how the boy acted during the banquet. In other words, whether he should extend the banishment, or to let the boy remain in the imperial palace for further observation. TL, back to first person POV. Living a life of a prince in the imperial palace was far more comfortable than I could have ever imagined. For the past week or so, I stayed in a room that would put any seven-star hotel to shame. Most of the time, I'd just be laying on the bed, munching on various snacks while perusing the grimoire. Holy cow! Who could have imagined that the life of a prince would be this exquisite? I wasn't sure about the other nobles but well, the servants and maids here at least treated me with utmost respect. The bed was so cushy that I'd fall asleep as soon as I lied down on it. The food served was at the zenith of opulence, too. But the best of all, no one tried to stick their nose into my business or even try and nag me to death. I wasn't aware of what the role of an imperial prince entailed, but... When I think about it, living in the imperial palace isn't so bad, is it? I didn't need to lug around heavy corpses or dig out graves. And in a stark contrast to my initial fears, no one tried to keep me in check nor posed a clear threat to my life. Most importantly, though, I was in the palace of the imperial family, a place which was completely filled from top to bottom with priests and paladins. No vampire would be insane enough to infiltrate this sort of sanctuary, right? As for the blood-sucking undead in the city, the imperial court would surely smoke it out sooner or later. After finishing the grimoire, I stood up from the bed. Feels like something's not quite enough, though. It was indeed true that the palace held quite a lot of grimoires. However, it was a lot harder to get a satisfying enough result from them. Not just divinity control, but even the divinity reserve inside me felt as if they weren't improving at all. This feeling was kinda like something's been tightly clogged up somewhere, that I was going through a slump. I smacked my lips while staring outside the window. It was already nighttime with a bright moon visible in the sky. I cautiously opened the creaking door. My fingers were crossed but unfortunately, there was a paladin standing right outside. He stared at me, looking visibly tense. How may I be of your assistance, your highness? I wanted to test out Amun's skull, but because paladins like this dude were practically everywhere in this place, I couldn't activate nor practice any of my skills. Ah, well. I wanted to fetch some more grimoires, you see, said I. In that case, let me summon some servants. Don't bother. Let them enjoy their well-deserved break. Besides, they wouldn't be able to tell apart which book is which. I might as well just go there myself. Allow us to escort you, your highness. Man, how annoying. Look. This was why I couldn't freely activate my skills, what with them following me around everywhere. After arriving at the Imperial Library, I had the paladins wait by the door before finally stepping inside alone. I thought no one would be here at this late hour, but contrary to my expectations, there was a girl here already. All by herself, no less. Her attire was different from the regular maidservants. Seeing as how her robe came across a bit more high class, I figured that she must have been one of the ladies in waiting. She was reading a book with a lit lantern placed on the table. After sensing a person's presence, she raised her head and stared at me. Hey, ladies in waiting gotta work hard too, don't they? Seeing how you need to study refinement even deep into the night like this. My words caused a rapid transformation in her expression. She gradually froze up in pure fear, then shot up from her seat and hurriedly stumbled away from me. Judging from her reaction, I figured that she had finally recognized who I was. Her reactions made sense, though, since she was unfortunate enough to run into the Imperial Prince with a prior record of assaulting a lad in waiting at this pretty late hour inside a library that's practically sealed off from the outside. She must have been overcome with shock and fear by now. I spoke up. You don't have to be that scared. I won't do anything to harm you. I only came here to read some books, that's all. 
maybe I wasn't convincing enough, because she just stood there with her lips resolutely clamped shut. I furrowed my brows while looking at her. Wait a minute, maybe she wasn't an ordinary lady in waiting? I recalled back to the Witch Morgana incident as well as when I ran into the Holy Emperor Kelt All False. Back then, there had been just too many people for me to individually check out their real identities and that's how that witch slipped past me. As for the Emperor, I mistook him as just a simple gardener working hard at his job. I really needed to change my mindset here. This was the Imperial Palace, after all. As I had no idea who was who, it's probably wiser to confirm the identity of the person I was dealing with every single time, even if doing such a thing was a bit of a pain in the neck. Name, Alice Astoria. Age, 15. Traits, loving and merciful, a massive pool of divinity plus magical knowledge, God's fragment, prediction, hand-to-hand -hand combat, excellent physique. I'll do my best to help my grandfather. I was surprised by her status as revealed by mind's eye. Astoria? Wasn't that the surname of Archbishop Rapahel, the one who authored the grimoire on the subject of divinity control? Was she his granddaughter then? Weren't there five archbishops in the theocratic empire? A granddaughter of one of them was a lady-in-waiting, and she was standing right before my eyes. In that case, uh, could she be the one that the original seventh imperial prince tried to rape? Besides, what's that God's fragment thing? It feels like I've seen that term somewhere before. Um, excuse me. Are you, really the imperial prince? It seemed that my worries were for nothing. She rubbed her eyes as if she couldn't quite believe what she was seeing right now and kept staring directly at my face. The fear previously visible in her eyes had already disappeared. It was replaced by surprise and puzzlement instead. 030. Imperial Prince is attending a banquet minus one, part one and two, Finn. Chapter 49, 031. Imperial Prince is attending a banquet minus two, part one. I was puzzled by the question from the girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. She didn't seem to recognize me. Maybe it hadn't been that long since she started working here or something. I shifted my gaze over to the book she had been reading. Treatment and the Impossible Miracle, Resurrection. The title sounded a lot like a topic I used to read somewhere else. Raphael Astoria probably wrote this book as well. What a good granddaughter she was, to be studying deep into the night like this. The grimoire itself was a pretty high-leveled one too. This just went to show how knowledgeable Raphael Astoria's granddaughter was. It seems that a certain grandfather is blessed with a wonderful granddaughter, said I while approaching her. She flinched and hurriedly stepped away from me. Those backing steps were filled with vigilance. What she did was a rather impertinent thing to do when speaking to an imperial prince like myself. She must have realized this too, because she belatedly bowed her head and acted according to the established decorum. I could only grin wryly and look at the grimoire again. Resurrection, was it? That sure sounded like an interesting topic. I then shifted my gaze over to this lady-in-waiting. Ah. Looks like I interrupted you. No, not at all, your highness. I was already thinking of tidying up and retiring for the night. She bowed her head deeply. Her desire to avoid me as much as possible came across pretty loud and clear from how she was already heading towards the exit. Then again, I had the prior record of trying to jump on not just a simple maid, but an esteemed daughter of a famed noble household. It made complete sense that she was on guard against me. Sure thing. Have a pleasant night. I waved my hand at her and settled down on the chair before scanning through the grimoire. It was an intriguing topic. All right. The book was talking about resurrection through divinity, not demonic energy as how necromancers would do it. I muttered out, Resurrection, is it? Doesn't sound like it'll be completely impossible, actually. No, it's impossible. I glanced at the lady in waiting. The girl who was about to exit the doorway had stopped moving and turned around to say that. She flinched in surprise, then hurriedly bowed her head again. 
Please forgive me for my insolence, Your Highness. What's your basis? I beg your pardon. The lady in waiting, Alice, raised her head and formed a slightly dazed expression on her face. I pressed hard on the grimoire's page with my fingertip and asked her once more. What's your basis for what you just said? It's because, despite divinity's ability to bestow life force, it can only restore the body but not arrest the soul that has already escaped from it, Your Highness. Such a thing will be impossible even if Goddess Gaia herself grants us with a miracle. What if you can arrest the soul, then? But, doing that is impossible for priests wielding divinity, Your Highness. The only way to make it happen is by using necromancy, but that is of a completely opposite nature to ours. Okay, I get that. However, what if you possess both natures? That is utterly impossible. These two natures are in direct opposition to each other. Even if you do manage to utilize divinity and demonic energy at the same time, your body will explode and you will be exterminated completely. Not even your soul will survive from that. There wasn't even a single shred of hesitation in her voice. I wonder about that. It looks to me that this thing called resurrection isn't completely impossible. My response caused her brows to furrow deeply. I flipped through the grimoire's pages while muttering to seemingly no one in particular. What about an even better divinity control method? Offering prayers to the gods should suffice, your highness. Besides praying. For magicians, mana, and incantations. For priests, divinity, and prayers, while for the dark magicians, demonic energy, and lifespan. Those are the costs one has to pay in order to wield the powers of nature. If you seek another route beside offering prayers, then there are magic tools you can consider. If there was something I was curious about, I would simply ask her as if I was talking to myself. I wonder if it'll be impossible to cast magic while omitting the necessary preparations. Yes. It is possible, Your Highness. Incantations and prayers are there to correctly arrange the sequence of the images forming in your mind. Through enough training, you may get to omit those preparations, but it is not the most efficient method when you try to gather a great amount of energy or to lower the expenditure. However, there is an exception. My question was answered ably by Alice Astoria, who just so happened to be still standing far away from me. If you are blessed with literally an infinite amount of divinity that can deal with all problems that arise from this, then you will be able to omit everything and wield the powers of nature at will. Now those were some truly satisfactory answers. Time continued ticking by as we discussed several things. The lantern's light had gone off before anyone noticed it and the rays of morning sun seeped past the windows. I yawned grandly and rubbed my drowsy eyes, only to realize that she was no longer in the library. I suddenly felt apologetic just then, thinking that I may have needlessly held her up here for the whole night when she probably wanted to go back to her room and rest instead. I guess it's also time for me to tidy up and get out of here myself. I closed the grimoire and got up from the chair. But the first thing to greet me was Harmon's mug as soon as I opened the library's door. He had a troubled expression on his face while looking at me. Your Highness, the banquet is one week from now. Have you prepared for it yet? Now that I thought about it, didn't someone say that the Holy Emperor was organizing a banquet? The feudal lord from up north, Jeanald Repang, and even Grill had been invited. For some reason, Charlotte was also asked to attend as well. Man can't I, like, skip that annoying thing. Only by having your accomplishments publicly acknowledged will your stay be more comfortable here, your highness. I smacked my lips in response. Why did I get the feeling that things were about to get even more annoying? And also. Were you with Lady Alice up until earlier, Your Highness? M.M.? Ah, that? Yeah, I was. Hi A.A.A., that girl was really amazing, let me tell you. Seriously, her knowledge regarding magic was second to none. Thanks to her, the stuff I was curious about are all completely answered now. It felt like that clogged up sensation somewhere deep inside me had been blown away without a single trace left. 
Harman studied my mood before cautiously opening his mouth. Did anything happen, your highness? What do you mean? Hang on, you thought I'd jump on that girl? Hey man, just what do you take me for? Harman, even though the time we spent together is, admittedly not all that long, but hell, we've gone through the proverbial hell and back, didn't we? Don't tell me you still can't let go of your suspicions even now. I tucked and was about to voice out my mind. But then. You, already tried it once before, your highness. Wah. You tried to. Jump on her already. Lady Alice Astoria is the granddaughter of His Eminence Raphael, one of the five archbishops of the Empire and the very same person that ensured your action would remain as an attempt only. My mind blanked out after hearing this. TL, in third person POV. Alice, currently walking on the corridors of the Imperial Palace, was recalling the seventh Imperial Prince's figure. That was the Imperial Prince? The seventh? That Alan all false. She frowned heavily before shaking her head hard. No, it can't be. Outwardly, he seemed to be the exact same person, but something about him felt entirely different in her view. She got this sense of incongruency from him, almost like two different natures were all jumbled up inside the boy. From what she heard, he lost his memories after the suicide attempt, and that seemed to have resulted in the changes to his personality as well. However, she found it strange that even his nature had become different too. When she first saw the seventh imperial prince in the library, she was terrified. But her worries turned out to be unnecessary in the end. He simply settled down quietly on one of the seats, and while reading the book, he began asking her as if he earnestly wished to learn about something. Alice replied to all of his questions. This process repeated itself again and again whenever she resolved herself to exit from the library. Upon fearing that he'd find a pretext somewhere, she deliberately explained everything in as much detail as possible. At first, she was scared. She thought that he'd harm her if she let her guard down even for a second. However, the level of his questions steadily rose up as hours ticked by. She even found the topics quite enjoyable to discuss. This was how she even forgot about the passage of time. The person before her eyes was undoubtedly the one who harmed her, and yet, his disposition seemed to belong to someone else entirely. Before long, she found herself starting to observe the Imperial Prince more closely while looking forward to what he'd ask her next, instead. Goodness, no matter how badly human beings suffered from intense bouts of curiosity and the desire to learn to think that she actually tried to study a person who attempted to assault her. This was pure insanity. She thought that she couldn't have been in the right frame of mind. You're here, my child. Alice raised her gaze. Her grandfather, Raphael Astoria, was standing before the room occupied by the first imperial prince. Chapter 50, 031 Imperial Prince is attending a banquet minus two, part two. I went to look for you in your room, but you were not there. Where have you been? The caring grandfather asked her with a concerned expression, and Alice replied with a smile. I was studying in the library, grandfather. Rapahel smiled back in response. You resemble me when it comes to satisfying our far too intense curiosity. I'm worried that you may harm your health if you keep this up, child. Ah, and also... Please do be more careful. The seventh imperial prince is lurking somewhere in the palace even as we speak. Do pay extra caution not to run into him. Alice flinched a little when she heard that. Due to her excessive curiosity, she had recently ended up spending the whole night with the seventh imperial prince. What kind of a misunderstanding would occur when her grandfather learns of this matter? Maybe he'd even seek out the imperial prince once more while wielding a crozier. Alice did her best to form a bright smile. Please do not worry. I'm growing up healthy and tough all thanks to my mother who safely gave birth to me. Iku, my granddaughter. 1. Raphael lovingly held her tightly. She smiled like a benevolent goddess as she gently patted her grandfather's head. 
Will you be all right? He asked her again with another deeply worried expression. Even if his granddaughter was praised as a genius, the task they were about to perform together was just too heavy of a burden for her young shoulder to bear. I'll be fine, grandfather. With those words, Raphael handed over a bird beak mask and a medical robe to her. Don't push yourself too hard, child. Well then. Let us go inside. Alice put on the mask and the robe before staring at the door of the first imperial prince's room. Raphael knocked, opened the door, and stepped inside. The first imperial prince suffering from indescribable torment was laying on the bed. His body was rotting away even now. Judging from how he was thrashing about wildly on top of the mattress, his pain must have been truly agonizing and unbearable. The healers wearing the bird beak masks who had entered earlier grabbed the prince's four flailing limbs and bound them tight to seal his movements. Then, healing magic was cast on him. Alice lent her support from their side. She kept her eyes locked on the first imperial prince Luan through the clear lenses of the mask. Cold sweat trickled down her body. This one single act of trying to conserve his rotting body had kept them mindlessly busy. They also had to pay an even greater attention so that divinity wouldn't accidentally get into his heart tainted by the curse. She was praised as a genius, a once-in-a-generation talent, or even as a girl who might be a saintess. And yet, even someone like her was nothing more than yet another ineffective healer in front of the first imperial prince Luan. The treatment process came to an end seven hours later. The healers opened the door and exited from the room. The expressions revealed after removing their masks were of despondency. They either held their heads in helplessness or plopped down where they stood. Some even spat out frustrated groans. Alice was no different from them. She carried a forlorn expression underneath the mask. Alice, Archbishop Raphael called out to her as he took off his mask. He too was soaked in sweat from head to toe. Noticing that she didn't respond, his gaze shifted towards her. The girl was simply standing there in her spot unmoving, her mask still on her face. It was probably due to mental shock, even though she had to go through the same experience every single time. Don't blame yourself. This is an impossible task, after all. Alice flinched a little when she heard that word. Impossible. Raphael watched her blur the end of her word and immediately realized his own slip of the tongue. She wanted to save the first imperial prince more than anyone else. So her own grandfather passing the sentence of death on the dying prince right in front of her eyes was clearly not the right thing to do. I'm sure you're exhausted from this ordeal, so why don't you go ahead and rest in your room? I shall take care of reporting back to the imperial family. She powerlessly nodded her head. With staggering steps, she walked on the palace's corridor. However, the very moment she went around the corner, all semblance of strength abandoned her legs and she ended up squatting down. I couldn't heal him. She took off the mask. Her golden locks were soaked through and the messy strands tumbled down her face. Her despairing expression could now be seen with the mask off. But why not? I possess Gaia's fragment, and yet, why couldn't I? She already knew that she was the saintess. She knew better than anyone that she was still in the middle of her growth, and in the future, she'd get to wield an even greater power than right now. Even then, she couldn't shake off this gnawing feeling that even if her growth was completed, it'd still be impossible to heal the first imperial prince Luan. At this rate, the prince would definitely die for sure. No, he wouldn't just merely die but turn into an undead, instead. This was indeed the impossibility. Exactly as her grandfather told her just now. Demonic energy invading one's heart meant that the curse would never come undone unless you died first. Resurrection, is it? Doesn't sound like it'll be completely impossible, actually. Alice recalled what the seventh imperial prince said earlier. Resurrection, a miracle that would only be seen in the legendary myths. Not to mention, an absolutely impossible domain that went against the providence of nature itself, too. But if it was this miracle, then treating the first imperial prince would certainly be possible. 
she tried to comb through every bit of knowledge crammed deep inside her head. She kept her fingers crossed all the time but eventually, had to let go of her expectations. What a funny thing it was. She herself loudly stated that such a thing was impossible, and yet here she was, hoping for that exact miracle to occur. In the end, there was nothing she could do. She held her head in frustration and despair. Back to first person POV. You sure this is everyone? I perused the report Harmon had compiled for me. It was a list of past actions and the individual relationships the seventh imperial prince had, ones that the paladin got to observe with his own eyes in the palace. When I asked him about such things back in the monastery, this guy didn't even mention anything about Alice Astoria. So naturally, I had to dig in even further for his reasoning, and he eventually replied that it was to maintain secrecy. It sorta of made sense, seeing how even the village stuck in the land of the dead spirits knew about the seventh imperial prince trying to assault a lady-in-waiting. It'd be even more troublesome if the rumor of whose granddaughter it was somehow wound up spreading throughout the empire's citizens. Yes, your highness. This is everyone. Even while answering me, Harmon was avoiding my gaze. That's odd. There isn't any info on my mother and father here. Do you even require that, your highness? Don't you remember them perfectly anyway? What do you mean, I remember? I've forgotten all about them, you know. You don't have to hide the truth from me, your highness. We're riding on the same boat, aren't we? What the heck? You're now openly getting in bed with me? Fine, whatever man. Hurry up and spit it out, will ye? Harmon had this deeply troubled expression on him. He pondered deeply about something before opening his mouth. When you were with both of your parents, you lived a truly happy, ordinary life, your highness. Even as he said this, he kept avoiding my gaze. This guy, he was definitely lying. I figured that I still wouldn't get any answers even if I went around asking other people. I noticed earlier that the maids and servants were very reluctant to even mention both the father and mother of the seventh imperial prince. Which wasn't surprising at all, since the topic itself dealt with the imperial family's internal affairs. Unless you were a high-ranking aristocrat, even thinking of mentioning it in the open would be quite tough. Harmon seemed to be trying to change the topic, because he brought something else up. Tomorrow is the banquet, your highness. Have you finished preparing for the occasion? Nope. He did urge me to learn about etiquette earlier, but I didn't bother. Heck, I didn't even have enough time to learn more about magic, so where would I find spare moments to waste on learning such a useless thing called etiquette? Harmon spat out a lengthy sigh. Others may start mocking you if you put on a poor display, your highness. Charlotte has been learning diligently in her own room just so that she wouldn't embarrass you in any way. Tell her to just relax and enjoy it at her own pace. Isn't that what a party is supposed to be, anyway? A party and a banquet are two different beasts, your highness. Harman sighed once more. What will you do if his highness the first imperial prince attends as well? After hearing that, I quickly glanced at the report once more. You know. There is no mention of this first imperial prince in here, too. A simple oversight on my part, your highness. Harman's gaze automatically went towards the ceiling. This dude, his ability to lie was on par with little kids. I asked him, okay, so. Who is the first imperial prince then? Harman pretended to not hear me, but when I locked my glare on him, he finally caved in and opened his mouth. Luin all false. His gaze lowered and he was now looking straight into my eyes. He's your older brother, born from the same womb, your highness. 031. Imperial Prince is attending a banquet minus two, part one and two, Finn.